Stanley in Africa by James P. Boyd Introduction A volume of travel, exploration and adventure is never without instruction and fascination for old and young. There is that within us all which ever seeks for the mysteries which are bidden behind mountains, closeted in forests, concealed by earth or sea, in a word, which are enwrapped by nature. And there is equally that within us which is touched most sensitively and stirred most deeply by the heroism which has characterized the pioneer of all ages of the world and in every field of adventure. How like enchantment is the story of that revelation which the new America furnished the old world! What a spirit of inquiry and exploit it opened! How unprecedented and startling, adventure of every kind became! What thrilling volumes tell of the hardships of daring navigators or of the perils of brave and dashing landsmen. Later on, who fails to read with the keenest emotion of those dangers, trials and escapes which enveloped the intrepid searchers after the icy secrets of the poles. Or confronted those who would unfold the tale of the older civilizations and of the ocean's island spaces. Though the directions of pioneering enterprise change, yet more and more man searches for the new. To follow him, is to write of the wonderful. Again, to follow him is to read of the surprising and the thrilling. No prior history of discovery has ever exceeded in vigorous entertainment and startling interest that which centers in, the dark continent, and has for its most distinguished hero, Henry M. Stanley. His coming and going in the untrodden and hostile wilds of Africa, now to rescue the stranded pioneers of other nationalities, now to explore the unknown waters of a mighty and unique system, now to teach cannibal tribes respect for decency and law. And now to map for the first time with any degree of accuracy, the limits of new dynasties, make up a volume of surpassing moment and peculiar fascination. All the world now turns to Africa as the scene of those adventures which possess such a weird and startling interest for readers of every class, and which invite to heroic exertion on the part of pioneers. It is the one dark, mysterious spot, strangely made up of massive mountains, lofty and extended plateaus, salt and sandy deserts, immense fertile stretches, climates of death and balm, spacious lakes, gigantic rivers, dense forests, numerous. Grotesque and savage peoples, and an animal life of fierce mien, enormous strength and endless variety. It is the country of the marvelous, yet none of its marvels exceed its realities. And each exploration, each pioneering exploit, each history of adventure into its mysterious depths, but intensifies the world's view of it and enhances human interest in it. For it is there the civilized nations are soon to set meets and bounds to their grandest acquisitions, perhaps in peace, perhaps in war. It is there that white colonization shall try its boldest problems. It is there that Christianity shall engage in one of its hardest contests. Victor Hugo says, that, Africa will be the continent of the twentieth century. Already the nations are struggling to possess it. Stanley's explorations proved the majesty and efficacy of equipment and force amid these dusky peoples and through the awful mazes of the unknown. Empires watched with eager eye the progress of his last daring journey. Science and civilization stood ready to welcome its results. He comes to light again, having escaped ambush, flood, the wild beast and disease, and his revelations set the world aglow. He is greeted by kings, hailed by savants, and looked to by the colonizing nations as the future pioneer of political power and commercial enterprise in their behalf, as he has been the most redoubtable leader of adventure in the past. This miraculous journey of the dashing and intrepid explorer, completed against obstacles which all believed to be insurmountable, safely ended after opinion had given him up as dead. Together with its bearings on the fortunes of those nations who are casting anew the chart of Africa, and upon the native peoples who are to be revolutionized or exterminated by the last grand surges of progress. All these render a volume dedicated to travel and discovery, especially in the realm of, the Dark Continent, surprisingly agreeable and useful at this time. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content.
Henry M. Stanley. The news rang through the world that Stanley was safe. For more than a year he had been given up as lost in African wilds by all but the most hopeful. Even hope had nothing to rest upon save the dreamy thought that he, whom hardship and danger had so often assailed in vain, would again come out victorious. The Mission of Henry M. Stanley to find, succor and rescue Emin Pasha, if he were yet alive, not only adds to the life of this persistent explorer and wonderful adventurer one of its most eventful and thrilling chapters. But throws more light on the Central African situation than any event in connection with the discovery and occupation of the coveted areas which lie beneath the equatorial sun. Its culmination, both in the escape of the hero himself and in the success of his perilous errand, to say nothing of its far-reaching effects upon the future of the Dark Continent, opens, as it were, a new volume in African annals. And presents a new point of departure for scientists, statesmen and philanthropists. Space must be found further on for the details of that long, exciting and dangerous journey, which reversed all other tracks of African travel. Yet redounded more than all to the glory of the explorer and the advancement of knowledge respecting hidden latitudes. But here we can get a fair view of a situation, which in all its lights and shadows, in its many startling outlines, in its awful suggestion of possibilities, is perhaps the most interesting and fateful now before the eyes of modern civilization. It may be very properly asked, at the start, who is this wizard of travel, this dashing adventurer, this heroic explorer and rescuer, this pioneer of discovery, who goes about in dark, unfathomed places, defying flood and climate? Jungle and forest, wild beast and merciless savage, and bearing a seemingly charmed life. Who is this genius who has in a decade revolutionized all ancient methods of piercing the heart of the unknown, and of revealing the mysteries which nature has persistently hugged since the morning stars first sang together in joy? The story of his life may be condensed into a brief space, brief yet eventful as that of a conqueror, moved ever to conquest by sight of new worlds. Henry M. Stanley was born in the hamlet of Denby, in Wales, in 1840. His parents, who bore the name of Roland, were poor, so poor, indeed, that the boy, at the age of three years, was virtually on the town. At the age of thirteen, he was turned out of the poor house to shift for himself. Fortunately, a part of the discipline had been such as to assure him the elements of an English education. The boy must have improved himself beyond the opportunities there at hand, for in two or three years afterwards, he appeared in North Wales as a schoolteacher. Thence he drifted to Liverpool, where he shipped as a cabin boy on a sailing vessel, bound for New Orleans. Here he drifted about in search of employment till he happened upon a merchant and benefactor, by the name of Stanley. The boy proved so bright, promising and useful, that his employer adopted him as his son. Thus the struggling John Rowland became, by adoption, the Henry M. Stanley of our narrative. Before he came of age, the new father died without a will, and his business and estate passed away from the foster child to those entitled at law. But for this misfortune, or rather great good fortune, he might have been lost to the world in the counting room of a commercial city. He was at large on the world again, full of enterprise and the spirit of adventure. The Civil War was now on, and Stanley entered the Confederate Army. He was captured by the Federal forces, and on being set at liberty through his fortunes in with his captors by joining the Federal Navy, the ship being the Ticonderoga, on which he was soon promoted to the position of acting ensign. After the war, he developed those powers which made him such an acquisition on influential newspapers. He was of genial disposition, bright intelligence, quick observation and surprising discrimination. His judgment of men and things was sound. He loved travel and adventure, was undaunted in the presence of obstacles, persistent in every task before him, and possessed shrewd insight into human character and projects. His pen was versatile and his style adapted to the popular taste. No man was ever better equipped by nature to go anywhere and make the most of every situation. In a single year he had made himself a reputation by his trip through Asia Minor and other eastern countries. In 1866 he was sent by the New York Herald, as war correspondent, to Abyssinia. The next year he was sent to Spain by the same paper, 
to write up the threatened rebellion there. In 1869 he was sent by the Herald to Africa to find the lost Livingstone. A full account of this perilous journey will be found elsewhere in this volume, in connection with the now historic efforts of that gallant band of African pioneers who immortalized themselves prior to the founding of the Congo Free State. Suffice it to say here, that it took him two years to find Livingstone at Ajiji, upon the great lake of Tanganyika, which lake he explored, in connection with Livingstone. And at the same time made important visits to most of the powerful tribes that surround it. He returned to civilization, but remained only a short while, for by 1874 he was again in the unknown wilds, and this time on that celebrated journey which brought him entirely across the continent from east to west. Revealed the wonderful water resources of tropical Africa and gave a place on the map to that remarkable drainage system which finds its outlet in the Congo River. Says the Reverend G.O.L. Taylor of this march, it was an undertaking which, for grandeur of conception, and for sagacity, vigor, and completeness of execution, must ever rank among the marches of the greatest generals and the triumphs of the greatest discoverers of history. No reader can mentally measure and classify this exploit who does not recall the prolonged struggles that have attended the exploration of all great first-class rivers, a far more difficult work, in many respects, than ocean sailing. We must remember the wonders and sufferings of Orellana's voyages, though in a brigantine, built on the Rio Napo, and with armed soldiers, down that Mediterranean of Brazil, the Amazon, from the Andes to the Atlantic, in 1540. We must recall the voyage of Marquette and Joliet down the Mississippi in 1673, the toils of Park and Landers on the Niger, 1795-1830. And of Speke and Baker on the Nile, 1860-1864, if we would see how the deed of Stanley surpasses them all in boldness and generalship, as it promises also to surpass them in immediate results. The object of the voyage was twofold, first, to finish the work of Speke and Grant in exploring the great Nile lakes, and, secondly, to strike the great Lualaba where Livingstone left it, and follow it to whatever sea or ocean it might lead. And again, the story of the descent of the great river is an Iliad in itself. Through hunger and weariness, through fever, dysentery, poisoned arrows, and smallpox, through bellowing hippopotami, crocodiles, and monsters. Past mighty tributaries, themselves great first-class rivers, down roaring rapids, whirlpools, and cataracts, through great canoe fleets of saw-teethed, fighting, gnashing cannibals fiercer than tigers. Through thirty-two battles on land and river, often against hundreds of great canoes, some of them ninety feet long and with a hundred spears on board. And, at last, through the last fearful journey by land and water down the tremendous cannon below Stanley Pool, still they went on, and on, relentlessly on, till finally they got within hailing and helping distance of Boma. On the vast estuary by the sea. And on August 9, 1877, the news thrilled the civilized world that Stanley was saved, and had connected Livingstone's Lulaba with Tucky's Congo. After 7,000 miles, wanderings in 1,000 days save one from Zanzibar, and four times crossing the equator, he looked white men in the face once more, and was startled that they were so pale. Black had become the normal color of the human face. Thus the central stream of the second vastest river on the globe, next to the Amazon in magnitude, was at last explored, and a new and unsuspected realm was disclosed in the interior of a prehistoric continent. Itself the oldest cradle of civilization. The delusions of ages were swept away at one masterful stroke, and a new world was discovered by a new Columbus in a canoe. It was on that memorable march that he came across the wily Arab, Tipu Tib, at the flourishing market town of Nyangwe, who was of so much service to Stanley on his descent of the Lulaba, Congo, from Nyangwe to Stanley Falls, 1. 000 miles from Stanley Pool, but who has since figured in rather an unenviable light in connection with efforts to introduce rays of civilization into the fastnesses of the Upper Congo. This, as well as previous journeys of Stanley, established the fact that the old method of approaching the heart of the continent by desert coursers, or of threading its hostile mazes without armed help, was neither expeditious nor prudent. It revolutionized exploration, by compelling respect from hostile man and guaranteeing immunity from attack by wild beast. 
For nearly three years Stanley was lost to the civilized world in this transcontinental journey. Its details, too, are narrated elsewhere in this volume, with all its vicissitude of 7,000 miles of zigzag wandering and his final arrival on the Atlantic coast, the wonder of all explorers, the admired of the scientific world. Such was the value of the information he brought to light in this eventful journey, such the wonderful resource of the country through which he passed after plunging into the depths westward of Lake Tanganyika. And such the desirability of this new and western approach to the heart of the continent, not only for commercial but political and humanitarian purposes, that the cupidity of the various colonizing nations, especially of Europe, was instantly awakened, and it was seen that unless proper steps were taken, there must soon be a struggle for the possession of a territory so vast and with such possibilities of empire. To obviate a calamity so dire as this, the happy scheme was hit upon to carve out of as much of the new discovered territory as would be likely to embrace the waters of the Congo and control its ocean outlet. A mighty state which was to be dedicated forever to the civilized nations of the world. In it there should be no clash of foreign interests, but perfect reciprocity of trade and free scope for individual or corporate enterprise without respect to nationality. The King of Belgium took a keen interest in the project, and through his influence other powers of Europe, and even the United States, became enlisted. A plan of the proposed state was drafted and it soon received international ratification. The new power was to be known as the Congo Free State, and it was to be, for the time being, under control of an administrator general. To the work of founding this state, giving it meets and bounds, securing its recognition among the nations, removing obstacles to its approach, establishing trading posts and developing its commercial features, Stanley now addressed himself. We have been made familiar with his plans for securing railway communication between the mouth of the Congo and Stanley Pool, a distance of nearly 200 miles inland, so as to overcome the difficult, if not impossible. Navigation of the Swiftly Rushing River We have also heard of his successful efforts to introduce navigation, by means of steamboats, upon the more placid waters of the Upper Congo and upon its numerous affluents. Up until the year 1886, the most of his time was devoted to fixing the infant empire permanently on the map of tropical Africa and giving it identity among the political and industrial powers of Earth. In reading of Stanley and studying the characteristics of his work one naturally gravitates to the thought, that in all things respecting him, the older countries of Europe are indebted to the genius of the newer American institution. We cannot yet count upon the direct advantages of a civilized Africa upon America. In a political and commercial sense our activity cannot be equal to that of Europe on account of our remoteness, and because we are, as yet, but little more than colonists ourselves. Africa underlies Europe, is contiguous to it, is by nature situated so as to become an essential part of that mighty earth tract which the sun of civilization is, sooner or later, to illuminate. Besides Europe has a need for African acquisition and settlement which America has not. Her areas are small, her population has long since reached the point of overflow, her money is abundant and anxious for inviting foreign outlets, her manufacturing centers must have new cotton and jute fields. Not to mention supplies of raw material of a thousand kinds, her crowded establishments must have the cereal foods, add to all these the love of empire which like a second nature with monarchical rulers. And the desire for large landed estates which is a characteristic of titled nobility, and you have a few of the inducements to African conquest and colonization which throw Europe in the foreground. Yet while all these are true, it is doubtful if, with all her advantages of wealth, location and resource, she has done as much for the evangelization of Africa as has America. No, nor as much for the systematic and scientific opening of its material secrets. And this brings us to the initial idea of this paragraph again. Though Stanley was a foreign waif, cast by adverse circumstances on our shores. It seemed to require the robust freedom and stimulating opportunities of republican institutions to awaken and develop in him the qualities of the strong practical and venturesome man he became. Monarchy may not fetter thought, but it does restrain actions. It grooves and ruts human energy by laws of custom and by arbitrary rules of caste. It would have repressed a man like Stanley, or limited him to its methods. 
he would have been a subject of some dynasty or a victim of some conventionalism. Or if he had grown too large for repressive boundaries and had chosen to burst them, he would have become a revolutionist worthy of exile, if his head had not already come to the block. But under republican institutions his energies and ambitions had free play. Every faculty, every peculiarity of the man grew and developed, till he became a strong, original and unique force in the line of adventure and discovery. This outcrop of manhood and character, is the tribute of our free institutions to European monarchy. The tribute is not given grudgingly. Take it and welcome. Use it for your own glory and aggrandizement. Let crowned heads bow before it, and titled aristocracy worship it, as they appropriate its worth and wealth. But let it not be forgotten, that the American pioneering spirit has opened Africa wider in ten years than all the efforts of all other nations in twenty. Congo Free State In 1877, Stanley wrote to the London Daily Telegraph as follows. I feel convinced that the question of this mighty waterway, the Congo, will become a political one in time. As yet, however, no European power seems to have put forth the right of control. Portugal claims it because she discovered its mouth, but the great powers, England, America, and France, refuse to recognize her right. If it were not that I fear to damp any interest you may have in Africa, or in this magnificent stream, by the length of my letter, I could show you very strong reasons why it would be a politic deed to settle this momentous question immediately. I could prove to you that the power possessing the Congo, despite the cataracts, would absorb to itself the trade of the whole enormous basin behind. This river is and will be the grand highway of commerce to West Central Africa. When Stanley wrote this, with visions of a majestic Congo empire flitting through his brain, he was more than prophetic, at least, he knew more of the impulse that was then throbbing and permeating Europe than any other man. He had met Gambetta, the great French statesman, who in so many words had told him that he had opened up a new continent to the world's view and had given an impulse to scientific and philanthropic enterprise which could not but have material effect on the progress of mankind. He knew what the work of the International Association, which had his plans for a free state under consideration, had been, up to that hour, and were likely to be in the future. He was aware of the fact that the English Baptist missionaries had already pushed their way up the Congo to a point beyond the equator, and that the American Baptists were working side by side with their English brethren. He knew that the London and Church Missionary Societies had planted their flags on Lakes Victoria and Tanganyika, and that the work of the Free Kirk of Scotland was reaching out from Lake Nyasa to Tanganyika. He had seen Pinto and Weissman crossing Africa and making grand discoveries in the Portuguese possessions south of the Congo. De Braza had given France a West African empire. Germany had annexed all the vacant territory in southwest Africa, to say nothing of her East African enterprises, Italy had taken up the Red Sea coast, Great Britain had possessed the Niger Delta. Portugal already owned 700,000 square miles south of the Congo, to which no boundaries had been affixed. Stanley knew even more than this. His heroic nature took no stock in the horrible climate of Africa, which he had tested for so many years. He was fully persuaded that the plateaus of the upper Congo and the central continent were healthier than the lands of Arkansas, which has doubled its population in 25 years. He treated the coast as but a thin line, the mere shell of an egg, yet he saw it dotted with settlements along every available waterway, the Kwanzaa, Congo, Quilu, Agawe, Muni, Cameroon, Oil, Niger, Roquel, Gambia and Senegal rivers. He asked himself, what is left? And the answer came, nothing, except the basins of the four mighty streams, the Congo, the Nile, the Niger and the Sherry, Shire, all of which require railways to link them with the sea. His projected railway from Vivi, around the cataracts of the Congo, to Stanley Pool, 147 miles long, would open nearly 11,000 miles of navigable waterway, and the trade of 43 million people, worth millions of dollars annually. The first results of Stanley's efforts in behalf of a free Congo state were, as already indicated, the formation of an international association, whose president was Colonel Strouch, and to whose existence and management the leading powers of the world gave their assent. 
It furnished the means for his return to Africa, with plenty of help and with facilities for navigating the Congo, in order to establish towns, conclude treaties with the natives, take possession of the lands. Fix meets and bounds and open commerce, in a word, to found a state according to his ideal, and firmly fix it among the recognized empires of the world. In January, 1879, Stanley started for Africa, under the above auspices and with the above intent. But instead of sailing to the Congo direct, he went to Zanzibar on the east coast, for the purpose of enlisting a force of native pioneers and carriers. Aiming as much as possible to secure those who had accompanied him on his previous trips across the continent and down the river, whose ascent he was about to make. Such men he could trust, besides, their experience would be of great avail in so perilous an enterprise. A second object of his visit to Zanzibar was to organize expeditions for the purpose of pushing westward and establishing permanent posts as far as the Congo. One of these, under Lt. Cambier, established a line of posts stretching almost directly westward from Zanzibar to Nyangwe, and through a friendly country. With this work, and the enlistment of 68 Zanzibaris for his Congo expedition, three-fourths of whom had accompanied him across Africa, he was engaged until May, 1879, when he sailed for the Congo, via the Red Sea and Mediterranean. And arrived at Banana Point at the mouth of the Congo, on August. 14, 1879, as he says, to ascend the great river with the novel mission of sowing along its banks civilized settlements, to peacefully conquer and subdue it, to mold it in harmony with modern ideas into national states. Within whose limits the European merchant shall go hand in hand with the dark African trader, and justice and law and order shall prevail, and murder and lawlessness and the cruel barter of slaves shall forever cease. Once at Banana Point, all hands trimmed for the tropical heat. Heads were shorn close, heavy clothing was changed for soft, light flannels, hats gave place to ventilated caps, the food was changed from meat to vegetable. Liquors gave place to coffee or tea, for be it known a simple glass of champagne may prove a prelude to a sunstroke in African lowlands. The officers of the expedition here met, an international group indeed, an American, Stanley, two Englishmen, five Belgians, two Danes, one Frenchman. The steamer Barga had long since arrived from Europe with a precious assortment of equipments, among which were building material and a flotilla of light steam launches. One of these, the En Avant was the first to discover Lake Leopold II, explore the Bayer and reach Stanley Falls. In seven days, August 21, the expedition was underway, braving the yellow, giant stream with steel cutters, driven by steam. The river is three miles wide, from 60 to 900 feet deep, and with a current of six miles an hour. On either side are dark walls of mangrove and palm, through which course lazy, unknown creeks, alive only with the slimy reptilia of the coast sections. For miles the course is through the serene river flood, fringed by a leafy, yet melancholy nature. Then a cluster of factories, known as Kasinga, is passed, and the river is broken into channels by numerous islands, heavily wooded. Only the deeper channels are now navigable, and selecting the right ones the fleet arrives at Wood Point, a Dutch trading town, with several factories. Up to this point, the river has had no depth of less than 16 feet, increased to 22 feet during the rainy season. The mangrove forests have disappeared, giving place to the statelier palms. Grassy plains begin to stretch invitingly down to the water's edge. In the distance high ridges throw up their serrated outlines, and seemingly converge toward the river, as a look is taken ahead. Soon the wonderful fetish rocks are sighted, which all pilots approach with dread, either through superstition or because the deep current is broken by miniature whirlpools. One of these granite rocks stands on a high elevation and resembles a lighthouse. It is the Limboline Zambi, finger of God, of the natives. Boma is now reached. It is the principal emporium of trade on the Congo, the buying and selling mart for Banana Point, and connected with it by steamers. There is nothing picturesque hereabouts, yet Boma has a history as old as the slave trade in America, and as dark and horrible as that traffic was infamous. Here congregated the white slave dealers for over two centuries, 
and here they gathered the dusky natives by the thousand, chained them in gangs by the dozen or score, forced them into the holds of their slave ships, and carried them away to be sold in the Brazils, West Indies, and North America. Whole fleets of slave ships have anchored off Boma, with their loads of rum, their buccaneer crews and bloodthirsty officers, intent on human booty. Happily, all is now changed and the Arab is the only recognized slave stealer in Africa. Boma has several missions, and her traders are on good terms with the surrounding tribes. Her market is splendid, and here may be found in plenty oranges, citrons, limes, papaws, pineapples, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, onions, turnips, cabbage, beets, carrots, and lettuce, besides the meat of bullocks, sheep, goats, and fowls. After establishing a headquarters at Boma, under the auspices of the International Commission, the expedition proceeded to Masuko, where the heavier steamer, Albion, was dismissed, and where all the stores for future use were collected. This point is 90 miles from the sea. River reconnaissances were made in the lighter steamers, and besides the information picked up, the navigators were treated to a hippopotamus hunt which resulted in the capture of one giant specimen. Upon whose back one of the Danish skippers mounted in triumph, that he might have a thrilling paragraph for his next letter to Copenhagen. Above Boma the Congo begins to narrow between verdure-clad hills rising from 300 to 1,100 feet, and navigation becomes more difficult, though channels of 15 to 20 feet in depth are found. Further on, toward Vivi is a splendid reach of swift, deep water, with an occasional whirlpool, capable of floating the largest steamship. Vivi was to be a town founded under the auspices of the International Commission, an entrepot for an extensive country. The site was pointed out by Didida, chief of the contiguous tribe, who seemed to have quite as keen a commercial eye as his European visitors. Hither were gathered five of the most powerful chiefs of the vicinity, who were pledged, over drafts of fresh palm juice, to recognize the newly established emporium. It is a salubrious spot, surrounded by high plateaus, affording magnificent views. From its lofty surroundings one may sketch a future, which shall abound in well-worn turnpike roads, puffing steamers, and columns of busy tradespeople. As Vivi is, the natives are by no means the worst sort of people. They wear a moderate amount of clothing, take readily to traffic, keep themselves well supplied with marketing, and use as weapons the old-fashioned flintlock guns they have secured in trade with Europeans. At the grand assemblage of chiefs, one of the dusky seniors voiced the unanimous sentiment thus, we, the big chiefs of Vivi are glad to see the Mundal, traitor. If the Mundal has any wish to settle in this country, as Masala, the interpreter, informs us, we will welcome him, and will be great friends to him. Let the Mundal speak his mind freely. Stanley replied that he was on a mission of peace, that he wanted to establish a commercial emporium, with the right to make roads to it and improve the surrounding country. And that he wanted free and safe intercourse with the people for all who chose to come there. If they would give guarantees to this effect, he would pay them for the right. Then began a four hours chaffer which resulted in the desired treaty. Apropos to this deal Stanley says, in the management of a bargain I should back the Congo native against Jew or Christian, Parsi, or Banyan, in all the round world. I have there seen a child of eight do more tricks of trade in an hour than the cleverest European trader on the Congo could do in a month. There is a little boy at Bolobo, aged six, named Linguji, who would make more profit out of a pound's worth of cloth than an English boy of fifteen would out of ten pounds worth. Therefore when I write of the Congo natives, Bakugo, Bayanzi, or Batik tribes, I associate them with an inconceivable amount of natural shrewdness and a power of indomitable and untiring chaffer. Thus Vivi was acquired, and Stanley brought thither all his boats and supplies. He turned all his working force, a hundred in number, to laying out streets to the top of the plateau, where houses and stores were erected. The natives rendered assistance and were much interested in the smashing and removal of the boulders with the heavy sledges. They called Stanley Beulah Matari, Rock Breaker, a title he came to be known by on the whole line of the Congo, up to Stanley Falls. Gardens were planted, shade trees were set out, and on January 8, 1880, 
Stanley wrote home that he had a site prepared for a city of 20,000 people, at the head of navigation on the lower Congo, and a center for trade with a large country. When suitable roads were built, he left it in charge of one of his own men, as governor, or chief, and started on his tedious and more perilous journey through the hills and valleys of the cataract region. This journey led him through various tribes, most of whom lived in neat villages, and were well supplied with live animals, garden produce and cotton clothing. They were friendly and disposed to encourage him in his enterprise of making a good commercial road from Vivi, around the cataracts, to some suitable station above, provided they were well paid for the right of way. A melancholy fact in connection with many of these tribes is that they have been decimated by internecine wars, mostly of the olden time, when the catching and selling of slaves was a business. And that thereby extensive tracts of good land have been abandoned to wild game, elephants, buffaloes, waterbuck and antelopes, which breed and roam at pleasure. It was nothing unusual to see herds of half a dozen elephants luxuriously spraying their sunburnt backs in friendly pools, nor to startle whole herds of buffaloes, which would scamper away, with tails erect, for safety, cowards all. Except when wounded and at bay, and then a very demon, fuller of fight than a tiger and even more dangerous than the ponderous elephant. Owing to the fact that the Congo threads its cataract section with immense falls and through deep gorges, this part of Stanley's journey had to be made at some distance from its channel, and with only glimpses of its turbid waters. Over lofty ridges, through deep grass-clothed or densely forested valleys, and across various tributaries, abounding in hippopotami and other water animals. Many fine views were had from the mountains of Ngoma. He decided that a road could be made from Vivi to Isangela, a distance of 52 miles, and that from Isangela navigation could be resumed on the Congo. And this road he now proceeded to make, for, though years before in his descent of the river he had dragged many heavy canoes for miles overland, and around similar obstructions, he now had heavier craft to carry, and objects of commerce in view. He had 106 men at his disposal at Vivi, who fell to work with good will, cutting down the tall grass, removing boulders, corduroying low grounds, bridging streams, and carrying on engineering much the same as if they were in a civilized land, the natives helping when so inclined. The workmen had their own supplies, which were supplemented by game, found in abundance, and were molested only by the snakes which were disturbed by the cutting and digging. Of these, the spitting snake was the most dangerous, not because of its bite, but because it ejects its poison in a stream from a distance of six feet into the face and eyes of its enemy. The ill effects of such an injection lasts for a week or more. The tall grass was infested with the whip snake, the bulky python was found near the streams, while a peculiar green snake inhabited the trees of the stony sections and occasionally dangled in unpleasant proximity to the faces of the workmen. As this road-making went on, constant communication was kept up with Vivi. The steamers were mounted on heavy wagons, and were drawn along by hand power as the road progressed. Stores and utensils of every kind were similarly loaded and transported. The mules and asses, belonging to the expedition, were of course brought into requisition, but in nearly all cases their strength had to be supplemented by the workmen. Accidents were not infrequent, but fatal casualties were rare. Some died of disease, yet the general health was good. One of the coast natives fell a victim to an enraged hippopotamus, which crushed him and his bark as readily as an eggshell. Thus the road progressed to Makia Manguba, a distance of twenty-two miles from Vivi, and after many tedious trips to and fro, all the equipments of the expedition were brought to that point. The time consumed had been about five months, from March to August. Here the steel lighters were brought into requisition, and the equipments were carried by steam to a new camp on the Bundy River, where road-making was even more difficult, because the forests were now dense and the woods, mahogany, teak, guayacum and bombax, very hard. Fortunately the natives kept up a fine supply of sweet potatoes, bananas, fowls and eggs, which supplemented the usual rice diet of the workmen. It was with the greatest hardship that the road was completed between the Luenda and Lulu rivers, so thick were the boulders and so hard the material which composed them. The Europeans all fell sick, and even the natives languished. 
At length the Beulah River was reached, sixteen miles from the Bundy, where the camp was supplied with an abundance of buffalo and antelope meat. The way must now go either over the steep declivities of the Ngoma Mountains, or around their jagged edges, where they abut on the roaring Congo. The latter was chosen, and for days the entire force were engaged in cutting a roadway along the sides of the bluffs. This completed, a short stretch of navigable water brought them to Isangela, fifty-two miles from Vivi. It was now January 2, 1881. Thither all the supplies were brought, and the boats were scraped and painted, ready for the long journey to Manyanga. Stanley estimated that all the goings and comings on this 52 miles of roadway would foot up 2,352 miles of travel. And it had cost the death of six Europeans and 22 natives, besides the retirement of 13 invalids. Verily, it was a year dark with trial and unusual toil. But the cataracts had been overcome, and rest could be had against further labors and dangers. The little steel lighters are now ready for their precious loads. In all, there has been collected at Isangela full fifty tons of freight, besides wagons and the traveling luggage of 118 colored carriers and attendants and pioneers. It is a long, long way to Manyanga, but if the river proves friendly, it ought to be reached in from seventy to eighty days. The Congo is three quarters of a mile wide, with rugged shores and tumultuous currents. The little steamers have to feel their way, hugging the shores in order to avoid the swift waters of the outer channels, and starting every now and then with their paddles the drowsy crocodiles from their habitat. The astonished creatures dart forward, at first, as if to attack the boats, but of a sudden disappear in the flood, to rise again in the rear and give furious chase at a distance they deem quite safe. This part of the river is known as Long Reach. These reaches, or stretches, some of them five miles long, are expansions of the river, between points of greater fall, and are more easily navigable than where the stream narrows or suddenly turns a point. The canon appearance of the shores now begins to disappear, and extensive grass-grown plains stretch occasionally to the water's edge. At the camp near Kololo Point, where the river descends swiftly, the expedition was met by Crittington and Bentley, two missionaries, who were fleeing in a canoe from the natives of Kinshasa, where they had been surrounded by an armed mob and threatened with their lives. They were given protection and sent to Isangela. Stanley had now to mourn the loss of his most trustworthy messenger, Sooty. He had gone back to Vivi for the European mail and on the way had met a herd of buffaloes. Selecting the finest, he discharged his rifle at it and killed it, as he thought. But when he rushed up to cut its jugular vein, the beast arose in fury, and tossed and mangled poor Sooty so that he died soon after his companions came to his rescue. Stretch after stretch of the turbulent Congo is passed, and camp after camp has been formed and vacated. At all camps, where practicable, the natives have been taken into confidence, and the intent of the expedition made known. With hardly an exception they fell into the spirit of the undertaking, and gladly welcomed the opportunity to open commerce with the outer world. The Nzambi rapids now offer an obstacle to navigation, but soon a safe channel is found, and a magnificent stretch of water leads to a bay at the mouth of the Quilu River, a navigable stream, with a depth of eight feet. A width of forty yards and a current of five miles an hour. The question of food now became pressing. Each day the banks of the river were scoured for rations, by gangs of six men, whose duty it was to purchase and bring in cassava, bread, bananas, Indian corn, sweet potatoes, etc. Not forgetting fowls, eggs, goats, etc., for the Europeans. But these men found it hard work to obtain fair supplies. By April 7 the camp was at Kimbanza opposite the mouth of the Lukunga and in the midst of a land of plenty, and especially of crocodiles, which fairly infest the river and all the tributaries thereof. Here, too, are myriads of little fish like minnows, or sardines, which the natives catch in great quantities, in nets, and prepare for food by baking them in the sun. The population is quite dense, and of the same amiable mood, the same desire to traffic, and the same willingness to enter into treaties, as that on the river below. Further up are the Ndunga people and the Ndunga rapids, where the river is penned in between high, 
forbidding walls and where nature has begrudged life of every kind to the seam. But out among the villages all is different. The people are thrifty and sprightly. Their markets are full of sweet potatoes, eggs, fish, palm wine, etc. And the shapely youths, male and female, indulge in dances which possess as much poetry of motion as the Terpsichorean performances of the more highly favored children of civilization. The next station was Manyanga, a destination indeed, for here is a formidable cataract, which defies the light steamers of the expedition, and there will have to be another tedious portage to the open waters of Stanley Pool. It was now May 1, 1881. Manyanga is 140 miles from Vivi. The natives were friendly but adverse to founding a trading town in their midst. Yet Stanley resolved that it should be a station and supply point for the 95 miles still to be traversed to Stanley Pool. He fell sick here, of fever, and lay for many days unconscious. Such was his prostration, when he returned to his senses, that he despaired of recovery, and bade his attendants farewell. In the midst of hardship which threatened to break his expedition up at this point, he was rejoiced to witness the arrival of a relief expedition from below, other boats, plenty of provisions and a corps of workmen. Then the site of the town of Manyanga was laid out, and a force of men was employed to build a road around the cataract and haul the boats over it. This point is the center of exchange for a wide territory. Slaves, ivory, rubber, oil, pigs, sheep, goats and fowls are brought in abundance to the market, and it is a favorite stopping place for caravans from the mouth of the Congo to Stanley Pool. But the natives are crusty, and several times Stanley had to interfere to stop the quarrels which arose between his followers and the insolent market people. At length the town was fortified, provisioned and garrisoned, and the expedition was on its way to Stanley Pool, around a portage of six miles in length, and again into the Congo. Then up and up, with difficult navigation, past the mouths of inflowing rivers, around other tedious portages, through quaint and curious tribes, whose chiefs grow more and more fantastic in dress and jealous of power. Till they even come to rival that paragon of strutting kingliness, the famed Mtesa of Uganda. Though not hostile, they were by no means amiable, having made a recent session of the country on the north of the Congo to French explorers. King Itzi, or Ngaliima, was among the most powerful of them and upon him was to turn the fortune of the expedition in the waters of the upper Congo. Stanley made the happy discovery that this Ngaliima was the Itzi, of whom he had made a blood brother on his descent of the river, and this circumstance soon paved the way to friendship and protection. Despite the murmurs and threats of neighboring chiefs. The last king of note, before reaching Stanley Pool, was Makoko, who favored the breaking of rocks and the cutting down of trees in order to pass boats over the country. But who wanted it understood that his people owned the country and did not intend to part with their rights without due consideration. Scarcely had a treaty been struck with him when Stanley was informed that Ngaliima was on his track with two hundred warriors, and determined to wipe out his former negotiations with blood. Already the sound of his war drums and the shouts of his soldiers were heard in the distance. Stanley ordered his men to arm quickly and conceal themselves in the bush, but to rush out frantically and make a mock attack when they heard the gong sounding. Ngaliima appeared upon the scene with his forces and informed Stanley that he could not go to Kintamo, for Makoko did not own the land there. After a long talk, the stubborn chief left the tent in anger and with threats of extermination on his lips. But as he passed the enclosure, he was attracted by the gong, swinging in the wind. What is this? he asked. It is fetish, replied Stanley. Strike it, let me hear it, he exclaimed. Oh, Ngaliima, I dare not, it is the war fetish. No, no, no. I tell you to strike. Well, then. Here Stanley struck the gong with all his force, and in an instant a hundred armed men sprang from the bush and rushed with demoniac yells upon the haughty chief and his followers. Keeping up all the while such demonstrations as would lead to the impression that the next second would bring an annihilating volley from their guns. The frightened king clung to Stanley for protection. His followers fled in every direction. Shall I strike the fetish again? inquired Stanley. No, no. Don't touch it, 
exclaimed the now subdued king. And the broken treaty was solemnized afresh over a gourd of palm wine. Makoko was jolly over the discomfiture of his powerful rival. These Kintamo people, sometimes called the Wambunda, now gave to Stanley some seventy-eight carriers and greatly assisted him in making his last twelve miles of roadway and in conveying his boats and wagons over it. The expedition was now in sight of Stanley Pool, beyond the region of the cataracts, and at the foot of navigation on the upper Congo. It was now December. 3, 1881, the boats were all brought up and launched in smooth water, a station was founded, and the expedition prepared for navigation on that stupendous stretch of water between Stanley Pool and Stanley Falls. The Kintamo station was called Leopoldville, in honor of King Leopold of Belgium, European patron of the Congo Free State, and to whose generosity more than that of any other the entire expedition was due. It was the most important town thus far founded on the Congo, for it was the center of immense tribal influence, a base of operations for 5,000 miles of navigable waters, and a seat of plenty if the chiefs remained true to their concessions. It was therefore well protected with a blockhouse and garrison, while the magazine was stocked with food and ammunition. Gardens were laid out and planted, stores were erected in which goods were displayed, and soon Stanley had the pleasure of seeing the natives bringing ivory and marketing for traffic. The stay of the expedition at Leopoldville was somewhat lengthy and it was April, 19, 1882, before it embarked for the Upper Congo, with its 49 colored men, for whites, and 129 carrier loads of equipments. The boats passed Bamo Island, 14 miles in length, which occupies the center of Stanley Pool, the stream being haunted by hippopotami and the interior of the island by elephants and buffaloes, adventures with which were common. The shores are yet bold and wooded, monkeys and troops fling themselves from tree to tree, white-collared fish eagles dart with shrill screams across the wide expanse of waters, and crocodiles stare wildly at the approaching steamers. Only to dart beneath them as they near and then to reappear in their wake. Says Stanley, of this part of the river. From the Belize to Omaha, on the line of the Mississippi, I have seen nothing to excite me to poetic madness. The Hudson is a trifle better in its upper part. The Indus, the Ganges, the Irrawaddy, the Euphrates, the Nile, the Niger, the La Platte, the Amazon, I think of them all, and I can see no beauty on their shores that is not excelled many fold by the natural beauty of this scenery, which, since the Congo highlands were first fractured by volcanic caprice or by some wild earth dance, has remained unknown, unhonored, and unsung. From Stanley Pool to Mswata, a distance of 64 miles, the river has a width of 1,500 yards, a depth sufficient to float the largest steamer, and heavily wooded banks. The people are of the Katik tribes and are broken into many bands, ruled by a high class of chieftains, who are not averse to the coming of the white man. The Congo receives an important tributary near Mswata, called the Kwa. This Stanley explored for 200 miles, past the Holy Isle, or burial place of the Wabuma kings and queens, through populous and pleasantly situated villages and onward to a splendid expanse of water, which was named Lake Leopold II. It was during his exploration of the Kwa that Stanley fell sick. And on his return to Mswata, was compelled to return to Leopoldville and so back to Manyanga, Vivi, and the various stations he had founded, to the coast, whence he sailed for Loando, to take a steamer for Europe. The three-year service of his Zanzibaris was about to expire, and when he met at Vivi, the German, Dr. Peschnaloch, with a large force of men and a commission to take charge of the expedition, should anything happen to him, Stanley, he felt that it was in the nature of a reprieve. On August 17, 1882, he sailed from Loando for Lisbon. On his arrival in Europe, he laid before the International Association a full account of the condition of affairs on the Congo. He had founded five of the eight stations at first projected, had constructed many miles of wagon road, had left a steamer and sailing vessels on the upper Congo, had opened the country to traffic up to the mouth of the Kwa. A distance of 400 miles from the coast, had found the natives amiable and willing to work and trade. And had secured treaties and concessions which guaranteed the permanency of the benefits sought to be obtained by the expedition and the founding of a great free state. 
Yet with all this he declared that, the Congo Basin is not worth a two-shilling piece in its present state, and that to reduce it to profitable order a railroad must be built from the lower to the upper river. Such road must be solely for the benefit of Central Africa and of such as desire to traffic in that region. He regarded the first phase of his mission as over, the opening of communication between the Atlantic and Upper Congo. The second phase he regarded as the obtaining of concessions from all the chiefs along the way, without which they would be in a position to force an abandonment of every commercial enterprise. The International Association heard him patiently and offered to provide funds for his more extensive work, provided he would undertake it. He consented to do so and to push his work to Stanley Falls, if they would give him a reliable governor for the establishments on the Lower Congo. Such a man was promised. And after a six-week stay in Europe, he sailed again for Congo land on November 23, 1882. He found his trading stations in confusion, and spent some time in restoring order, and revittling the empty storehouses. The temporary bridges on his hastily built roads had begun to weaken and one at the Palanga crossing gave way, compelling a tedious delay with the boats and wagons he was pushing on to the relief of Leopoldville. Here he found no progress had been made and that under shameful neglect everything was going to decay. Even reciprocity with the natives had been neglected, and garrison and tribes had agreed to let one another severely alone. To rectify all he found wrong required heroic exertion. He found one source of gratification in the fact that two English religious missions had been founded on the ground of the association, one a Baptist, the other undenominational. Dar. Sims, head of the Baptists, was the first to navigate the waters of the Upper Congo, and occupy a station above Stanley Pool, but soon after the Livingstone, or undenominational mission, established a station at the equator. Both missions now have steamers at their disposal, and are engaged in peaceful rivalry for moral conquest in the Congo Basin. The relief of Leopoldville accomplished, Stanley started in his steam launches, one of which was new, May 9, 1883, for the upper waters of the Congo, with 80 men. Passing his former station at Mswata, he sailed for Bolobo, passing through a country with few villages and alive with lions, elephants, buffaloes and antelopes, proof that the population is sparse at a distance from the river. Beyond the mouth of the Lawson, the Congo leaves behind its bold shores and assumes a broader width. It now becomes lacustrine and runs lazily through a bed carved out of virgin soil. This is the real heart of equatorial Africa, rich alluvium, capable of supporting a countless population and of enriching half a world. The Bolobo country is densely populated, but flat and somewhat unhealthy. The villages arise in quick succession, and perhaps 10,000 people live along the river front. They are peaceful, inclined to trade, but easily offended at any show of superiority on the part of white men. Ibaka is the leading chief. He it was who conducted negotiations for Gatchula, who had murdered two white men, and who had been arraigned for his double crime before Stanley. The latter insisted upon the payment of a heavy fine by the offending chief, or war. After long deliberation, the fine was paid, much to Stanley's relief, for war would have defeated the whole object of his expedition. Ibaka's remark, when the affair was so happily ended, was, Gatchula has received such a fright and has lost so much money, that he will never be induced to murder a man again. No, indeed, he would rather lose ten of his women than go through this scene again. A Bolobo concession for the association was readily obtained in a council of the chiefs. And this station at Bolobo was most important. The natives are energetic traders, and have agents at Stanley Pool and points further down the river, to whom they consign their ivory and camwood powder, very much as if they were Europeans or Americans. They even acquire and enjoy fortunes. One of them, Manguru, is a nabob after the modern pattern, worth fully $20,000, and his canoes and slaves exploit every creek and affluent of the Congo, gathering up every species of merchandise available for the coast markets. Within two hours of Bolobo is the marketplace of the Bayanzi tribe. The town is called Mpumba. It is a live place on market days, and the fakirs vie with each other in the sale of dogs, crocodiles, hippopotamus meat, snails, fish and redwood powder. 
negotiations having been completed at Bilobo, and the station fully established, Stanley started with his flotilla, May 28, on his way up the river. The natives whom he expected to confront were the Yanzi and Ubangi. He was well provided with guides from Bilobo, among whom were two of Ibaka's slaves. The shores of the river were now densely wooded, and the river itself spread out to the enormous width of five miles, which space was divided into channels by islands, miles in length, and covered with rubber trees, tamarinds, baobab, bombacks, redwood, palms and date palms, all of which were interwoven with profuse creepers, making an impenetrable mass of vegetation, royal to look upon, but suggestive of death to anyone who dared to lift the verdant veil and look behind. Slowly the tiny steamers push against the strong currents and make their way through this luxuriant monotony, broken, to be sure, every now and then, by the flit of a sunbird, the chirp of a weaver, the swish of a bamboo reed. The graceful nodding of an overgrown papyrus, the scurrying of a flock of parrots, the yawn of a lazy hippopotamus, the plunge of a crocodile, the chatter of a disturbed monkey colony, the scream of the white-collared fish eagle, the darting of a kingfisher, the pecking of wagtails, the starting of jays and flamingos. Yet with all these appeals to eye and ear, there is the sepulchral gloom of impervious forest, the sad expanse of grassy plain, the spectral isles of the stream, the vast dome of tropical sky. And the sense of slowness of motion and cramped quarters, which combine to produce a melancholy almost appalling. It is by no means a Rhine journey, with gay steamers, flush with food and wine. The Congo is one and a half times larger than the Mississippi, and with a width which is majestic in comparison with the Father of Waters. It shows a dozen varieties of palm. Its herds of hippopotami, flocks of gleeful monkeys, troops of elephants standing sentry at forest entrances, bevies of buffaloes grazing on its grassy slopes, swarms of ibis. Parrots and guinea fowl fluttering everywhere, these create a life for the Congo, surpassing in variety that of the Mississippi. But the swift-moving, strong, Sonora steamer, and the bustling river town, are wanting. At last night comes, and the flotilla is twenty miles above Bilobo. Night does not mean the end of a day's work with the expedition, but rather the beginning of one, for it is the signal for all hands to put ashore with axes and saws to cut and carry a supply of wood for the morrow's steaming. A great light is lit upon the shore, and for hours the ringing of axes is heard, varied by the woodman's weird chant. The supply is borne back in bundles, the tired natives eat their cassava bread and boiled rice suppers, the whites partake of their roast goat's meat, beans, bananas, honey, milk and coffee, and then all is silence on the deep, dark river. The camp is Eugend, still in the Bayanzi country. The natives are suspicious at first, but are appeased by the order that every member of the expedition shall make up his reedy couch in close proximity to the steamers. The next day's steaming is through numerous villages, banana groves, palm groups, and an agreeable alternation of bluff and vale. The levee hills approach the water in the airy red projections of Iambai. The natives gaze in awe upon the passing flotilla, as much as to say, what does it all mean? Has doom indeed dawned for us? Two hours above Iambai the steamers lose their way in the multitude of channels, and have to put back. On their return, twenty canoes are sighted in a creek. Information must be had, and the whaleboat is launched and ordered to visit the canoes. At sight of it, the occupants of the canoes flee. Chase is given, and five miles are passed before the whaleboat catches up. The occupants of the canoes are found to be women, who jump into the water and escape through the reeds to the shore. They prove dumb to all inquiries as to the river courses, and might as well have been spared their fright. On May 31st the journey was against a head wind, and so slow that two trading canoes, each propelled by twenty Bayanzi paddles, bound for Ubangi, kept pace with the steamers all day. Provisions were now running low. Since leaving Bilobo, the eighty natives and seven Europeans had consumed at the rate of 250 pounds of food daily. It was therefore time to prepare for barter with the settlement which came into view on June 1, and which the guides called Lokalila. Lokalila is a succession of the finest villages thus far seen on the Congo. They are composed of substantial huts, 
built on a bold shore, and amid a primeval forest, thinned of its trees to give building spaces. The natives are still of the Wyanzi tribe, and whether friendly or not, could not be ascertained on first approach. Stanley took no chances with them, but steaming slowly past their five mile of villages, he ordered all the showy calicos and trinkets to be displayed. And placed his guides and interpreters in the bows of the boats to harangue the natives and proclaim his desire to trade in peace. Though the throng gradually increased on the shore and became more curious as each village was passed, it gave no response except that the country had been devastated by frightful disease and was in a state of starvation. Horrid indeed was the situation, if they spoke the truth. But what of the fat, well-to-do looking people on the banks? Ah! There must be something wrong somewhere. The steamers passed above the villages and put up for the night. Soon the natives came trooping from the villages, bearing loads of fowls, goats, plantains, bananas, cassava, sweet potatoes, yams, eggs, and palm oil, and all eager for a trade. Barter was brisk that night, and was resumed the next morning, when canoe after canoe appeared, loaded down with rations. A supply of food for eight days was secured. They excused their falsehoods of the previous day to the fear they had of the steamers. On finding that they were not dangerous, their cowardice turned into admiration of a craft they had never seen before. The Congo now ran through banks one hundred feet high and a mile and a half apart, clothed with magnificent timber. Between these the flotilla sailed on June 2 d, being visited occasionally by native fishermen with fish to sell. The camp this night was in a deserted spot, with nothing to cheer it except dense flocks of small birds, followed by straggling armies of larger ones resembling crows. On the evening of June 3d the steamers reached a point a few miles below Ngam. Here Stanley was surprised to hear his name called, in good English, by the occupants of two canoes, who had fish and crocodiles to sell. He encouraged the mongers by making a purchase, and on inquiry found that the natives here carry on quite a brisk trade in young crocodiles, which they rear for the markets. They procure the eggs, hatch them in the sand, and then secure the young ones in ponds, covered with nets, till they are old enough to market. Ngam was now sighted, on a bank forty feet above the river, amid a wealth of banana groves and other signs of abundance. Above and below Ngam the river is from four to five miles wide, but here it narrows to two miles and flows with a swift current. The sail over the wide stretch above Ngam was through the land of the Kuku, a trading people. At Butuna the steamers were welcomed with delight, and the shores echoed with shouts of Malamu. Good. But it remained for the Usindi to greet the travellers with an applause which was ridiculously uproarious. Hundreds of canoes pushed into the stream, followed and surrounded the steamers, their occupants cheering as though they were frantic, and quite drowning every counter-demonstration. At length a dozen of them sprang aboard one of the steamers, shook hands with all the crew, and gratified their curiosity by a close inspection of the machinery and equipments. Then they would have the steamers put back to their landing at Usindi, where the welcome was continued more obstreperously than ever. The secret of it all was that these people were great river traders, and many of them had been to Leopoldville and Kintamo, three hundred miles below, where they had seen houses, boats and wagons. They were a polished people, not given to show of their weapons for purposes of terrorizing their visitors, and kindly in the extreme. Aoka, their king, besought Stanley to make a station at Usindi and enter into permanent trade relations with his people. A very few miles above Usindi the flotilla entered a deep channel of the Congo, which seemed to pass between fruitful islands, whose shores were lined with people. They were ominously quiet till the steamers passed, when they gave pursuit in their canoes. The steamers stopped, and the pursuers made the announcement that they bore an invitation from King Mengambo, of Iribu, to visit him. Mention of the Iribu was enough to determine Stanley. They are the champion traders of the Upper Congo, and are equaled only by the powerful Ubanzi who live on the north side of that great flood. The Iribu have, time and again, borne down upon the Lokalila, Ngam, Kuku, Butunu and Yusindi, and even the fierce Bengala, and taught them all how to traffic in peace and with credit. 
When the steamers came to anchor at Mangambo's village, the aged king headed a procession of his people and welcomed Stanley by shaking his hand in civilized fashion. There were cheers, to be sure, but not the wild vociferations of those who looked upon his flotilla as something supernatural. There was none of that eager curiosity which characterizes the unsophisticated African, but a dignified bearing and frank speech. They had an air of knowledge and travel which showed that their intercourse with the trading world had not been in vain. They know the Congo by heart from Stanley Pool to Yupoto, a distance of 600 miles. Are acquainted with the military strength and commercial genius of all the tribes, and can compute the value of cloth, metals, beads and trinkets, in ivory, livestock and market produce, as quickly as the most skillful accountant. Blood brotherhood was made with Mangambo, valuable gifts were interchanged, and then the chief, in a long speech, asked Stanley to intercede in his behalf in a war he was waging with Magwala and Pika. Which he did in such a way as to bring about a truce. The large tributary, Lukana, enters the Congo near Iribu, with its black waters and sluggish current. The flotilla left the mouth of the Lukana on June 6, and after a sail of fifty miles, came to Ikengo on June 8. The route had been between many long islands, heavily wooded, while the shores bore an unbroken forest of teak, mahogany, gum, bombax and other valuable woods. At Ikengo the natives came dashing into the stream in myriad of canoes shouting their welcomes and praising the merits of their respective villages. Here it was, come to Ikengo. There it was, come to Atumba. Between it was, come to Nganda. With all it was, we have women, ivory, slaves, goats, sheep, pigs, etc. It was more like a fakir scene in Constantinople or Cairo than a pagan greeting in the heart of the wilderness. Perhaps both their familiarity and importunity was due in great part to the fact they remembered Stanley on his downward trip years before. Having, in 1877, been royally received at Nganda, Stanley landed there, and stopped temporarily among those healthy, bronze-colored denizens, with their fantastic caps of monkey, otter, leopard or goat skin, and their dresses of grassy fiber. From this point Stanley made a personal exploration to the large tributary of the Congo, called the Mohindu, which he had mapped on his trip down the Congo. He found what he had conceived to be an affluent of 1,000 yards wide, to be one of only 600 yards wide, with low shores, running into extensive timber swamps. He called it an African Styx. But further up it began to develop banks. Soon villages appeared, and by and by came people, armed, yellow-bodied, and dancing as if they meant to awe the occupants of the boat. But the boat did not stop till it arrived at a cheerful village, eighty miles up the river, where, on attempting to stop, it was warned off with the threat that a landing would be a sure signal for a fight. Not wishing to tempt them too far, the steamer put back, receiving as a farewell a volley of sticks and stones which fell far short of their object. On the return of the steamer to Nganda, preparation was made for the sail to the next station up the Congo, which being in the latitude of only one minute north of the equator, or, in other words, as nearly under it as was possible, was called Equator Station. This station was made a permanent one by the appointment of Lieutenant Vangel as commander, with a garrison of twenty men. Lieutenant Kokwilhat, with twenty men, was also left there, till reinforcements and supplies should come up from Leopoldville. After remaining here long enough to prepare a station site and appease the neighboring chiefs with gifts, the balance of the expedition returned down the river to Nganda, or rather to Iribu. For it had been determined that Nganda was too sickly a place for a station. Yet how were these hospitable people to be informed of the intended change of base without giving offense? Stanley's guide kindly took the matter in hand, and his method would have done credit to a Philadelphia lawyer. Rubbing his eyes with pepper till the tears streamed down his cheeks, and assuming a broken-hearted expression, he stepped ashore among the assembled natives, as the boat touched at Nganda, and took a position in their midst. Utterly regardless of their shouts of welcome and their other evidences of hearty greeting. To all their anxious inquiries he responded nothing, being wholly engaged in his role of sorrow. At last, when their importunity could not be further resisted, he told them a pitiful story of hardship and death in an imaginary encounter up the river, 
and how Mangambo's boy, of Iribu, had fallen a victim. Beseeching them to join in a war of redress, etc. etc. The acting of the native guide was complete, and all in Ganda was so deceived by it and so bent on a war of revenge that it quite forgot to entertain any ill feeling at the departure of the steamer and the abandonment of the station. So Stanley sailed down to Iribu, where he found his truce broken and Mangambo plunged again into fierce war with his neighbors, Mpika and Magwala. Once more Stanley interceded by calling a council of the chiefs on both sides. After an impressive speech, in which he detailed the horrors of war and the folly of further slaughter over a question of a few slaves, he induced the hostile chiefs to shake hands and exchange pledges of peace. They ratified the terms by firing a salute over the grave of the war, and disbanded. Iribu is a large collection of villages extending for fully five miles along the Congo and Lukana, and carrying a depth of two miles into the country. These closely knitted villages contain a population of 15,000 people, with as many more in the immediate neighborhood. The Lukana was now explored. Its sluggish, reed-obstructed mouth soon brought the exploring steamer into a splendid lake with village-lined shores. This was Lake Mantumba, 144 miles in circumference. The inhabitants are experts in the manufacture of pottery and camwood powder and carry on a large ivory trade with the Watwa dwarfs. Stanley then returned to the Congo and continued his downward journey, rescuing in one place the occupants of a capsized canoe, at another giving aid to a struggling Catholic priest on his way to the mouth of the Kwa to establish a mission. Trying an ineffectual shot at a lion crouching on the bank and gazing angrily at the flotilla, pursuing its fleeing form, only to stumble on the freshly slain carcass of a buffalo which the forest king had stricken down while it was drinking. And at length arriving at Leopoldville, after an absence of fifty-seven days, to find there several new houses, erected by the commandant, Lieutenant. Valka, who had also founded the new station of Kinshasa where two months before all was wilderness, now fully five hundred banana trees were flourishing, terms of peace had been kept with the whimsical Ngaliima, and the storerooms of the station were regular banks, that is. They were well stocked with brass rods, the circulating medium of the country. Stanley remained at Leopoldville for some time, rectifying mischiefs which had occurred at Vivian Menyanga, and dispatching men and supplies up to Bilobo. Here incidents crowded upon him. Having commissioned a young continental officer to establish a station on the opposite side of the river, the fellow no sooner arrived on the ground than he developed a homicidal mania and shot one of his own sergeants. He was brought back in a tattered and dazed condition and dismissed down the river. Word came of the destruction of a canoe by a gale near the mouth of the Kwa, and the drowning of Lieutenant. Jansen and twelve people, among whom was Abe Gio, the Catholic priest above mentioned. From Kimpoko Station came word that a quarrel had broken out there with the natives and that relief must be had. A visit showed the station to have been deserted, and it was destroyed and abandoned. More and more awful grew the situation. A canoe courier brought the harrowing word that Bilobo had been burned, with all the freshly dispatched goods. This news spurred Stanley to a hasty start for the ill-fated station on August 22 d. Arriving opposite Bilobo, Stanley's rear steamers were fired upon from an ambush on the shore, and forced to administer a return fire. His steamers had never been fired upon before. He effected a landing at Bilobo, only to find a majority of the villages hostile to him, and bent on keeping up a desultory fire from the bush. So, unloading one of the steamers, he sent it back to Leopoldville to bring up quickly a Krupp cannon and ammunition. Despite his endeavors to bring about a better feeling, Stanley's men were fired upon daily, and they returned it as best they could, occasionally killing a native, and doing damage to their banana trees, beer pots and chicken coos. At length the wounding of a chief brought about a parley and offers of peace tokens, but Stanley replied that since they seemed to be so fond of fighting, and were not doing him any particular harm. He proposed to keep it up from day to day till his monster gun arrived from Stanley Pool, when he would blow them all sky high. This awful threat was too much for them. A nine days palaver ensued, which resulted in their payment of a fine and renewed peace. But when the great gun arrived, they saw, in the absence of trigger, 
stock and ramrod, so little likeness to a gun, that they claimed Stanley had deceived them, and refused to be propitiated till he proved it to be what he had represented. The Congo at Bolobo is 4,000 yards wide. Stanley ordered the cannon to be fired at a range of 2,000 yards, and when they saw a column of water thrown up by the striking of the charge at that distance, and witnessed the recoil of the piece. They began to think it was indeed a terrible weapon. They were still further convinced of the truth of his representations by a second shot, which carried the charge to a distance of 3,000 yards. It was by such maneuvers as these that Stanley established fresh relations with these WINZ tribes. They are naturally wild and turbulent. A dispute over a brass rod, or a quarrel over a pot of beer, is a signal for war. Superstition rules them, as few tribes are ruled. A bad dream by a chief may lead to the suspicion that he is bewitched, and some poor victim is sure to suffer burning for witchcraft. Ibaka caused a young girl to be strangled because her lover had sickened and died. At an upper village forty-five people were slaughtered over the grave of their chief, a sort of propitiatory sacrifice. After all matters had been settled, Stanley read them a lecture on the folly of fighting friendly white men, who had never done them an injury, and did not intend to. To show his appreciation of the situation, he made them a present of cloth and brass rods, and offered to pay for a treat of beer. They went out and held a palaver, and then returned with a request that the gifts be duplicated. Never! shouted Stanley. Ibaka, this land is yours. Take it. I and my people depart from Bolobo forever. To this all the chiefs remonstrated, saying they had no intention of driving him away, and explaining that their demand was only according to the custom of the WINZ to always ask for twice as much as was offered them. Despite this rather surprising commercial spirit, they are not a vindictive people, simply superstitious and quarrelsome. After these difficulties, Stanley resumed his upriver journey for Lokalila, passing on the way the mouths of the Minkin River, of the Lakuba, and of the larger river Bunga, whose banks are thickly strewn with villages. Once at Lokalila, a station was formed by clearing away the tall forest trees. Though the forests were magnificent, and capable of furnishing timber for generations, the soil was hard, stony and forbidding, and Stanley despaired of ever getting a garden of sufficient dimensions and fertility to support a garrison. He, however, left a Mr. Glaive, a young Englishman, in charge, who seemed to think he could force nature to promise subsistence and comfort. On September 22 D. Stanley started for Usindi, having on board Mayango, of that place, and his shipwrecked crew. On their safe arrival, there was no show of gratitude for the favor done, but blood brotherhood was made with Mayango. This provoked the jealousy of the senior chief, Aoka, a dirty old fellow, of wicked mien, whose grievance seemed to be that Mayango was too popular in the community. A short palaver reconciled him to the situation, and Stanley departed with the assurance that Yusindi might be counted on as a safe stopping place in the future. Mayango favored him with a guide who was well acquainted with the upper waters of the Congo. Iribu was now passed, and then the mouth of the ball, whose people are a piratical crew, dreaded by all their neighbors. By September 29 the flotilla was at Equator Station again, after an absence of 100 days. What a transformation! The jungle and scrub had disappeared, and in their stead was a solid clay house, roomy, rainproof and bulletproof, well lighted and furnished. Around it were the neat clay huts of the colored carriers and soldiers, each the center of a garden where grew corn, sugar cane, sweet potatoes, pumpkins, cucumbers, etc. Then there was a grand garden, full of onions, radishes, carrots, beans, peas, beets, lettuce, potatoes and cabbages, and also a servant's hall, goat houses, fowl houses and all the etc. of an African plantation. It was Stanley's ideal of a Congo station, and sight of it gave him greater heart for his enterprise than anything he had yet seen. The native chief, Ikenj, was at first disposed to be troublesome, but was soon appeased. On October 11 Stanley congratulated himself that he had passed so much of the river limit, leaving peace behind him with all the nations, and stations abounding in means of support, if they exerted themselves in the right direction. 
Equator Station is 757 miles from the Atlantic Ocean and 412 miles above Leopoldville, on Stanley Pool. Stanley's initial work was really done here, but in response to earnest wishes from Brussels, he continued it in the same spirit and for the same purpose for 600 miles further, with a view of making a permanent station at Stanley Falls. With 68 colored men and 5 Europeans on board, and with his steamers well freighted with necessaries, he left Equator Station on October 16. The first place of moment passed was at Aranga, near the confluence of the Luluna with the Congo. The country around is flat, densely wooded, and the villages close together. The Aranga people were anxious for a landing in palaver, but the steamers pushed on to Balambo, where a famine prevailed, and where the natives were peaceable and anxious to make blood brotherhood. Above Balambo the steamers were met by a fleet of canoes, whose occupants bore the news that the Bengala were anxious for a stop and palaver. These were the terrible fighters who harassed Stanley so sorely on his descent of the Congo in 1877. He had heard further down the river that they had threatened to dispute every inch of water with the white man if ever he came that way again. But he had also heard from Mangambo, of Iribu, that the lesson they had learned was so severe that all the white men would have to do would be to shake a stick at them. Still Stanley approached anxiously. The Bengala villages stretch for miles along the Congo. He did not stop his steamers, which were soon surrounded by hundreds of canoes, but kept slowly moving past the countless villages for fully five hours. The canoe men seemed impelled wholly by curiosity, and no sign of hostility appeared. The guide held frequent talks with the natives, none of which evoked other than friendly replies. They are a tall, broad-shouldered, graceful people, shading off from a dark bronze to a light complexion. The steamers came to a halt for the night at an island, two hours' sail from the upper end of the villages, and five hundred yards from the shore, and thither the guide came in the evening with a young chief, Boliko, who invited a landing the next day. In the morning he came with an escort of canoes and took Stanley to his village, through the identical channel whence had issued the hostile canoes in 1877. Here trading was carried on briskly and satisfactorily, till a message came from old Matabwaiki to the effect that he regarded it as an insult on the part of a boy like Boliko to be extending the tribal honours in that way. The only way out of this was for the steamers to drop back two miles and spend a day opposite the village of the old chief, lord of many guns. Old Mata was found to be a Herculean fellow, nearly eighty years old, and walking with a staff that resembled a small mast. By his side appeared seven sons, all fine-looking fellows, but the grey shock of the old man towered above them all when he straightened himself up. Around them was a throng which numbered thousands. The assembly place and place of welcome was laid with grass mats. Stanley and his men marched into it, ogled on every side, and not knowing whether the end would be peace or war. The guide presented them with a speech which described Stanley's work and objects, all he had done below them on the river, the advantages it would be to treat and trade with him, winding up with an intimation that it might be dangerous. Or at least useless, to prove unfriendly, for his steamers were loaded with guns and ammunition sufficient for the extermination of the entire people. The result was a treaty, sealed with blood brotherhood, and a promise on the part of Stanley to return at no distant day and establish a permanent station among the Bengala. This village was Iboko. The Congo here is literally filled with islands which render a passage from one shore to the other almost impossible. These islands are all richly verdure clad and present a scene of rare loveliness, draped in a vegetable life that finds a parallel nowhere else in nature. It took the steamers thirteen hours to work their way across to the left, or Mutembo side. But Mutembo was deserted. The steamers made Katakura, through channels bordered with splendid copal forests, whose tops were covered with orchilla, fortunes for whole civilized nations, if possessed and utilized. Katakura was also deserted. Where were these people? Their places had been populous and hostile in 1877. Had they fallen a prey to stronger tribes? Alas! Such must have been their fate in a country where wars never end, and where provocations are the slightest. Many deserted settlements were now passed, when MPA, ruled by Yunga, was reached, 
744 miles from Leopoldville. The people were peaceful and disposed to make all necessary concessions. The next day brought them to Nganza, ruled by old Rabanga, who had received Stanley with cordiality in 1877. The people were exceedingly anxious to trade, and offered their wares, especially their ivory, of which they had plenty, at ridiculously low figures. The people are known as the Langalanga, the upper country, and they go almost entirely naked. Their bodies are cross-marked and tattooed. The country is regarded as a paradise for ivory traders, owing to the ignorance of the natives as to the real commercial value of the article. Here is the turning point in African currency. The cloth and brass rods of the Atlantic coast no longer hold good, but the Canton bead and the cowrie of Ujiji are the measure of exchange. Langalanga is therefore the commercial watershed which divides the Atlantic and Pacific influence. On November 4 the Casa was passed, whose people fled on the approach of the steamers. It was the same at Yukongo. Then came a series of deserted villages. Presently appeared the newly settled towns of Ndobo and Ibunda, with their wattled huts. Bumba came next, with whose chief, Mayambai, blood brotherhood was made amid a throng of curious sightseers. It was the fiftieth time Stanley's arm had been punctured for treaty purposes since he entered upon his journey. There was little opportunity for trading here owing to the curiosity of the people over the steamers. They could hardly be persuaded that the dreaded Ibanza, devil, did not live down in the boats. It must be he who required so much wood for food and gave such groans. If not, what was it that lived in that great iron drum and made those wheels spin round so rapidly? In this mood they forgot the art of exchange so natural with African natives. Their curiosity was such that the crowds about and upon the steamers became not only a drawback to exchange, but to work. At length one of the cabin boys tried the effect of a practical joke. He opened the cabin door and pushed forward the form of a splendid Bengal tiger, as a banza, which was creating all the noise and trouble in the boat. The frightened native shrieked and ran at glance of the terrible figure, and the river bank was cleared in a moment. Yells of laughter followed them from the boat's crew. Being assured by this that nothing harmful was intended, they began to cluster back, and really joined heartily in the merriment. As they saw that the source of their terror was only a tiger skin hurriedly stuffed for the purpose of giving them a scare. Trade was more active after that, and provisions were plenty. Above Bamba the steamers neared the equally populous town of Yambinga. The chief was Mukuga, who wore an antelope skin cap adorned with cock's feathers, a broad shoulder belt with leopard skin attachment, and strings of tags, tassels and fetish mysteries. He was a timid chief, notwithstanding his gaudy apparel, and quite willing to make blood brotherhood. All of these later villages were plentifully supplied with war canoes, the count being 556 at Lower and Upper Yambinga, and 400 at Baroba. Above Yambinga the flotilla got lost in an affluent of the Congo and had to put back to the main stream. The stream was supposed to be the Itimbiri. For many days both shores of the Congo had not appeared at once. But on the twelfth both sides could be seen, and on the right was a wide plain once inhabited by the Yayalima, a tribe of artisans skilled in the manufacture of iron, including swords, spears, bells and fetishes of various devices. On an island above dwelt the Yambungu, who were disposed to trade and who brought fine sweet potatoes, fowls, eggs, and a species of sheep with broad, flat tails. The districts were now very populous, and the affluence frequent and very complicated as to name and direction of flow. The Basaka, Bahamba and Baru villages were passed without a stop. At all of these there were canoe demonstrations, but whether for hostile purpose or not was not inquired after. The flotilla was now nearing the great Congo affluent, the Aruwimi, out of whose mouth issued the enormous canoe fleet which so nearly annihilated Stanley in 1877. He gave orders to be on the alert, but to resort to hostilities only when all hope of self-preservation otherwise had failed. Scarcely had these orders passed when a stream of long, splendid-looking war canoes, filled with armed men, dashed out from behind an island, and began to reconnoitre the steamers. 
they pushed over to the right bank and kept an upward course, without show of resistance and at a safe distance. The steamers plunged ahead, and soon the mouth of the Aruwimi opened its spacious jaws to receive them. High on the bank appeared the town of Makulu, whose Basoko inmates had fought the battle with Stanley years before. He knew their disposition then, but what was it now? Was the meeting to be one of war or friendship? The Congo has a majestic flow where it receives its great tributary, the Aruwimi. Rounding a point, the steamers entered the affluent, to find the villagers in force, dressed in war paint, armed with spear and shield, beating their war drums, and disporting themselves fantastically on the banks. The canoes of observation were speedily joined by others. The three steamers were put across to a clearing on the divide between the Congo and Aruwimi, and two of them brought to anchor. The EU Avant was then steamed up the Aruwimi past Makulu. Then her head was turned downstream, and the guide was stationed on the cabin to proclaim the words of peace and friendship as the steamer slowly returned. The drums on shore ceased to beat. The battle horns were hushed. The leaping forms were still. The guide was eloquent in his speech and dramatic in his action. He had the ear of all Makulu. At length the response came that if all the steamers anchored together, the Basoko would soon come as friends. The canoes hovered about, but could not be persuaded to come within 250 yards. Hours elapsed before they mustered up sufficient courage to approach the shore within hailing distance of the camps at the anchorage. Thither the guide and three companions went, and the ceremony of blood brotherhood was performed. The town of Makulu heard the shouts of satisfaction at this result, and a response came in the shape of drum beats and horn toots. Intercourse with the fierce Basoko was a possibility. These Basokos received Stanley's guide, Yumbala, first and loaded him with presents. They then told him of Stanley's former approach and battle, also of a second visitation far worse than Stanley's, which must have been won by an Arab gang of slave stealers, judging from its barbarity. They were averse to a journey up the Aruwimi, though willing that the expedition should proceed up the Congo. It was impossible to get information from them respecting their river. They proved to be willing traders, and possessed products in abundance. Their spears, knives, paddles and shields showed remarkable workmanship, being delicately polished, and carved with likenesses of lizards, crocodiles, canoes, fish and buffaloes. Their headdresses were of fine palm materials, decorated, and a knit haversack formed a shoulder piece for each man. Physically they are a splendid people, industrious after their style, fond of fishing, and not given to that ignorant, childish curiosity so common among other tribes. They are adepts at canoe construction, and some of their vessels require a hundred stout warriors to propel them in a fight. Notwithstanding opposition, Stanley determined to explore the Aruwimi, which is 1,600 yards wide at its mouth, and narrows to 900 yards above Makula. He found in succession the Umana, the Basango, the Isambo, all populous, timid, and friendly. After passing Yambua and Irungu, he came to the quite populous metropolis of Yambumba, on a bluff forty feet high, containing eight thousand people living in steeply conical huts, embowered by bombax, palms, banana trees and fig trees. The puffing of the steamers put the whole town to flight. Further on came the rapids of the river and the Yambuya people and town. These shrewd people declined to trade on the plea of poverty, and even refused to give the correct name of their village. Their appearance belied their assertions. Stanley found the rapids of the Aruwimi a bar to steam navigation. They are ninety-six miles from the mouth of the river, which runs nearly westward thus far. It was this brief exploration of the river which determined him to use it as a route to Albert Nyanza on his search for Emin Pasha. Should it keep its course and continue its volume, it could not but find a source far to the east in the direction of the lake, and very near to its shores. As one of the fatalities which overhang explorers, Stanley mistook it for the Welly, described by Schweinfurth, just as Livingstone mistook the Lulaba for the Nile. This Welly, or Wellamaqua, river about which Stanley indulges in surmises, is the celebrated river brought into notice by Schweinfurth's discoveries, and over which a geographical controversy raged for seventeen years.
The question was whether it was the Sherry River, which emptied into Lake Chad, or whether its mysterious outlet was further south. Stanley's last journey in search of Emin Pasha pretty definitely settled the controversy by ascertaining that the Welly is the upper course of the Mobangi, a tributary of the Congo. And while speaking of Schweinfurth, we must use him as authority to settle any misapprehension likely to arise respecting the nature of the dwarfs which Stanley encountered on the waters of the upper Aruwimi. He calls them Monbuddhis, thereby giving the impression that the tribe is one of dwarfs. It was Schweinfurth's province to set at rest the long-disputed question of the existence of a dwarf race in Central Africa. He proved, once for all, that Herodotus and Aristotle were not dealing with fables when they wrote of the pygmies of Central Africa. One day he suddenly found himself surrounded by what he conjectured was a crowd of impudent boys, who pointed their arrows at him, and whose manner betokened intentional disrespect. He soon learned that these hundreds of little fellows were veritable dwarfs, and were a part of the army of Munza, the great Monbuta king. These are the now famous Aka, who, so far as we know, are the smallest of human beings. It is these same Aka who, wandering in the forest a little south of Schweinfurth's route, picked off many a carrier in Stanley's late expedition, using arrows whose points were covered with a deadly poison, and refusing all overtures of friendship. Schweinfurth's description of the Nyam Nyams, great eaters, and of their southern neighbors, the Monbuddhis, is the best that has yet appeared in print. He approached the country through the powerful Dinka tribes on the north, whom he found rich in cattle, experts in ironworking and highly proficient in the art of pottery ornamentation, especially as to their smoking pipes. Competent authorities agree with his opinion that the ornamental designs upon their potteries and iron and copper wares, now exhibited in the Berlin Museum of Ethnology, would not discredit a European artist, and among these people. So far advanced in some respects, Schweinfurt discovered the first evidences of cannibalism which is said to prevail, on very doubtful authority, however, in a very large part of the Congo Basin. It is a noteworthy fact that, in all his travels, Livingstone never saw evidence of this revolting practice except on one or two occasions, and in all his voluminous writings he hardly refers to the topic. Dar. Junker, however, draws a distinction between the Nyam Nyam and Monbuta cannibals which Schweinfurth in his briefer visit failed to observe. Junker says the Nyam Nyam use human flesh as food only because they believe that in this way they acquire the bravery and other virtues with which their victims may have been endowed. The Monbutu, on the other hand, make war upon their neighbors for no other purpose than to procure human flesh for food, because they delight in it as a part of their cuisine. With methodical care they dry the flesh they do not immediately use, and add it to their reserve supplies of food. Schweinfurth's journey into Nyam Nyam was through a prairie land covered with the tallest grasses he had yet seen in Africa. The people are given to cattle raising and the chase. They are not of stalwart size, and their color is dark brown rather than black. What they lack in stature they make up in athletic qualities. They took a keen interest in showing the traveler their sights, and in the evening regaled his camp with music, dispensed by a grotesque singer, who accompanied his attenuated voice with a local guitar of thin, jingling sound. The drums and horns of the Nyam Nyams are used only for war purposes. Everything testified to the fruitfulness of the soil. Sweet potatoes and yams were piled up in the farmsteads, and circular receptacles of clay for the preservation of corn were erected upon posts in the yards. The yards are surrounded by hedges of paradise figs. Back of these are the plantations of manioc and maize, and beyond their fields of elusine. The women are modest and retiring in the presence of white men, and their husbands hold them in high respect. The people are great believers in magic. The best shots, when they have killed an unusual number of antelopes or buffaloes, are credited with having charmed roots in their possession. The Nyam Nyam country is important as being the watershed between the Nile and the rivers which run westward into the Congo, the Welly being the largest, which runs nearly parallel with the recently discovered Aruwimi. The Nyam Nyam are great ivory traders and take copper, cloth, or trinkets at a cheap figure for this valuable ware. The southern and western part of their country becomes densely wooded and the trees are gigantic. Here the shape of the huts change, becoming loftier and neater, 
the yards having posts in them for displaying trophies of war and the chase. The characteristics of the Nyam Nyam are pronounced and they can be identified at once amidst the whole series of African races. Every Nyam Nyam soldier carries a lance, trumbash, and dagger, made by their own smiths. Wooing is dependent on a payment exacted from the suitor by the father of the intended bride. When a man resolves on matrimony, he applies to the sub-chieftain who helps him to secure his wife. In spite of the practice of polygamy, the marriage bond is sacred, and unfaithfulness is generally punished with death. The trait is paramount for this people to show consistent affection for their wives. Schweinfurth doubts the charge of cannibalism brought against this people, and thinks their name, Great Eaters, might have given rise to the impression that they were man-eaters. The festivities that occur in case of marriage are a bridal procession, at the head of which the chieftain leads the bride to the home of her future husband, accompanied by musicians, minstrels and jesters. A feast is given, of which all partake in common, though in general the women are accustomed to eat alone in their huts. This marriage celebration, with slight variations, is usual with the tribes of Central Africa. Livingstone describes one among the hames of the Lulaba River, in which the bride is borne to the home of her husband on the shoulders of her lover or chieftain. The domestic duties of a Nyam Nyam wife consist mainly in cultivating the homestead, preparing the daily meals, painting her husband's body and dressing his hair. Children require very little care in this genial climate, being carried about in a band or scarf till old enough to walk, and then left to run about with very little clothing on. They are lovers of music, as are their neighbors, especially the bongo people, who possess a variety of quaint instruments capable of producing fairly tuneful concerts. Their language is an upshoot of the great root which is the original of every native tongue in Africa north of the equator. They always consult auguries before going to war. In grief for the dead they shave their heads. A corpse is adorned for burial in dyed skins and feathers. They bury the dead with scrupulous regard to the points of the compass, the men facing the east and the women the west. Stanley now steamed back to the Congo, and once more breasted its yellow flood. He was now in the true heart of Africa, 1,266 miles from the sea and 921 from Leopoldville, and upon a majestic flood capable of carrying a dozen rivers like the Aruwimi. It was a region of deep, impenetrable forests, fertile soil, and few villages, for the fierce Bahunga seemed to have terrorized and devastated all the shores. The river abounds in large, fertile islands, the homes of fishermen and stalwart canoe men, who carry their products to clearings on the shores, and there exchange them for the inland products. This makes the shore clearings kind of marketplaces, sometimes peopled and sometimes deserted. In the distance a fleet of canoes is sighted, bearing down on the steamers. Are they the hostile Bahunga? The N Avant is sent forward on a reconnaissance, and soon makes out the fleet to consist of a thousand canoes, extending a mile and a half in length. Five men to a canoe gave a force of five thousand men, an army of sufficient size to overwhelm a hundred such tiny steamers as composed the Stanley Flotilla. A storm arose, accompanied by vivid lightning and heavy thunder shocks. The elements cleared the river of all fragile barks and left the steamers to their course. The old town of Mombi came into view. It was not such as Stanley had mapped it, but a burned and nearly deserted spot. The Arab slave merchant had evidently penetrated thus far, and these ashes were the marks of his cruelty. Another town, higher up, and entirely in ashes, proved the sad conjecture to be true, for before it sat at least two hundred Wobegon natives, too abject in their desolation to even affect curiosity at the approaching steamers. On being hailed, they told the pitiful tale of how a strange people, like those in the steamers, and wearing white clothes, had come upon them in the night, slaughtered their people, and carried off their women and children. The fleet of canoes, seen among the islands below, contained their own people, gathered for protection, forced to live on the islands in the daytime and to go ashore at night for food. All this had happened but eight days before, and the marauders had retreated up the river in the direction of Stanley Falls. A few miles above, the charred stakes, upright canoes, poles of huts, scorched banana groves and prostrate palms indicated the ruins of the site of Yavunga. 
the twelfth devastated town and eighth community passed since leaving the mouth of the Aruwimi. Opposite Yavunga were the Yaporo, a populous tribe, but now stricken by fire, sword and famine as were their brothers. These had charged on Stanley six years before, but they were now in no mood to dispute his way. Floating by is an object which attracts attention. A boat hook is thrown over, and to it clings the forms of two women bound together by a cord. The ghastly objects are raised, and a brief inspection shows that they could not have been drowned more than twelve hours before. The steamers push on, round a point, and in the distance appear white objects. A glass is brought to bear, and they prove to be the tents of the Arab thieves. They are from Nyangwe, above the falls, the capital of Tipu Tib's empire, unholy conquest from the Manuema people, founded in flame, murder and kidnapping. The camp was palisaded and the banks were lined with canoes, evidence that the marauders had managed somehow to pass the falls in force. The first impulse of Stanley was to attempt a rescue and wreak a deserved vengeance on these miscreants. But on second thought, his was a mission of peace, and he was without authority to administer justice. He represented no constituted government, but was on a mission to found a government. To play the role of judge or executioner in such an emergency might be to defeat all his plans and forever leave these wretches without a strong arm to cling to in time of future need. Had he come upon an actual scene of strife and burning, it would have been his to aid the weaker party, but now the law of might must have its way. Till a sturdier justice than was at his disposal could come to tread in majesty along those dark forest aisles. And now what a meeting and greeting there was. The steamers signaled the arrival of strangers. A canoe put out from the shore and hailed in the language of the eastern coast. Both sides understood that the meeting was one of peace. The steamers made for shore below the tents, and a night encampment was formed. Soon Stanley's Zanzibaris were shaking hands with the Manuema slaves of Abed bin Salim, who constituted the band that had been ravaging the country to obtain slaves and ivory. They had been out for sixteen months, and for eleven months had been raiding the Congo. The extent of country they had plundered was larger than Ireland, and contained a population of one million souls. They numbered three hundred men, armed with shotguns and rifles, and their retinue of domestic slaves and women doubled their force. Their camp, even then, was on the ruins of the town of Yangambi, which had fallen before their torches, and many of whose people were prisoners on the spot where they were born. Stanley took a view of the stockade in which they had confined their human booty. This is the horrible story as he writes it. The first general impressions are that the camp is much too densely peopled for comfort. There are rows upon rows of dark nakedness, relieved here and there by the white dresses of the captors. There are lines or groups of naked forms upright, standing or moving about listlessly. Naked bodies are stretched under the sheds in all positions, naked legs innumerable are seen in the perspective of prostrate sleepers. There are countless naked children, many were infants, forms of boyhood and girlhood, and occasionally a drove of absolutely naked old women, bending under a basket of fuel, or cassava tubers, or bananas, who are driven through the moving groups by two or three musketeers. In paying more attention to details, I observe that mostly all are fettered, youths with iron rings around their necks, through which a chain like one of our boat anchor chains is rove, securing the captives by twenties. The children over ten are secured by three copper rings, each ringed leg brought together by the central ring, which accounts for the apparent listlessness of movement I observed on first coming in presence of the curious scene. The mothers are secured by shorter chains, around whom their respective progeny of infants are grouped, hiding the cruel iron links that fall in loops or festoons over mama's breasts. There is not one adult man captive amongst them. Besides the shaded ground strewn over so thickly by the prostrate and upright bodies of captives, the relics of the many raids lie scattered or heaped up in profusion everywhere. And there is scarcely a square foot of ground not littered with something, such as drums, spears, swords, assegais, arrows, bows, knives, ironware of native make of every pattern, paddles innumerable, scoops and balers, wooden troughs, ivory horns. Whistles, buffalo and antelope horns, ivory pestles, wooden idols, beads of wood, 
berries, scraps of fetishism, sorcerers' wardrobes, gourds of all sizes, nets, from the lengthy seine to the small hand net. Baskets, hampers, shields as large as doors, of wood or of plated rattan, crockery, large pots to hold eight gallons, down to the child's basin, wooden mugs, basins, and mallets, grass cloth in shreds, tatters and pieces. Broken canoes, and others half-excavated, native adzes, hatchets, hammers, iron rods, etc., etc. All these littering the ground, or in stacks and heaps, with piles of banana and cassava peelings, flour of cassava, and sliced tubers drying, make up a number of untidy pictures and details, through all of which, however, prominently gleam the eyes of the captives in a state of utter and supreme wretchedness. Little perhaps as my face betrayed my feelings, other pictures would crowd upon the imagination. And after realizing the extent and depth of the misery presented to me, I walked about as in a kind of dream, wherein I saw through the darkness of the night the stealthy forms of the murderers creeping towards the doomed town. Its inmates all asleep, and no sounds issuing from the gloom but the drowsy hum of chirping cicadas or distant frogs, when suddenly flashed the light of brandished torches. The sleeping town is involved in flames, while volleys of musketry lay low the frightened and astonished people, sending many through a short minute of agony to that soundless sleep from which there will be no waking. I wish to be alone somewhere where I could reflect upon the doom which has overtaken Bandu, Yamburi, Yangambi, Yaporo, Yakusu, Bukanga, Yakanda, Ituka, Yeriembi, Yerush, Populous Isanji, and probably thirty scores of other villages and towns. The slave traders admit they have only 2,300 captives in this fold, yet they have raided through the length and breadth of a country larger than Ireland, bearing fire and spreading carnage with lead and iron. Both banks of the river show that 118 villages and 43 districts have been devastated, out of which is only adduced this scant profit of 2,300 females and children, and about 2,000 tusks of ivory. The spears, swords, bows, and the quivers of arrows show that many adults have fallen. Given that these 118 villages were peopled only by 1,000 each, we have only a profit of 2%. And by the time all these captives have been subjected to the accidents of the river voyage to Kirundu and Nyangwe, of camp life and its harsh miseries, to the havoc of smallpox and the pests which miseries breed, there will only remain a scant one percent. Upon the bloody venture. They tell me, however, that the convoys already arrived at Nyangwe with slaves captured in the interior have been as great as their present band. Five expeditions have come and gone with their booty of ivory and slaves, and these five expeditions have now completely weeded the large territory described above. If each expedition has been as successful as this, the slave traders have been enabled to send 5,000 women and children safe to Nyangwe, Kirundu and Vibondo, above the Stanley Falls. Thus 5,000 out of an assumed million will be at the rate of a half percent, or five slaves out of 1,000 people. This is poor profit out of such large waste of life, for originally we assumed the slaves to have mustered about 10,000 in number. To obtain the 2,300 slaves out of the 118 villages they must have shot a round number of 2,500 people, while 1,300 more died by the wayside, through scant provisions and the intensity of their hopeless wretchedness. How many are wounded and die in the forest or droop to death through an overwhelming sense of their calamities, we do not know. But if the above figures are trustworthy, then the outcome from the territory with its million of souls is 5,000 slaves obtained at the cruel expense of 33,000 lives. And such slaves. They are females, or, young children who cannot run away, or who with youthful indifference, will soon forget the terrors of their capture. Yet each of the very smallest infants has cost the life of a father and perhaps his three stout brothers and three grown-up daughters. An entire family of six souls would have been done to death to obtain that small, feeble, useless child. These are my thoughts as I look upon the horrible scene. Every second during which I regard them the clink of fetters and chains strikes upon my ears. My eyes catch sight of that continual lifting of the hand to ease the neck in the collar, or as it displays a manacle exposed through a muscle being irritated by its weight or want of fitness. 
My nerves are offended with the rancid effluvium of the unwashed herds within this human kennel. The smell of other abominations annoys me in that vitiated atmosphere. For how could poor people, bound and riveted together by twenties, do otherwise than wallow in filth? Only the old women are taken out to forage. They dig out the cassava tuber, and search for the banana, while the guard, with musket ready, keenly watches for the coming of the vengeful native. Not much food can be procured in this manner, and what is obtained is flung down in a heap before each gang, to at once cause an unseemly scramble. Many of these poor things have been already months fettered in this manner, and their bones stand out in bold relief in the attenuated skin, which hangs down in thin wrinkles and puckers. And yet who can withstand the feeling of pity so powerfully pleaded for by those large eyes and sunken cheeks? What was the cause of all this vast sacrifice of human life, of all this unspeakable misery? Nothing but the indulgence of an old Arab's, wolfish, bloody, starved and ravenous instincts. He wished to obtain slaves to barter away to other Arabs, and having weapons, guns and gunpowder, enough, he placed them in the hands of three hundred slaves, and dispatched them to commit murder wholesale. Just as an English nobleman would put guns in the hands of his guests and permit them to slaughter the game upon his estate. If we calculate three quarts of blood to each person who fell during the campaign of murder, we find that this one Arab caused to be shed 2,850 gallons of human blood, sufficient to fill a tank measurement of 460 cubic feet. Quite large enough to have drowned him and all his kin. Nyangwe, above mentioned, is an important market town on the Congo, some distance above Stanley Falls, and the capital of the undefined possessions of which Tipu Tib holds sway. Livingstone says he has seen fully 3,000 people at the Nyangwe market of a clear day, anxious to dispose of their fish, fruits, vegetables and fowls. Many of them had walked twenty-five miles, bearing their baskets, heavily laden with produce, and some had come even further in canoes. On one occasion a riot broke out, instigated either by jealousy among the surrounding tribes or by the Arab slave dealers for the purpose of making captures. Three burly fellows began to fire their guns into the throng of women, who hastily abandoned their wares and dashed for the canoes. The panic was so great that the canoes could not be manned and pushed into the river. The frantic women, fired into continually from the rear, leaped and scrambled over the boats and jumped wildly into the river, preferring the chances of a long swim to an island rather than inevitable destruction on the shore. Many of the wounded wretches threw up their hands in despair ere they reached midstream, and sank to rise no more. Rescuing canoes put out into the water, and many were thus saved. But one poor woman refused to be rescued, saying she would take her chances of life in the water rather than return to be sold as a slave. The Arabs estimate the slaughter that day at four hundred souls. Stanley now fully understood the meaning of all he had heard below of the terrible visitations of these banditti, of the merciless character of the Bahunga, which name they had misunderstood and of the desire of the dwellers on the lower waters that he should ascend the Congo, thereby hoping that all the whites would destroy one another in the clash which seemed inevitable. After an exchange of gifts with these cutthroats and the loan of an interpreter to speak with the people at the falls, the steamers departed from a scene which nature had made beautiful, but which the hand of man had stained with crime and blood. The Congo here has bluffy, picturesque shores on the one side, and on the other lowlands adapted for sugar cane, cotton, rice and maize. Some critics of Stanley have expressed wonder at his failure to assert his usual heroism when made to witness these Arab barbarities while ascending the Congo. They think he should have attacked and driven off these thieves and murderers, no matter what the result might have been to himself and his enterprise. The same, or a similar class of critics, think that when he was making his last journey up the Congo and the Aruwimi in search of Emin Pasha, he showed entirely too much consideration for the Arab marauders. And especially for that cunning and depraved official, Tipu Tib, whom he recognized as governor at Nyangwe. Despite what are regarded by some impulsive people as the higher claims of humanitarianism, we are perfectly willing to trust to Mr. Stanley's sense of right is modified by the exigencies of a situation about which no one else can know as much as himself. 
That situation was altogether new and peculiar on both his ascents of the Congo in behalf of the Congo Free State, and in search of Emin Pasha. In the first instance he bore a commission from a higher power, the International Commission, whose agent he was. He had instructions to do certain things and to leave others undone. To provoke hostilities with those he met, to quarrel and fight, except in self-preservation, were not only things foreign to his mission, as being sure to defeat it, but were expressly forbidden to him. Conquest was no part of the new policy of the Congo Free State, but its foundation was peace and free concession by all the tribes within its boundaries. Time will vindicate his leniency in the midst of such scenes as he was forced to witness at the mouth of the Aruwimi and on the Congo above, during his first ascent of the river. And the same will prove true of his second ascent. To be sure, he was on a different mission and had greater freedom of action, but he knew well, from former experience, the character of the peoples upon the two great rivers near their jurisdiction. And if any events ever proved the wisdom of the steps which a man took, those surely did which clustered about and composed the eventful, if melancholy, history of Stanley's rear guard on the Aruwimi. Several correspondents, some of whom accompanied Stanley on his two upriver journeys, and others who have been over the ground, have written fully of the Aruwimi situation, and their views are valuable. Though space forbids more than a condensation of them here. A fatal river, say they all, was the Aruwimi for Stanley. It was so in 1877. 1883 served to recall regretful memories of his canoe descent, and introduced him to sadder scenes than he had ever occasioned or witnessed. The details of the deserted and blackened camp of his rear guard on the Emin Pasha relief expedition will prove to be more tragic than any which went before. It was close to the confluence of the Aruwimi with the Congo, as narrated elsewhere in this volume, that Stanley was compelled, in 1877, to storm a native village. And, as we have just seen, when he passed the spot again in 1883, what wonder that the dusky warriors reassembled to receive him. Round the bend, where the great affluent gaped into view, the river was thronged with war canoes, and on the banks stood the villages of Basango and Makulu, where Stanley's ancient foes resided. In fantastic array appeared long lines of fully armed warriors, a land force supporting the fighting men afloat. How, aided by a picturesque and showy interpreter, with a voice as powerful as his eloquence, Stanley, on this latter occasion, appeased their warlike ardor and made them friends, has just been told in these pages. The reader will understand, however, from the number of the force against him and the ferocious character of the tribes, why Stanley was so careful when forming his latest camp on the Aruwimi, to have it well stockaded and efficiently sentineled. The local natives had not only the incentive of their previous defeat by Stanley to keep their hostility alive, but they had had meanwhile some bitter experiences of the Arab raider. They are splendid races of men, the tribes of the Makulu and the Basoko, picturesque in their yellow war paint, their barbaric shields and decorative headdresses. They are skilled workmen. Their paddles are beautifully carved, their spears and knives artistic and of dexterous shapeliness. They have also broadswords, and in a general way their weapons are of wonderful temper and sharpness. Now and then the Arab raiders find their work of massacre and plunder a hot business among such natives as these, but the advantage of the rifle is, of course, tremendous, and can only have one result. The Arabs do not, however, always have it entirely their own way. They leave both dead and wounded sometimes in the hands of the enemy, who frequently condemn both to the pot, and make merry, no doubt, over their grilled remains. Among the many hardships of the Aruwimi camp, established by Stanley for his rear guard, on his latest upward trip, and left under Major Bartolot, was the uncontrollable character of the Menyima carriers and escort. These people have for many years been the slave hunting allies of the Arabs, their jackals, their cheetahs. And the Stanley camp had actually to be spectators of the attack and raiding of a native village, opposite their own quarters, on the other side of the river. It was towards night when the onslaught began. The sudden sound of the warlike drums of the surprised natives came booming across the water, followed by the fierce rattle of the Arab musketry. Dark figures and light were soon mixed together in the fray. The natives fought bravely, but they fell rapidly before the rifle. 
pelted with the deadly hail of shot, they were soon vanquished. Then from hut to hut the flames of ruin began to spread, and in the lurid light women and children were marched forth to the slave hunter stockade, some to be ransomed next day by the remainder of the ivory the natives had successfully hidden. Others probably to be passed on from hand to hand until they eventually reached a slave dealing market. And all this the officers and comrades of Mr. Stanley had the humiliation to witness without daring to interfere, not from any fear of losing their lives in the defense of the weaker, a death which has been courted by thousands of brave men on land and sea, but for reasons of policy. They were not there to protect the natives of the Aruwimi from Arab raiders, but to follow Mr. Stanley with the stores necessary for the success of his expedition. Nor is it likely that the force under Major Bartolot would have obeyed him if he had desired to intervene. Mr. Stanley himself more than once in his African experience has had to shut his eyes to Arab aggression and cruelty, although his influence with Tipu Tib has no doubt paved the way for the realization of his humane ambition in the matter of slavery. From their stockade and on board their launch at Yambuya, Bartolot and his comrades could see the woefully unequal warfare on the raided village. And there is no need of the assurance that their hearts beat high with indignation and a desire to take a hand in it. Moreover, these lawless brutalities practiced upon the natives made the difficulties of the camp all the greater, not only affecting the dangers of the advance, but increasing the perils of the way to the falls. As was experienced by Ward on his travels to and fro, his aimless journeys, Mr. Stanley has called them, but undertaken nevertheless by order of Ward's superior officer, Major Bartolot. Whether or not the Arabs of the camp or the Menuimas had a share in the tragedy on the other side of the river is a question perhaps of no serious moment. But confessions were made to Ward which rather tend to show that the Arabs, while waiting for the expected advance, fulfilled other engagements on the river. I went to Salim's camp today, writes Mr. Ward in one of his private letters, and they told me that two more of their men, Arabs, had been caught and eaten by the natives whose village they had raided and burnt some weeks ago. The same correspondent again writes, This morning some of the raiders came down from upriver with news of the defeat of ten of their number, cut to pieces by the natives, who sought refuge in their canoes above the rapids. Salim and his men started off in pursuit, and returned at night lamenting that they had killed only two of the natives. On the next day he told Ward that where his men had fallen he found their fingers tied in strings to the scrub of the river bank, and some cooking pots containing portions of their bones. What a weary time it was waiting, and with only this kind of incident to ruffle the monotony of it, waiting for the promised carriers that did not come, waiting for news of Stanley that only came in suggestions of disaster. It is hardly a matter of surprise that the camp began to fear the worst. Their own experiences of the broken word of Tipu Tib and the utter unreliability and ferocity of a portion of their force might well give a pessimistic tone to their contemplation of the awful possibilities of Stanley's march. Every omen of the Aruwimi was unfavorable to success. And they must have been terribly impressed by such a scene as that which cast its murderous light upon the river not long previously to the forward march, with the assassination of the commander and the eventual dispersion of the rearguard. The above refers to Stanley's Emin Pasha expedition, details of which are given further on. But it is introduced here as showing what he had to contend with every time he struck the confluence of the two great rivers, and how difficult it was for him to pursue any other policy than he did, as it is a bewildering spot in nature. And in its human forces, so it is in its diplomacy. One of the writers above mentioned goes on to discuss the question of cannibalism whose existence on the Upper Congo, and in other parts of Africa, has been asserted by correspondence. He says his own description of these practices on the Aruwimi and the Congo are in no way connected with the reports which are criticized in Mr. Stanley's letter from Salala, on Lake Victoria, in August 1889. Mr. Ward in none of his letters has ever mentioned or suggested that the Menuimas were cannibals, or in any way justified the extraordinary statement of the Rev. William Brooke in the Times to the effect that it was common in the Manuema camp to see human hands and feet sticking out of cooking pots. This is evidently a canard. Perhaps it would be well for Mr. Brooke to give his authorities, since Mr. Stanley asks who they are that have seen these extraordinary sights. 
The Menuimas are a fierce race, but, personally, Mr. Stanley has found them loyal and true to his service, and they are not cannibals, so far as I can learn. The instances of cannibalism mentioned in letters from the Aruwimi camp refer to the natives of the district outside the camp, and against whom the camp was fortified. But if Mr. Brooke has been misled, so also has Mr. Stanley in regard to the report he seems to have found in his bundles of newspaper cuttings to the effect that an execution of a woman was delayed by Jameson or Bartolot in order that a photographer might make ready his apparatus for taking a negative of the incident. This gruesome anecdote does not belong to Africa at all, it comes from a different part of the world altogether, was discussed in Parliament as an allegation made against an English consul, and turned out to be either untrue or a gross exaggeration. When Mr. Stanley has learned all that was said and conjectured about his doings in the long intervals of the silence and mystery that enshrouded him he will find less and less material for serious criticism in the other packets of press extracts he may yet have to unfold, but he need hardly be told that those who knew him and those who have trusted him would not. Whatever happened, be led into thinking for a moment that he would break his promise or neglect his duty. Stanley's upward-bound steamers now pass several devastated districts which in 1877 were peopled by ferocious beings ready with their canoes to sweep down upon his descending flotilla. At length the island tribe of the Winya is reached. These are expert fishermen, and had been left unharmed by the Arabs, and for policy's sake too, since their acquaintance with Stanley Falls had been turned to practical account. Their knowledge of the intricate channels had enabled them to pilot the Arab canoes down over the obstructions and return them in the same way, the owners making the portage afoot. Here the steamers were at the foot of Stanley Falls. These falls consist of seven distinct cataracts extending over a distance of 56 miles. The lower or seventh cataract is simply a rough interruption to navigation for a distance of two miles. Above this is a navigable stretch of 26 miles, when the sixth cataract is reached. This, on the left side, is an impassable fall, but on the right is a succession of rapids. From the sixth to the fifth cataract is a 22-mile stretch of navigable water. The fifth, fourth, third, second and first cataracts come in quick succession, and within a space of nine miles. They appear to be impassable, but the fact that the natives managed to pass the Arab canoes up and down them proves that there are channels which are open to light craft when dexterously handled. The width of the Congo at the seventh cataract is 1,330 yards, divided into several broken channels by islands and rocks. The inhabitants of the islands above and below are skillful fishermen belonging to two or three different tribes. They obstruct even the swiftest channels with poles from which are appended nets for catching fish and these are visited daily in their canoes, over waters of clashing swiftness and ever-threatening peril. Portions of their catch they use for food, the rest is converted into smoked food with which they buy women and children slaves, canoes and weapons. They are impregnably situated as to enemies. Their villages are scenes of industry. Long lines of fish curers may be seen spreading fish on the platforms, old men weave nets and sieves, able-bodied men are basket makers and implement makers of various fantastic designs, the women prepare meal and bread, etc., or make crockery. The watermen are skillful canoe builders. This was the spot upon which Stanley desired to erect a trading station and these were the people with whom he was to negotiate for a possession. He had no fears of the result, for it was evident that the Arabs and the half-castes of Nyangwe, beyond, would find advantage in a station at which they could obtain cloth, guns, knives and all articles of European manufacture at a much cheaper rate than from the eastern coast. A palaver was opened with the assembled chiefs, in which Stanley was formally received and stated his object. Receptions by African chiefs are always very formal. Altogether, they are not uninteresting. Livingstone mentions one with King Chidapangwa, in which he was ushered into an enormous hut where the dignitary sat before three drummers and ten more men with rattles in their hands. The drummers beat fearfully on their drums, and the rattlers kept time, two of them advancing and retreating in a stooping posture, with their rattles near the ground, as if doing the chief obeisance, but still keeping time with the others. 
After a debate of three days' duration the chiefs came to terms and ceded sovereignty over the islands and adjacent shores, with the right to build and trade. The large island of Wayne Rosari was selected as the site of the station and a clearing was made for building. The question of a supply of vegetable food was settled by Siwa Siwa, an inland chief, who promised to make the garrison his children and guaranteed them plenty of garden products. Binny, engineer of the Royal, a plucky little Scotchman of diminutive stature, was appointed chief of the new Stanley Falls station, and left in full authority. The boat's crews cleared four acres of ground for him, and furnished him with axes, hoes, hammers, nails, flour, meats, coffee, tea, sugar, cloths, rods, beads, mugs, pans, and all the etc. of a mid-African equipment. He was given thirty-one armed men and plenty of ammunition. Then with full instructions as to his duty he was left to the care of Providence. On December 10 the steamers began their return journey, having reached the full geographic limit marked out by the Brussels Committee. The return was to be signalized by obtaining the protectorship of the districts intervening between the stations thus far established on the Congo, so that the authority of the new state should be unbroken from Vivi to Stanley Falls. But this work, on second thought, could well be left to others with more time at their disposal than had Stanley. Therefore the steamers, taking advantage of the current, and bearing ten selected men of the native tribes about Stanley Falls, each in possession of three ivory tusks, made a speedy downward trip. Tribe after tribe was passed, some of which had not been seen on the ascent, because the steamers were constantly seeking out new channels. Whenever it was deemed politic, stops were made and treaties entered into. All on board suffered much from the river breezes, heightened by the velocity of the steamers. These breezes checked perspiration too suddenly, and some severe prostrations occurred. By Christmas the flotilla was back to Iboko, where thieving was so rampant as to necessitate the seizure of one of the offenders and his imprisonment in a steamer. The chief, Kokoro, came alongside in a canoe to commend Stanley for ridding the tribe of a fellow who could bring such disgrace upon it, and he was really very earnest in his morality till he looked in upon the prisoner and found it was his son. Then there was lamentation and offers to buy the boy back. Stanley's terms were a restitution of the stolen articles, and these not being met, he sailed away with the offender, promising to return in ten days to insist upon his conditions. The populous districts of Uzimbai and Abengo were passed. At Yukumurai the whole population came out to greet the steamers, as it did at Bangata and Naranga. As many of these places had not been visited on the upward journey, it was manifest that word of the treaties and the impression made were being gradually and favorably disseminated by the canoe traders. Equator Station was found in a flourishing condition. It was January 1, 1884, when the steamers began an upward journey again to Iboko, in order to keep faith with Kokoro by returning his son. The old chief, Matabwaiki, was indignant at the seizure of one of his subjects, but seeing that Stanley had returned and was acquainted with the tribal custom that a thief could be held till the stolen goods were restored. He fell in with his idea of justice, and went so far as to insist on a return of the stolen articles, or else the imprisonment which Stanley had inflicted. This attitude resulted in a restoration of the property and the temporary shame of the culprits. Again the steamers arrived at Equator Station, where the commandant had a harrowing tale to tell of how the neighboring Bakuti had lost their chief and had come to the station to buy the soldier laborers to the extent of fifty. Thinking they were slaves, in order that they might sacrifice them over the dead chieftain's grave. It is needless to say that they were driven out of the station and given to understand that rites so horrid were not sanctioned by civilized people. But they succeeded in getting fourteen slaves elsewhere, and had them ready for execution on the day of burial. Some of the garrison went out to witness the cruel rite. They found the doomed men kneeling, with their arms bound behind them. Nearby was a tree with a rope dangling from it. One of the captives was selected, and the rope was fastened round his neck. The tree, which had been bent down by the weight of several men, was permitted to assume its natural position, and in doing so it carried the victim off his feet. The executioner approached with a short, sharp falchion, and striking at the neck, severed the head from the body. The remaining captives were dispatched in similar manner. 
Their heads were boiled and the skin was taken off, in order that the skulls might ornament the poles around the grave. The soil saturated with their blood was buried with the dead chief, and the bodies were thrown into the Congo. Revolting as it all was, there was no preventive except the rifles, and they would have meant war. On January 13 the steamers left Equator Station and soon arrived at Yusindi, where the guide, Yumbala, was paid and dismissed. The next day Lukalila was reached, where some progress at station building had gone on, and a healthy condition prevailed. Bilobo was the next station but arrival there revealed only a wreck. It had been burned a second time, with all the guns, and a terrific explosion of the ammunition. The firing was due to the freak of a man delirious with fever, who imagined that a conflagration would provide him with a burial scene far more honorable than the butchery of slaves indulged in by native African potentates. Stanley had his suspicions of the story, and could with difficulty believe that the destruction was not due to some sinister influences which pervaded the Bilobo atmosphere. By January 20 the flotilla was back at Kinshasa, in Stanley Pool, where much progress had been made. In two hours they were at Leopoldville, after an absence of 146 days and a sail of 3,050 miles. Here everything was flourishing. The houses stood in comfortable rows, and the gardens were bringing forth vegetables in abundance. The natives were peaceable and ready to trade, the magazines were full, and as a depot it was adequate for the supply of all the upriver stations. Not so, however, with the downriver stations. They were confused and required attention. Stanley therefore prepared a caravan for Vivi. Goodbyes were given to the friends at Leopoldville, and the huge caravan started on its long journey over hills and prairie stretches, through dales and across streams, skirting forests here and piercing them there, past happy, peaceful villages. Too far from the Congo to be annoyed by its ravines. The promising uplands of Ngam are past, ruled by Latit, he who in 1882 requested the gift of a white man that he might have the pleasure of cutting his throat. But Lutit has been transformed from a ferocious chief into quite a decent citizen. Ngam station is a peaceable one, and Lutit furnishes the servants and carriers for it, besides sending his children to the Baptist school. The caravan then passes the Bakongo and Ienzi people, noted for their good behavior. All the land is fertile and the valleys exceedingly rich. Manyanga is reached. The station has not advanced, but is confused and ruinous, though probably a cool $100,000 has been expended upon it by the Association of the Congo. Again the caravan takes up its march through the Ndunga people and thence down into the broad valley of the Lukunga, where Stanley is hospitably received by Mr. and Mrs. Ingham of the Livingstone Mission, at their pretty little cottage and school, surrounded by a spacious and well-tended garden. Westward of the Lukunga are plateau lands, like the American prairies, covered with tall grass, and capable of raising the richest crops of wheat and corn. The plateaus passed, a descent is made into the valley of the Quilu, and then into those of the Luama and Lunianzo, where the station of Banza Mantica is reached, close by which is a Livingstone mission house. The prospect from the hilltops here is a grand, embracing sight of nearly a dozen native villages whose dwellers are devoted to the cultivation of groundnuts. In six hours the caravan is at Isangela, sight of which station filled Stanley with grief, so backward had improvement been. Hundreds of bales of stock were rotting there through neglect of the commandant to keep the thatched roofs of the houses in repair. The country now becomes broken and rugged, and the way obstructed with large boulders. All nature here is a counterpart of that rough tumultuous channel where thunders the Congo in its last furious charges to the sea. It is now five miles to Vivi. The height is 1,700 feet above the sea. The air is cool and delicious. The natives are peaceful and industrious. There is an English mission on those highlands, in the midst of peace and plenty. Once at Vivi, Stanley is again grieved, for the commandants had done nothing to make it either ornamental or useful. All is barren, like the surrounding hills. Not a road had been cut, not a cottage thatched. The gardens were in waste, the fences broken. The twenty-five whites there were lazily indifferent to their surroundings, 
and without any energy or vivacity except that inspired by European wine. The native sick list was fearfully large and there was a general demand for medicines, till Stanley made an inspection and found that they were only feigning sickness as an excuse for idleness. Shocked at all this Stanley resolved to move the station up and away to the larger plateau. He did so, and left it with a reorganized staff and force, writing home, meanwhile, an account of his work. The old and new Vivi stations were connected by a railroad, and by June 1884, the new station had five comfortable houses, surrounded by a freshly planted banana orchard. On June 6 Stanley left Vivi for Boma, and took passage on the British and African steamer Consembo, on the 10th, for an inspection of the West African coast. The steamer stopped at Landana, a factory town, with a French mission peeping out of a banana grove on an elevation. It next touched at Black Point to take on produce, and then at Longo and Mayumbo. It then entered the Gabon country, and stopped off at the town of that name, which is the seat of government of the French colony. At Gabon are several brick buildings, stores, hotels, a Catholic and American Protestant mission, ten factories and a stone pier. It is a neat place, and almost picturesque with its hill-dotted houses and tropical vegetation. The steamer then passed the Spanish town of Alobi, on an island of that name, off the mouth of the Muni River. Rounding Cape St. Juan, it next touched at the celebrated island of Fernandopa, whose center is a peak 10,000 feet high. The country of the Cameroons now begins, a people even more degraded than those of the Congo. Skirting this country, Duke Town, or Old Calabar, was reached on June 21. This is the Oil River region of Africa and 300 barrels of palm oil awaited the Kinsembo. Stanley took a trip inland to Creek Town, where is a Scottish mission. He was struck with the similarity of what he saw to scenes on the Congo, the same palms, density of forest, green verdure, reddish loam, hut architecture. Only one thing differed, and that was that the residences of the native chiefs were of European manufacture. Palm oil has brought them luxurious homes, modernly furnished. The ivory, oil, rubber, gum, camwood powder, orchilla, beeswax, grains and spices would do the same for Congo at no distant day. The steamer next anchored in Bonny River, off the town of Bonny, where there is a well-to-do white population and an equally well-to-do native population, with many factories and a large traffic. These people seem to have solved the difficult problem of African climate, and to have dissipated much of the fear which clung to a residence on and about the rivers which find their way to the sea in the Bight of Benin. Passing New Calabar, anchor is cast off the Benin River, in a roadstead where clustered ships from all the principal ports of Europe. The Kinsembo is now fully loaded and makes for Quetta and then Sierra Leone. Then sail was set for London. Stanley got off at Plymouth on July 29, 1884, and four days later presented a report of his expedition and his mission to the King of Belgium at Ostend. Some part of the work of founding the Congo Free State had now been done. Stanley and his expedition had been instrumental in clearing ground, leveling sites, reducing approaches, laying foundations, and building walls. The Bureau of the Association had contributed means and supplied tools and mortar. But windows were now to be placed and roofs put on. Then the fabric must be furnished and equipped within. The finishing work could only be done through the agency of its royal founder. He took it up where Stanley laid it down, and applied to the governments of Europe and America for recognition of what had been done, and for a guarantee of such limits as were foreshadowed by the new state. The border lands were those of France and Portugal. Treaties, fixing boundaries, were made with these countries. Precedents were formed in the case of the Puritan Fathers, the New Hampshire colonists, the British East India Company, the Liberian Republic, the colonists of Borneo. Establishing the right of individuals to build states upon cessions of territory and surrenders of sovereignty by chiefs and rulers who hold as original owners. Stanley's present to the association was a series of treaties duly ratified by 450 independent African chiefs, who held land by undisturbed possession, ancient usage and divine right. They had not been intimidated or coerced, but of their own free will and for valuable considerations had transferred their sovereignty and ownership to the association. 
The time had now come for cementing these grants and cohering these sovereignties, so that they should stand forth as a grand entirety and prove worthy of the name of solid empire. And just here occurs one of the most interesting chapters in the founding of the Congo Free State. As it was to the Welsh American Stanley, that the initial work of the grand enterprise was due, so it was to his country, the United States of America, that that work was preserved and its results turned to the account of the world. England, with her usual disregard of international sentiment, and in that spirit which implies that her ipsy dixit is all there is of importance in diplomacy, had made a treaty with Portugal, signed February 26, 1884. Recognizing the mouth of the Congo as Portuguese territory, and this in the face of the fact that the mouth of that great river had been regarded as neutral territory. And of the further fact that for half a century England herself had peremptorily refused to recognize Portuguese claims to it. This action on the part of England awakened emphatic protest on the part of France and Germany, and commercial men in England denounced it through fear that Portuguese restrictions on trade would destroy Congo commerce entirely. It remained for the United States to speak. Her minister to Belgium, General H. S. Sanford, had all along been a faithful coadjutor of the Committee of the International Association, and he began to call attention to the danger of the step just taken by England. He also reminded the American people that to their philanthropy was due the Free States of Liberia, founded at a cost of $2,500,000, and to which 20,000 colored Americans had been sent. He also reminded them that one of their citizens had rescued Livingstone and thereby called the attention of the world to the Congo Basin and Central African enterprise. By means of these and other arguments he induced on Congress to examine thoroughly the subject of the Congo Free State and Anglo-Portuguese Treaty. The Committee on Foreign Relations reported to the Senate as follows. It can scarcely be denied that the native chiefs have the right to make the treaties they have made with Stanley acting as the representative of the International Association. The able and exhaustive statements of Sir Travis Twiss, the eminent English jurist, and of Prof. Arntz, the no less distinguished Belgian publicist, leave no doubt upon the question of the legal capacity of the African International Association, in view of the law of nations. To accept any powers belonging to these native chiefs and governments, which they may choose to delegate or cede to them. The practical question to which they give an affirmative answer, for reasons which appear to be indisputable, is this, can independent chiefs of several tribes cede to private citizens the whole or part of their state? With the sovereign rights which pertain to them, conformably to the traditional customs of the country? The doctrine advanced in this proposition, and so well sustained by these writers, accords with that held by the government of the United States, that the occupants of a country, at the time of its discovery by other and more powerful nations, have the right to make the treaties for its disposal, and that private persons when associated in such a country for self-protection, or self-government, may treat with the inhabitants for any purpose that does not violate the laws of nations. After a patient investigation of all the facts bearing upon the Congo question, the United States Senate passed a resolution, April 10, 1884, authorizing the President to recognize the International African Association as a governing power on the Congo River. This recognition by the United States was a new birth for the association, whose existence had been menaced by England's treaty with Portugal. The European powers, whose protest had thus far been impotent, now ably seconded the position taken by this country, and the result was a reaction in English sentiment. Which bade fair to secure such modification or interpretation of the Portuguese treaty as would secure to the Congo Free State the outlet of the Congo River. A conference of the nations interested in the new state, and the trade of the Congo, was called at Berlin, November 15, 1884. The German Empire, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, France, Great Britain, Italy, Portugal, Russia, Sweden and Norway, Turkey and the United States, were represented. Prince Bismarck formally opened the conference by declaring that it had met to solve three problems. 1. The free navigation, with freedom of trade on the River Congo. 2. The free navigation of the River Niger. 3. The formalities to be observed for valid annexation of territory in future on the African continent. The above propositions opened up a wide discussion. 
It was wonderful to see the development of sentiment respecting the power of the international association and its territorial limits in Africa. England could not stand discussion of her rights on the Niger, and the better to protect them, or rather to withdraw them from the arena of debate, she gave full recognition to the international association. Germany and Austria both recognized the flag of the association. France treated with the association respecting the boundaries of her possessions on the north. Portugal followed with a treaty by which the association obtained the left, or south bank of the Congo from the sea to the Wangoango. All the other powers present recognized the association and signed the convention with it. Now for the first time in history there was a Congo free state de jure and de facto. It had legal recognition and rights, and took its place among the empires of the world. Geographically it had bounds, and these are they. A strip of land at the mouth of the Congo, 22 miles long, extending from Banana Point to Cabo Lombo. All of the north or right bank of the Congo as far as the cataract of Ntambo Mataka, three miles above Manyanga Station, with back country inland as far as the Kalanga River. All of the south bank of the Congo to the Wangoango Rivulet. From the said rivulet to the latitude of Naki, thence east along that parallel to the Kwa River, thence up the Kwa to S. Lat. 6 degrees, thence up the affluent of the Kwa, Lubilash, to the watershed between the Congo and Zambesi, which it follows to Lake Banguila. From the eastern side of Banguila the line runs north to Lake Tanganyika, and follows its western shore to the Razizi affluent, then up this affluent to E. Long. 30 degrees, as far as the watershed, between the Congo and Nile. Thence westward to E. Long. 17 degrees, and along that meridian to the Lacona Basin. The Berlin Conference not only created a mighty state and sanctioned its powers and boundaries, but it confirmed unto France a noble territory on the north of the Congo equal to any in Africa for vegetable production and mineral resources. Having an Atlantic coastline of 800 miles, giving access to eight river basins, with 5,200 miles of navigable water, and a total area of 257,000 square miles. It also settled the boundaries of Portugal on the Atlantic coast, giving to her possessions a frontage of 995 miles, and an area larger than France, Belgium, Holland and Great Britain combined, rich in pastoral lands, oil and rubber forests. Minerals and agricultural resources, enough to give each one of her people a farm of 33 acres. The territory embraced in the Congo Free State, and dedicated to free commerce and enterprise, is equal to 1,600,000 square miles. The same privileges were extended to within one degree of the east coast of Africa, subject to rights of Portugal and Zanzibar. This would make a privileged commercial zone in Central Africa of 2,400,000 square miles in extent. While there are at present but few legitimate traders within this vast area to be benefited by these liberal endowments of the Congo Free State, the wisdom of setting the territory apart and dedicating it to international uses is already apparent. The European powers are in hot chase after landed booty in Central Africa. England is flying at the throat of Portugal, is jealous of France and Germany, is snubbing Italy and is ready to rob Turkey. It is surely one of the grandest diplomatic achievements to have rescued so important and imposing a portion of a continent from the turmoil which has ever characterized, and is now manifest in European greed for landed possessions. If the European powers had been permitted to seize all the coasts of the continent, and the continent itself, and to levy contributions on trade according to their respective wills, they would have forever strangled commercial development. Except as suited their selfish ends. On the other hand the guarantee of the association that its large and productive areas should be free from discrimination and oppression, would naturally tempt enterprising spirits to venture inland and win a continent from barbarism. The courts of law of the association would be everywhere and always open, there would be no charges on commerce except those necessary to support the government, the liquor traffic might not be abused. A positive prohibition would rest on the slave trade, the missionary, without respect to denomination, would have special protection, scientific development would be encouraged, to all these. The powers present at the Berlin Conference gave a pledge, with these they endowed the Congo Free State. 
Stanley was one of the most conspicuous figures in this memorable conference. He was not a debater, nor even a participant in the ordinary acceptation of the term, but he was questioned and cross-questioned on every matter relating to African climatology, geography, anthropology, mineralogy, geology, zoology, and resources. And many a point of controversy turned on his information or judgment. The International Association, which has in its keeping the Free Congo State, ratified, through its president, Colonel Strauch, the General Act of the Berlin Conference, and thus made it the constitution of the new state in Central Africa. To the terms of this constitution the new state as well as the powers represented at the conference stand bound as against the world. The Company of the Congo, for laying and operating a railway around the Congo cataracts, was formed under French auspices in February 1887, and by June, the first and second contingent of engineers had left for the Congo. When completed, the staff consisted of one director, twelve engineers and one surgeon. A number of Hussas, from the Gold Coast, were engaged for the mechanical work, and the whole were divided into gangs, each with its special work to do, following each other along the route. The work went on speedily, and the final observation was taken at Stanley Pool, in November, 1888. The proposed railway is to extend from a little below Vivi, Matadi, up to which large vessels may be taken, past the long series of cataracts to Stanley Pool. The total length of the line is to be 275 miles. On leaving Matadi it bends away from the Congo to the southeast, and keeps at a distance of several miles from the river till it approaches Stanley Pool. The first 16 miles of the route will be attended with considerable difficulties, while the remainder of the line will be laid under exceptionally easy conditions. It is in the first 16 miles that there will be any serious rock cutting and embankments, and the expense of the construction in this part is estimated at $11,548 a mile, while those on the remainder of the line will cost much less. In addition to this, there will be the cost of erecting aqueducts, building bridges, etc., all of which, it is stated, will be much greater in the first few miles, than subsequently. On the first few miles, also, there are a few steep inclines, but for the rest of the route the inclines are reported to be insignificant. There are only three bridges of any size, across the Mkes, the Mpozo, and the Quilu, ranging from 250 feet to 340 feet, half a dozen others from 130 feet to 190 feet, with a number very much smaller. The fact is, the engineering difficulties in the construction of the proposed railway are insignificant. One of the chief considerations will be the climate. The route is situated within the rainiest region of Africa, and unless special precautions are taken the road, especially in the first section, will be liable to be swept away. From this point of view alone it is very doubtful if a railway suitable for the region could be built, so as to last, for less than five million dollars. The railway will be built on the narrow gauge system. The locomotives, when loaded, will weigh 30 tons, and drag at the rate of 11 miles per hour, an average of 50 tons. Thus one train per day each way would, if fully loaded, represent a total of 36,000 tons per annum, far in excess of any traffic likely to be available for many years. The railway, if built, would tap about 7,000 miles of navigable rivers. Evidence of the strides forward made by the Congo Free State is just now furnished by Mr. Taunt, commercial agent of the United States at Boma, in his report for 1889 to the Department of State. He says in substance that within the last two years the Congo Free State has made a wonderful advancement. Here is now found, where for ages has been a jungle, inhabited only by wild beasts and wilder men, a well-equipped government. It has its full corps of officials, its courts of law, post offices, custom stations, a standing army of 1,500 men, well officered and drilled, a currency of gold, silver, and copper and all the appliances of a well-ordered government. Boma, the seat of government of the Congo Free State, is situated upon the Congo, about 90 miles from its mouth. Here are the residences of the governor and of the lesser officials, and here are established the courts and the governmental departments. The army is well distributed at different stations along the banks of the river, and does excellent service in policing the stream against the incursions of the Arabs. 
the port of entry of the Congo Free State, is Banana Settlement at the mouth of the Congo. For lines of steamers, British, German, Portuguese, and French, make frequent connection between the settlements and European ports. A Dutch line also runs a steamer to the Congo in infrequent trips. Cable communication is already established between Europe and two points easily accessible from the mouth of the Congo, and telegraphic connection will doubtless soon be made with banana. All these arrangements are, of course, only auxiliaries to the great trading interests already established in the region of the Congo. In this trade the merchants of Rotterdam lead, having stations established for hundreds of miles both north and south of the river. During the last two years they have penetrated even to the upper Congo and established trading stations at Stanley Falls, a point 1,500 miles distant from the mouth of the river. This company employs a large force of white agents, and is largely interested in the raising of coffee, tobacco, cocoa, and other products of the tropics. Holland alone has not been allowed to occupy this rich field. French, English, Portuguese, and Belgian capitalists have seen the advantages to be derived from this occupation of a new soil, and have not been slow to seize their opportunities. The last named, especially, are making preparations for the investment of a large amount of capital in this new and productive field. In the Congo Free State, as thus open to the trade of the world, is supplied a market in which American manufacturers should be able successfully to compete. There is a great demand for cotton goods, canned food, cutlery, lumber, and ready-built frame houses. Manchester has already monopolized the trade in cotton goods, which, in the further extension of trading posts, is capable of almost indefinite expansion. Birmingham and Sheffield supply brass wire, beads and cutlery, and England and France now supply the demand for canned foods. It would seem that the markets of the United States should supply a portion at least of this great demand for manufactured articles. In the items of lumber and canned food surely we should be able to compete successfully with Europe. Although it would seem probable that the establishment of saw mills upon the Congo should soon serve to do away with the demand for the first named of these articles. The one desideratum, without which our manufacturers cannot hope to open up a prosperous trade with the Congo Free State, is a direct line of steamships from Boma to some American port. Without this, the added freights from this country to Europe for transshipment to the Congo would, it would seem, be an insurmountable bar to a profitable trade, however desirable such trade might be. As has been already observed, in order to ensure from the natives a loyal observance of their promises, Stanley made a treaty with each chief along the course of the Congo, to the general effect that, in consideration of certain quantities of cloth to be paid them monthly, they should abstain from acts of aggression and violence against their neighbors. The design of these treaties was to ensure peace among the tribes themselves. Other agreements and treaties were also made, designed to secure such transfers of their sovereignty to the International Commission, as would enable it to organize the Congo Free State. As these forms are novel, we give such of them as will enable a reader to understand the preliminary steps toward the formation of this new state. Preliminary Declaration We, the undersigned chiefs of Nzungi, agree to recognize the sovereignty of the African International Association, and in sign thereof, adopt its flag, blue, with a golden star. We declare we shall keep the road open and free of all tax and impost on all strangers arriving with the recommendation of the agents of the above association. All troubles between ourselves and neighbors, or with strangers of any nationality, we shall refer to the arbitration of the above association. We declare that we have not made any written or oral agreement with any person previous to this that would render this agreement null and void. We declare that from henceforth we and our successors shall abide by the decision of the representatives of the association in all matters affecting our welfare or our possessions. And that we shall not enter into any agreement with any person without referring all matters to the chief of Manyanga, or the chief of Leopoldville, or act in any manner contrary to the tenor or spirit of this agreement. Witnesses Duala, his ex Mark, of Chami, Pard. Mwamba, his ex Mark, of Makitus. Kikuru, his ex Mark, chief of Nzungi. Nsika, his ex Mark, chief of Banzambuba. Nzako, his ex Mark, 
of Banzambuba. Insulampaka, his ex mark, of Banzambuba. Isiaki, his ex mark, chief of Banzambuba. Forms of a treaty. Henry M. Stanley, commanding the expedition on the Upper Congo, acting in the name and on behalf of the African International Association, and the King and Chiefs Ngambai and Mafila, having met together in conference at South Manyanga, have, after deliberation, concluded the following treaty, viz. Article 1. The chiefs of Ngambai and Mafila recognize that it is highly desirable that the African International Association should, for the advancement of civilization and trade, be firmly established in their country. They therefore now, freely of their own accord, for themselves and their heirs and successors forever, do give up to the said association the sovereignty and all sovereign governing rights to all their territories. They also promise to assist the said association in its work of governing and civilizing this country, and to use their influence with all the other inhabitants, with whose unanimous approval they make this treaty. To secure obedience to all laws made by said association, and assist by labor or otherwise, any works, improvements, or expeditions, which the said association shall cause at any time to be carried out in any part of the territories. Art. 2. Dot, the chief of Ngambai and Mafila promise at all times to join their forces with those of the said association, to resist the forcible intrusion or repulse the attacks of foreigners of any nationality or color. Art. 3. The country thus ceded has about the following boundaries, viz., the whole of the Ngambai and Mafila countries, and any other tributary to them, and the chiefs of Ngambai and Mafila solemnly affirm that all this country belongs absolutely to them. That they can freely dispose of it, and that they neither have already, nor will on any future occasion, make any treaties, grants or sales of any parts of these territories to strangers, without the permission of the said association. All roads and waterways running through this country, the right of collecting tolls on the same, and all game, fishing, mining, and forest rights, are to be the absolute property of the said association. Together with any unoccupied lands as may at any time hereafter be chosen. Art. For dot, the African International Association agrees to pay to the chiefs of Ngambai and Mafila the following articles of merchandise, viz., one piece of cloth per month, to each of the undersigned chiefs, besides presents of cloth in hand. And the said chiefs hereby acknowledge to accept this bounty and monthly subsidy in full settlement of all their claims on the said association. Art. V. The African International Association promises. 1. To take from the natives of this ceded country no occupied or cultivated lands, except by mutual agreement. 2 to promote to its utmost the prosperity of the said country. 3. To protect its inhabitants from all oppression or foreign intrusion. 4. It authorizes the chiefs to hoist its flag, to settle all local disputes or palavers, and to maintain its authority with the natives. Agreed to, signed and witnessed, this first day of April, 1884. Henry M. Stanley. Witnesses to the Signatures. E. Spencer Burns. D. Lehrman. Duala. Sankey, his ex mark, senior chief of Ngambai. Maminpa, his ex mark, senior chief of Mafila. Joint agreement and treaty. We, the undersigned chiefs of the districts placed opposite our names below, do hereby solemnly bind ourselves, our heirs and successors for the purpose of mutual support and protection, to observe the following articles. Article 1. We agree to unite and combine together, under the name and title of the New Confederacy, that is, our respective districts, their homes and villages shall be embraced by one united territory, to be henceforth known as the New Confederacy. Art. 2. Dot, we declare that our objects are to unite our forces and our means for the common defense of all the districts comprised within said territory. To place our forces and our means under such organization as we shall deem to be best for the common good of the people and the welfare of the Confederacy. Art. 3. The new Confederacy may be extended by the admission of all such districts adjoining those mentioned before, 
when their chiefs have made application and expressed their consent to the articles herein mentioned. Art. 4. We, the people of the new confederacy, adopt the blue flag with the golden star in the center for our banner. Art. V. The confederated districts guarantee that the treaties made between them shall be respected. Art. 6. The public force of the confederacy shall be organized at the rate of one man out of every two men able to bear arms, of native or foreign volunteers. Art. 7. The organization, the armament, equipment, subsistence of this force, shall be confided to the chief agent in Africa of the Association of the Upper Congo. To the above articles, which are the result of various conventions held between district and district, and by which we have been enabled to understand the common wish, we, sovereign chiefs and others of the Congo district hereby append our names. Pledging ourselves to adhere to each and every article. Names of Signers The Berlin Conference The Berlin Conference which settled the contributions of the Congo Free State, and secured for it the recognition of the principal civilized nations of the world, commenced its sitting at half past two o'clock, on the 26th of February, 1885. Under the presidency of His Highness, Prince Bismarck. The Prince opened the closing session conference by saying, Our conference, after long and laborious deliberations, has reached the end of its work, and I am glad to say that. Thanks to your efforts and to that spirit of conciliation which had presided over our proceedings, a complete accord has been come to on every point of the program submitted to us. The resolutions which we are about to sanction formally, secure to the trade of all nations free access to the interior of the African continent. The guarantees by which the freedom of trade will be assured in the Congo Basin, and the whole of the arrangements embodied in the rules for the navigation of the Congo and the Niger, are of such a nature as to afford the commerce and industry of all nations the most favorable conditions for their development and security. In another series of regulations you have shown your solicitude for the moral and material welfare of the native population, and we may hope that those principles, adopted in a spirit of wise moderation, will bear fruit. And help familiarize those populations with the benefit of civilization. The particular conditions under which are placed the vast regions you have just opened up to commercial enterprise, have seemed to require special guarantee for the preservation of peace and public order. In fact, the scourge of war would become particularly disastrous if the natives were led to take sides in the disputes between civilized powers. Justly apprehensive of the dangers that such event might have for the interest of commerce and civilization, you have sought for the means of withdrawing a great part of the African continent from the vicissitudes of general politics. In confining therein the rivalry of nations to peaceful emulation in trade and industry. In the same manner you have endeavored to avoid all misunderstanding and dispute to which fresh annexations on the African coast might give rise. The declaration of the formalities required before such annexation can be considered effective, introduces a new rule, into public law, which in its turn will remove many a cause of dissent and conflict from our international relations. The spirit of mutual good understanding which has distinguished your deliberations has also presided over the negotiations that have been carried on outside the conference. With a view to arrange the difficult question of delimitation between the parties exercising sovereign rights in the Congo Basin, and which, by their position, are destined to be the chief guardians of the work we are about to sanction. I cannot touch on this subject without bearing testimony to the noble efforts of His Majesty, the King of the Belgians, the founder of a work which now has gained the recognition of almost all the powers, and which, as it grows, will render valuable service to the cause of humanity. Gentlemen, I am requested by His Majesty, the Emperor and King, my August Master, to convey to you his warmest thanks for the part each of you has taken in the felicitous accomplishment of the work of the conference. I fulfill a final duty in gratefully acknowledging what the conference owes to those of its members who undertook the hard work of the commission, notably to the Baron de Corsel and to Baron Lambermont. I have also to thank the delegates for the valuable assistance they have rendered us, and I include in this expression of thanks the secretaries of the conference, who have facilitated our deliberations by the accuracy of their work. Like the other labors of man, the work of this conference may be improved upon and perfected, but it will, I hope. 
mark an advance in the development of international relations and form a new bond of union between the nations of the civilized world. General Act of the Conference Respecting The Congo Free State Chapter 1 Declaration relative to the freedom of commerce in the basin of the Congo, its mouths and circumjacent districts, with certain arrangements connected therewith. Article 1. The trade of all nations shall be entirely free. 1. In all territories constituting the basin of the Congo and its affluence. The basin is bounded by the crests of adjoining basins, that is to say, the basins of the Niari, of the Agao, of the Sheri, and of the Nile towards the north by the line of the eastern ridge of the affluence of Lake Tanganyika towards the east. By the crests of the basin of the Zambesi and the Loge towards the south. It consequently embraces all the territories drained by the Congo and its affluence, comprising therein Lake Tanganyika and its eastern tributaries. 2. In the maritime zone extending along the Atlantic Ocean from the parallel of 2 degrees 30 minutes south latitude to the mouth of the Loge. The northern limit will follow the parallel of 2 degrees 30 minutes from the coast until it reaches the geographical basin of the Congo, avoiding the basin of the Agao, to which the stipulations of the present act do not apply. The southern limit will follow the course of the Loge up to the source of that river, and then strike eastwards to its junction with the geographical basin of the Congo. 3. In the zone extending eastwards from the basin of the Congo as limited above herein, to the Indian Ocean, from the fifth degree of north latitude to the mouth of the Zambesi on the south. From this point the line of demarcation will follow the Zambesi upstream to a point five miles beyond its junction with the Shire, and continue by the line of the ridge dividing the waters which flow towards Lake Nyasa from the tributary waters of the Zambesi, until it joins the line of the water parting between the Zambesi and the Congo. It is expressly understood that in extending to this eastern zone the principle of commercial freedom, the powers represented at the conference bind only themselves. And that the principle will apply to territories actually belonging to some independent and sovereign state only so far as that state consents to it. The powers agree to employ their good officers among the established governments on the African coast of the Indian Ocean, to obtain such consent, and in any case to ensure the most favorable conditions to all nations. Article 2. All flags, without distinction of nationality, shall have free access to all the coast of the territories above enumerated, to the rivers which therein flow to the sea, to all the waters of the Congo and its affluence, including the lakes. To all the canals that in the future may be cut with the object of uniting the watercourses or the lakes comprised in the whole extent of the territories described in Article 1. They can undertake all kinds of transport, and engage in maritime and fluvial coasting, as well as river navigation, on the same footing as the natives. Article 3. Goods from every source imported into these territories, under any flag whatever, either by way of the sea, the rivers, or the land, shall pay no taxes except such as are equitable compensation for the necessary expenses of the trade. And which can meet with equal support from the natives and from foreigners of every nationality. All differential treatment is forbidden both with regard to ships and goods. Article 4. Goods imported into these territories will remain free of all charges for entry and transit. The powers reserved to themselves, until the end of a period of twenty years, the right of deciding if freedom of entry shall be maintained or not. Article 5. Every power which exercises, or will exercise, sovereign rights in the territories above mentioned, cannot therein concede any monopoly or privilege of any sort in commercial matters. Foreigners shall therein indiscriminately enjoy the same treatment and rights as the natives in the protection of their persons and goods, in the acquisition and transmission of their property, movable and immovable, and in the exercise of their professions. Article 6. Provisions relative to the protection of the natives, to missionaries and travelers, and to religious liberty. All the powers exercising sovereign rights, or having influence in the said territories, undertake to watch over the preservation of the native races, and the amelioration of the moral and material conditions of their existence. And to cooperate in the suppression of slavery, and, above all, of the slave trade. They will protect and encourage, 
without distinction of nationality or creed, all institutions and enterprises, religious, scientific, or charitable, established and organized for these objects. Or tending to educate the natives and lead them to understand and appreciate the advantages of civilization. Christian missionaries, men of science, explorers and their escorts and collections, to be equally the object of special protection. Liberty of conscience and religious tolerations are expressly guaranteed to the natives as well as to the inhabitants and foreigners. The free public exercise of every creed, the right to erect religious buildings and to organize missions belonging to every creed, shall be subjected to no restriction or impediment whatever. Article 7. Postal Arrangements. The Convention of the Postal Union, revised at Paris, on June 1, 1878, shall apply to the said basin of the Congo. The powers which their exercise, or will exercise, rights of sovereignty or protectorate, undertake, as soon as circumstances permit, to introduce the necessary measures to give effect to the above resolutions. Article 8. Right of surveillance conferred on the International Commission for the Navigation of the Congo. In all parts of the territory embraced in the present declaration, where no power shall exercise the rights of sovereignty or protectorate, the International Commission for the Navigation of the Congo, constituted in accordance with Article 17, shall be entrusted with the surveillance of the application of the principles declared and established in this declaration. In all cases of difficulties arising, relative to the application of the principles established by the present declaration, the governments interested shall agree to appeal to the good offices of the International Commission leaving to it the examination of the facts which have given rise to the difficulties. Chapter 2. Declaration Concerning the Slave Trade. Article 9. In conformity with the principles of the right of natives as recognized by the signatory powers, the slave trade being forbidden, and operations, which on land or sea supply slaves for the trade, being equally held to be forbidden, the powers which exercise or will exercise rights of sovereignty or influence in the territories forming the basin of the Congo, declare that these territories shall serve neither for the place of sale, nor the way of transit for traffic in slaves of any race whatsoever. Each of the powers undertakes to employ every means that it can to put an end to the trade and to punish those who engage in it. Chapter 3 Declaration relating to the neutrality of the territories comprised in the said basin of the Congo. Article X. In order to give a new guarantee of security for commerce and industry, and to encourage by the maintenance of peace the development of civilization in the countries mentioned in Article I, or placed under the system of free trade. The high party signatory to the present act, and those who will accept the same, hereby undertake to respect the neutrality of the territories or parts of the territories dependent on the said countries, comprising therein the territorial waters. For so long as the powers, which exercise, or will exercise, the rights of sovereignty or protectorate over the territories, avail themselves of the right to proclaim them neutral, and fulfill the duties that neutrality implies. Article 11. In cases where a power exercising the rights of sovereignty or protectorate in the countries as mentioned in Article 1, and placed under the system of free trade, shall be involved in war, the high party signatory to the present act. And those who will accept the same, hereby engage to use their good officers so that the territories belonging to that power, and comprised within the said boundaries where free trade exists, shall, by the mutual consent of that power and of the other, or others, of the belligerent parties, be held to be neutral, for so long as the war lasts, and considered as belonging to a non-belligerent state. The belligerent parties will then abstain from extending hostilities into such neutralized territories as well as from using them as a base for operations of war. Article 12. In the event of a serious disagreement originating on the subject, or arising within the limits of the territories mentioned in Article 1 and placed under the system of freedom of trade, between powers signatory to the present act. Or powers accepting the same, these powers undertake, before appealing to arms, to have recourse to the mediation of one or several of the friendly powers. Under the said circumstances the said powers reserve to themselves the option of proceeding to arbitration. Chapter 4 Act of the Navigation of the Congo Article 13 
The navigation of the Congo, without any exception of any branches or issues of the river, is to remain entirely free for merchant shipping of all nations in cargo or ballast, for the carriage of cargo or the carriage of passengers. It shall be in accordance with the provisions of the present Act of Navigation, or of the regulations established in execution of the said Act. In the exercise of that navigation, the subjects and flags of all nations, shall, under all circumstances, be treated on a footing of absolute equality. As well as regards the direct navigation from the open sea towards the interior parts of the Congo, and vice versa, as for grand and petty coasting, and boat and river work all along the river. Consequently, throughout the Congo's course and mouth, no distinction shall be made between the subjects of the riverside states, and those not bordering on the river, and no exclusive privilege of navigation shall be granted either to societies, corporations or individuals. These provisions are recognized by the signatory powers, as henceforth forming part of public international law. Article 14. The navigation of the Congo shall not be subjected to any restraints or imposts which are not expressly stipulated for in the present Act. It shall not be burdened with any duties for harborage stoppages, depots, breaking bulk, or putting in through stress of weather. Throughout the length of the Congo, ships and merchandise passing along the stream shall be subject to no transit dues, no matter what may be their origin or destination. There shall not be established any tolls, marine or river, based on the fact of navigation alone, nor shall any duty be imposed on the merchandise on board the vessels. Such taxes and duties only shall be levied, as are of the character of remuneration for services rendered, to the said navigation. That is to say. 1. Taxes of the port for the actual use of certain local establishments, such as wharves, warehouses etc. The tariff of such tax is to be calculated on the expenses of construction and support of the said local establishments, and in its application to be independent of the origin of the vessels and their cargo. 2. Pilotage dues on sections of the river, or where it appears necessary to establish stations of certificated pilots. The tariff of these dues to be fixed and proportionate to the services rendered. 3. Dues in respect of the technical and administrative expenses, imposed in the general interest of the navigation, and comprising lighthouses, beacon, and buoyage dues. Dues of the last description to be based on the tonnage of the ships, according to the papers on board, and to be conformable to the regulations in force on the lower Danube. The tariffs of the taxes and dues mentioned in the three preceding paragraphs are not to admit of any differential treatment, and are to be officially published in each port. The powers reserve to themselves the right, at the end of five years, by mutual agreement, to inquire into the above-mentioned tariffs in case they require revision. Article 15. The affluence of the Congo shall, under all circumstances, be subject to the same regulations as the river of which they are the tributaries. The same regulations shall apply to the lakes and canals as to the rivers and streams in the territories defined in Article 1, paragraphs 2 and 3. Nevertheless the powers of the International Commission of the Congo shall not extend over the said rivers, lakes and canals, unless with the assent of the states under whose sovereignty they are placed. It is also understood that for the territories mentioned in Article 1, Paragraph 3, the consent of the sovereign states on whom these territories are dependent remains reserved. Article 16. The roads, railways, or lateral canals, which shall be established for the special object of supplementing the innavigability or imperfections of the waterway in certain sections of the Congo. Of its affluence and other watercourses held to be like unto them by Article 15, shall be considered in their capacity as means of communication as dependencies of the river, and shall be likewise open to the traffic of all nations. And as on the river, there shall be levied on these roads, railways and canals only tolls calculated on the expenses of construction, maintenance and administration, and on the profits due to the promoters. In the assessment of these tolls, foreigners and the inhabitants of the respective territories shall be treated on a footing of perfect equality. Article 17. An international commission is instituted and appointed to ensure the execution of the provisions of the present Act of Navigation. The powers signatory to this Act, as well as those who afterwards accept it, shall at all times be represented on the said commission, each by a delegate. 
no delegate shall have more than one vote, even in the event of his representing several governments. This delegate shall be paid by his own government direct. The salaries and allowances of the agents and servants of the International Commission shall be charged to the proceeds of the dues levied conformably to Article 14, paragraphs 2 and 3. The amounts of said salaries and allowances, as well as the number, position and duties of the agents and servants, shall appear in the account rendered each year to the governments represented on the International Commission. Article 18. The members of the International Commission, as well as the agents nominated by them, are invested with the privilege of inviolability in the exercise of their functions. The same guarantee shall extend to the offices, premises and archives of the Commission. Article 19. The International Commission for the Navigation of the Congo, shall be constituted as soon as five of the signatory powers of the present General Act shall have nominated their delegates. Pending the constitution of the Commission, the nomination of the delegates shall be notified to the government of the German Empire, by whom the necessary steps will be taken to manage the meeting of the Commission. The Commission will draw up, without delay, the arrangements for the navigation, river police, pilotage and quarantine. These regulations, as well as the tariffs, instituted by the Commission, before being put in force, shall be submitted to the approbation of the powers represented on the Commission. The powers interested, shall declare their opinion therein with the least possible delay. Offenses against these regulations shall be dealt with by the agents of the International Commission, where it exercises its authority direct, and in other places by the Riverside powers. In case of abuse of power or injustice on the part of an agent or servant of the International Commission, the individual considering himself injured in his person or his rights, shall apply to the consular agent of his nation. He will inquire into his complaint, and if prima facie, he finds it reasonable, he shall be entitled to report it to the Commission. On his initiative, the Commission, represented by three or fewer of its members, shall join with him in an inquiry touching the conduct of its agent or servant. If the consular agent considers the decision of the Commission as objectionable in law, he shall report to the government, who shall refer to the powers represented on the Commission, and invite them to agree as to the instructions to be given to the Commission. Article XX. The International Commission of the Congo, entrusted under the terms of Article 17, with ensuring the execution of the present Act of Navigation, shall specially devote its attention to. 1. The indication of such works as are necessary for ensuring the navigability of the Congo, in accordance with the requirements of international trade. On sections of the river where no power exercises rights of sovereignty, the International Commission shall itself take the measures necessary for ensuring the navigability of the stream. On sections of the river occupied by a sovereign power, the International Commission shall arrange with the Riverside Authority. 2. The fixing of the tariff for pilotage, and of the general tariff of navigation dues, provided for in the second and third paragraphs of Article 14. The tariffs mentioned in the first paragraph of Article 14, shall be settled by the territorial authority within the limits provided for in that article. The collection of these dues shall be under the care of the international or territorial authority, on whose account they have been established. 3. The administration of the revenues accruing from the application of the foregoing paragraph 2. 4. The surveillance of the quarantine establishment instituted in compliance with Article Ziv. 5. The nomination of agents for the general service of the navigation and its own particular servants. The appointment of sub-inspectors shall belong to the territorial authority over sections occupied by a power, and to the international commission over the other sections of the river. The Riverside Power will notify to the International Commission the nomination of its sub-inspectors which it shall have appointed, and this power shall pay their salaries. In the exercise of its duties, as defined and limited above, the International Commission shall not be subject to the territorial authority. Article XXI. In the execution of its task, the International Commission shall have recourse, in case of need, to the vessels of war belonging to the signatory powers of this Act, and to those which in the future shall accept it. If not in contravention of the instructions which shall have been given to the commanders of those vessels by their respective governments. Article XXI. 
The vessels of war of the powers signatory to the present Act which enter the Congo are exempt from the payment of the navigation dues provided for in paragraph 3 of Article 14. But they shall pay the contingent pilotage dues as well as the harbor dues, unless their intervention has been demanded by the International Commission or its agents under the terms of the preceding article. Article XXAI With the object of meeting the technical and administrative expenses which it may have to incur, the International Commission, instituted under Article 17, may in its own name issue loans secured on the revenues assigned to the said Commission. The resolutions of the Commission regarding the issue of a loan must be carried by a majority of two-thirds of its votes. It is understood that the governments represented on the Commission shall not, in any case, be considered as assuming any guarantee nor contracting any engagement or joint responsibility with regard to said laws unless special treaties are concluded amongst them to that effect. The proceeds of the dues specified in the third paragraph of Article 14 shall be in the first place set aside for the payment of interest and the extinction of said loans, in accordance with the agreements entered into with the lenders. Article Ziv At the mouths of the Congo there shall be founded, either at the initiation of the Riverside Powers, or by the intervention of the International Commission, a quarantine establishment which shall exercise control over the vessels entering and departing. It shall be decided later on by the powers, if any, and under what conditions, sanitary control shall be exercised over vessels navigating the river. Article XXV. The provisions of the present Act of Navigation shall remain in force during times of war. Consequently, the navigation of all nations, neutral and belligerent, shall at all times be free for the purposes of trade on the Congo, its branches, its affluence, and its mouths, as well as on the territorial waters fronting the mouths of the river. The traffic shall likewise remain free, notwithstanding the state of war, on its roads, railways, lakes and canals, as mentioned in Articles 15 and 16. The only exception to this principle shall be in cases in connection with the transport of articles intended for a belligerent, and held in accordance with the law of nations to be contraband of war. All the works and establishments instituted in execution of the present Act, particularly the offices of collection and their funds, the same as the staff permanently attached to the service of such establishments, shall be treated as neutral, and shall be respected and protected by the belligerents. Chapter 5 the Act of Navigation of the Niger Article XXVI The navigation of the Niger, without accepting any of the branches or issues, is, and shall continue free for merchant vessels of all nations, in cargo or ballast, conveying goods or conveying passengers. It shall be conducted in accordance with the provisions of the present Act of Navigation, and with the regulations established in execution of the same Act. In the exercise of that navigation, the subjects and flags of every nation shall be treated, under all circumstances, on a footing of perfect equality, as well in the direct navigation from the open sea to the interior ports of the Niger. And vice versa, as for grand and petty coasting, and in boat and river work throughout its course. Consequently throughout the length and mouths of the Niger, there shall be no distinction between the subjects of the riverside states, and those of states not bordering on the river and there shall be conceded no exclusive privilege of navigation to any society, or corporation, or individual. These provisions are recognized by the signatory powers as henceforth forming part of public international law. Article XXVI. The navigation of the Niger shall not be subjected to any obstacle or duty based only on the fact of the navigation. It shall not be subject to any duties for harborage, stoppages, depots, breaking bulk, or putting into port through stress of weather. Throughout the length of the Niger, vessels and goods passing along the stream shall not be subject to any transit dues, whatsoever may be their origin or destination. There shall be established no sea or river toll, based on the sole fact of navigation, nor any duty on the goods which happen to be on board the ships. Only such taxes and dues shall be levied as are of the nature of a payment for services rendered to the said navigation. The tariff of these taxes or dues shall admit of no differential treatment. Article XXVI. 
The affluence of the Niger shall in every respect be subject to the same regulations as the river of which they are the tributaries. Article 6. Roads, railways or lateral canals, which shall be established with the special object of supplementing the innavigability or other imperfections of the waterway, in certain sections of the course of the Niger, its affluence, its branches, and its issues, shall be considered, in their capacity of means of communication, as dependencies of the river and shall be open similarly to the traffic of all nations. As on the river, there shall be levied on the roads, railways and canals. Only such tolls as are calculated on the expenses of construction, maintenance and administration, and on the profits due to the promoters. In the assessment of these tolls, foreigners and the inhabitants of the respective territories, shall be treated on a footing of perfect equality. Article Triple X. Great Britain undertakes to apply the principles of freedom of navigation enunciated in Articles XXVI, XXVA, 18 I, ZIX. To so much of the waters of the Niger and its affluent branches and issues as are or shall be under her sovereignty or protectorate. The regulations she will draw up for the safety and control of the navigation shall be designed to facilitate, as much as possible, the passage of merchant shipping. It is understood that nothing in the engagements thus accepted shall be interpreted as hindering or likely to hinder Great Britain from making any regulations whatever as to the navigation which shall not be contrary to the spirit of such engagements. Great Britain undertakes to protect foreign traders of every nation engaged in commerce in those parts of the course of the Niger, which are or shall be under her sovereignty or protectorate, as if they were her own subjects. Provided that such traders conform to the regulations which are or shall be established in accordance with the foregoing. Article XXXI. France accepts, under the same reservations and identical terms, the obligations set forth in the preceding articles, so far as they apply to the waters of the Niger, its affluence, its branches, and its issues. Which are or shall be under her sovereignty or protectorate. Article XXXI. Each of the other signatory powers similarly undertake, that they will similarly act in such cases as they exercise or may hereafter exercise, rights of sovereignty or protectorate, in any part of the Niger, its affluent branches or issues. Article XXXAI The provisions of the present act of navigation shall remain in force during times of war. Consequently, the navigation of all nations, neutral or belligerent, shall at all times be free for the purpose of trade on the Niger, its branches, affluents, mouths and issues. As well as on the territorial waters fronting the mouths and issues of the river. The traffic shall likewise remain free, notwithstanding the state of war, on its roads, its railways and canals mentioned in Article 6. The only exception to this principle shall be in cases in connection with the transport of articles intended for a belligerent, and held, in accordance with the laws of nations, to be contraband of war. Chapter 6. Declaration relative to the essential conditions for new annexations on the African continent to be considered effective. Article XXXIV. The power, which in future takes possession of a territory on the coast of the African continent, situated outside of its actual possessions, or which, having none there, has first acquired them, and the power which assumes a protectorate, shall accompany either act by a notification addressed to the other powers signatory to the present act, so as to enable them to protest against the same, if there exist any grounds for their doing so. Article XXXV. The powers signatory to the present act, recognize the obligation to ensure in the territories occupied by them on the coasts of the African continent, the existence of an adequate authority to enforce respect for acquired rights. And for freedom of trade and transit wherever stipulated. Chapter 7. General Provisions. Article XXXVI. The powers signatory to the present general act reserve to themselves the right of eventually, by mutual agreement, introducing therein modifications or improvements, the utility of which has been shown by experience. Article XXXVI. The powers who may not have signed the present act shall accept its provisions by a separate act. The adhesion of each power shall be notified in the usual diplomatic manner to the government of the German Empire, and by it to those of all the signatory and adherent states. 
the adhesion shall imply the full right of acceptance of all the obligations, and admission to all the advantages stipulated for in the present General Act. Article XXXVI. The present General Act shall be ratified with as short a delay as possible, and in no case shall that delay exceed a year. It shall come into force for each power on the date of its ratification by that power. Meanwhile the powers signatory to the present Act bind themselves to adopt no measure that shall be contrary to the provisions of the said Act. Each power shall send its ratification to the government of the German Empire, which undertakes to ratify the same to all the signatory powers of the present General Act. The ratifications of all the powers shall remain deposited in the archives of the government of the German Empire. When all the ratifications shall have been produced, a deed of deposit shall be drawn up in a protocol, which shall be signed by the representatives of all the powers that have taken part in the Berlin Conference. And a certified copy of it shall be sent to each of those powers. In consideration of which, the respective plenipotentiaries have signed the present General Act, and hereto affix their seals. Done at Berlin, February 26, 1885. Inasmuch as the Congo Free State starts with the sanction of all the leading powers of civilization, it assumes a dignity, at its very inception, which attaches to no other African dynasty. It is, or ought to be, beyond those jealousies which have torn, and are tearing, other possessions in Africa to pieces, and retarding their colonization and development. Further, the terms of its creation ought to assure it the united sympathy and combined energy of its patrons and founders. And these ought to be invincible within its magnificent boundaries for overcoming every obstacle to permanent sovereignty and commercial, industrial and moral development. But the spirit of comedy, which has made a Congo free state possible, might as well have rescued equatorial Africa, from ocean to ocean, from the rapacious grasp of the jealous and contending powers of Europe. True, something like a free belt has been recognized, extending to within a few miles of the eastern coast, and intended to secure an outlet for products which can be more advantageously marketed in that direction. Yet this is of no avail against projects designed to appropriate and control, politically and commercially, the immense sweep of country between the Congo Free State and Indian Ocean. It is rather an incentive to these powers to make haste in their work of appropriation and reduction, and they are at it with an earnestness which savors of the days when two Americas furnished the flesh for picking and the bone for angry contention. Great Britain, Portugal, Germany, Italy, are in clash about East African areas, protectorates, sovereignties, commercial interests, with the likelihood of further trouble, and such deep complications as arms only can simplify and relieve. Looking but a little into the future, one can catch a glimpse of the fate in store for East Africa. It is to be the grand political offset to the Congo Free State. This has been resolved upon by Great Britain, and its outlines are already mapped in her foreign policy. As matters stand, there is nothing to prevent the consummation of her designs. She has virtual possession of the eastern coast from Cape Colony to the mouth of the Zambezi. She has Egypt in her grasp, which means the Nile Valley from Alexandria to the Head Lakes, Victoria, Albert and Edward Nyanza, with their drainage systems. On the ocean side the power of the Sultan has been already limited to Zanzibar and adjacent islands, and it is now like the last flicker of a wasted candle. On the Zambezi, and north of it, up the Shire to Lake Nyasa, come the claims of Portugal. Portugal is weak, and a poor colonizer at that. She can be ousted by diplomacy or sat down upon by force. The German and Italian interests will eventually blend with those of Great Britain, or shape themselves into well-defined states, pledged to peace and anxious to be let alone. England is well equipped for this gigantic undertaking. She has an extensive South African and Egyptian experience. She has her experience in India, which she need but repeat in Africa to realize her dreams, or at least achieve more than would be possible with any other power. And then India is overpopulated. It might be that thousands, perhaps millions, of her people would swarm to African shores, where they would find a climate not unlike their own, and resources which they could turn to ready account. At any rate, England could enlist in India an army for the occupation of East Africa. 
Her Indian contingent in Egypt answered an excellent purpose, and redeemed the otherwise fatal campaign toward Khartoum. The business of establishing an internal economy in this new empire is easier for Great Britain than any other country. Her prestige means as much with native tribes as with the petty sovereignties of Europe, or the islands of the Pacific. Her shows of force are impressive, her methods of discipline effective. In the midst of opposition her hand is hard and heavy. A string of fortifications from the Zambezi to Cairo, with native garrisons, under control of English army officers, would inspire the natives with fear and assure their allegiance. The tact of her traders and the perseverance of her missionaries would bring about all else that might be necessary to create a thrifty and semi-Christian state. Our posterity will watch with interest the development of Africa through the agency of its Congo Free State on the west, and its imperial state on the east. The one contributing to the glory of all civilized nations, the other to that of a single nation, the one an enlargement of sovereignty, the other a concentration of it. One has for its inspiration the genius of freedom, the other the genius of force. One is a dedication to civilizing influences, the other is a seizure and appropriation in the name of civilization. We can conceive of the latter, under the impetus of patronage and of concentrated energy, supplemented by arbitrary power, taking the lead for a time, and maintaining it till its viceroyalties become centers of corruption and its subjects helpless peons. But in the end, the former will bound to the front, lifted by internal forces, which are free and virile, buoyed by a spirit of self-helpfulness and independence, sustained from without by universal sympathy and admiration. And from within by beings who have voluntarily consented and contributed to their progress and enlightenment, and are proud participants in their own institutions. The historian of a century hence will confirm or deny the above observations. If he confirms them, he will add that long experience proved the inutility of forcing our governments, usages and peoples on those of Africa without modification, and to the utter subordination of those which were native. But that, on the contrary, the best civilizing results were obtained by recognition of native elements, their gradual endowment with sovereignty, their elevation to the trusts which commerce and industry impose. It is time that our boasted civilization should show a conquest which is not based on the inferiority, wreck and extermination of the races it meets within its course. It has careered around the globe in temperate belts, stopping for nothing that came in its way, justifying everything by its superiority. Nature calls a halt in mid-Africa, and practically says, the agents of civilization are already here. Use them, but do not abuse. You can substitute no other that will prove either permanent or profitable. The Rescue of Emin In the fall of 1886, Stanley was summoned from the United States by the King of Belgium to come and pay him a visit. That monarch seems to have remembered what others had forgotten, that a European adventurer and a European project lay buried somewhere beneath the equator and in the very heart of the dark continent. Stanley responded to the king's invitation, and out of the interview which followed sprang a reason for his late and most memorable journey across equatorial Africa. But it was deemed wise to interest other agencies, and so the British Geographical Society was consulted and induced to lend a helping hand. In order to further nationalize the projected journey a commission was formed under whose auspices it was to take place. This enlisted for the moment the sympathies of the German peoples, for the lost one was a German. So grew up what came to be known as the Emin Bay Relief Committee, with headquarters at London, and with Sir William McKinnon as its secretary. And now, who is Emin Bay, or as he appears most frequently, Emin Pasha? What is there about his disappearance in the wilds of Africa that makes knowledge of his whereabouts and his rescue so desirable? What, of more than humanitarian moment, can attach to a journey planned as this one was? These questions are momentous, for they involve far more than mere men or mere projects of rescue. They involve the aims and ambitions of empires, the policies of dynasties, the destinies of future African states and peoples. That these things are true will appear from the answers which history makes to the above queries, a history which is aglow with events and attractive in its details. However little it may serve to reveal of the present plans of those who contribute most to its making. Emin Pasha was born in the Austrian province of Silesia, 
and the town of Oplin, in 1840, the same year as Henry M. Stanley. He studied medicine at Breslau, Königsberg and Berlin, and entered upon the world as a regular MD. With a diploma from the Berlin University. Sometime before the Russian-Turkish War he went to Constantinople and entered the Turkish army with the title of Bey, or Colonel. A taste for travel took him to the east where he acquired the Oriental languages. On his return we find him attached to the Imperial Ministry of Turkey, but only during part of the incumbency of Midhat Pasha, who, finding his ministry opposed to his ultra-hatred of Russia, dismissed it. Up to this time he was known as Diar. Edward, Edward, Schnitzer, that being the name of his parents, with the prefix of Colonel, or Bey as an affix. This was all as to outside knowledge of him. On his dismissal from the court at Constantinople he fled to Asia, and after many wanderings turned up at Swakim and finally at Khartoum, in Africa, where he made the acquaintance of that ill-starred and fatalistic English adventurer. General Gordon, then Governor-General of the Sudan, under English auspices. The general finding him an adventurer of attainments made him a storekeeper of his army, and upon ascertaining that he was an M.D., promoted him to the position of surgeon. In 1877 he was a practitioner of medicine at Lado, in southern Sudan. He afterwards became Surgeon General of Gordon's staff. In this capacity he served for four years. During this time he was engaged in making many valuable scientific researches and collections and in contributing interesting papers to European learned societies. He was also of great use to Gordon, who sent him to Uganda and Anyoro on diplomatic missions. In 1878, when General Gordon was made Governor-General of the Sudan by the British government, he raised Colonel Schnitzer to the rank of Governor of the province of Hat el Seva in southern Sudan. By this time the Mahdi had risen in the Sudan, and was confronting Gordon with his Mohammedan followers. To identify himself more fully with the Mohammedan people among which he had to live, Colonel Schnitzer abandoned his German name and took the Arabic one of Emin, the faithful one, and the full title of Pasha, general or governor. The scheme on the part of Gordon was to seize and hold the equatorial provinces of the Sudan, in the rear of the Mahdi's forces and thus introduce a military menace as well as make a political and moral diversion in favor of the cause he represented. Gordon gave him part of his own army, augmented by a large native force, and with this Emin Pasha took possession of his provinces far toward the equator, and abutting on the central lake system of the continent. For a time all went well with him. He proved a most indefatigable traveler, and showed special fitness to govern. He was familiar with the language of the Turks, Arabs, Germans, French and Italians, and acquired readily the dialects of the heathen tribes. On every side he displayed suavity, tact and genius. In 1879, he made an excursion to the western shore land of the Mordan, which till then had not been visited by white men. In 1880 he visited Makralaland, and planted many trading stations, thus enlarging his territory geographically and politically. In this expedition he located many important rivers, chief of which was the Kabali. In 1881 he pushed his explorations westward into the land of the powerful Nyam Nyams, and southward into the lands of the Monbudis, which tribes are types of the best physical and political strength in that part of Africa, west of the Nile sources. Thus Emin kept on increasing the extent and importance of his territory, and it came to be recognized as the best governed of any in the vast undefined domain of the Sudan. He found it infested with Arab slave dealers, who practiced all the barbarities of their kind, and much of his time was occupied in suppressing the nefarious traffic. He became the recognized foe of those who penetrated his domains to barter in human flesh, or if cupidity dictated, to burn, pillage and kill, in order that they might freight their dues with trophies of their cruelty. Though undefined east and west, his kingdom came to recognize Lado as its northern capital, and Wade Lai, on Lake Albert Nyanza, as its southern. The work of organizing his territory extended from 1878 to 1882. He had practically driven out the slave traders and converted a deficient revenue into a surplus for his government, conducting everything on the basis laid down by his superior, General Gordon and carrying out with the most marked success the plans of that noble enthusiast. 
He was fast making his territory semi-civilized when the Mahdi arose, led his hosts northward, massacred the army of Gordon, and finally made himself master of Khartoum and a great part of the Sudan. This was in 1882. The Egyptian garrisons throughout the southern Sudan were then abandoned to their fate, and the last attempt to save Khartoum ended with the death of General Gordon. During the years of bloodshed that followed, Emin remained at his post, his provinces entirely cut off from the world, and he himself neglected and left entirely to his own resources. He held at the time about 4,000 native and Egyptian troops under his command. He was completely surrounded by hostile tribes, but it is generally admitted that if he had chosen to leave behind him the thousands of helpless women and children and abandon the province to the merciless cruelties of the slave traders. He could easily have effected his escape either to the Congo or to the Zanzibar coast. But he determined to stay and to keep the equatorial provinces for civilization, if possible. The great work done by this brave and indefatigable German cannot be told here in detail. But he organized auxiliary forces of native soldiers. He was constantly engaged in warfare with surrounding tribes, he garrisoned a dozen river stations lying long distances apart. His ammunition ran low and he lacked the money needed for paying his small army. But in the face of manifold difficulties and dangers he maintained his position, governed the country well, and taught the natives how to raise cotton, rice, indigo and coffee, and also how to weave cloth and to make shoes, candles, soap and many articles of commerce. He vaccinated the natives by the thousand in order to stamp out smallpox, he opened the first hospital known in that quarter, he established a regular post route, with forty offices. He made important geographical discoveries in the basin of the Albert Nyanza Lake, and in many ways demonstrated his capacity for governing barbarous races by the methods and standards of European civilization. Murder, war and slavery were made things of the past, so that at last, the whole country became so safe that only for the wild beasts in the thickets, a man could have gone from one end of the province to the other. Armed with nothing more than a walking stick. A German writer said of him at the time, in his capital, Lado, where Dr. Schnitzer earlier resided, he arose every day before the sun. His first work was to visit the hospitals and care for the health of the people and the troops. After a day devoted to executive labors, a great part of the night would be spent in writing those essays on anthropology, ethnology, geography, botany, and the languages of the people dwelling in his province which have made his name famous as a scientific explorer. TN 1885 Emin had ten fortified stations along the Upper Nile, the most northern one being Lado, and the most southern one Wadelai. The latter place he made his capital for some time. His command at Wadelai then consisted of 1,500 soldiers, 10 Egyptians and 15 Negro officers. The rest were at the various stations on the Nile. He had ammunition to hold out until the end of 1886, and longer, he wrote, if the wild tribes did not make the discovery that he would be then entirely out of it. In 1887 he wrote, I am still holding out, and will not forsake my people. After that, letters were received from him in which he described his position as hopeful. In one of the last of these letters he wrote, The work that Gordon paid for with his blood I will strive to carry on according to his intentions and his spirit. For twelve long years I have striven and toiled and sown the seeds for future harvests, laid the foundation stones for future buildings. Shall I now give up the work because a way may soon open to the coast? Never. The successes of the Mahdi had isolated him entirely on the north. To the west and south were powerful tribes which, though not unfriendly, could offer him no avenue of escape. To the east were still more powerful peoples, once friendly but now imbued with the Mahdi's hatred of white men and their commercial and political objects. Chief of these were the Uganda, whose king, Tessa, had died in 1884, and had been succeeded by his son Wanga, a thorough Mahdiist and bitter against European innovation. Emin was therefore a prisoner. This was known in Europe in 1886, but how critical his situation was, no one could tell. It was natural to regard it as perilous, and it was hoped that the Egyptian government would take measures for his relief. 
the Cairo government did nothing except to give him the title of Pasha and to offer £10,000 to any expedition that might be sent to him. Many relief expeditions were then planned, but nothing came of them till the one at whose head Stanley was placed took shape. Where should such an expedition go? What should it do? It did not take long for the Wizard of Equatorial Travel to decide. Here might be opened a whole volume of controversy as to whether Stanley's mission in search of Emin was really humanitarian or not. The Germans who had the greatest interest in the safety of their fellow countrymen, refused to look on the expedition as other than a scheme to rid the southern Sudan of a Teutonic ruler in the interest of England. They regarded Emin as abundantly able to take care of himself for an indefinite time, and the event of his withdrawal as amounting to a confession that Germanic sovereignty was at an end in the lake regions of Central Africa. It cannot be ascertained now that Stanley entered upon the expedition for the relief of Emin Pasha in other than a humanitarian spirit, though he was backed by English capital. It is fair to presume that since he was invited to the ordeal by the Belgian king, whose exchequer was responsible for the greater part of the outlay, he went with perfectly disinterested motives. But be that as it may, he felt the delicacy of his task and, after having discovered the lost one, his interviews with him are models of diplomatic modesty and patience. On being placed in charge of the expedition by its projectors, Stanley naturally chose the Congo route into the heart of Africa, because he was familiar with it by his recent efforts to found the Congo Free State. And because it would give him a chance to review and refresh his labors in that behalf. If all things were as he had left them, he knew that a waterway traversable by steam was open for him to a point on the Congo opposite the habitation of Emin and distant but a few hundred miles. So May 11, 1887, found Stanley on the west coast of Africa ready to start inland. He did not collect his force and equipments at the mouth of the Congo, but made his way around the cataracts to Stanley Pool. There, at the station called Kinshasa everything was gathered for the upriver journey. Thence, the expedition embarked in three steamers, Lo Stanley, the large stern-wheeler belonging to the Congo Free State, towing the Florida which had just been put together by sections. Lo Stanley in Florida had on board about 300 men, mostly trained and armed natives, among whom were four English officers and several scientific gentlemen, besides a cargo of ammunition, merchandise and pack animals. The next steamer was the Henry Reed, a launch belonging to the American Baptist Missionary Union, and kindly loaned to Stanley for the purpose of transporting part of his force and equipments from Stanley Pool to his proposed camp on the Aruwimi. The other steamer was the Peace, placed at Stanley's disposal by the Reverend Holman Bentley, of the English Baptist Missionary Society, and of which a young missionary named Whiteley had charge. On their passage up the Congo, and after a sail of ten days a camp was formed at Bolobo, and left in charge of Captain Ward, who was deemed a proper person for the command on account of his previous knowledge of the natives. Always inclined to be more or less hostile at that point. Captain Ward had met Stanley below Stanley Pool and while he was performing his tedious journey around the cataracts. He thus describes the expedition on its march at the time of the meeting. In the front of Stanley's line was a tall Sudanese warrior bearing the Gordon Bennett yacht flag. Behind the soldier, and astride a magnificent mule, came the great explorer. Following immediately in his rear were his personal servants, Somalis, with their braided waistcoats and white robes. Then came Zanzibaris with their blankets, water bottles, ammunition belts and guns. Stalwart Sudanese soldiery, with great hooded coats, their rifles on their backs, and innumerable straps and leather belts around their bodies. Wagawali porters, bearing boxes of ammunition, to which were fastened axes, shovels and hose lines, as well as their little bundles of clothing, which were invariably rolled up in old threadbare blankets. At one point the whaleboat was being carried in sections, suspended from poles, which were each borne by four men. Donkeys laden with sacks of rice were next met, and a little further back were the women of Tipu Tib's harem, their faces concealed and their bodies draped in gaudily colored clothes. Here and there was an English officer. A flock of goats next came along, and then the form of Tipu Tib came into view as he strutted majestically along in his flowing Arab robes and large turban, carrying over his right shoulder a jewel-hilted sword. The emblem of office from the Sultan of Zanzibar. 
Behind him followed several Arab sheikhs, whose bearing was quiet and dignified. It was not the intention to hurry over the long stretch of water between Stanley Pool and the Aruwimi, but to make the trip by easy stages. Yet it was a trip involving great labor, for there being no coal, and the steamers being small, the work of wood cutting had to be done every night. The launches required as much wood for twelve hours steaming as thirty or forty men, laboring at night, could cut with their axes and crosscut saws. In some portions of the upper Congo where the shores are swampy for miles in width, the men were often compelled to wade these long distances before striking the rising forest land. And of course they had to carry the wood back to the steamers over the same tedious and dangerous routes. As has been stated, Stanley's objective was the mouth of the large river Aruwimi, which enters the Congo, a short distance below Stanley Falls, in lat one degree north. And whose general westward direction led him to think that by following it he would get within easy marches of Lake Albert Nyanza and thus into Emmons Dominions. On the arrival of the expedition at the mouth of the Aruwimi, an armed camp was formed at Yambunji and left in charge of the unfortunate Major Bartolot, and here a conference was awaited with the dual-hearted Arab, Tipu Tib, whom Stanley had recognized as ruler at Nyangwe, on the Congo, above Stanley Falls, and who was bound to him by the most solemn treaties. The wily chieftain came up in due time, and the interview was such as to engender serious doubts of his further friendship, notwithstanding his protestations. The occasion was a palaver, at the request of Major Bartolot. With a view to obtain some definite understanding as to the providing of the Manima porters whom Tipu Tib had promised Stanley he would supply in order that the rear guard might follow him up from the Aruwimi River to Wadelai. How the porters did not come up to time, how the commander of the rear guard was hampered with new conditions as to wait when the men did appear. And how the dreadful business ended in the assassination of Major Bartolot and the breaking up of the camp, will appear further on. The death of Mr. Jameson soon afterwards, at Ward's camp, on the Congo, a distressing sequel to the former tragedy, was in somber tone with the reports of Stanley's death which came filtering through the darkness at about the same time. The cloud which fell upon the Aruwimi camp seemed to spread its dark mantle over the entire expedition. Mr. Werner, in his interesting volume A Visit to Stanley's Rear Guard, gives a characteristic sketch of the Arab chief, and Mr. Werner was the engineer in charge of the vessel which took Major Bartolot part of the way on his last journey to the falls. After the light complexion of the other Arabs, he says, I was somewhat surprised to find Mr. Tipu Tib as black as any Negro I had seen, but he had a fine well-shaped head, bald at the top, and a short, black, thick beard thickly strewn with white hairs. He was dressed in the usual Arab style, but more simply than the rest of the Arab chiefs, and had a broad, well-formed figure. His restless eyes gave him a great resemblance to the Negro's head with blinking eyes in the electric advertisements of somebody's shoe polish which adorned the walls of railway stations some years ago, and earned him the nickname of Nubian. Blacking In June, 1887, Stanley started on his ascent of the unknown Aruwimi, and through a country filled with natives prejudiced against him by the Arab traders and friends of the Mahdi. His force now comprised five white men and 380 armed natives. His journey proved tedious and perilous in the extreme, and though he persevered in the midst of obstacles for two months, he was still 400 miles from Albert Nyanza. It was now found that the river route was impracticable for the heavier boats. At this point their troubles thickened. The natives proved hostile, and ingenious in their means of opposing obstructions to the further progress of the expedition. They refused to contribute provisions, and starvation stared the travelers in the face. For weeks their only food was wild fruit and nuts. To forage was to invite death, and to engage in open war was to court annihilation. Disease broke out, and it must have swept them all away but for the precautions which Stanley took to head off its ravages. As it was, the number was greatly reduced, and the men were weak, emaciated, in a state of panic, amid surrounding dangers and without spirit for further trials. Writing of this critical period, his letters say. What can you make of this, for instance? On August 17, 1887, 
all the officers of the rear column are united at Yambuya. They have my letter of instructions before them, but instead of preparing for the morrow's march, to follow our track, they decide to wait at Yambuya. Which decision initiates the most awful season any community of men ever endured in Africa or elsewhere? The results are that three quarters of their force die of slow poison. Their commander is murdered and the second officer dies soon after of sickness and grief. Another officer is wasted to a skeleton and obliged to return home. A fourth is sent to wander aimlessly up and down the Congo, and the survivor is found in such a fearful pest hole that we dare not describe its horrors. On the same date, 150 miles away, the officer of the day leads 333 men of the advance column into the bush, loses the path and all consciousness of his whereabouts, and every step he takes only leads him further astray. His people become frantic. His white companions, vexed and irritated by the sense of the evil around them, cannot devise any expedient to relieve him. They are surrounded by cannibals and poison-tipped arrows thin their numbers. Meantime I, in command of the river column, am anxiously searching up and down the river in four different directions, through forests my scouts are seeking for them, but not until the sixth day was I successful in finding them. Having now brought his different marching columns closer together, and loaded his sick in light canoes, he started on, intercepted continually by wild native raiders who inflicted considerable loss on his best men. Who had to bear the brunt of fighting as well as the fatigue of paddling. Soon progress by the river became too tedious and difficult, and orders were given to cast off the canoes. The land course now lay along the north bank of the Atura, amid dense forests, and through the despoiled lands which had been a stamping ground for Ugarawa and killing the Lango raiders. No grass land, with visions of beef, mutton and vegetables, were within a hundred miles of the dismal scene. For two weeks the expedition threaded the unknown tangle, looking out for ambuscades, warding off attacks, and braving dangers of every description. At length the region of the Dwaris was reached and a plantain patch burst into view. The hungry wayfarers plunged into it and regaled themselves with the roasted fruit, while the more thoughtful provided a store of plantain flour for the dreaded wilderness ahead. Another plunge was made into the trackless forest and ten days elapsed before another plantation was reached, during which time the smallpox broke out, with greater loss of life than any other enemy had as yet inflicted. Meanwhile they had passed the mouth of the Ihuru, a large tributary of the Atura, and were on the banks of the Ishuru. As there was no possibility of crossing this turbulent tributary, its right bank was followed for four days till the principal village of the Andakuma tribe was reached. It was surrounded by the finest plantation of bananas and plantains, which all the Menyima's habit of spoliation and destruction had been unable to destroy. There the travelers, after severe starvation during fourteen days, gorged themselves to such excess that it contributed greatly to lessen their numbers. Every twentieth individual suffered from some complaint which entirely incapacitated him for duty. From Andakuma, a six days march northerly brought them to a flourishing settlement, called Indiman. Here Stanley was utterly nonplussed by the confusion of river names. The natives were dwarfs. After capturing some of them and forcing answers, he found that they were on the right branch of the Ihuru River and that it could be bridged. Throwing a bridge across, they passed into a region wholly inhabited by dwarfs who proved very hostile. They are the Wambudi people, and such were their number and ferocity that Stanley was forced to change his northeast into a southeast course and to follow the lead of elephant tracks. They had now to pass through the most terrible of all their African experiences. Writing further of this trying ordeal, Stanley says. On the fifth day, having distributed all the stock of flour in camp, and having killed the only goat we possessed, I was compelled to open the officer's provision boxes and take a pound pot of butter, with two cupfuls of my flour, to make an imitation gruel, there being nothing else save tea, coffee, sugar, and a pot of sage in the boxes. In the afternoon a boy died, and the condition of the majority of the rest was most disheartening. Some could not stand, falling down in the effort to do so. These constant sights acted on my nerves until I began to feel not only moral but physical sympathy, as though the weakness was contagious. Before night a maddy carrier died. 
The last of our Somalis gave signs of collapse, and the few Sudanese with us were scarcely able to move. When the morning of the sixth day dawned, we made broth with the usual pot of butter, an abundance of water, a pot of condensed milk, and a cupful of flour for 130 people. The chiefs and Bonnie were called to a council. At my suggesting a reverse to the foragers of such a nature as to exclude our men from returning with news of the disaster, they were altogether unable to comprehend such a possibility. They believed it possible that these 150 men were searching for food, without which they would not return. They were then asked to consider the supposition that they were five days searching food, and they had lost the road, perhaps, or, having no white leader, had scattered to shoot goats and had entirely forgotten their starving friends and brothers in the camp. What would be the state of the 130 people five days hence? Bonnie offered to stay with ten men in the camp if I provided ten days' food for each person, while I would set out to search for the missing men. Food to make a light cupful of gruel for ten men for ten days was not difficult to procure, but the sick and feeble remaining must starve unless I met with good fortune. And accordingly a stone of buttermilk, flour, and biscuits were prepared and handed over to the charge of Bonnie. In the afternoon of the seventh day we mustered everybody, besides the garrison of the camp, ten men. Suddy, a Menyima chief, surrendered fourteen of his men to their doom. Kibaboras, another chief, abandoned his brother, and Fundai, another Menyima chief, left one of his wives and her little boy. We left twenty-six feeble and sick wretches already past all hope unless food could be brought them within twenty-four hours. In a cheery tone, though my heart was never heavier, I told the forty-three hunger-bitten people that I was going back to hunt for the missing men. We traveled nine miles that afternoon, having passed several dead people on the road, and early on the eighth day of their absence from camp we met them marching in an easy fashion, but when we were met the pace was altered. So that in twenty-six hours from leaving starvation camp we were back with a cheery abundance around us of gruel and porridge, boiling bananas, boiling plantains, roasting meat and simmering soup. This had been my nearest approach to absolute starvation in all my African experience. Altogether twenty-one persons succumbed in this dreadful camp. After twelve days' journey the party on November twelfth reached Abwairi. The Arab devastation, which had reached within a few miles of Ibwiri, was so thorough that not a native hut was left standing between Urgarava and Ibwiri. What the Arabs did not destroy the elephants destroyed, turning the whole region into a horrible wilderness. Stanley continues, our sufferings terminated at Ibwiri. We were beyond the reach of destroyers. We were on virgin soil, in a populous region, abounding with food. We, ourselves, were mere skeletons, reduced in number from 289 to but little more than half that number. Hitherto our people were skeptical of what we told them. The suffering had been so awful, the calamities so numerous, and the forests so endless, that they refused to believe that by and by we would see plains and cattle, the Nyanza, and Emin Pasha. They had turned a deaf ear to our prayers and entreaties for, driven by hunger and suffering, they sold their rifles and equipments for ears of Indian corn, deserted with their ammunition and became generally demoralized. Perceiving that mild punishment would be of no avail, I resorted to the death penalty, and two of the worst cases were hanged in the presence of all. We halted thirteen days at Ibwiri, reveling on fowls, goats, bananas, corn, yams, etc. The supplies were inexhaustible and our people glutted themselves with such effect that our force increased to 173 sleek robust men, one had been killed with an arrow. On November 24 the expedition started for Albert Nyanza, 126 miles distant. Given food, the distance seemed nothing. On December 1 an open country was sighted from the top of a ridge which was named Mpipisga. On the 5th the plains were reached and the deadly, gloomy forest left behind. The light of day now beamed all around, after 160 days of travel. They thought they had never seen grass so green or a country so lovely. The men could not contain themselves but leaped and yelled for joy, and even raced over the ground with their heavy burdens. On November 9, 1887, Stanley says, we entered the country of the powerful chief Mazamboni. 
The villages were scattered so thickly that no road except through them could be found. The natives sighted us, but we were prepared. We seized a hill as soon as we arrived in the center of a mass of villages, and built a zariba as fast as billhooks could cut the brushwood. The war cries were terrible from hill to hill, peeling across the intervening valleys. The people gathered in hundreds at every point, wore horns and drums announcing the struggle. After a slight skirmish, ending in our capture of a cow, the first beef we had tasted since we left the ocean, the night passed peacefully, both sides preparing for the morrow. Here Mr. Stanley narrates how negotiations with natives failed, Mazamboni declining a peace offering, and how a detachment of forty persons, led by Lieutenant Stairs, and another of thirty, under command of Mr. Jeffson, with sharpshooters, left the Zariba and assaulted and carried the villages, driving the natives into a general rout. The march was resumed on the twelfth and here were constant little fights. On the afternoon of the thirteenth, says Mr. Stanley, we sighted the Nyanza, with Cavalli, the objective point of the expedition. Six miles off I had told the men to prepare to see the Nyanza. They murmured and doubted, saying, why does the master continually talk this way? Nyanza indeed. When they saw the Nyanza below them, many came to kiss my hands. We were now at an altitude of 5,200 feet above the sea, with the Albert Nyanza 2,900 feet below, in 1 degree 20 minutes. The south end of the Nyanza lay largely mapped for about 6 miles south of this position and right across to the eastern shore. Every dent in its low, flat shore was visible, and traced like a silver snake on the dark ground was the tributary Lanilki, flowing into the Albert Nyanza from the southwest. After a short halt to enjoy the prospect, we commenced the rugged and stony descent. Before the rear guard had descended 100 feet the natives from the plateau poured after them, keeping the rear guard busy until within a few hundred feet of the Nyanza plain. We camped at the foot of the plateau wall, the aneroids reading 2,500 feet above the sea level. A night attack was made, but the sentry sufficed to drive our assailants off. We afterwards approached the village of Kakongo, situated at the southwest corner of Albert Lake. Three hours were spent by us in attempting to make friends, but we signally failed. They would not allow us to go to the lake, because we might frighten their cattle. They would not exchange the blood of brotherhood, because they never heard of any good people coming from the west side of the lake. They would not accept any present from us, because they did not know who we were, but they would give us water to drink, and would show us the road up to Nyam Sassi. From these singular people we learned that they had heard that there was a white man at Anyoro, but they had never heard of any white men being on the west side, nor had they ever seen any steamers on the lake. There was no excuse for quarreling. The people were civil enough, but they did not want us near them. We therefore were shown the path and followed it for miles. We camped about half a mile from the lake, and then began to consider our position with the light thrown upon it by conversation with the Kikongo natives. But, now he was in more of a quandary than ever. The lake was before him, but no sign of Emin nor any of his officials. Could he have failed to hear of Stanley's sacrifices in his behalf? The famished expedition looked in vain on that expanse of water for evidence of friendly flag or welcome steamer. It had left all its own boats behind, a distance of 190 miles, and was therefore helpless for further search. This should not be, and so with his accustomed heroism, Stanley resolved on a return march to Kalinga for boats. It was a hard, quick journey, occupying weeks, for the distance was great. Writing of his fatigue and disappointment on his arrival at Lake Albert Nyanza, Stanley says. My couriers from Zanzibar had evidently not arrived, or Emin Pasha, with his two steamers. Would have paid the southwest side of the lake a visit to prepare the natives for our coming. My boat was at Kalingalonga, 190 miles distant, and there was no canoe obtainable. To seize a canoe without the excuse of a quarrel, my conscience would not permit. There was no tree anywhere of a size sufficient to make canoes. Wade Lai was a terrible distance off for an expedition so reduced. We had used five cases of cartridges in five days fighting on the plain. 
a month of such fighting must exhaust our stock. There was no plan suggested that was feasible, except to retreat to Abwairi, build a fort, send the party back to Kalingalanga for a boat, store up every load in the fort not conveyable, leave a garrison in the fort to hold it. March back to Albert Lake, and send a boat in search of Emin Pasha. This was the plan which, after lengthy discussions with the officers, I resolved upon. The most pathetic part of this eventful history is the fact that Emin had really received Stanley's messages, had been surprised at his coming to rescue him, and had made an effort to meet him on some likely point on the lake. But having failed had returned to his southern capital, Wade Lai, on the Nile outlet of the lake. During the time so spent by the expedition the outside world was filled with rumors of the death of Stanley, either by disease or at the hands of the natives. These reports would always be followed by some favorable report from the expedition, not authentic, but enough to give hope that the hardy explorers were safe and continuing their way across the continent. Occasionally, too, during the first part of the trip, couriers would arrive at the coast from Stanley announcing progress, but, as they advanced, no further communications were received. And the expedition was swallowed up in the jungles and vast forests of Central Africa. Putting his plans for a return into execution, Stanley had to fight his way from the shores of the lake to the top of the plateau, for the Kakongo natives were determined he should not pass back the way he had come. He was victorious with a loss of one man killed and one wounded. The plateau gained, he plunged westward by forced marches, and by January 7, 1888, was back at Abwairi. After a few days' rest there, he dispatched Lt. Stairs with 100 men to Kalinga to bring up the boats. On his return with the boats, he was sent to Ugarawas to bring up the convalescents. Stanley now fell sick and only recovered after a month of careful nursing. It was now April 2d, and he again started for the lake, accompanied by Jefferson and Park, Nelson being left in command at the post, now Fort Bodo, with a garrison of 43 men. On April 26, he was again in Mazamboni's country, who, after much solicitation was induced to make blood brotherhood with Stanley. Strange to say every other chief as far as the lake followed his example, and every difficulty was removed. Food was supplied in abundance and gratis, and the gracious natives, expert in the art of hut building, prepared in advance the necessary shelter for night. When within a day's march of the lake, Natives came up from Cavalli saying that a white man had given their chief a note done up in a black packet and that they would lead Stanley to him if he would follow. He replied, he would not only follow but make them rich, for he did not doubt that the white man was Emin Pasha. The next day's march brought them to Chief Cavalli, who handed Stanley a note from Emin Pasha done up in black American oil cloth. It was to the effect that as there had been a native rumor that a white man had been seen at the south end of the lake, he, Emin, had gone thither in a steamer but had been unable to obtain reliable information. The note further begged Stanley to remain where he was till Emin could communicate with him. The next day, April 23d, Stanley sent Jefferson with a strong force to take the boat of the expedition to Lake Nyanza. On the 26th the boat crew sighted Mawa Station, the southernmost station in Emin's boundaries. There Jefferson was hospitably received by the Egyptian garrison. On April 29, Stanley and his party again reached the bivouac ground on the plateau overlooking the lake, where they had encamped before, and at 5 p.m., they sighted the Khedive steamer, seven miles away on the lake, steaming up towards them. By 7 p.m., the steamer arrived opposite the camp, and shortly afterwards, Emin Pasha, Sr. Karate and Jefferson came to Stanley's headquarters where they were heartily welcomed. The next day Stanley moved his camp to a better place, three miles above Nyam Sassi, and Emin also moved his camp thither. The two leaders were together, in frequent consultation, till May 25th. The Pasha was surrounded by two battalions of regulars, besides a respectable force of irregulars, sailors, artisans, clerks and servants. How different, in many respects, was the situation from what Stanley expected. He found Emin Pasha in the midst of plenty and unwilling to be rescued. He found his own forces jaded with travel, on the eve of starvation, and anxious to be rescued. He found, moreover, a prince in his own equatorial empire, 
who looked with jealous eyes on the relief expedition. In one of his, Emmons, letters dated April 17, 1888, he declared that he had no intention to give up his work in Africa and had determined to await Stanley's coming at Wadeley. In another letter he expressed himself very decidedly to the effect that he did not wish his province to come under English suzerainty. He was evidently of the opinion that the British government in sending out Stanley had its eyes on his province with a view to eventually incorporating it with the Sudan, should the Anglo-Egyptians succeed in re-establishing authority at Khartoum. The same idea gradually forced itself to acceptance in Europe, and, as we know, the German government later became no less anxious to get into communication with Emin in the hope of preventing him from making any arrangement with England. It was not therefore such a meeting as took place years before between Stanley and Livingstone, at a Gigi on the banks of Lake Tanganyika. Long interviews followed which did not impress Stanley with the fact that his expedition was to be a success, so far as getting Emin out of the country was concerned. Altogether, said Emin, if I consent to go away from here we shall have eight thousand people with us. His principal desire seemed to be that Stanley should relieve him of about one hundred of his Egyptian soldiers, with their women and children. He said he was extremely doubtful of the loyalty of the first and second battalions. It was this interview which Stanley announced to the world of civilization by way of the Congo route. The situation was most delicate. He could not urge upon the ruler of an empire to flee from his dominions, he could not even ask one who seemed to be in the midst of peace and plenty, to desert them for the hardships of a long journey to the coast. He could only impress on him in a modest way the objects of the expedition and the propriety of his taking advantage of its presence to effect an escape from dangers which were thickening every hour, and which must ere long take shape in a descent upon him by the ever-increasing hordes of the Mahdi. These representations were of no avail and Stanley left him on May 25, leaving with him Jefferson and five of his carriers. In return Emin gave Stanley 105 of his regular Mahdi native porters. In 14 days Stanley was back at Fort Bodo, where he found Captain Nelson and Lieutenant Stairs. The latter had come up from Ugarawas, 22 days after Stanley had set out for the lake, bringing along, alas! Only sixteen out of fifty-six men. All the rest had perished on the journey. Stairs brought along the news that Stanley's twenty couriers, by whom he had sent word to Bartolot at Yambuna, had passed Ugarawas on their way to their destination, on March 16. Fort Bodo was in excellent condition on Stanley's arrival, and enough ground had been placed under cultivation to ensure a sufficient amount of corn for food. On June 16 he left Fort Bodo with 111 Zanzibaris and 101 of Emin Sudanese, for Kilona, where he arrived on June 24, pushing on, he arrived at Ugarawas on July 19. While this backward journey was performed rapidly and without serious hindrance, it was to end in sorrow. Ugarawas was found deserted, its occupants having gathered as much ivory as they could, and passed down the river in company with Stanley's couriers. Stanley made haste to follow, and on August 10 came up with the Ugarawa people in a flotilla of 57 canoes. His couriers, now reduced to 17 in number, related awful stories of hairbreadth escapes and tragic scenes. Besides the three which had been slain, two were down with wounds, and all bore scars of arrow wounds. A week later they were all down to Bunalala, where Stanley met his friend, Diar. Bonnie, at the stockade, and inquired for Major Bartolot, who, it will be recollected, was left in charge of Stanley's rear guard at Yambuna, with orders to secure food and carriers from Tipu Tib. Stanley asked. Well, my dear Bonnie where's the Major? He is dead, sir, shot by Emanuema, about a month ago, replied Bonnie. Good God, I cried, and Jameson. He has gone to Stanley Falls to try to get more men from Tipu Tib. And Troop. Troop has gone home invalid. Well, where is Ward? Ward is at Bangala. Heaven alive. Then you are the only one here. Yes, sir. Without loss of further time, Stanley hastened down to Yambuna, only to find the sad story too, too, true. Bartolot and his entire caravan had been destroyed, 
and the officers left in charge of the station had fled panic-stricken down the river with all the supplies of the station. Stanley complained greatly of this desertion, yet proceeded to do the best he could to reprovision the fort and recuperate his men. He remained long enough to study the situation, and it was sad in the extreme as it gradually unfolded in his mind. His governor of Stanley Falls and the Congo beyond, the Arab Tipu Tib, was evidently working in the interest of the Mahdi, in violation of his oath and most solemn covenants. Though proof of his open hostility was wanting, Stanley strongly suspected him of conspiring to bring about the massacre of Bartolot's caravan, in July, 1888, with a view of preventing his, Stanley's, return to the Albert Nyanza. Evidence of a widespread conspiracy to rid the entire equatorial section of its European occupants was also found in the fact that the destruction of Bartolot's caravan antedated but a month the uprising in Emin Pasha's provinces. The desertion of him by his army in his deposition from power and final imprisonment, the details of which are given hereafter. Yet with these fierce fires of conspiracy crackling about him in the depths of the African forest, Stanley thought more of others than himself. He resolved to hasten back to the lake to rescue Emin from a danger which must by this time have become plain to him, even if it had not already crushed him. He worked his force by relays till the Ituri ferry was reached. Here he expected to hear from Emin. Disappointment increased his fears, and he resolved to rid himself of all encumbrance and resort to forced marches. He therefore established a camp at the Ituri ferry and left stairs in command with 124 people. With the rest he forced his way across the plains, the natives being the same as those with which he had engaged in desperate conflict on previous journeys. But now they were quite changed in spirit, and instead of offering him opposition they were anxious to make blood brotherhood with him. They even constructed the huts of his camps and brought food, fuel and water as soon as the sites were pitched upon. With all this kindness and sociability of the natives, not a word could be gathered from them of the state of affairs on the Albert Nyanza. At length, January 16, 1889, at a station called Gaviras, a message was received from Cavalli, on the southwest side of the lake. It was a letter from Jefferson, with two confirmatory notes from Emin, and conveyed the startling intelligence, that a rebellion had broken out, in the previous August, in Emin's dominions, and that the Pasha had been made a prisoner. The rebellion had been gotten up by some half-dozen of the Egyptian officers, and had been augmented by the soldiers at Labor, though those of other stations had remained faithful. Then the letter goes on to warn Stanley to be careful on his arrival at Cavalli, and continues in the following pitiful strain. When the Pasha and I were on our way to regaff two men, one an officer, Abdul Vol Effendi, and the other a clerk, went about and told the people they had seen you, and that you were only an adventurer, and had not come from Egypt. That the letters you had brought from the Khedive and Nubar were forgeries, that it was untrue Khartoum had fallen. And that the Pasha and you had made a plot to take them, their wives and their children out of the country and hand them over as slaves to the English. Such words in an ignorant, fanatical country like this acted like fire among the people, and the result was a general rebellion and we were made prisoners. The rebels then collected the officers from the different stations and held a large meeting here to determine what measures they should take. And all those who did not join the movement were so insulted and abused that they were obliged for their own safety to acquiesce in what was done, the Pasha was deposed and those officers suspected of being friendly to him were removed from their posts. And those friendly to the rebels were put in their places. It was decided to take the Pasha as a prisoner to Regaf, and some of the worst rebels were even in for putting him in irons. But the officers were afraid to put their plans into execution, as the soldiers said they would never permit anyone to lay a hand on him. Plans were also made to entrap you when you returned and strip you of all you had. Things were in this condition when we were startled by the news that the Mahdi's people had arrived at Lado with three steamers and nine sandals and nuggers, and had established themselves on the site of the old station. Omar Sali, their general, sent up three peacock dervishes with a letter to the Pasha demanding the instant surrender of the country. The rebel officers seized them and put them into prison, and decided on war. After a few days the Mahdiists attacked and captured Regaf, 
killing five officers and numbers of soldiers and taking many women and children prisoners, and all the stores and ammunition in the station were lost. The result of this was a general stampede of the people from the stations of Biddon Kiri and Muddy, who fled with their women and children to Labor, abandoning almost everything. At Kiri the ammunition was abandoned and was seized by natives. The Pasha reckons that the Mahdiists number about 1500. The officers and a large number of soldiers have returned to Mugi and intend to make a stand against the Mahdiists. Our position here is extremely unpleasant, for since the rebellion all is chaos and confusion. There is no head and half a dozen conflicting orders are given every day, and no one obeys. The rebel officers are wholly unable to control the soldiers. The Boris have joined the Mahdiists. If they come down here with a rush, nothing can save us. The officers are all frightened at what has taken place and are anxiously awaiting your arrival, and desire to leave the country with you, for they are now really persuaded that Khartoum has fallen, and that you have come from the Khedive. We are like rats in a trap. They will neither let us act nor retire, and I fear, unless you come very soon, you will be too late, and our fate will be like that of the rest of the garrisons of the Sudan. Had this rebellion not happened, the Pasha could have kept the Mahdiists in check some time, but now he is powerless to act. I would suggest, on your arrival at Kavalis, that you write a letter in Arabic to Shukri Aga, chief of the Mswa station, telling him of your arrival, and telling him that you wish to see the Pasha and myself. Write also to the Pasha or myself, telling us what number of men you have with you. It would, perhaps, be better to write me, as a letter to him might be confiscated. Neither the Pasha nor myself think there is the slightest danger now of any attempt to capture you, for the people are now fully persuaded that you are come from Egypt, and they look to you to get them out of their difficulties. Still it would be well for you to make your camp strong. If we are not able to get out of the country, please remember me to my friends, etc. Yours faithfully, Jeffson. To this letter were appended two postscripts, the first dated November 24, 1888. It ran. Shortly after I had written you, the soldiers were led by their officers to attempt to retake Regaf, but the Mahdiists defended it, and killed six officers and a large number of soldiers. Among the officers killed were some of the Pasha's worst enemies. The soldiers in all the stations were so panic-stricken and angry at what happened that they declared they would not attempt to fight unless the Pasha was set at liberty. So the rebel officers were obliged to free him and send him to Wadalai, where he is free to do as he pleases, but at present he has not resumed authority in the country. He is, I believe, by no means anxious to do so. We hope in a few days to be at Tunguru Station, on the lake, two days steamer from Sabe, and I trust when we hear of your arrival that the Pasha himself will be able to come down with me to see you. We hear that the Mahdiists sent steamers down to Khartoum for reinforcements. If so, they cannot be up here for another six weeks. If they come up here with reinforcements, it will be all up with us, for the soldiers will never stand against them, and it will be a mere walkover. Everyone is anxiously looking for your arrival, for the coming of the Mahdiists has completely cowed them. We may just manage to get out if you do not come later than the end of December, but it is entirely impossible to foresee what will happen. Jeffson in a second postscript, dated December 18, says. Mogo, the messenger, not having started, I send a second postscript. We were not at Tunguru on November 25th. The Mahdiists surrounded Duffel Station and besieged it for four days. The soldiers, of whom there were about 500, managed to repulse them, and they retired to Regaf, their headquarters, as they have sent down to Khartoum for reinforcements, and doubtless will attack again when strengthened. In our flight from Wadelai the officers requested me to destroy our boats and the advances. I therefore broke it up. Duffel is being renovated as fast as possible. The Pasha is unable to move hand or foot, as there is still a very strong party against him, and his officers no longer in immediate fear of the Mahdi. Do not on any account come down to us at my former camp on the lake near Kavali Island, but make your camp at Kavali, on the plateau above. Send a letter directly you arrive there, and as soon as we hear of your arrival I will come to you. 
will not disguise facts from you that you will have a difficult and dangerous work before you in dealing with the Pasha's people. I trust you will arrive before the Mahdiists are reinforced, or our case will be desperate. Yours faithfully, signed, Jeffson. Imagine the effect of such word as this on one who stood almost alone in the midst of a continent, without power to face the disciplined forces of the Mahdi, and with no open line of retreat. The best he could do for the moment was write an assuring letter and dispatch it to the Nyanza as quickly as possible, pushing on after it to Cavalli. With Stanley, to resolve was to act. He accordingly sent word to Jeffson that he need have no anxiety on his, Stanley's, account for he was in the midst of natives who were not only friendly but ready to fight for him. That on his arrival at Cavalli he would be in a condition to rescue Emin and his attendants, and that every inducement must be brought to bear on him to come southward on the lake with his command, if not still held prisoners. On Stanley's arrival at Cavalli, he again wrote, under date of January 18, 1889. And this letter, together with those which followed, reveals a situation quite as embarrassing as the former one had been, for still Emin seemed to be unaware of his danger. Stanley's letter read. Cavalli, January 18, 3 o'clock p.m. My dear Jeffson, I now send thirty rifles and three Cavalli men down to the lake with my letters with my urgent instructions that a canoe should be sent off and the bearers be rewarded. I may be able to stay longer than six days here, perhaps ten days. I will do my best to prolong my stay until you arrive without rupturing the peace. Our people have a good store of beads and courier's cloth, and I noticed that the natives trade very readily, which will assist Cavalli's resources should he get uneasy under our prolonged visit. Should we get out of this trouble I am his most devoted servant and friend but if he hesitates again I shall be plunged in wonder and perplexity. I could save a dozen pashas if they were willing to be saved. I would go on my knees and implore the pasha to be sensible of his own case. He is wise enough in all things else, even for his own interests. Be kind and good to him for his many virtues, but do not you be drawn into the fatal fascination the Sudan territory seems to have for all Europeans in late years. As they touch its ground they seem to be drawn into a whirlpool which sucks them in and covers them with its waves. The only way to avoid it is to blindly, devotedly, and unquestioningly obey all orders from the outside. The committee said. Relieve Emin with this ammunition. If he wishes to come out the ammunition will enable to do so. If he elects to stay it will be of service to him. The Khedive said the same thing and added that if the Pasha and his officers wished to stay, they could do so on their own responsibility. Sir Evelyn Baring said the same thing in clear, decided words, and here I am after 4,100 miles travel with the last installment of relief. Let him who is authorized to take it, take it and come. I am ready to lend him all my strength and will assist him, but this time there must be no hesitation, but positive yea or nay, and home we go. Yours sincerely, Stanley. In the course of his correspondence Mr. Stanley says, on February 6 Jeffson arrived in the afternoon at our camp at Cavalli. I was startled to hear Jeffson, in plain, undoubting words, say, sentiment is the Pasha's worst enemy. No one keeps Emin back but Emin himself. This is the summary of what Jeffson learned during the nine months from May 25, 1888, to February 6, 1889. I gathered sufficient from Jeffson's verbal report to conclude that during nine months neither the Pasha, Kasadi, nor any man in the province had arrived nearer any other conclusion than what was told us ten months before. However, the diversion in our favor created by the Mahdiists' invasion and the dreadful slaughter they made of all they met inspired us with hope that we could get a definite answer at last. Though Jeffson could only reply, I really can't tell you what the Pasha means to do. He says he wishes to go away, but will not move. It is impossible to say what any man will do. Perhaps another advance by the Mahdiists will send them all pell-mell towards you, to be again irresolute and requiring several weeks' rest. Stanley next describes how he had already sent orders to mass the whole of his forces ready for contingencies. He also speaks of the suggestions he made to Emin as to the best means of joining him, insisting upon something definite, otherwise it would be his, Stanley's, 
duty to destroy the ammunition and march homeward. It seems that Stanley's letters were beginning to have weight with Emin, and that he was coming to think it cruel to subject his followers to further danger, whatever opinion he entertained of his own safety. So on the morning of February 13, 1889, Stanley was rejoiced to receive in his camp on the plateau above Cavalli, at the hands of a native courier, a letter from Emin Pasha himself, which announced his arrival at Cavalli. But let the letter speak for itself. Sir, in answer to your letter of the seventh inst. I have the honor to inform you that yesterday I arrived here with my two steamers, carrying a first lot of people desirous to leave this country under your escort. As soon as I have arranged for a cover for my people, the steamers have to start from Swa Station to bring on another lot of people. Awaiting transport with me are some twelve officers, anxious to see you, and only forty soldiers. They have come under my orders to request you to give them some time to bring their brothers from Wade Lai, and I promise them to do my best to assist them. Things having to some extent now changed, you will be able to make them undergo whatever conditions you see fit to impose upon them. To arrange these I shall start from here with officers for your camp, after having provided for the camp, and if you send carriers I could avail me of some of them. I hope sincerely that the great difficulties you had to undergo and the great sacrifices made by your expedition on its way to assist us may be rewarded by full success in bringing out my people. The wave of insanity which overran the country has subsided, and of such people as are now coming with me we may be sure. Permit me to express once more my cordial thanks for whatever you have done for us. Yours, Emin. Thus the two heroes of African adventure came together on the west shore of the lake which marked the southern boundary of Emin Pasha's influence. It was a trying meeting for both. Stanley was firm in his views and true to the objects of his mission. Emin was still divided between his desire to save all of his followers who were willing to go, and his sense of obligation to those who chose to remain behind. In a modified form his convictions, expressed in April, 1887, still held. He then said. The work that Gordon paid for with his blood I will strive to carry on, if not with his energy and genius, still according to his intentions and in his spirit. When my lamented chief placed the government of this country in my hands, he wrote to me, I appoint you for civilization and progress sake. I have done my best to justify the trust he had in me. And that I have to some extent been successful and have won the confidence of the natives is proved by the fact that I and my handful of people have held our own up to the present day in the midst of hundreds of thousands of natives. I remain here as the last and only representative of Gordon's staff. It therefore falls to me, and is my bounden duty, to follow up the road he showed us. Sooner or later a bright future must dawn for these countries. Sooner or later these people will be drawn into the circle of the ever-advancing civilized world. For twelve long years have I striven and toiled, and sown the seeds for future harvest, laid the foundation stones for future buildings. Shall I now give up the work because a way may soon open to the coast? Never. As if anticipating the end, Stanley had already begun to call in the detachments of his expedition. On February 18th Lt. Stairs arrived at Cavalli with his strong column from the remote Aturi. Meanwhile negotiations were going on daily with Emin. The force he had brought up the lake consisted of himself, Salim Bey, seven other officers, and sixty-five people. Salim Bey became the spokesman for both Stanley and Emin. He had just achieved a victory over the Mahdi's forces by recapturing Duffel, killing 250 of the enemy and lifting the restraints from Emin, himself. At length, on February 18, the date of the arrival of Lt. Stairs, Salim, at the head of a deputation, announced to Stanley a request on the part of Emin that he, Stanley, allow all the equatorial troops and their families to assemble at Cavalli. In reply Stanley explained fully the object of his expedition, and offered to remain at Cavalli for a reasonable time in order to give Emin's forces an opportunity to join him. Salim and his deputation retired satisfied, saying they would proceed at once to Wade Lai and begin the work of transportation. They started on February 26. On the 27th, Emin returned to Cavalli with his little daughter, Farida, and a caravan of 144 men. 
he and Stanley agreed that twenty days would be a reasonable time in which to gather all the people and movables at Cavalli. These twenty days were necessary to Stanley's comfort, too, for much sickness had prevailed among his forces, and now, under the ministrations of Surgeon Park, his active force had been raised from two hundred to two hundred and eighty men. The refugees from Wadeli soon began to pour into Cavalli. They were a mixture of soldiers, their wives and children, loaded with promiscuous camp effects, most of which was practically rubbish, entailing great labor in handling, and nearly all of which would have to be abandoned on the subsequent march. Stanley saw the result of all this accumulation and on March 16 issued orders to stop bringing the stuff to his camp. But 1355 loads had already arrived, enough to embarrass the march of ten times such a force as was then in camp. At this time Stanley was gratified by a report from Salim announcing that the rebellious soldiers and officers at Wadeli, and all of the people there, were anxious to depart for Egypt under his escort. But while this was true of Wadeli, it was not true of Cavalli, for Stanley discovered a conspiracy among the promiscuous gathering there. Which took the shape of a concerted attempt on the part of Emin's Egyptian soldiers to steal the arms of Stanley's Zanzibaris, and stir up general mutiny. Knowing that while Emin had been praised for personal bravery and at the same time condemned for laxity of discipline, and seeing that such a state of affairs would be fatal, both in getting a start and in prosecuting a long march, Stanley decided on immediate and resolute action. Forming his own men, armed with rifles, into a square on the plateau, he ordered all of the Pasha's people into it. Those who refused to go, he arrested and forced in, or had them placed in irons and flogged. They were then questioned as to their knowledge of the conspiracy, but all denied having had anything to do with it. Then all who desired to accompany Stanley were asked by Emin to stand aside. They were told that the condition upon which they could go was that of perfect obedience to Stanley's orders as their leader, and that extermination would speedily follow the discovery of any further tricks. They promised a most religious obedience. This muster revealed the fact that Emin's followers numbered 600 people, necessitating the enlistment of 350 new carriers. The entire number now ready for the march was 1,500 persons. But on May 7, Stanley received an intercepted letter from Salim Bey which stated that the rebels at Wade Lai had changed their mind, risen in mutiny, and robbed the loyal forces of all their ammunition. They also asked with the greatest effrontery that Stanley be called before them and questioned as to his future objects before they consented to go with him. The letter in addition contained hints of a plot to attack and capture his expedition in case he started without giving them satisfaction. Instantly Stanley assembled all the officers in his camp and asked them if they felt he would be justified in remaining there after April 10. They all replied in the negative. Going to Emin, he said, their Pasha, you have your answer. We march on the 10th. Emin asked whether they could acquit him in their consciences for abandoning his people, alluding to those who had not yet arrived from Wade Lai. Stanley replied that they could most certainly do so, as to all who had not arrived by the 10th. All of Stanley's accounts of this part of his expedition bear evidence of trouble with Emin. He still trusted the rebellious soldiers, even those who had agreed to leave for Egypt. He mistrusted Stanley's ability to reach Zanzibar with so numerous a caravan, on account of a lack of food. He had left many valuable servants behind, whom he desired to take along, but he said, they are unwilling to accompany me. This opened Stanley's eyes. He says, it now became clear that the Pasha had lost his authority at Wade Lai, however obstinately he clung to his belief in his forces there. May 10 came and Stanley started with his immense expedition for the sea, his objective being Zanzibar, on the east coast of Africa. He had promised Emin to march slowly for a few days in order to give Salim, with such servants and stragglers as he might bring along, an opportunity to overtake them, but he never saw them more. To pursue a route eastward from Albert Nyanza was impracticable, for the powerful Anyoro and Uganda tribes lay in that direction. These and other tribes had been infected with the Mahdi spirit, and would therefore prove hostile. He therefore chose a route in a southerly direction, till the extreme southern waters of Victoria Nyanza had been rounded, when he would be on the natural lines running from Zanzibar into the interior. 
Besides, this would bring him through nearly 400 miles of practically undiscovered country. Zanzibar, the objective point of the journey, is on an island of the same name, 20 miles from the east coast of Africa, and in latitude 6 degrees south. It is a Mohammedan town of 30,000 people, with many good houses and mosques. Though the soil is excellent and prolific of fruits and vegetables, the town depends for its prosperity on trade and commerce. When the slave trade was driven from the Atlantic coast of Africa, it found its way to the eastern, or Pacific coast, and flourished in a manner never before known. Zanzibar, always notorious as a slave depot, became the recognized headquarters of the horrid traffic, and rapidly rose to a position of great wealth and influence. Her slave market attracted the notice and excited the disgust and indignation of strangers of every creed and country. Nothing could be more revolting than sight of the Arabic purchasers of slaves examining the build, the eyes, the teeth, and all the physical qualities of the victims offered for sale in the marts. Tens of thousands of slaves were known to pass through Zanzibar annually on their way to various parts of Egypt and Turkey. On the appearance of British cruisers on the coast, with orders to capture and condemn all slave dows, the Sultan of Turkey prohibited the traffic at Zanzibar. But this only diverted its course. The next step was to induce the Sultan to issue a general proclamation, prohibiting the trade in all places on the coast, under his authority. This was done in 1876. The result has been a considerable diminution of the infamous traffic, which can now only be carried on by a system of smuggling, which incurs much risk. Zanzibar is the most important starting point for travelers and missionaries destined for Central Africa, and is a depot for such supplies as may be needed from time to time. From every point of view his route was well chosen. Skirting the Anyoro country, he fell under their displeasure and became the victim of a fierce attack, which he parried successfully. This opened his way for a considerable distance along the ranges of mountains which pass under the general name of the Belegas. These mountains rise to the immense height of 18,000 to 19,000 feet, and their summits are capped with snow. The huts of the natives were visible on their sides at altitudes of 8,000 feet. During their 19 marches along the base of these ranges, their severest obstacle was the Semliki River, a bold stream, 100 yards wide, whose crossing was rendered doubly difficult by the Warasmas natives. They formed an ambuscade, from which they delivered a single volley at the travelers, but fortunately it proved ineffective. It did not take much of a demonstration to put them to flight. After a march of 113 days the southern waters of Victoria Nyanza were reached. From this point Stanley sent letters to the coast stating that his objective was now Mpwapwa, 230 miles inland, whither provisions should be sent. This was done, and an armed escort was furnished him by German officials thence to the coast, at Bagamoyo, opposite Zanzibar, where the expedition arrived about December 1, 1889. Then steamer was taken to Zanzibar, where the hero of the expedition, together with Emin Pasha, and all the officials, were received with open arms, fates and acclamations. Telegrams of congratulations poured in from crowned heads, and all parts of the world. A sample from Queen Victoria types them all. London, December 12th. My thoughts are after you and your brave followers, whose hardships and dangers are at an end. I again congratulate you all, including the Zanzibaris, who displayed such devotion and fortitude during your marvelous expedition. I trust Emin Pasha is making favorable progress. One drawback to all these exultations at Zanzibar was the fact that Emin Pasha, after escaping all the tribulations of the wilderness, had fallen from the piazza of his hotel at Bagamoyo, on December 5, and received injuries of an alarming nature. The sad announcement of this clouded the occasion somewhat, and gave a tone of melancholy to what would have been unmixed gratulation. In reply to a cablegram from the Emperor of Germany, Stanley said, December 7. Imperator E.D. Rex. My expedition has now reached its end. I have had the honor to be hospitably entertained by Major Weissman and other of Your Majesty's officers under him. Since arriving from Papua, our travels have come to a successful conclusion. We have been taken across from Bagamoyo to Zanzibar by Your Majesty's ship Spurburn Schwalb, 
and all honors coupled with great affability, have been accorded us. I gratefully remember the hospitality and princely affability extended to me at Potsdam, and profoundly impressed with Your Majesty's condescension, kindness and gracious welcome. With a full and sincere heart I exclaim, Long live the noble Emperor William! And writing for the general public, he says. Over and above the happy ending of our appointed duties, we have not been unfortunate in geographical discoveries. The Aruwimi is now known from its source to its bourne. The great Congo forest, covering as large an area as France and the Iberian Peninsula, we can now certify to be an absolute fact. The mountains of the moon this time, beyond the least doubt, have been located, and Ruwenzori, the cloud king, robed in eternal snow, has been seen and its flanks explored, and some of its shoulders ascended. Mounts Gordon Bennett and McKinnon Cones being but giant sentries warding off the approach to the inner area of the Cloud King. On the southeast of the range the connection between Albert Edward Nyanza and the Albert Nyanza has been discovered, and the extent of the former lake is now known for the first time. Range after range of mountains has been traversed, separated by such tracts of pasture land as would make your cowboys out west mad with envy. And right under the burning equator we have fed on blackberries and bilberries, and quenched our thirst with crystal water fresh from snow beds. We have also been able to add nearly 6,000 square miles of water to Victoria Nyanza. This has certainly been the most extraordinary expedition I have ever led into Africa. A veritable divinity seems to have hedged us while we journeyed. I say it with all reverence. It has impelled us whither it would, effected its own will, but nevertheless guided and protected us. I gave as much goodwill to my duties as the strictest honor would compel. My faith that the purity of my motive deserved success was firm, but I have been conscious that the issues of every effort were in other hands. Not one officer who was with me will forget the miseries he has endured, yet everyone that started from his home destined to march with the advance column and share its wonderful adventures is here today, safe, sound and well. This is not due to me. Lieutenant Stairs was pierced with a poisoned arrow like others, but others died and he lives. The poison tip came out from under his heart eighteen months after he was pierced. Jeffson was four months a prisoner, with guards with loaded rifles around him. That they did not murder him is not due to me. These officers have had to wade through as many as seventeen streams and broad expanses of mud and swamp in a day. They have endured a sun that scorched whatever it touched. A multitude of impediments have ruffled their tempers and harassed their hours. They have been maddened with the agonies of fierce fevers. They have lived for months in an atmosphere that medical authority declared to be deadly. They have faced dangers every day, and their diet has been all through what legal serfs would have declared to be infamous and abominable, and yet they live. This is not due to me any more than the courage with which they have borne all that was imposed upon them by their surroundings or the cheery energy which they bestowed to their work or the hopeful voices which rang in the ears of a deafening multitude of blacks and urged the poor souls on to their goal. The vulgar will call it luck. Unbelievers will call it chance, but deep down in each heart remains the feeling, that of verity, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in common philosophy. I must be brief. Numbers of scenes crowd the memory. Could one but sum them into a picture it would have grand interest. The uncomplaining heroism of our dark followers, the brave manhood latent in such uncouth disguise, the tenderness we have seen issuing from nameless entities, the great love animating the ignoble. The sacrifice made by the unfortunate for one more unfortunate, the reverence we have noted in barbarians, who, even as ourselves, were inspired with nobleness and incentives to duty, of all these we would speak if we could, but I must end with. Thanks be to God for ever and ever. This letter is characteristic of Stanley. The hardships of his journey will fade from memory, but its successes will become historic. He has made the dark continent dark no longer. To him and his undaunted comrades the world owes a debt of gratitude it will be difficult to repay. The vast tracts of hitherto unknown wilderness through which he traveled will stimulate the enterprise of the pioneer, and the day is not far distant, within the lifetime of our children's children. Perhaps, 
when the shrill echo of the engine's whistle will be heard on the rugged sides of snow-capped mountains which Stanley has explored. When those illimitable forests will resound with the woodman's axe, and when the law of commerce will change the tawny native from a savage into a self-respecting citizen. Barbarism will retire from its last stronghold on the planet, as the darkness disappears when the sun rises over the hilltops. The dire distresses of his long journey, begun two and a half years ago, are beyond the reach of language. He merely hints at some of them and leaves the rest to the imagination. We ponder his pathetic references to the sturdy loyalty of companions and followers, maddened with the agonies of fierce fevers, falling into their graves through the subtle poison with which the natives tipped their arrows and spears. Bravely fighting their way through interminable swamps only to succumb at last, and the conviction steals over us that such a story has never been told before and may never be told again. He rescued Emin and his comrades, who were, in daily expectation of their doom, then turned his face southward, made various and important explorations on his way. And at last came within speaking distance of the millions who followed him from the hour he entered the mouth of the Congo with a solicitude which no other man of our time has commanded. It would not do to close any account of Stanley's brilliant career without noting the fact that Emin Pasha, in one of his last published letters, written after he was beyond all danger from Mahdi vengeance in African climate, fully acknowledges the value of the aid sent him, and makes it clear that his hesitation at availing himself of it was due to that high sense of duty which had gained him the name of Emin, or the faithful one. The last and most trusted of Gordon's lieutenants, he regarded it as his, bounden duty, to follow up the road the general showed him. And it must have been a wrench to tear himself away from the life-work to which he had in a measure consecrated himself, to see the labors of years thrown away, and all his endeavors come to naught. But it could not be helped under the circumstances, and Emin, like many before him, has had to succumb to the force of fate. And so ends for the present the attempt to civilize the equatorial provinces of Egypt. The ruler of Egypt has formally renounced them, Gordon is dead, and his trusted lieutenant has at last thrown up the sponge. It has been a strange and eventful story, in which the heroes have been of the race which has done so much for the regeneration of the dark places of the world. For a time the dark and turbid waves of ignorance, of slavery, and of cruelty will roll back over this part of the dark continent and pessimists will say that nothing more can be done. But it is only for a time. The day will surely come when the dreams of Gordon and of Emin will become actual realities, and when that time comes we may be sure that the name of Henry M. Stanley will be remembered and honored. Egypt and the Nile The historic approach to the Dark Continent is by way of storied Egypt and its wonderful river, the Nile. In making this approach we must not forget the modern commercial value of the route from Zanzibar, pursued by Stanley, 1871-72, while hastening to the rescue of Dr. Livingstone, the great English explorer, nor of that other, by way of the Congo, which bids fair to prove more direct and profitable than any thus far opened. It was an enterprise as bold as any of those undertaken by hardy mariners to rescue their brother sailors who had met shipwreck while striving to unfold the icy mysteries which surround the North Pole. And, unlike many of these, it was successful. The two great explorers shook hands in October 1871, at Ajiji, on the banks of Lake Tanganyika, in the very heart of the great forest and river system of Africa, and amid dark-skinned, but not unkind, strangers, who constitute a native people as peculiar in all respects as their natural surroundings. We mention this because it was a great achievement in the name of humanity. Livingstone had started on this, his last, exploring tour in 1866, and had been practically lost in African wilds for nearly four years. But it was a greater achievement in the name of science and civilization, for it not only proved that, the Dark Continent, was more easily traversable than had been supposed. But it may be set down as the beginning of a new era in African exploration. In all ages Africa has been a wonderland to the outside world. As the land of Cush, in Bible story, it was a mystery. It had no bounds, but was the unknown country off to the south of the world where dim legend had fixed the dark races to work out a destiny under the curse laid upon the unfortunate Ham. 
Even after Egypt took somewhat definite meaning and shape in Hebrew geography as the land of Mizraim, or the land of Ham, all else in Africa was known vaguely as Ethiopia, marvelous in extent. Filled with a people whose color supported the Hamitic tradition, wonderful in animal, vegetable and mineral resources. Thence came Sheba's queen to see the splendors of Solomon's court, and thence emanated the long line of Candaces who rivaled Cleopatra in wealth and beauty and far surpassed her in moral and patriotic traits of character. In olden times the gateway to Africa was Egypt and the Nile. As an empire, history furnishes nothing so curious as Egypt, as a river nothing so interesting as her Nile. We may give to the civilization of China and India whatever date we please, yet that of Egypt will prove as old. And then what a difference in tracing it! That of China and India rests, with a few exceptions, on traditions or on broken crockery tablets and confused shreds of ruins. That of Egypt has a distinct tracery in monuments which have defied the years, each one of which is a book full of grand old stories. We can read today, by the light of huge pillar and queer hieroglyphic, back to Menes, the first Egyptian king, and to Abydus, the oldest Egyptian city, and though the period be 4,500 years before Christ, scarcely a doubt arises about a leading fact. There was wealth then, art, civilization, empire, and one is ever tempted to ascribe to Egypt the motherhood of that civilization which the Hebrew, Indian, Etruscan, Persian, Roman, Greek and Christian, carved into other shapes. Says the learned Diar. Henry Brugsch Bay, who has spent thirty years among Egyptian monuments and who has mastered their inscriptions, literature, the arts, and the ideas of morality in religion, so far as we know, had their birth in the Nile Valley. The alphabet, if it was constructed in Phoenicia, was conceived in Egypt, or developed from Egyptian characters. Language, doubtless, is as old as man, but the visible symbols of speech were first formulated from the hieroglyphic figures. The early architecture of the Greeks, the Doric, is a development of the Egyptian. Their vases, ewers, jewelry and other ornaments, are copies from the household luxury of the pharaohs. The influence of Egypt on the Hebrew race has a profound interest for the whole Christian world. Let the time of Abraham be fixed at 1900 BC. The Great Pyramid of Egypt, built by the first pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, had then been standing for 1,500 years. Egypt had a school of architecture and sculpture, a recorded literature, religious ceremonies, mathematics, astronomy, music, agriculture, scientific irrigation, the arts of war, ships, commerce, workers in gold, ivory, gems and glass. The appliances of luxury, the insignia of pride, the forms of government, the indices of law and justice, two thousand years before the father of the faithful was born. And longer still before the fierce Semitic tribes of the desert gave forth their Hebrew branch, and placed it in the track of authentic history. In the Bible we read of the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. In the prayer of King Cunitan, dating long before any biblical writing, we find a clear recognition of one God, and a reaching out of the soul after him, embraced in a language without parallel for beauty of expression and grandeur of thought. Ages before the giving of the law on Sinai and the establishment of the Hebrew ceremonial worship, the Book of the Dead, with its high moral precepts, was in the possession of every educated Egyptian. The Jews went out of Egypt with a pure Semitic blood, but with a modified Semitic language. They carried with them in the person of their great leader, Moses, all the wisdom of the Egyptians. This is shown by their architecture, religious customs, vestments, persistent kindred traditions. Both Moses and Jesus were of the race whose early lessons were received with stripes from Egyptian masters. The hieroglyphical writings of Egypt contain the possibilities of Genesis, the Iliad, the Psalms, the Aeneid, the Inferno, and Paradise Lost. In the thought that planned the Hall of Columns upon the Nile, or sculptured the Rock Temple of Ammon, was involved the conception of Solomon's Temple, the Parthenon, St. Peter's, Westminster Abbey, and every sacred fane of Europe and America. Therefore, travel and exploration in this wonderful land, the remote but undoubted source of letters, morals, sciences and arts, are always interesting. Thebes, Memphis, Zoantanus, Pedum, Tini, Philae, 
Bubastis, Abidus, are but as fragments of mighty monuments, yet each discloses a story abounding in rich realities and more striking in its historic varieties than ever mortal man composed. But for the powerful people that made the Nile Valley glow with empire, but for the tasteful people that made it beautiful with cities and monuments, but for the cultured people that wrote on stone and papyrus, were given to costly ceremonies. And who dreamed of the one God, the Israelites would have recrossed the Isthmus of Suez, or the Red Sea, without those germs of civilization, without those notions of Jehovah, which made them peculiar among their desert brethren. And saved them from absorption by the hardy tribes of Arabia and Syria. In going from Europe across the Mediterranean to Egypt, you may think you can sail directly into one of the mouths of the Nile, and ascend that stream till the first cataract calls a halt. But neither of the great mouths of the Nile give good harbors. Like those of our own Mississippi, they are narrow and exposed by reason of the deposits they continually carry to the sea. The two main mouths of the Nile, it has had several outlets in the course of time, are over a hundred miles apart. The western, or Rosetta, mouth was once the seat of a famed city from whose ruins were exhumed, 1799, the historic Rosetta Stone, now in the British Museum. It was found on the site of a temple dedicated by Necho II. To Tum, the setting sun. And the inscription itself, written in three kinds of writing, Greek, hieroglyphic, and in choreal, or running hand, was a decree of the Egyptian priests assembled in synod at Memphis in favor of Ptolemy Epiphanes. Who had granted them some special favor. Its great value consisted in the fact that it afforded a safe key to the reading of the hieroglyphical writings found on all Egyptian monuments. The eastern, or Damietta, mouth of the Nile gives a better harbor, but the boats are slow. Beyond this is Port Said, where you can enter the ship canal across the Isthmus of Suez and pass to the Red Sea. But you are not now in the Egypt you seek. There are no verdant meadows and forests of date palms and mulberry, which give to the interior of Lower Egypt, covered with numerous villages and intersected by thousands of canals, the picturesque character of a real garden of God. You only see a vast sandy plain, stretching on either side of the canal. It is a sea of sand with here and there little islands of reeds or thorny plants, white with salty deposits. In spite of the blue sky, the angel of death has spread his wings over this vast solitude where the least sign of life is an event. Speaking of canals, reminds one that this Suez Canal, 100 miles long, and built by M. De Lesseps, 1858-1869, was not the first to connect the waters of the Red Sea with the Mediterranean. One was projected B.C. 610 by Pharaoh Necho, but not finished till the time of Ptolemy Philadelphus, which ran from the Red Sea to one of the arms of the Nile. It was practically out of use in the time of Cleopatra. The best Mediterranean port of Egypt is Alexandria, the glory of which has sadly departed. It is far to the west of the Rosetta mouth of the Nile, but is connected by rail with Cairo. Though founded 330 BC. By Alexander the Great, conqueror of Egypt, as a commercial outlet, and raised to a population, splendor and wealth unexcelled by any ancient city, it is now a modern place in the midst of impressive ruins. Its mixed and unthrifty population is about 165,000. As you approach it you are guided by the modern lighthouse, 180 feet high, which stands on the site of the Great Light of Pharos, built by Ptolemy II, 280 BC. And which weathered the storms of sixteen centuries, lighting the sea for forty miles around. It was of white marble and reckoned as one of the seven wonders of the world. Standing in the streets of Alexandria, what a crowd of historic memories rush upon you. You are in Lower Egypt, the delta of the Nile, the country of the old pharaohs whose power was felt from the Mediterranean to the mountains of the moon, whose land was the black land. Symbol of plenty among the tribes of Arabia and throughout all Syria, land where the Hebrews wrought and whence they fled back to their home on the Jordan, land of the Grecian Alexander, the Roman Caesar, the Mohammedan Caliph. No earthly dynasty ever lasted longer than that of the pharaohs. We hardly know when time began it, but Brugge dates it from Menes, BC 4400. It fell permanently with Alexander's conquest, 330 BC. 
and was held by his successors, the Greek Ptolemies, for three hundred years, or until the Romans took it from Cleopatra, whose name is perpetuated in the famous Cleopatra's Needles, which for nearly two thousand years stood as companion pieces to Pompey's pillar. The pillar of Pompey, 195 feet high, still stands on high ground southeast of the city, near the Moslem burial place. But the needles of Cleopatra are gone. Late investigations have thrown new light on these wonders. They were not made nor erected in honor of Cleopatra at all, but were historic monuments erected by the pharaoh, Thutmese III, 1600 BC, at Heliopolis, City of the Sun. The two largest pair were, centuries ago, transported, one to Constantinople, the other to Rome. The two smaller pair were taken to Alexandria by Tiberius and set up in front of Caesar's temple, where they obtained the well-known name of Cleopatra's Needles. One fell down and, after lying prostrate in the sand for centuries, was taken to London in 1878 and set up on the banks of the Thames. It is 68 feet high, and was cut out of a single stone from the quarries of Syene. The other was taken down and transported to New York, where it is a conspicuous object in Central Park. They bear nearly similar inscriptions, of the time of Thutmese III. And Ramesses II. Egypt fell into the hands of the Saracen invaders in A.D. 625, and has ever since been under Mohammedan or Turkish rule. The Alexandria of the Ptolemies with its half-million people, its magnificent temples, its libraries and museums, its learning and art, its commerce for all the world, has lost all its former importance. And is today a dirty trading town filled with a mixed and indolent people. There is no chapter in history so sweeping and interesting as that which closed the career of Alexandria to the Christian world. It was the real center of Christian light and influence. Its bishops were the most learned and potential, its schools of Christian thought the most renowned. It was in commerce with all the world and could scatter influences wider than any other city. It had given the Septuagint version of the Bible to the nations. All around, it had made converts of the Coptic elements, which were native, and Egypt's natural defenders in case of war. But these it had estranged. Therefore the Saracen conquest was easy. Pelusium and Memphis fell. Alexandria was surrounded, and fell A.D. 640. I have taken, says Amru, the great city of the west with its four thousand palaces, four thousand baths, four hundred theatres, twelve thousand shops, and forty thousand Jews. Amru would have spared the great library of seven hundred thousand volumes. But the caliphs, Omars, answer came, these books are useless if they contain only the word of God, they are pernicious if they contain anything else. Therefore destroy them. Aside from the monuments above mentioned, there is little else to connect it with a glorious past except the catacombs on the outskirts, which are of the same general character as those at Rome. These catacombs possess a weird interest wherever they exist. They abound in one form or another in Egypt, and are found in many other countries where, for their extent and curious architecture, they rank as wonders. Those lately unearthed in the vast necropolis of Memphis, and called the Serapian, were the burial place of the Egyptian god Apis, or Serapis, the supreme deity represented by the bull Apis. This sacred bull was not allowed to live longer than twenty-five years. If he died before that age, and of natural causes, he was embalmed as a mummy and interred in the Serapian with great pomp. Otherwise, he was secretly put to death and buried by the priests in a well. In the Serapian are some magnificent sarcophagi in granite, and inscriptions which preserve the Egyptian chronology from 1400 BC to 177 BC. The great catacombs at Rome were the burial places of the early Christians. It was supposed they were originally the quarries from which the building stone of the city had been taken. But while this is true of the catacombs of Paris, it is now conceded that those of Rome were cut out for burial purposes only, less perhaps to escape from the watchfulness of despotic power. Then in obedience to a wish to remain faithful to the traditions of the early church which preserved the Jewish custom of rock or cave sepulture. These catacombs are of immense and bewildering proportions. 
Their leading feature is long galleries, the sides of which are filled with niches to receive the remains. At first these galleries were on a certain level, 20 to 30 feet below the surface. But as space was required, they were cut out on other levels, till some of the galleries got to be as much as 300 feet below the surface. There are some attempts at carving and statue work about the remains of illustrious persons, and many inscriptions of great historic value, but in general they have been much abused and desecrated. And we are sorry to say chiefly by Christian peoples, mostly of the time of the Crusades, who found, or supposed they would find, rich booty, in the shape of finger rings and other precious things laid away with the dead. Macfarlane, in his book Upon the Catacombs, tells of a company of gay young officers of the French army who entered them on a tour of inspection. They had plenty of lights, provisions, wine and brandy, and their exploration became a revel. They finally began to banter one another about venturing furthest into the dark labyrinthine recesses. One, as impious as he was daring, refused to leave the crypts till he had visited all. Darting away, torch in hand, he plunged into gallery after gallery, until his torch began to burn low and the excitement of intoxication left him. With great difficulty he found his way back to the chapel where he had left his companions. They were gone. With still greater difficulty he reached the entrance to the catacomb. It was closed. He shouted frantically, and madly beat upon the railings with a piece of tombstone. But it was night and no one could hear. In desperation he started back for the chapel. He fell through a chasm upon crackling, crumbling bones. The shock to his nerves was terrible. Crawling out, he reached the chapel, amid intolerable fear. He who had many a time marched undauntedly on gleaming lines of bayonets and had schooled himself to look upon death without fear, was not equal to the trials of a knight in a charnel house. His thirst became intolerable. He stumbled upon a bottle left by his companions and, supposing it contained water, drank eagerly of its contents. In a few moments the drink acted with violence and, in his delirium, he became the victim of wild visions. Spectres gathered around him. The bones of the dead rose and clattered before him. Fire gleamed in eyeless skulls. Fleshless lips chattered and shrieked till the caves echoed. Death must soon have been the result of this fearful experience had not morning come and brought fresh visitors to the catacombs, who discovered the young officer in a state of stupor and took him to the hospital. For months he lay prostrate with brain fever. He had been taught the weakness of man in that valley of the shadow of death, and ever after gave over his atheistic notions, and lived and died a Christian. You may leave Alexandria by canal for the Nile, and then sail to Cairo. You will thus see the smaller canals, the villages, the peasantry, the dikes of the Nile, the mounds denoting ruins of ancient cities. You will see the wheels for raising water from the Nile by foot power, and will learn that the lands which are not subject to annual overflow must be irrigated by canals or by these wheels. You will see at the point where the Nile separates into its Damietta and Rosetta branches, the wonderful barrage, or double bridge, intended to hold back the Nile waters for the supply of Lower Egypt without the need of water wheels. It is a mighty but faulty piece of engineering and does not answer its purpose. From this to Cairo the country gets more bluffy and, ere you enter the city, you may catch glimpses of the pyramids off to the right. But the speediest route from Alexandria is by rail. You are soon whirled into the Moslem city. Cairo is not an ancient city, though founded almost on the site of old Egyptian Memphis. It is Saracen, and was then Cahira, Cairo, city of victory, for it was their first conquest under Omar, after they landed and took Pelusium. It was greatly enlarged and beautified by Saladin after the overthrow of the Caliphs of Baghdad. It dates from about AD 640. It is a thickly built, populous, population 327,000, dirty, noisy, narrow street, city on the east bank of the Nile. Its mosques, houses, gardens, business, people, burial places, manners and customs, tell at a glance of its Mohammedan origin. Its mosques are its chief attraction. They are everywhere, and some of them are of vast proportions and great architectural beauty. 
The transfer of the Mamluk power in Egypt to the present Khedives was brought about by Muhammad Ali, an Albanian. The Mamluks were decoyed into the citadel at Cairo and nearly all murdered. One named Imam Bey escaped by leaping on horseback from the citadel. He spurred his charger over a pile of his dead and dying comrades, sprang upon the battlements. The next moment he was in the air, another, and he released himself from his crushed and bleeding horse amid a shower of bullets. He fled, took refuge in the sanctuary of a mosque, and finally escaped into the deserts of the Thebaid. The scene of this event is always pointed out to travelers. It is a city divided into quarters, the European Quarter, Coptic Quarter, Jewish Quarter, Water Carriers Quarters, and so on. The narrow streets are lined with bazaars, little stores or markets, and thronged by a mixed populace, veiled ladies, priests in robes, citizens with turbaned heads, peddlers with trays on their heads, beggars without number, desert Bedouins. Dervishes, soldiers, boatmen and laborers. Abraham sent Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac. Matrimonial agents still exist in Cairo in the shape of katibis, or betrothers. They are women, and generally sellers of cosmetics, which business gives them opportunity to get acquainted with both marriageable sons and daughters. They get to be rare matchmakers, and profit by their business in a country where a man may have as many wives as he can support. Your sleep will be disturbed by the mezahar who goes about the city every morning to announce the sunrise, in order that every good Moslem may say his prayers before the luminary passes the horizon. There is no end to the drinking troughs and fountains. Joseph's well, discovered and cleaned out by Saladin, is one of the leading curiosities. It is three hundred feet deep, cut out of the solid rock, with a winding staircase to the bottom. West of the Nile and nearly opposite Cairo, is the village of Guise, on the direct road to the pyramids, mention of which introduces us to ancient Egypt and the most wonderful monuments in the world. Menes, the constant, reigned at Tini. He built Memphis, on part of whose site Cairo now stands, but whose center was further up the Nile. The Egyptian name was Menifer, the good place. The ruins of Memphis were well preserved down to the 13th century, and were then glowingly described by an Arab physician, Latif. But the stones were gradually transported to Cairo, and its ruins reappeared in the mosques and palaces of that place. Westward of the Nile, and some distance from it, was the necropolis of Memphis, its common and royal burying ground, with its wealth of tombs. Overlooked by the stupendous buildings of the pyramids which rose high above the monuments of the noblest among the noble families who, even after life was done, reposed in deep pits at the feet of their lords and masters. The contemporaries of the 3rd, 3966 BC to 3766 BC, 4th, 3733 BC to 3600 BC, and 5th, 3566 BC to 3333 BC. Dynasties are here buried and their memories preserved by pictures and writings on the walls of their chambers above their tombs. This is the fountain of that stream of traditions which carries us back to the oldest dynasty of that oldest country. If those countless tombs had been preserved entire to us, we could, in the light of modern interpretation, read with accuracy the genealogies of the kings and the noble lines that erected them. A few remaining heaps enable us to know what they mean and to appreciate the loss to history occasioned by their destruction. They have served to rescue from oblivion the fact that the pharaohs of Memphis had a title which was, King of Upper and Lower Egypt. At the same time he was, Paris, of the Great House, written Pharaoh in the Bible. He was a god for his subjects, a lord par excellence, in whose sight there should be prostration and a rubbing of the ground with noses. They saluted him with the words, His Holiness. The royal court was composed of the nobility of the country and servants of inferior rank. The former added to dignity of origin the graces of wisdom, good manners, and virtue. Chiefs, or scribes carried on the affairs of the court. The monuments clearly speak of Sanafru, of the Third Dynasty, BC 3766. A ravine in the Memphian necropolis, where are many ancient caverns, contains a stone picture of Sanafru, who appears as a warrior striking an enemy to the ground with a mighty club. The rock inscriptions mention his name, 
with the title of Vanquisher of Foreign Peoples, who in his time inhabited the cavernous valleys in the mountains round Sinai. The pharaohs of the fourth dynasty were the builders of the hugest of the pyramids. The tables discovered at Abydos make Khufu the successor of Sinafu. Khufu is the Cheops of the historian Herodotus. His date was 3733 BC. No spirited traveler ever sets foot on the black soil of Egypt, without gazing on that wonder of antiquity, the threefold mass of the pyramids on the steep edge of the desert, an hour's ride over the long causeway extending out from Gais. The desert's boundless sea of yellow sand, whose billows are piled up around the gigantic pyramids, deeply entombing the tomb, surges hot and dry far up the green meadows and mingles with the growing grass and corn. From the far distance you see the giant forms of the pyramids, as if they were regularly crystallized mountains, which the ever-creating nature has called forth from the mother soil of rock, to lift themselves up towards the blue vault of heaven. And yet they are but tombs, built by the hands of men, raised by King Khufu, Cheops, and two other pharaohs of the same family and dynasty, to be the admiration and astonishment of the ancient and modern world. We speak now of the three largest, there are six others in this group, and twenty-seven more throughout the Nile Valley. They are perfectly adjusted to points of the compass, north, south, east and west. Modern investigators have found in the construction, proportions and position of the Great Pyramid especially, many things which point to a marvelous knowledge of science on the part of their builders. If the half they say is true of them, there are a vast number of lost arts to discredit modern genius. Some go so far as to trace in their measurements and construction, not only prophecy of the coming of Christ, but chart of the events which have signalized the world's history and are yet to make it memorable. They base their reasoning on the fact that there was no architectural model for them and no books extant to teach the science requisite for their construction, that their height and bases bear certain proportions to each other. And to the diameter of a great circle, that they are on the line of a true meridian, that certain openings point to certain stars, and so on till ingenuity is exhausted. The three large pyramids measure thus. Pyramid. Height. Feet. Breadth of. Base, feet. Khufu, Cheops. Great. 450.75. 746. Kafra. Second. 447.5. 690.75. Menkara. Third. 203. 352. 88. As soon as a pharaoh mounted the throne he gave orders to a nobleman, master of all the buildings, to plan the work and cut the stone. The kernel of the future edifice was raised on the limestone rock of the desert in the form of a small pyramid built in steps. Its well-constructed and finished interior formed the king's eternal dwelling, with his stone sarcophagus lying on the stone floor. Let us suppose this first building finished while the king still lived. A second covering was added on the outside of the first, then a third, then a fourth, and so the mass of the giant building grew greater the longer the king lived. Then at last, when it became almost impossible to extend the area of the pyramid further, a casing of hard stone, polished like glass, and fitted accurately into the angles of the steps, covered the vast mass of the king's sepulchre. Presenting a gigantic triangle on each of its four faces. More than seventy of such pyramids once rose on the margin of the desert, each telling of a king, of whom it was at once the tomb and the monument. At present the Great Pyramid is, externally, a rough, huge mass of limestone blocks, regularly worked and cemented. The top is flattened. The outside polished casing, as well as the top, has been removed by the builders of Cairo, for mosques and palaces, as have many of the finest ruins on the Nile. The Sphinx was sculptured at some time not far removed from the building of the three great pyramids. Recent discoveries have increased the astonishment of mankind at the bulk of this monstrous figure and at the vast and unknown buildings that stood around it and, as it were, lay between its paws. It is within a few years that the sand has been blown away and revealed these incomprehensible structures. In a well nearby was found a finely executed statue of Khafra, builder of the second pyramid. 
There are other sphinxes, but this at the base of the Great Pyramid is the largest. It has a man's head and a lion's body, and is supposed to represent the kingly power of the sun god. Its length is 140 feet, and height 30 feet. Between its paws is an altar, to which you ascend by a long flight of steps. The Arabs call it, the fatherly terror. In the middle, chamber of the dead, of Menkara's pyramid was found his stone sarcophagus and its wooden cover, both beautifully adorned in the style of a temple. They were taken out and shipped for England, but the vessel was wrecked, and the sarcophagus now lies at the bottom of the Mediterranean. The lid was saved and is now in the British Museum. On it is carved a text or prayer to Osiris, king of the gods, O Osiris, who hast become king of Egypt, Menkara living eternally, child of heaven, son of the divine mother, heir of time, over thee may she stretch herself and cover thee. Thy divine mother, in her name as mystery of heaven. May she grant that thou shouldst be like God, free from all evils, King Menkara, living eternally. The prayer is not uncommon, for parts of it have been found on other monuments. Its sense is, delivered from mortal matter, the soul of the dead king passes through the immense spaces of heaven to unite itself with God, after having overcome the evil which opposed it on its journey through earth. The entrance to the Great Pyramid was formerly quite concealed, only the priests knowing where to find the movable stone that would admit them. But now the opening is plain, and is about forty-five feet from the ground on the north side. Thence there is a descent through a narrow passage for three hundred and twenty feet into the sepulchral chamber. The passage is much blocked and difficult. The great red granite sarcophagus is there, empty and broken, mute receptacle of departed greatness, for which the relic hunter has had quite too little respect. With the end of the fifth dynasty pyramid building ceased. The glory of Memphis departed and went to Thebes, where kingly vanity seems to have sought outlet in the temple architecture whose ruins are the wonder of the world. Above the old site of Memphis, is Tura, and out on its desert side are the pyramids of Saqqara, eleven in number. The most remarkable is the Steppe Pyramid, believed to be more ancient than those of Guise. But there is something even more wonderful here, the Temple of Serapis, which it took four years to disengage from the sands of the desert after its site was discovered. It seems to have been dedicated to Serapis, the sacred bull of Egypt. Beneath it is a great catacomb where once laid the remains of thousands of sacred bulls. Their stone coffins are still there, cut out of solid blocks of granite, and measuring fourteen feet long by eleven feet high. Further up the Nile are the high limestone cliffs of Gebeli Titer, on which perches the Coptic, convent of the Puli. The monks who live here are great beggars. They let themselves down from the cliff and swim off to a passing boat to ask alms in the name of their Christianity. The next town of moment is Sayav, capital of Upper Egypt. It stands on the site of ancient Lycopolis, Wolf City, and is backed in by lofty cliffs, from which the views are very fine. Further up is Gurge, whence you must take journey on the back of donkeys to Abydus, off eastward on the edge of the desert. Here was the most ancient city of this, Ortini, where Mina reigned, on whose ruins Abydus was built, itself an antiquity in wonder. Here is the great temple begun by Seti I and completed by his son Ramesses II. 1333 BC Ramesses II. Was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Its roof, pillars, and walls are all preserved, and the chiseling on the latter is something marvelous. What renders it doubly interesting is, the name of the sculptor is preserved. His name was High, and he must have been a man of decided genius, for his picture of the king and son taming the bull is quite spirited. In this temple is also the celebrated sculpture called the Table of Abydus, which gives a list of sixty-five kings, from Menes down to the last king of the Twelfth Dynasty, a period of 2,166 years. It is a most invaluable record and has done much to throw light on Egyptian history. It was discovered in 1865. Abydus then, or Tini, was the starting point of Egyptian power and civilization, as we now know it. Here was the first dynasty of the pharaohs, transferred afterwards to Memphis where the pyramids became their monuments, retransferred to Thebes where the temples chronicled their greatness and grandeur. Old as Thebes is, Abydus is older, and Tini older still. 
most carefully has the temple at Abidus been exhumed from the sand which has preserved it for three thousand years, most of the time against the hands of those who, knowing better, would have spoiled its fair proportions and its great historic value. Abidus seems to have been a city of tombs, and it is possible that the greatness of all Egypt sought it as a burial place. The most powerful of these Theban kings were those of the twelfth dynasty Inan, beginning 2466 BC. Though Thebes can be traced back to the sixth dynasty as a city. It was a period in which strong monarchs ruled, and the arts were cultivated with magnificent results. Thebes was the capital, and on its temples and palaces the most enormous labor and expense were lavishly bestowed. And this not in Thebes alone, but in all the cities of Egypt, and they all make history too, impressive, invaluable history. Sayout owes its present importance to the caravan trade with Darfur and Nubia. Passing on toward Thebes, the river banks get more and more bluffy. You soon come to Dendra on the west bank. Its ruins are magnificent, and by many regarded as the finest in Egypt. The portico of its ancient temple is inconceivably grand. Its length is 265 feet and height 60 feet. It is entirely covered with mystic, varied and fantastic sculptures, hieroglyphics, groups, figures of deities, sacred animals, processions of soldiers, in short the manners and mythology of all Egypt. The workmanship is elaborate and finished. The interior is no less beautiful. The roof contained a sculptured representation of the twelve signs of the zodiac. It has been taken down and is now in the museum at Paris. A few miles further on in this bewildering region of solid rock bluffs, immense quarries, deep sculptured caverns, you come to Thebes itself, city of the hundred gates, lying on both sides of the Nile. The reports of whose power and splendor we would regard as fabulous, were its majestic ruins not there still to corroborate every glowing account. Whatever of Egyptian art is older than that of the Theban era lacked the beauty which moves to admiration. Beginning with the Theban kings of the twelfth dynasty, the harmonious form of beauty united with truth and nobleness meets the eye of the beholder as well in buildings as in statues. The great labyrinth and the excavation for the artificial Lake Moeris, at Alexandria, were made during this period. In Tanis, at the mouth of the Nile, was erected a temple whose inscriptions show not only the manners of the country with great historic accuracy, but tell the tale of frequent trade with the people from Arabia and Canaan. The site of Thebes is an immense amphitheater with the Nile in the center. At first you see only a confusion of portals, obelisks and columns peeping through or towering above the palm trees. Gradually you are able to distinguish objects, and the first that strikes you is the ruins of Luxor on the eastern bank. They overlook the Arab village at their base, and consist of a long row of columns and the huge gateway of the Temple of Luxor. The columns are those of an immense portico, and by them stood two beautiful obelisks, one of which is now in the Place de la Concorde, Paris. The columns are monoliths, fully ten feet in diameter, and many of them in a perfect state. All are covered with inscriptions of various signification. This temple was built by Ramesses II, and is therefore not one of the oldest in Egypt, though not the least interesting. On the westward or opposite side of the Nile is Memnon and the temple home of Ramesses II. There is little or nothing of the temple there, but twin colossal statues stand in lonely desolation on the plain, and these once guarded the temple entrance. One is perfect, the other broken. Both measured sixty-four feet in height. They are sitting giants carved from solid stone. They represented King Amenhotep, in whose honor the temple was built. At their feet are small sitting statues, one of his wife T, the other of his mother Mutamue, each carved out of red sandstone mixed with white quartz, and each a marvelous exhibition of skill in treating the hardest and most brittle materials. They stand twenty-two feet apart. The northern, or broken one, is that which the Greeks and Romans celebrated in poetry and prose as the vocal statue of Memnon. Its legs are covered with inscriptions of Greek, Roman, Phoenician and Egyptian travelers, written to assure the reader that they had really visited the place or had heard the musical tones of Memnon at the rising of the sun. In the year 27 BC. 
The upper part of this statue was removed from its place and thrown down by an earthquake. From that time on, tourists began to mutilate it by cutting into it their befitting or unbefitting remarks. The assurances that they had heard Memnon sing or ring ceased under the reign of Septimius Severus who completed the wanting upper part of the body as well as he could with blocks of stone piled up and fastened together. It is a well-known fact that split or cracked rocks, after cooling during the night, at the rising of the sun or as soon as the stone becomes warm, may emit a prolonged ringing note. After the statue was restored in the manner above described, the sound, if ever it emitted any, naturally ceased. The crack was covered by the masonry. The story of the architect of this temple is told in the hieroglyphics. That part which relates to these two memorable statues tells how he conceived them without any order from the king, cut them out of solid rock, and employed eight ships to move them from the quarries down the Nile to Memphis. Even in our highly cultivated age, with all its inventions and machines which enable us by the help of steam to raise and transport the heaviest weights, the shipment and erection of the mammoth statues of Memnon remain an insoluble riddle. Verily the architect, Amenhotep the son of Hapul, must have been not only a wise but especially ingenious man of his time. Back of the Memnon statues and the ruins of the palace temple, which they guarded, and five hundred yards nearer the Libyan desert, stood the Ramesion. It was both palace and temple. It is finely situated on the lowest grade of the hills as they begin to ascend from the plain, and its various parts occupy a series of terraces, one rising above the other in a singularly impressive and majestic fashion. Its outer gateway is grandly massive. Sculptures embellish it, very quaint and vivid. It formed the entrance to the first court, whose walls are destroyed. Some picturesque remessed columns remain however. And at their foot lie the fragments of the hugest statue that was ever fashioned by Egyptian sculptor. It was a fitting ornament for a city of giants, such an effigy as might have embellished a palace built and inhabited by titans. Unhappily, it is broken from the middle, but when entire it must have weighed about 887 tons, and measured 22 feet 4 inches across the shoulders, and 14 feet 4 inches from the neck to the elbow. The toes are from two to three feet long. The whole mass is composed of Syene granite, and it is offered as a problem to engineers and contractors of the present day, how were nearly 900 tons of granite conveyed some hundreds of miles from Syene to Thebes. It is equally difficult to imagine how, in a country not afflicted by earthquakes, so colossal a monument was overthrown. Such was the Rame Zion. It looked towards the east, facing the magnificent temple at Karnak. Its propylon, or gateway, in the days of its glory, was in itself a structure of the highest architectural grandeur, and the portion still extant measures 234 feet in length. The principal edifice was about 600 feet in length and 200 feet in breadth, with upwards of 160 columns, each 30 feet in height. A wall of brick enclosed it. And a dramas, fully 1,600 feet long, and composed of 200 sphinxes, led in a northwesterly direction to a temple or fortress, sheltered among the Libyan hills. This period of temple building and ornamentation which makes Thebes as conspicuous in Egyptian history as pyramid building had made Memphis, extended over several dynasties, and practically ended with the 20th, 1200 BC to 1133 BC which embraced the long line of Ramesses, except Ramesses I and II. This was the time of the Hebrew captivity and of the Exodus. The most illustrious of all these kings, the Alexander the Great of Egyptian history, was Thutmese III, who reigned for fifty-three years and carried Egyptian power into the heart of Africa as well as Asia. Countless memorials of his reign exist in papyrus rolls, on temple walls, in tombs and even on beetles and other ornaments. These conquests of his brought to Egypt countless prisoners of every race who, according to the old custom, found employment in the public works. It was principally to the great public edifices, and among those especially to the enlarged buildings of the temple at Amman, Ape, near Karnak, that these foreigners were forced to devote their time. Though Karnak is several miles further up the Nile, and on the same side as Luxor, it is in the same splendid natural amphitheatre, and is a part of the grand temple system of Thebes and its suburbs. 
Let us visit its magnificent ruins before stopping to look in upon Thebes proper. The Karnak ruins surpass in imposing grandeur all others in Egypt and the world. The central hall of the Grand Temple is a nearly complete ruin, but a room has been found which contained a stone tablet on which Thutmese III is represented as giving recognition to his fifty-six royal predecessors. This valuable historic tablet has been carried away and is now in Paris. This temple was 1,108 feet long and 300 wide. But this temple was only a part of the gorgeous edifice. On three sides were other temples, a long way off, yet connected with the central one by avenues whose sides were lined with statuary, mostly sphinxes. Many of the latter are yet in place, and are slowly crumbling to ruin. Two colossal statues at the door of the temple now lie prostrate. Across the entire ruins appear fragments of architecture, trunks of broken columns, mutilated statues, obelisks, some fallen others majestically erect, immense halls whose roofs are supported by forests of columns, and portals. Surpassing all former or later structures. Yet when the plan is studied and understood, its regularity appears wonderful and the beholder is lost in admiration. Here are two obelisks, one sixty-nine feet high, the other ninety-one feet, the latter the highest in Egypt, and adorned with sculptures of perfect execution. One hundred and thirty-four columns of solid stone, each seventy feet high and eleven in diameter, supported the main hall of the temple which was three hundred and twenty-nine feet by one hundred and seventy feet. The steps to the door are forty feet long and ten wide. The sculptures were adorned with colors, which have withstood the ravages of time. Fifty of the sphinxes remain, and there is evidence that the original number was six hundred. All who have visited this scene describe the impression as superior to that made by any earthly object. Says Denon, the whole French army, on coming in sight of it, stood still, struck as it were with an electric shock. Beltsoni says, the sublimest ideas derived from the most magnificent specimens of modern architecture, cannot equal those imparted by a sight of these ruins. I appeared to be entering a city of departed giants, and I seemed alone in the midst of all that was most sacred in the world. The forest of enormous columns adorned all round with beautiful figures and various ornaments, the high portals seen at a distance from the openings to this vast labyrinth of edifices. The various groups of ruins in the adjoining temples, these had such an effect as to separate me in imagination from the rest of mortals, and make me seem unconscious whether I was on earth or some other planet. And Karnak, like all Nile scenes, is said to be finer by moonlight than sunlight. But you must go protected, for the wild beast does not hesitate to make a lair of the caverns amid these ruins. Human vanity needs no sadder commentary. This temple was the acme of old Egyptian art. Its mass was not the work of one king, but of many. It therefore measures taste, wealth and architectural vigor better than a book. But its founder, Thutmese III, left similar monuments to his power. They have been traced in Nubia, in the island of Elephantine, in various cities of northern Egypt, and even in Mesopotamia. In central Thebes you meet with ruins of the home palace or dwelling place of Ramesses III. The king's chamber can be traced by the character of the sculptures. You see in these the king attended by the ladies of his harem. They are giving him lotus flowers and waving fans before him. In one picture he sits with a favorite at a game of drafts. His arm is extended holding a piece in the act of moving. And so the various domestic scenes of the old monarch appear, reproducing for us, after a period of 3,500 years, quite a history of how things went on in the palaces of royalty upon the Nile. The tombs of Thebes surpass all others in number, extent and splendor. They are back toward the desert in the rocky chain which bounds it. Here are subterranean works which almost rival the pyramids in wonder. Entrance galleries cut into the solid rock lead to distant central chambers where are deposited the sarcophagi which contain the bodies of the dead. The walls everywhere, and the sarcophagi, or stone coffins, are elaborately sculptured with family histories, prayers, and all the ornaments which formed the pride of the living. Festivals, agricultural operations, commercial transactions, hunts, 
bullfights, fishing and fowling scenes, vineyards, ornamental grounds, form the subject of these varied, interesting and truly historic sketches. The chambers and passages which run in various directions contain mummies in that wonderful state of preservation which the Egyptians alone had the art of securing. They are found wrapped in successive folds of linen, saturated with bitumen, so as to preserve to the present the form and even the features of the dead. Alas! How these sacred resting places have been desecrated! The sarcophagi have been broken and carried away, and the mummified remains that rested securely in their niches for thousands of years have been dragged out to gratify the curiosity of sightseers in all quarters of the globe. Beyond Thebes, the Nile enters a narrow sandstone gorge. But just before you enter this you pass the very wonderful temple of Edfau, in almost a perfect state of preservation, further testimonial to the wealth, power and art of those old Theban kings. Entering the gorge, the rocks overhang the river for miles on miles. You are now in the midst of the sandstone quarries whence were drawn the material for many a statue and temple. At the head of the gorge is a suin, trading point for the Sudan in Central Africa. It is the ancient Syene, and is the real quarrying ground of Egypt. The red granite from the steppes of Syene is in the pyramids and all the mighty monuments of the Nile Valley. Entering the vast quarries here, you can see a large obelisk not entirely detached from the solid rock, lying just as it was left by the workmen thousands of years ago. There are also half-finished monuments of other forms still adhering to their mother rock, and a monstrous sarcophagus which had for some reason been discarded ere it was quite finished. In the river opposite Asuan is the island of Elephantine or Isle of Flowers, on which are the ruins of two temples of the Theban period. Three miles above is the first cataract of the Nile, which was reckoned as the boundary of Upper Egypt. You are now 580 miles south of Cairo and 730 from the Mediterranean, on the borders of Nubia. Asuan is a border town now, with 4,000 people, but in the time of old Theban kings, Syene was not on the margin of their empire and glory, nor did the wonders of the Nile Valley cease here. A short way above Asuan is the beautiful island of Philae, the turning point of tourists on the Nile, crowned with its temples, colonnades and palms and set in a framework of majestic rocks and purple mountains. The island was especially dedicated to the worship of Isis, and her temple is yet one of the most beautiful of Egyptian ruins, as much of the impressive coloring of the interior remains uninjured. The ruins of no less than eight distinct temples exist here, some of which are as late as the Roman occupation of Egypt. 120 miles above, or south of, the first cataract of the Nile, 36 miles north of the last, and quite within the borders of Nubia, the traveler, struck hitherto with the impoverished aspect of the country. Suddenly pauses with astonishment and admiration before a range of colossal statues carved out of the rocky side of a hill of limestone, the base of which is washed by the famous river. For centuries the drifting sands of the desert had accumulated over the architectural wonders of Ipsambul, and no sign of them was visible except the head of one gigantic statue. No traveller seems to have inquired what this solitary landmark meant, whether it indicated the site of a city, a palace, or a tomb, until, in 1717, the enthusiastic Beltsoni undertook the work of excavation. His toil was well rewarded. For it brought to light a magnificent specimen of the highest Egyptian art, a specimen which, with Champollion, we may confidently attribute to the palmiest epoch of pharaonic civilization. Every voyager who visits Ipsambul seems inspired with more than ordinary feelings of admiration. Here, exclaims Elliot Warburton, the daring genius of Ethiopian architecture ventured to enter into rivalry with nature's greatness, and found her material in the very mountains that seemed to bid defiance to her efforts. You can conceive nothing more singular and impressive, says Mrs. Romer, than the façade of the great temple, for it is both a temple and a cave. Ipsambul, remarks Sir F. Henniker, is the any plus ultra of Egyptian labor and in itself an ample recompense for the labor of a voyage up the Nile. There is no temple, of either Dendera, Thebes, or Philae, which can be put in competition with it. And one may well be contented to finish one's travels with having seen the noblest monument of antiquity in Nubia and Egypt. There are two temples at Ipsambul, one much larger than the other. 
but each has a spios, or cavern, hewn out of the solid rock. Let us first visit the more considerable, consecrated by Ramesses II. To the sun god Phra, or Osiris, whose statue is placed above the entrance door. An area of 187 feet wide by 86 feet high is excavated from the mountain, the sides being perfectly smooth, except where ornamented by relievos. The facade consists of four colossal statues of Ramesses II. Seated, each 65 feet high, two on either side of the gateway. From the shoulder to the tiara they measure 15 feet 6 inches, the ears are 3 feet 6 inches long, the face 7 feet, the beard 5 feet 6 inches, the shoulders 25 feet 4 inches across. The molding of each stony countenance is exquisite. The beauty of the curves is surprising in stone, the rounding of the muscles and the flowing lines of the neck and face are executed with great fidelity. Between the legs of these gigantic remesids are placed four statues of greatly inferior dimensions, mere pygmies compared with their colossal neighbors, and yet considerably larger than ordinary human size. The doorway is twenty feet high. On either side are carved some huge hieroglyphical reliefs, while the whole facade is finished by a cornice and row of quaintly carved figures underneath a frieze of twenty-one monkeys, each eight feet high and six feet across the shoulders. Passing the doorway you enter a vast and gloomy hall. Here is a vast and mysterious isle whose pillars are eight colossal giants on whom the rays of heaven never shone. They stand erect, with hands across their stony breasts. Figures of the all-conquering Ramesses, whose mitre-shaped headdresses, each wearing in front the serpent, emblem of royal power, nearly touch the roof. They are all perfectly alike, all carry the crozier and flail. Every face is characterized by a deep and solemn expression. How different from the grotesque and often unclean monsters which embody the Hindu conception of divine attributes. They are the very types of conscious power, of calm and passionless intellect, as far removed from the petty things of earth as the stars from the worm that crawls beneath the sod. These images of the great king are supported against enormous pillars, cut out of the solid rock. And behind them run two gorgeous galleries, whose walls are covered with historical bar reliefs of battle and victory, of conquering warriors, bleeding victims, fugitives, cities besieged, long trains of soldiers and captives. Numerous companies of chariots, all combined in a picture of great beauty and impressive effect. This entrance chamber is 57 feet by 52 feet. It opens into a cellar 35 feet long, 251-2 feet wide and 22 feet high, and is supported in the center by four pillars each three feet square. Its walls are embellished by fine hieroglyphs in an excellent state of preservation. Behind is a smaller chamber where, upon thrones of rock, are seated the three divinities of the Egyptian trinity Amenare, Phra and Ta, accompanied by Ramesses the Great, here admitted on an equality with them. On either side of the outer entrance are doors leading to rooms hewn out of solid rock. They are six in number and each is profusely ornamented with lamps, vases, piles of cakes and fruits and other offerings to the gods. The lotus is painted in every stage of its growth, and the boat is a frequent symbol. These bar-reliefs seem to have been covered with a stucco which was painted in various colors. The ground color of the ceiling is blue and covered with symbolic birds. Well may Champollion exclaim, the temple of Ipsambul is in itself worthy a journey to Nubia. Or Lenormand say, it is the most gigantic conception ever begotten by the genius of the pharaohs. It is a temple of Ramesses II, of the 19th Theban dynasty, who figures as the Sesostris of the Greeks. Hardly less interesting is the little temple of Ipsambul, dedicated to Athar, or Isis, the Egyptian Venus, by the queen of Ramesses the Great. Either side of its doorway is flanked by statues thirty feet high, sculptured in relief on the compact mass of rock, and standing erect with their arms by their sides. The center figure of each three represents the queen as Isis, her face surmounted by a moon within a cow's horns. The other images are intended for King Ramesses himself. Beneath the right hand of each are smaller statues representing the three sons and three daughters of the king and queen. A portion of the rock, measuring 111 feet in length, has been excavated to make room for the façade of the temple. 
The devices begin on the northern side with an image of Ramesses brandishing his falchion, as if about to strike. Ather, behind him, lifts her hand in compassion for the victim, Osiris, in front, holds forth the great knife, as if to command the slaughter. He is seated there as the judge, and decides the fate of the peoples conquered by the Egyptian king. The next object is a colossal statue of about thirty feet high, wrought in a deep recess of the rock, it represents Ather standing, and two tall plumes spring from the middle of her headdress, with the symbolic crescent on either side. Then comes a mass of hieroglyphics, and above them are seated the sun god and the hawk-headed deity Anubis. On either side of the doorway, as you pass into the Proneas, offerings are presented to Ather, who holds in her hand the lotus-headed scepter, and is surrounded with a cloud of emblems and inscriptions. This hall is supported by six square pillars, all having the head of Ather on the front face of their capitals, the other three faces being occupied with sculptures, once richly painted, and still exhibiting traces of blue, red, and yellow coloring. The shafts are covered with hieroglyphs, and emblematical representations of Osiris, Ather, Neph, and other deities. If these sacred edifices inspire a feeling of awe in the spectator, while in ruin, what must their effect have been when their shrines contained their mystics' images? When the open portals revealed their sculptures and the walls their glowing colors to the worshipping multitudes, when the roofs shone with azure and gold, when the colossal forms represented the deities in whom they reposed their faith. When processions of kings, nobles and priests marched along their torch-lit aisles, when incense filled the air and the vaults resounded with the music of ten thousand voices. When every hieroglyph and emblem had a meaning to the kneeling votary, now forgotten or never known. Numerous other Nubian temples bear witness to Egyptian prowess, wealth, patience and religious sentiment. That at Dur is cut out of the solid rock to a depth of 110 feet, and its grand entrance chamber is supported by six columns representing Osiris. It was built in honor of the great Ramesses. At Ibram are four rock temples, all of the time of the Theban kings. And so the traveler up the Nile, and into the domains of far-off Nubia, is continually meeting with these vast rock temples, monuments of the Egyptian kings on the one hand, tombs of the nobility on the other, and worshipping halls for all. Returning to Egypt and passing down the eastern arm of the Nile to Tanis, or Beni Hassan, where the Hebrews and Arabs were wont to trade with the Egyptians, we find one of the oldest authentic monuments, except the pyramids. And certainly the most interesting to us. It is the tomb of a nobleman under Usertesen II. BC 2366. The rich paintings on the walls of this tomb are of inestimable value as showing the arts, trades, and domestic, public and religious institutions of the Egyptians at this period. They are still more valuable in an historic view, for they relate to the arrival of a family of 37 persons from the Hebrew or Semitic nation, who had come to fix their abode on the blessed banks of the Nile. The father of the family is represented as offering a gift to the king. Behind him are his companions, bearded men, armed with lances, bows and clubs. The women are dressed in the lively fashion of the AMU tribe, to which the family belongs. The children and asses are loaded with baggage. A companion of the party is standing by with a lyre of very old form. The gift of the father, or patriarch, was the paint of Midian, an article highly prized by the Egyptians. Many persons have been eager to associate this inscription, or sculpture, with the arrival of the sons of Jacob in Egypt, to implore the favor of Joseph, but it antedates that event so far that there can be no possible connection between them. It does show however that arrivals in Egypt from Arabia and Palestine, for purposes of trade and even permanent residence, were not confined by any means to the scriptural period. But where in Egypt do these wonders of monument, of sculpture, of sacred writing, not exist? We find them everywhere, telling of a people full of genius and the germs of all civilization. You read as you could not read from a book, for there is no conflict of sentiment, no odd statements to reconcile. And what do you read? That the art of writing was familiar to priest and scribe. That they had ships, for their inscriptions show handsome nautical designs. There are glass blowers, flax dressers, spinners, weavers, and bales of cloth. There are potters, 
painters, carpenters, and statuaries. There is a doctor attending a patient and a herdsman physicking cattle. The hunters employ arrows, spears and the lasso. There is the Nile full of fish and a hippopotamus among the ewes. There is the bastinado for the men and the flogging of a seated woman. There are games of ball and other amusements for men and women. And then the luxuries. There are harpers, costly garments, patterns of every design, fashions for the hair, costly spices and perfumes. They have portrayed every type of life and business with a faithfulness which is astonishing. The most mysterious of Egyptian monuments is, the Caves of the Crocodiles, or Grottoes of Samoun, in Upper Egypt. They are not often visited because travelers are repelled at the outset by their difficulty and gloom. They are filled with an incalculable number of human mummies, and those of the crocodile, birds and reptiles. Whence they came is not known, but, it is supposed, from Monfalout and Hermonopolis on the opposite side of the Nile. An English traveller, M. Georges, penetrated them after great trouble, and was horrified to find within the dark grottoes the remains of a traveller who had been overcome by famine and exhaustion. He says. On raising our eyes we perceived a horrid spectacle. A corpse still covered with its skin was seated on the rounded fragment of a rock. Its aspect was hideous. Its arms were outstretched, its head thrown back. His neck was bent with the death agony. His emaciated body, eyes enlarged, chin contracted, mouth twisted and open, hair erect on his head, every feature distorted by suffering, these gave him a horrible appearance. It made one shudder. Involuntarily one thought of oneself. His shrunken hands dug their nails into the flesh, the chest was split open, displaying the lungs and tracheal artery, on striking the abdomen, it resounded hoarsely, like a cracked drum. Undoubtedly this man had been full of vital force when seized by death. Undoubtedly he had lost himself in these dark galleries, and his lantern having flickered out, he had vainly sought the track leading to the upper air, shouting in frenzied tones which none could hear. Hunger, thirst, fatigue, terror, must have driven him nearly mad, he had seated himself on this stone, and howled despairingly until death had mercifully come to his relief. The warm humidity in the bituminous exhalations of the cavern had so thoroughly interpenetrated his body, that now his skin was black, tanned, imperishable, like that of a mummy. It was eight years since the poor wretch had been lost. On quitting this spot of mournful memory, we turned to the left through a corridor whose roof and walls were blackened by bituminous vapors, and in which it was possible to walk upright. Thousands of bats, attracted by the torches, assailed us with a whir of wings, and considerably impeded our progress. We then arrived at the most interesting part of the grottoes, the soil, which gave way beneath our feet, was composed of the debris of mummies and their swathings. At every step arose a black, acrid, nauseating dust, as bitter as a compound of soot and aloes. An enormous number of crocodiles of all sizes encumber the galleries. Some are black, some corpulent, some gigantic, some not larger than lizards. The human mummies and those of birds are side by side with them. The travelers did not reach the end of these interminable galleries. The heat was intense, and they grew tired of sickening impressions. The mystery of the Nile regions above Khartoum were unlocked to geography and the scientific world more largely by Colonel Baker's armed expedition than by any other. We shall soon have the pleasure of following him to Lake Albert Nyanza in company with his faithful wife, on a journey of exploration. But before doing so let us see what he did in the upper Nile Valley in an armed way and in the name of humanity and that civilization of which we all are justly proud. And thus complete our story of the wonderful river on which Egypt depends for its sustenance. Colonel Baker, on his trip to Albert Nyanza found that at least 15,000 Arabs, subjects of the Khedive of Egypt, were engaged in the African slave trade, with headquarters at Khartoum, and mostly in the pay of merchants there. They were nothing but cruel brigands, well armed and officered, and equal to any outrage on the natives to secure slaves and other booty. They sowed the seeds of anarchy throughout Africa, and contributed to the suspicion, treachery, blackmailing, and every evil that cropped out in the chiefs of the African tribes. 
he determined to attack this moral cancer by actual cautery at the very root of the evil. These brigands were cowardly, and, he thought, could be crushed by a show of force, provided it emanated from the Khedive, the only sovereign they acknowledge. Therefore the Khedive was asked for authority, which he conferred, and Baker started having full power to suppress the slave trade, to reduce the countries south of Gondokoro, to annex them, to open navigation to the lakes under the equator. To establish military stations, to mete out death to all opponents, to govern all countries south of Gondokoro. He took Lady Baker and a goodly number of English assistants along, contracted for provisions for four years, supplied himself with money, trinkets, tools, and a total of thirty-six vessels, six of which were small steamers. To be increased to fifty-five vessels and nine steamers at Khartoum. The armed force consisted of 1,645 troops, 200 of which were cavalry, and two batteries of artillery. The troops were of the forces of the Khedive, half Egyptians and half natives of Sudan, the latter colored and by far the best warriors. There is something to be admired in these Sudanese soldiers. They are active, willing, brave and perfectly submissive to kind discipline. They have taste, skill and are acclimated. In their tribes they perpetuate traits which must have come down from old Egyptian times. Among the wives, especially of chiefs a favorite head dress is one which is supposed to reflect the appearance of the honored sphinxes, and it is, to say the least, very becoming. Every precaution was taken to have all assemble at Khartoum, but the expedition was not popular in Egypt, the boats could not be gotten over the Nile cataracts, and months rolled away before the colonel got ready to start. The fleet of thirty-three vessels in which he did start were nearly all prepared at Khartoum. On these he embarked fourteen hundred men for his voyage of one thousand four hundred and fifty miles to Gondokoro. His cavalry was dismissed as useless, and his bodyguard was made up of a corps of picked men, forty-six in all, half of whom were white and half black, that there might be no conspiracy among them, and that the one might stimulate the other. This guard was put into perfect drill, armed with the Snyder rifle, and named, the Forty Thieves, on account of the propensity they at first manifested. They afterwards became models of military discipline. On February 8, 1870, two small steamers and thirty-one sailing vessels started up the White Nile from Khartoum, with 850 soldiers and six months' provisions. The rest were to follow as fast as transports could be supplied. In five days they were at Fashoda, in the Shiluk country, 118 miles from Khartoum. On February 16 they reached the mouth of the Sobat, 684 miles from Khartoum. This stream was then sending down a volume of muddy water much larger than the White Nile itself. They were now in the region of immense flats and boundless marshes through which the White Nile soaks and winds for 750 miles from Gondokoro. The river proper is almost wholly obstructed by compressed vegetation known as sponge, and at points this is so thick as to defy the passage of boats without cutting. But the slavers had discovered another route through an arm or bayou called the Bar Giraffe, and this baker determined to take. The Bar Giraffe proved to be winding, but deep enough at first. Like the White Nile, its waters and banks abounded in game, the first specimen of the larger kind of which proved to be a lion, which bounded off to cover on the approach of the boats. By February 25th, they were in a mass of floating vegetation through which a canal had to be cut. These obstructions now became frequent and could only be pierced by means of canals and dams. On March 5th, the colonel was roused from a nap on the steamer's deck by a shock, followed by a cry, the ship sinking. A hippopotamus had charged the steamer from the bottom, and then had attacked her small boat, cutting two holes through her iron plates with his tusks. The diabia was only kept from sinking by the aid of the steamer's pumps. Obstructions became thicker and canal cutting almost continuous. The men got sick with fever. The grass swarmed with snakes and poisonous ants. The black troops proved hardier and more patient than the Egyptians. There were some ducks but not enough to supply meat for all. The colonel discovered a hippopotamus some distance off and ordered a boat to pull for him. He disappeared on its approach, but soon reappeared about thirty yards away. 
the colonel planted a bullet in his head. The animal sank, but was found floating near the fleet the next morning. The men speedily cut him up and were delighted with their supply of fresh meat. On March 21, while the men were digging out the steamers which had become blocked by the floating masses of vegetation, they felt something struggling beneath their feet. Scrambling away, they beheld the head of a crocodile protruding through the sud. The black soldiers, armed with swords and billhooks, attacked him, and soon his flesh gladdened the cooking pots of the Sudan regiment. In thirteen days the fleet only made twelve miles through the sud, although a thousand men were at work all the time cutting and tugging. The Egyptians fell sick by scores, and many died. On March 27, another hippopotamus was killed, which gave the men a supply of fresh meat. Several buffaloes were also killed. After having wasted 51 days since leaving Khartoum, it was discovered that the bar giraffe became too shallow for further venture. Return was therefore compulsory, much to the disgust of the officers but to the great satisfaction of the troops. The whole season was lost, for no other route was practicable till there should come a flush of waters. And the return was hardly less difficult than the upward progress. The canals they had cut were filled with vegetable masses and had to be reopened. But they finally reached the White Nile again and in time to intercept a Turkish slave party who had been raiding the Shilluks. Seventy-one slaves were found closely stowed away in their boat and eighty-four concealed on shore, under guard. These were liberated, and both slaves and captors informed that slavery had been abolished by the Khedive's order. The party sailed down the White Nile to its junction with the Sobat and there, on high, hard ground, prepared a permanent camp, really a little town with houses and workshops. The acquaintance of the Shilluks was made and cordial relations established. They brought their vegetables to camp to sell, and proved very kind and useful. But they had been greatly demoralized by the Arab kidnappers, as had all the tribes on both sides of the river. Soon after they were stationed here a sail was observed bearing down the river. It proved to be that of the boat from which the slaves had been liberated up near the mouth of the bar giraffe. It was ordered to stop and found to be loaded with corn. But there was an awkward smell about the forecastle. An officer drew a ramrod from a rifle and began to poke the corn. A cry came from beneath and a woolly head protruded. A woman was dragged forth by the arm. Then the planking was broken and the hold found full of slaves, packed like sardines in a barrel. Orders were given to immediately unload the vessel. One hundred and fifty slaves, many of them manacled, were taken out of that small, stench-ridden place. The slaves were released and the officers and crew of the boat put in irons. The former consisted of men and women. All were given freedom papers, and allowed the privilege of returning home. Those who did not wish to go might remain and they would be treated well. The women might marry the soldiers if they chose. Strange to say they all selected soldier husbands, and there would have been a grand wedding day after the African fashion, if Colonel Baker had not limited the engagements to a few at a time. Land was cleared around the encampment, and all hands kept to work at mechanics, farming, hunting, etc. Meanwhile Colonel Baker went to Khartoum with his steamers and a fleet of sailboats for a supply of corn. He then returned and prospected up the White Nile only to find it hopelessly obstructed, unless a special expedition were sent up to cut away the sponge and other vegetable obstructions. He also found out that most of the leaders of the very brigands he was sent out to capture were in league with the home authorities, and that they had territory assigned them in which to operate for which privilege they paid good round sums annually. He was therefore in the dilemma of openly serving a government which was secretly opposing him. By December 1, 1870, at which time the Upper Nile would be in flood and the season propitious, he expected to start again from his camp at Tufakia for Gondokoro. But it was December 11 before his full fleet of 26 vessels got off. Not daring to risk the White Nile, he turned off again through the bar giraffe, which he found more open. Nevertheless canals had to be frequently cut through the vegetable obstructions, and nearly the same incidents as the year before were repeated. 
When they arrived at the shallows, there was not water enough and the boats had to be dragged over the bars, after discharging part of their cargoes. Finally the White Nile was reached again, and all were thankful. Their last adventure in the Baffert Giraffe was with a hippopotamus which, in the night, dashed furiously on the small boats. The zinc boat was loaded with flesh. With one blow he demolished this. In another instant he seized the dingy in his immense jaws, and the crash of splintered wood told of its complete destruction. He then attacked, with a blind fury, the steam launch, and received shot after shot. Retreating for a time, he returned to the attack with even greater fury, when he received a ball in the head which keeled him over. He was evidently a character of the worst description for his body was literally covered with scars and wounds received in fights with bulls of his own species. By March 10, all the vessels were afloat on the White Nile, and their further upward journey began. In a month, April 15, they were all safely at Gondokoro, 330 miles from Bar Giraffe Junction and 1400 from Khartoum. Gondokoro was much broken up and nearly depopulated. The Austrian missionaries were gone and the place given over to raiders and kidnappers. The Bari tribes, great fighters and hunters, were in the employ of the Arab slave dealers, and Gondokoro was their headquarters. They received Colonel Baker coldly, for though they did not want to be slaves themselves, they had no objections to lending their aid to the Arab brigands to take slaves from other tribes, provided they were well paid for it. A military station was founded at Gondokoro, on high ground, and as the river was now too low to proceed further, Baker's army went into permanent quarters. Ground was planted in vegetables and corn, houses were built, boats were repaired, and an air of business pervaded the place. The Bari never fully reconciled themselves to Baker's presence, preferring no government at all. They are a pastoral people, possessing large herds of cattle and living well. The men are tall and powerful, and the women not unprepossessing. But they have been so badly demoralized by the slave dealers as to be hostile to white men and to every form of restraint. They were clearly in with the brigands to starve Baker's expedition out and force it to return to Khartoum. Baker formally annexed all this country to Egypt, and promulgated a code of laws for its government. This brought him into actual war with all the Bari tribes and collisions were frequent, in which the natives were generally worsted. There were enemies in the water too, for the Nile at Gondokoro literally swarms with crocodiles. One of these animals tore an arm off a sailor, and another seized and devoured a washerwoman who went into the water to do her washing. Many were killed by the men. Once the colonel shot a very large one, measuring twelve feet six inches long. It was supposed to be dead and the men, having fastened a rope around its neck, began to pull it up the bank. It suddenly came to life and opened its huge jaws. The men ran off in fright, and could not be induced to return till another bullet was lodged in its skull. The forty thieves were now a most efficient part of Colonel Baker's forces. The Egyptians had been gradually eliminated, so that now nearly all were blacks from the Sudan. They had ceased to steal, and were models of bravery and soldierly drill and obedience. They became good shots and grew to know their superiority over the native spearmen. The entire force at Gondokoro numbered 1,100 soldiers and 400 sailors. They were constantly menaced by the Bari, and never slept except under guard. At length the various hostile tribes formed a coalition and, inflamed by the slave dealers, made a combined night attack. They were received so hotly that they soon dispersed, with the loss of many men. In this instance the fire of the forty thieves was most effective, and the natives declared they were more afraid of them than all the rest of the army. Watching from this time on was unceasing. And various offensive expeditions were fitted out whose business was to subdue the tribes by piecemeal and make them acquainted with the new authorities and with the fact that dealing in slaves could no longer be tolerated on the White Nile nor in any country which might be annexed to Egypt. Baker had found out to his regret that he could not establish monthly boat service between Gondokoro and Khartoum, as he had intended, owing to the formidable obstacles in the White Nile. Disease carried off his men and horses. A drought blighted the gardens and fields around his camp. By October, 1871, 
a conspiracy to desert and return to Khartoum cropped out, which involved all his troops except the 40 thieves. To prevent this the vessels were run up the river on a prospecting tour. They made the discovery that corn in plenty existed in the Bari regions beyond. But it could not be bought. Whom these cunning natives could not drive out they were bound to starve out. The corn had therefore to be taken. It was a great relief to the garrison to know that they were not far from a land of abundance. Still Colonel Baker thought it prudent to weed out his discontented forces and especially to get rid of the long list of women, children and sick who were now a burden. He therefore sent thirty vessels back to Khartoum in November. Besides a goodly supply of corn, they took along eleven hundred persons, leaving him with a force of about five hundred and fifty soldiers and sailors. With this small force he was left to subdue hostile tribes, suppress the slave trade and annex the country. It seemed to him that the slave dealers had gained their point and defeated the object of the expedition. Yet he persisted. Small land and river expeditions were sent out in all directions for the purpose of subjugating natives and crushing slave parties. It was on one of these that a herd of eleven bull elephants was seen from the deck of the vessel. Men were landed who surrounded them and drove them into the river. They swam to the opposite side, but the banks were high and the water deep. They were within rifle range from the vessel, and began tearing down the banks with their tusks in order to climb up. Fire was opened on them, which kept them in a state of confusion. At one time several mounted the bank, but it gave way and precipitated them all into the water. At last one got on firm ground and exposed his flank. A ball struck him behind the shoulder which sent him into the river. His struggles brought him within twenty yards of the vessel. Another bullet went crashing through his brain and dispatched him. Another one was killed before the ammunition was exhausted. The carcasses of both became the prize of the men, and strange to say, many of the hostile natives, attracted to the spot by the firing, professed to be very friendly in order that they might share the rich elephant steaks. They preferred this meat to that of their own cattle, of which they had plenty. By November, Colonel Baker called in all his expeditions. He had established peace throughout a wide section, and set free the slaves captured by several large parties. The war with the Baris was virtually over. But the slave dealers had only changed their base of operations. They had gone further south and would there stir up the same trouble they had incited among the Bari. When all had reassembled at Gondokoro, preparations were set on foot for a movement further south, the general course to be the line of the White Nile. While these were going on, those who had leisure devoted themselves to hunting, and studying the animal, mineral and vegetable resources. It was a country of great natural wealth. Iron and salt abounded. Tobacco, beans, corn, hemp and cotton could easily be raised. Nearly every tropical fruit was found in abundance. There was good fishing in the rivers, and plenty of ducks and other small game in the lakes and ponds. Every now and then the hunters had an adventure with hippopotami, whose attacks were always dangerous. Elephants were very plenty in all the region about Gondokoro. They saw them singly and in herds, and had fine opportunity to study their habits. They are fond of the fruit of the keglik tree, which resembles a date. If the tree be small they quickly tear it up by the roots and eat the fruit at leisure. If it be large, and they frequently grow to a diameter of three feet, the animal butts his forehead against the tree till it quivers in every branch and showers its fruit down upon the delighted animal. On January 23, 1872, the expedition was off, a garrison having been left at Gondokoro. Its final destination was the Unyoro country, just north of Victoria Nyanza and east of Albert Nyanza. We will hear of all these names again and become familiar with them. The expedition started under excellent auspices, except as to numbers. The forty thieves were staunch and brave, and all the Sudani soldiers were in good spirits. The colonel's light steamer led the way, followed by the heavier vessels. This gave him fine opportunity to prospect the country and enjoy occasional hunts. The mountains of Rijayaf abut on the White Nile, about fifty or sixty miles above Gondokoro. In their midst is a fine cataract and much beautiful scenery. 
The geological formation is very peculiar. One curiosity was noted in the shape of an immense cyanite slab, 45 feet long and as many wide, resting like a table on a hard clay pedestal. This stone is reverenced by the Baris, and they think that any person who sleeps under it will surely die. The vessels could not go beyond the Rijayev cataract, and a journey overland to the Labor country was projected. But all attempts to employ native carriers failed. The soldiers of Baker's own force refused to draw the loaded carts. There was nothing left but to organize a small, light-armed and light-loaded force, and try the land journey in this way. This force started in February. The guide was old Laco, a rainmaker of Labor. Mrs. Baker went along, accompanied by a train of female carriers. They drove a herd of 1,000 cows and 500 sheep. The country was thickly populated and teeming with plenty. The Labor country was reached, after a 60-mile tramp, and they were in the midst of friends, the hated and hostile Baris having been left behind. Carriers could now be had in abundance and the journeys were rapid to the Azua, the largest tributary of the White Nile. Here was a grand country. There were high mountains and fertile valleys, fine forests and plenty of game. The march now lay toward Fatiko, the capital of the Shuli. It lies at the base of the Shua Mountains, amid the most picturesque scenery, 85 miles from Labor and 185 from Gondokoro. A grand entry into the town was made. The forty thieves and the rest of the troops were put into complete marching order. The band was ordered to play. There was a kind of dress parade and sham fight, mingled with drum and bugle sounds in the blare of the band. The maneuvers pleased the natives very much. They are fond of music, and as the troops reached a camping spot, the women of the village clustered around, assumed dancing attitudes, and in nature's costume indulged in one of their characteristic fandanges. The old women proving even more inveterate dancers than the young. Baker established a military station at Fatiko, leaving a detachment of 100 out of his 212 men. On March 18, 1872, he started for Anyoro. Though the intermediate country is rich in vegetation, it is uninhabited except by tropical animals, and is a common hunting ground for the tribes on either side. The Unyoros live east and north of Victoria Nyanza Lake. They are a numerous people, but not so stalwart as the Labors or Scully. Their soil is rich, and tobacco grows to an immense size. Their town of Masindi, twenty miles east of Lake Albert Nyanza, whose waters can be seen from the summits of the mountains, was reached by the expedition on April 25th. The country was placed under the protection of the Khedive, and the chief Kabariga, son of Kamrasi, was made acquainted with the fact that hereafter slavery was prohibited. This tribe had been at times heavily raided by slave hunters, and their pens in different parts of the country were even then full of captives, probably one thousand in all. The natives themselves, as is usual with African tribes, only saw harm in this when the captives were of their own tribe. Steal from everybody but from me, seems to be their idea of the Eighth Commandment. The expedition remained for some time in Masindi and attempted to establish a permanent military station. But the slave hunters seemed to have more power over the natives than Baker with his drilled forces and show of Egyptian authority. The chief and his subjects grew suspicious and finally hostile. They attacked Baker, and the result of the fight was their defeat and the destruction of their town by fire. Such an atmosphere was not congenial to peace and regular authority. Therefore a retreat was ordered toward Rio Na on the Victoria Nile. But how to make it? Every surrounding was hostile. Porters could be had with difficulty. Worst of all, provisions were exhausted. At this critical moment Mrs. Baker came to the rescue with a woman's wit and prudence. She had been laying up a reserve of flour when it was plenty, and now she brought forth what was deemed a supply for several days. On June 14, 1872, the station at Masindi was destroyed, and the expedition started on its backward journey amid hostile demonstrations by the natives. The journey was almost like a running battle. Day attacks were frequent, and scarcely a night passed without an attempt at a surprise. 
the Forty Thieves became the mainstay of the expedition. They were ever on the alert, and proved very formidable with their trusty Snyder rifles. They grew to know where ambuscades were to be expected, and were quick to dispose themselves so as to make defense complete or first attack formidable. They never fired without an object, and only when they had dead aim. And they knew the value of cover against the lances of the enemy. Their losses were therefore small, while they played havoc with the enemy, seldom failing to rout them, or to conduct an honorable retreat. At length they struck the Victoria Nile at Fawira, fifteen miles below Riona Islands. Here they built a stockade, and began to build canoes with which to cross the river which was five hundred yards wide. Word was sent up to Riona. The chief came and proved friendly. He informed the colonel of the plot between Kaba Riga and the Arab slave hunters to drive him out of the country, and declared that he would be faithful to the Khedive's authority. Whereupon Baker declared him chief instead of Kaba, and endowed him with full authority over the natives, in the name of the Khedive. Onyoro thus had a new king. He was left with a complement of Baker's small army as a guard and nucleus, and the colonel started down the river in canoes for his post at Fatiko. His small garrison, left there, received him gladly, but scarcely was the reception over when an attack was made upon it by the slave hunters. They were well prepared and determined. From behind huts and other places of safety they began to pick off the soldiers, and a charge of the forty thieves was ordered. It was brilliantly executed, and resulted in the dislodgement of the enemy and their pursuit for many miles with great slaughter and the capture of many prisoners, among whom were some 135 of their slaves. This battle resulted in the driving out of Abu Saud, the leader of the slave hunters, and the man who had rented the whole country from the authorities at Khartoum for the purpose of brigandage. He went to Cairo to complain of the treatment he had received at the hands of Baker and his party, and actually circulated the report that he and Mrs. Baker had been killed on the headwaters of the Nile. A strong fortification was built at Fatiko, which was finished by December, and reinforcements were sent for from Gondokoro. It was the hunting season, and many expeditions were organized for the capture of game, in which the natives joined with a hearty good will. Besides the rifle in skilled hands, the net of the natives for the capture of antelope and smaller game was much relied on, and once all enjoyed the magnificent sight of a tropical prairie on fire, with its leaping game of royal proportions. To be brought down almost at will, provided the hunter was not demoralized with its number and size. While at Fatiko, an embassy came from King Tessa of the Uganda professing friendship and offering an army of six thousand men for, he did not know what, but to punish any natives who might appear to be antagonistic, especially Kabariga. By March, 1873, reinforcements from Gondokoro arrived in pitiable plight. Baker's forces were now 620 strong. He reinforced his various military stations. Then he liberated the numerous slaves the upward troops had taken from the slave hunters. Most of these were women and back in their native country. They accepted liberty with demonstrations of joy, rushed to the officers and men on whom they lavished hugs and kisses, and danced away in a delirium of excitement. Colonel Baker's time would expire in April. Therefore he timed his return to Gondokoro so as to be there by the first of the month, 1873. The whole situation was changed. There was scarcely a vestige of the neat station he had left. The slave dealers had carried things with a high hand, and had demoralized the troops. Filth and disorder had taken the place of cleanliness and discipline. Things were put to rights by May, and on the 25 of that month Baker started down the Nile, leaving his 40 thieves as part of the Gondokoro garrison. On June 29, Colonel Baker, Mrs. Baker and the officers of this celebrated expedition arrived at Khartoum, and reached Cairo on August 24, whence they sailed for England. He concludes his history thus. The first steps in establishing the authority of a new government among tribes hitherto savage and intractable were of necessity accompanied by military operations. War is inseparable from annexation, and the law of force, resorted to in self-defense, was absolutely indispensable to prove the superiority of the power that was eventually to govern. The end justified the means. 
At the commencement of the expedition I had felt that the object of the enterprise, the suppression of the slave trade, was one for which I could confidently ask a blessing. A firm belief in providential support has not been unrewarded. In the midst of sickness and malaria we had strength, from acts of treachery we were preserved unharmed, in personal encounters we remained unscathed. In the end, every opposition was overcome, hatred and subordination yielded to discipline and order. A paternal government extended its protection through lands hitherto a field for anarchy and slavery. The territory within my rule was purged from the slave trade. The natives of the great Shuli tribe, relieved from their oppressors, clung to the protecting government. The White Nile, for a distance of 1,600 miles from Khartoum to Central Africa, was cleansed from the abomination of a traffic which had hitherto sullied its waters. Every cloud had passed away, and the term of my office expired in peace and sunshine. In this result, I humbly traced God's blessing. Baker's picture is much overdrawn. The situation in the Sudan has never been promising. In 1874, Colonel James Gordon was made Governor General of all these equatorial provinces which Baker had annexed to Egypt. Gordon was a brave enthusiast, who had acquired the title of Chinese Gordon, because he had organized an army at Shanghai, and, as brigadier, helped the Chinese government to put down a dangerous rebellion. He had received the Order of Mandarin, had infinite faith in himself, and a wonderful faculty for controlling the unruly elements in Oriental countries. He did some wonderful work in the Sudan in suppressing the slave trade, disarming the Bashi Bazooks, reconciling the natives, and preventing the government at Cairo from parcelling out these equatorial districts to Arab slave dealers. He worked hard, organized quite an army, and had a power in the Sudan which was imperial, and which he turned to good uses. But in 1879, he differed with the Khedive and resigned. Then England and France deposed the Khedive, Ismail, and set up Tofek, under pretext of financial reform. But these two countries could not agree as to a financial policy. France withdrew, and left England to work out the Egyptian problem. The problem is all in a nutshell. English ascendancy in Egypt is deemed necessary to protect the Suez Canal and her waterway to India. For this she bombarded and reduced Alexandria in 1882 and established a suzerainty over Egypt, Turkey giving forced assent, and France refusing to join in the mix. The new Khedive was helpless, purposely so. England planted within Egypt an army of occupation and took virtual directorship of her institutions. But the provinces all around, especially those newly annexed by Baker, revolted. Their Muslim occupants would not acknowledge English interference and sovereignty. Sudan was in rebellion both east and west of the Nile. England sent several small armies toward the interior and fought many doubtful battles. At length the project of reducing the Sudan was given over. But how to get the garrisons out of the leading strongholds in safety became a great problem. That at Khartoum was the largest, numbering several hundred, with a large contingent of women and children. It would be death for any of these garrisons to leave their fortifications and try boats down the Nile, or escape by camel back across the desert. Yet England was committed to the duty of relieving them. The rebellion was under the lead of the Mahdi, a Muslim prophet, who claimed to be raised up to save his people and religion. His followers were numerous and desperate. Gordon thought the old influence he had acquired over these people when governor-general of the Sudan, would avail him for the purpose of getting the forlorn garrisons away in safety. He was therefore reappointed governor-general in 1884, and started with Colonel Stewart for Khartoum. There they were besieged for ten months by the Mahdi's troops, and their Gordon was killed, January 27, 1885, by the enemy, and all his garrison surrendered or were killed. The English sent an army of 8,000 men up the Nile to rescue Gordon, and part of it got nearly to Khartoum, when word of the sad fate that had befallen the garrison reached it. The expedition retreated, and since then the Sudan and Upper Nile have been given over to the old Arab and slave-stealing element. Sources of the Nile By reversing the map of North America, turning it upside down, you get a good river map of Africa. The Mississippi, rising in a lake system and flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, 
becomes the Nile flowing into the Mediterranean, both long waterways. VST. Lawrence, rising in and draining the most magnificent lake system in the world, from Huron to Ontario, will represent the Congo, rising in and draining a lake system which may prove to be of equal extent and beauty. Both are heavy, voluminous streams, full of rapids and majestic falls. The Columbia River will represent the Zambesi, flowing into the Indian Ocean. Civilized man has, perhaps, known the African continent the longest, yet he knows it least. Its center has been a mystery to him since the earliest ages. If the Egyptian geographer traced the first chart, and the astronomer there first noted the motion of sun, moon and stars, if on the Nile the first mariner tried his bark on water. It was but yesterday that the distant and hidden sources of the great stream were revealed, and it is around these sources that the geographer and naturalist have now the largest field for discovery. And in their midst that the traveler and hunter have the finest fields for romance and adventure. The Mississippi has in three centuries become as familiar as the Rhine. The Nile, known always, has ever nestled its head in Africa's unknown lake region, safe because of mangrove swamp and arid waste. But now that the secret of its sources is out, and with it the fact of a high and delightful inner Africa, full of running streams and far-stretching lakes, of rich tropical verdure and abundant animal life. Is the dream a foolish one that here are the possibilities of an empire whose commerce, agriculture, wealth and enlightenment shall make it as powerful and bright as its past has been impotent and dark? We have known Africa under the delusion that it was a desert with a fringe of vegetation on the sea coast and in the valley of the Nile. Afric's burning sands and her benighted races are the beginning and end of our school thoughts of the dark continent. True, her Sahara is the most unmitigated desert in the world, running from the Atlantic Ocean clear to the Tigris in Asia, for the Red Sea is only a gulf in its midst. True, there is another desert in the far south, almost as blank. These, with their drifting sands, long caravans, ghastly skeletons, fierce Bedouin wanderers, friendly oases, have furnished descriptions well calculated to interest and thrill. But they are by no means the Africa of the future. They are as the shell of an egg, whose life and wonder are in the center. There are many old stories of African exploration. One is to the effect that a Phoenician vessel, sent out by Pharaoh Necho, left the Red Sea and in three years appeared at the Straits of Gibraltar, having circumnavigated the continent. But it required the inducement of commercial gain to fix its boundaries exactly, to give it place on the map of the world. Not until a pathway to the east became a commercial necessity, and a short, northwest passage, a brilliant hope, did the era of Arctic adventure begin. The same necessity, and the same hope for a southeast passage, led the Portuguese to try all the western coast of Africa for a short cut to the Orient. For seventy years they coasted in vain, till in 1482 Diaz rounded the Cape of Storms, afterwards called Cape of Good Hope. Twelve years later Vasco da Gama ran the first European vessel into the ports of India. The first permanent stream found by the Portuguese on going down the Atlantic, or west, coast of Africa was the Senegal River. They thought it a western outlet of the Nile. Here Europe first saw that luxuriant, intertropical Africa which differed so much from the Africa of traditions and schoolbooks. They knew that something else than a sandy waste was necessary to support a river like the Senegal. They had been used to seeing and reading of the tawny Bedouin wanderers, but south of this river they found a black, stout, well-made people, who in contradistinction to the thin, tawny, short moors of the desert, became black moors, blackamoors. And in contrast with the dry, sandy, treeless plains of Sahara they actually found a country verdant, woody, fertile and rolling. Unhappily the wrongs of the Negro began with his first contact with Europeans. The Portuguese took him home as a specimen. He then became a slave. The moral sense of Europe was still medieval. Her maritime nations fastened like leeches on the west coast of Africa and sucked her life blood. Millions of her children were carried off to Brazil, the West Indies, the Spanish Main, and the British colonies in North America and elsewhere. 
Much as we abhor the slave system of Africa as carried on at present by Turkish dealers, it is no more inhuman than that practiced for three hundred years by the Christian nations of Europe. This slave trade was fatal to discovery and research in Africa, such as was warranted by the knowledge which the Portuguese brought, and which is now warranted, and being realized too, by the recent revelations of Stanley, Livingstone and others. The slaver could not, because he dared not, venture far from his rendezvous on the river or in the lagoon where his victims were collected. He kept his haunts a secret, and closed the doors on all who would be likely to interfere with his gains. Not until slavery received its death blow among civilized nations did they begin to set permanent feet, in a spirit of scientific and Christian inquiry, on the interior soil of Africa. And to map out its blank spaces with magnificent lakes and rivers. Then began to come those stirring narratives of travel by Mungo Park, Landers and Clapperton, who tracked the course of the Niger River. Then began that northern march of sturdy and permanent Dutch and English colonists who are carrying their cultivation and civilization from the southern Cape to the Kalahari Desert, the southern equivalent of the Sahara. Then also a Liberian free state became possible, founded and ruled by the children of those who had been ruthlessly stolen from their happy equatorial homes and sold into bondage in the United States. Between the two sterile tracts of Africa lies the real continent. All the coast lands are a shell. Egypt is but a strip on either side the Nile. Central Africa, the lake regions which feed the Nile, Congo and Zambesi, is a great and grand section, where nature has been prodigal in all her gifts, and which invites a civilization as unique and strong as its physical features. We may wonder at the strange things revealed by Arctic research, but here are unrivaled chains of lake and river communication, and powerful states with strange peoples and customs, of which the last generation never dreamed. No spot of all the earth invites to such adventure as this, and none profiteth so much in the revelations which add to science and which may be turned to account in commerce and the progress of civilization. We have read the roll of names rendered immortal by efforts to reach the two poles of the earth. Africa's list of explorers contains the names of Livingstone, Gordon, Cameron, Speke, Grant, Burton, Baker, Schweinfurth, Stanley, Kirk, Van der Deck Ken, Elton, Pinto, Johnston, and others. Some of whom have laid down their lives in the cause of science, and every one recalling memories of gigantic difficulties grappled with, of dangers boldly encountered, of sufferings bravely borne, of great achievements performed. And all within the space of twenty years. Before entering these lake regions of Africa to see what they contain, it is due to the past to recall the fact that an old chart of the African continent was published at Rome in 1591, which contains a system of equatorial lakes and rivers. It shows the Blue Nile coming out of Abyssinia, and the White Nile taking its rise in two great lakes under the equator, the Victoria Nyanza of Speke, and the Albert Nyanza of Baker. Due south from Albert Nyanza is another lake which is the equivalent of Tanganyika, and this is not only connected with the Congo but with the Nile and Zambesi. Cameron and Stanley have both shown that Tanganyika sends its surplus waters, if any it has, to the Congo, and Livingstone has proven that the headwaters of these two mighty rivers are intimately connected. Is this ancient map a happy guess, or does it present facts which afterwards fell into oblivion? Ere the slave trade put its ban between the coast traders and the dwellers of the interior, ere Portuguese influence ceased in Abyssinia, and the missions of the Congo left off communications with Rome. Did these unknown regions yield their secrets to the then existing civilization? May not this geographic scrap, dug from among the rubbish of the Vatican Library, be the sole relic now extant of a race of medieval explorers the fame of whose adventures has fallen dumb, and whose labors have to be gone over again? The map of Africa, used in our school days, had a blank center. No geographer had soiled its white expanse with lines and figures. It was the happy hunting ground of conjecture and fancy. The Zambesi and Congo were short stumps of rivers, with perhaps a dotted line to tell what was not known. When two traders, the Pomberos, passed from Angola on the west to the Pacific, in the beginning of the present century, and wrote how they had crossed a hundred rivers, visited the courts of powerful Negro kings. 
traversed countries where the people had made considerable progress in the industries and arts, their story, like that of other pioneers, was discredited and their information treated with contemptuous neglect. But about thirty years ago the modern world was startled and gratified with its first glimpse at the lake regions of Africa. In 1849, Livingstone, Oswell and Murray, after weary marching across the Kalahari, or southern, desert, stood on the margin of Lake Ngami, the most southerly and first discovered of the great chain of equatorial lakes. They expected to find only a continuation of desert sands and desert hardships, but, lo! A mighty expanse of waters breaks on their vision, worth more as a discovery than a dozen nameless tribes or rivers. What could it mean? Was this the key to that mysterious outpour of rivers which, flowing north, east, and west, blended their waters with the Mediterranean, the Pacific and Atlantic? The discoverer could go no further then, but fancy was excited with the prospect of vague and limitless possibilities and speculation became active in every scientific center. Back again into the wilderness the discoverer is drawn, and a score of others plunge into the unknown to share his fame. From the discovery of Ngami, a broad sheet into which the Cubango, south of the Zambesi in parallel with it, expands ere it plunges into the great central salt pan, a great salt lake. May be dated the revival of modern curiosity in the secrets of the African continent. In the Portuguese colonies of Abyssinia, there were rumors that a great lake existed north of the Zambesi, called Maravi or Nyasa. Its outflow was unknown, and the theory was that it was one of a long chain which fed the Nile. They thought no other stream was worthy of such a source, but they did not ask, whence then the mightier volumes that pour through the Congo and Zambesi? Others said the Nile finds ample sources in the mountains of the moon. Nobody had seen these, but old Ptolemy, the geographer, had said so two thousand years ago, and hundreds of years before, Herodotus had written, in obedience to the dictates of two Egyptian priests, that two conical hills, Crophi and Mophi, divided the unfathomable waters of the Nile from those which ran into Ethiopia. This is all the information we had of the sources of the Nile down to 1863, at least of the white, or eastern, branch of the Nile. Then it was that Speak and Grant, coming from the south, and Baker following the valley of the river toward the equator, almost met on the spot which contains its true sources. Poor Livingstone could not be made to see the merit of their discovery. He clung to the story of Herodotus, amplified by that of Ptolemy, which fixed the head of the great river in two lakes some ten degrees south of the equator. Livingstone believed that the high watershed between the Zambesi and Congo would pass for the mountains of the moon, and that in the Lulaba, flowing northward, the Lulaba afterwards turned out to be the Congo. As Stanley showed, he had the track of the true Nile. Following this will-o'-the-wisp into the swamps of Lake Banguilo, he met a lonely and lingering death. To look on the sources of the Nile was ever a wish and dream. The conquerors of Egypt, at whatever time and of whatever nation, longed to unravel the problem of its fountains. In the days when a settled population extended far into Nubia and a powerful state flourished at Meroe, near the junction of the White and Blue Nile, the tramp of armed hosts in search of the mythical fountains. Favorite haunt of Jove himself when he wished seclusion, often resounded in the deep African interior. Sisostris, the first king who patronized map-making, made attempts to discover these springs. Alexander the Great, Cambyses the Persian, and the Roman Caesars, were inspired with the same wish. Julius Caesar said he would give up civil war could he but look on the sources of the Nile. Nero sent out a vast exploring party who told of cataracts and marshes which compelled their return. These expeditions were formidable. They returned empty-handed as to science, but generally loaded with spoils of conquest. The idea of a solitary explorer, with his life in his hand and good will toward all in his heart, encountering all the perils and privations of African travel for pure love of knowledge, is wholly a modern conception. Let mention be made here of Ismail Pasha, ex-viceroy of Egypt. To the practices of an oriental despot he added the spirit of a man of modern science. To him, more than to any other man, do we owe a complete solution of the mystery of the Nile. He plunged Egypt into inextricable debt, he ground his people with taxes, 
but he introduced to them the light of Western knowledge, he granted the concessions which built the Suez Canal, he sought out and annexed the sources of the Nile. For twenty years European pioneers and explorers, in his pay or under his protection, worked their way southward, mapping lakes and rivers, founding settlements, capturing slave gangs. Until the entire Nile Valley either acknowledges Egypt or is open to commerce and civilization, unless forsooth the recent Sudanese protest, made by the fanatical El Mahdi and his followers, should prove to be more persistent and better sustained than now seems probable. Our trip up the Nile to Asuan, or the first cataract, past the silent shapes of the temples, sphinxes and pyramids, surrounded by sights and sounds of oriental life, was as pastime. But now the holiday journey ends, and we are face to face with the realities and hardships of a Nubian desert. The Nile is no longer verdant on either side. The sands, dry and barren, form its shores. But that is not all. You skirted to Carrasco amid difficulties, and there you are at its great bend. If you followed it now to the next place of importance, Abu Hamd, you would have to travel nearly 600 miles. The waters are broken by falls and the country is desolate. No one thinks of the journey, unless compelled to make it. The course is that of the caravans across the Carrasco Desert to Abu Hamd. It is 400 miles of dreary waste, and calculated to burn out of the traveler any romance he may have entertained of Nubian adventure. Day marching over this desert is impossible at certain seasons. Night is given up to the uneasy motion of camel riding and the monotony of a desert tramp. Do not think the ground is even. Here and there it is broken by wadis or gulches, and as you descend into these the eye may be relieved with sight of vegetation. Perhaps a gazelle dashes away in fright to the nearest sand hills, or it may be you catch a glimpse of a naked Arab youth tending his flock of goats, for even desert wastes are not utterly void of plant and animal life. These deserts are not even rainless, though as much as four years have been known to pass without a shower. A rainstorm is watched with breathless hope by the nomad Arab tribes. They see the clouds drifting up from the distant Indian Ocean and pitching their black tents on the summits of the mountains that divide the Nile Valley from the Red Sea. A north wind may blow during the night and sweep them back whence they came. But more likely they burst into thunderstorm as if all the storms of a season were compressed into one. The dry wadis of yesterday are roaring torrents by morning, bearing to the Nile their tribute of a single day, and for a day or a week, the desert air is pure and the desert sand shoots a tender vegetation, only to be withered, like Jonah's gourd. In fewer hours than it sprang. The Arab camel driver, however, knows well a few spots where are running water and green turf the year round. These are the oases, or stepping stones, by means of which the burning wilderness may be crossed. Sometimes the wells fail, or have been poisoned or filled, or are in the possession of a hostile predatory band. Then the unfortunate traveler has to face death by thirst or exhaustion as he hurries on to the next halting place. At any rate he is profoundly thankful when the welcome waters of the Nile come into view again at Abu Hamd, and he knows he is within safe navigable distance of Khartoum, at the junction of the White and Blue Nile. And now, in passing from Abuham to Khartoum, we have a grand secret of the Nile. For twelve hundred miles above its mouth that mysterious river receives no tributary on the right hand nor on the left. It may be traced like a ribbon of silver with a narrow fringe of green, winding in great folds through a hot and thirsty desert and under the full blaze of a sun that drinks its waters but returns nothing in the shape of rain. And man also exacts a heavy tribute for purposes of irrigation. Whence its supply? Look for a partial answer to the Atbara, whose mouth is in the east bank of the Nile, halfway from Abu Hamd to Khartoum. Here light begins to break on the exhaustless stores of the Nile. During the greater part of the year the Atbara is dry. Not a hopeful source of supply, you say at once. The sources of the Atbara are away off to the east in the mountains of Abyssinia, whose great buttresses are now visible from the Nile Valley, and whose projections push to the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. There also are a lake region and Nile sources, whose discovery by Bruce a century ago gave the scientific world quite a stir. His account of this Abyssinian country, 
so unique in physical features, social life, history, religion and ancient remains, read so much like romance that it was not believed. But Beek, de Cossin, James Bruce and the great Livingstone, have since verified all and given him his proper place among accurate observers and intrepid travelers. But it was Sir Samuel Baker, on his first journey up the Nile in 1861, who pointed out the importance of the Abyssinian rivers as Nile tributaries. He turned aside from his southward route and followed the dry bed of the Atbara for a double purpose. First, to watch the great annual flooding of this Nile feeder. Second, to enjoy the sport of capturing some of the big game, such as the elephant, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, giraffe and lion, known to abound in the thick jungles covering the lower slopes of the adjacent hills. The Atbara, or Black Nile, was simply a vast wadi or furrow, 30 feet deep and 400 yards to half a mile across, plowed through the heart of the desert, its edges marked by a thin growth of leafless mimosas and dome palms. The only trace of water was here and there a rush-fringed pool which the impetuous torrent had hollowed out in the sudden bends in the river's course, and where disported themselves hippopotami, crocodiles, and immense turtles. That had long ago adjusted their relations on a friendly footing on the discovery that none of them could do harm to the others. On the 23 of June, the Simum was blowing with overpowering force, the heat was furnace-like, and the tents of travelers were covered with several inches of drifted sand. Above, in the Abyssinian mountains, however, the lightnings were playing and the rains were falling as if the windows of heaven had been opened. The monsoon had set in. The rising streams were choking their narrow channels in their frantic rush to the lowlands, and were tearing away huge masses of the rich dark soil, to be spread a month hence over the flat plains of Egypt. The party encamped on the Atbara heard through the night a sound as if of distant thunder, but it was, the roar of the approaching water. Wonder of the Desert Yesterday there was a barren sheet of glaring sand with a fringe of withered bush and tree. All nature was most poor. No bush could boast a leaf. No tree could throw a shade. In one night there was a mysterious change, wonders of the mighty Nile. An army of waters was hastening to the wasted river. There was no drop of rain, no thunder cloud on the horizon to give hope. All had been dry and sultry. Dust and desolation yesterday. Today a magnificent stream five hundred yards wide and twenty feet deep, dashing through a dreary desert. Bamboos, reeds, floating matter of all kinds, hurry along the turbid waters. Where are all the crowded inhabitants of the pools? Their prison doors are open, the prisoners are released, and all are rejoicing in the deep-sounding and rapid waters of the Atbara. Here is the clue to one part of the Nile mystery, its great annual inundations, source of fertilizing soil and slime. The Blue Nile, further on, and with its sources in the same Abyssinian fastnesses, contributes like the Atbara, though in a secondary degree, to the annual Nile flood and to Egypt's fertility, with this difference, that it flows all the year round. At Khartoum, as already seen, we reach the junction of the White and Blue Nile, the frontier of two strongly contrasted physical regions, and the dividing line between the nomadic barbarism of the north and the settled barbarism of the south. The secret that has still to be unveiled is the source of that unfailing flow of water which perpetually resists the influences of absorption, evaporation and irrigation. And carries a life-giving stream through the heart of Egypt at all seasons of the year. Khartoum has engrafted all the vices of its northern society on the squalor and misery of its southern. A more miserable, filthy and unhealthy spot can hardly be imagined. Yet it is not uninteresting, for here, up to a recent period, was the threshold of the unknown. It has been the starting point of numberless Nile expeditions since the days of the pharaohs. Mehemet Ali, first viceroy of Egypt, pushed his conquest of the Sudan, a little south of it in 1839. He found the climate so unhealthy that he established a penal colony a little way up the White Nile, banishment to which was considered equivalent to death. Says Sir Samuel Baker of Khartoum, on his second visit in 1869, during my first visit in 1861, the population was 30,000. It is now reduced one half, and nearly all the European residents have disappeared. 
and the change in the country between Berber and Khartoum is frightful. The river's banks, formerly verdant with heavy crops, have become a wilderness. Villages, once crowded, have entirely disappeared. Irrigation has ceased. The nights, formerly discordant with the croaking of water wheels, are now silent as death. Industry has vanished. Oppression has driven the inhabitants from the soil. It is all due to the governor-general of Sudan who, like a true Mohammedan, left his government to Providence while he increased the taxes. The population of the richest province of Sudan has fled oppression and abandoned the country. The greater portion have taken to the slave trade of the White Nile where, in their turn, they might trample on the rights of others, where, as they had been plundered, they might plunder. The wilderness of fever-stricken marshes that line the White Nile long baffled the attempts of the most determined explorers to penetrate to the southward. At length, dry land was reached again at Gondokoro, only five degrees from the equator. It in turn became an advanced position of Egyptian authority, a center of mission enterprise, a halfway house where the traveler rested and equipped himself for new discoveries. From the base of Gondokoro, Petherick pursued his researches into the condition of the Negro races of the Upper Nile. The Italian traveler, Miani, penetrated far towards the southwest, into the countries occupied by the Nyam Nyam tribes, that singular region of dwarfs and cannibals, and Dr. Schweinfurth, Colonel Long, and Lee. Tin followed up the search with magnificent results. Ndli. Tin, a brave Dutch lady, deserves special notice as having been perhaps the first European woman who encountered the terrible hardships and perils of the explorer's life in the cause of African discovery. She is far, however from being the last. The wives of two of the greatest pioneers in the work, Mrs. Livingstone and Lady Baker, accompanied with a noble-minded resolution the steps of their husbands, the one along the banks of the Zambesi, and the other on the White Nile. Ndli. Tin and Mrs. Livingstone paid with their lives for their devotion, and are buried by the streams from whose waters they helped to raise the veil. Lady Baker has been more fortunate. Only a girl of seventeen when she rode by her husband's side from Gondokoro. She lived to return to Europe where her name is inseparably linked with two great events of African history, the discovery of one of the great lakes of the Nile and the suppression of the slave traffic. As already intimated, the Egyptian conquest and annexation of the Sudan country, and the bad government of it which followed, made the region of the White Nile the great man-hunting ground of Africa. The traffic was general when the modern travelers began their struggle to reach the equatorial lakes. Arab traders were the chief actors in these enterprises and they were joined by a motley crew of other races, not excepting most of the white and Christian races. If they were not directly under the patronage of the Egyptian authorities at Khartoum, they made it worthwhile for those authorities to keep a patronizing silence, by throwing annually into their treasury something handsome in the shape of cash. Khartoum marks pretty distinctly the limit of the Arab races and the influence of the Mohammedan religion. Beyond, and toward the equator and Nile sources, are the Negro and Pagan. Fanaticism and race hatred, therefore, help to inflame the evil passions which the slave trade invariably arouses. The business of the miscreants engaged in this detestable work was simply kidnapping and murder. The trade of the White Nile was purely slave hunting. The trifling traffic in ivory and gums was a mere deception and sham, intended to cover the operations of the slaver. A marauding expedition would be openly fitted out at Khartoum, composed of some of the most atrocious ruffians in Africa and southwestern Asia, with the scum of a few European cities. Their favorite mode of going to work was to take advantage of one of those wars which are constantly being waged between the tribes of Central Africa. If a war were not going on in the quarter which the slave hunters had marked out for their raid, a quarrel was purposely fomented, at no time a difficult task in Africa. At dead of night the marauders with their black allies would steal down upon the doomed village. At a signal the huts are fired over the heads of the sleeping inmates, a volley of musketry is poured in, and the gang of desperadoes spring upon their victims. A scene of wild confusion and massacre follows, until all resistance has been relentlessly put down, and then the slave catcher counts over and secures his human spoils. This is the first act of the bloody drama. Most probably, 
if the kidnappers think they have not made a large enough haul, they pick a quarrel with their allies, who are in their turn shot down, or overpowered and manacled to their late enemies. Are soon floating down the Nile in a slave dhow, on their way to the markets of Egypt or Turkey. The waste of human life, the stoppage of industry in honest trade, the demoralization of the whole region within reach of the raiders, the detestable cruelties and crimes practiced on the helpless captives on the journey down the river. On the caravan route across the desert, or in the stifling dens where they are lodged at the slave depots and markets, represent an enormous total of human misery. Many will remember the efforts of Colonel Gordon, whom the Khedive made a pasha, and also a governor-general of the Sudan, at the capital Khartoum, to suppress this nefarious traffic. And it will also be remembered how in the late revolt against Egyptian authority, led by El Mahdi, Colonel Gordon again headed a forlorn hope to Khartoum, with the hope that he could stay the rising fanatical tide, or at least control it. So as to prevent a fresh recognition of slave stealers. He fell a victim to his philanthropic views, and was murdered in the streets of the city he went to redeem. We have already made the reader acquainted with the heroic and more successful efforts of Colonel Baker, Pasha, in the same direction. He was not so much of a religious enthusiast as Colonel Gordon, did not rely on fate, but thought an imposing, organized force the best way to strike terror into these piratical traitors and at the same time inspire the Negro races with better views of self-protection. In the long and brilliant record which Colonel Baker made in Africa, the honors he gathered as a military hero bent on suppressing the slave trade will ever be divided evenly with those acquired as a dauntless traveler and accurate scientific observer. Let it not be thought that slave catching and selling is now extinct. True, the care exercised in the waters of the Red Sea and Indian Ocean, makes it difficult to run slave cargoes into Arabia and the further east. True, Baker's expedition broke up a force of some 2,000 organized kidnappers on the upper White Nile. But these piratical adventurers are still abroad in more obscure paths and compelled to rely more on guile and cunning than on force for securing their prey. But let us pursue our journey from Khartoum toward the springs of the Nile. We do not take the Blue Nile. That comes down from the east, and the Abyssinian mountains. We take the White Nile, which is the true Nile, and comes up from the south or southwest. And we must suppose we are going along with Colonel Baker on his first journey, which was one in search of the Nile sources. It was a scientific tour, and not an armed one like his second expedition. Entering the White Nile, we plunge into a new world, a region whose climate and animal and vegetable life, in brief, whose whole aspect and nature, are totally unlike those of the desert which stretches up to the walls of Khartoum. We are within the zone of regular rainfall, an intermediate region that extends to the margin of the Great Lakes, where we meet with the equatorial belt of perennial rains. Henceforth we have not only heat but moisture acting upon the face of nature. One may determine which of the two climates is the more tolerable by considering whether he would prefer to be roasted or stewed. The traveler would find it hard to decide whether the desert or the swamp is the greater bar to his advance. Every mile of progress marks an increase of dampness and of warmth. First of all, we pass through the great mimosa forest, which extends, belt-like, almost across the continent, marking the confines of the Sahara and the Sudan. The reader must not imagine a dense girdle of tall trees and tangled undergrowth, but a park-like country, with wide glades between clumps and lines of thorny shrubbery. The mimosa, or Arabian acacia, the tree from which the gum Arabic of commerce is extracted, has assigned to it the outpost duty in the struggle between tropical luxuriance and desert drought. By and by it gives place to the ambach as the characteristic tree of the Nile. The margin of the river becomes marshy and reedy. The water encroaches on the land and the land on the water. The muddy stream rolls lazily along between high walls of rank vegetation, and bears whole islands of intertwisted leaves, roots and stems on its bosom, very much as an arctic strait bears its acres of ice flows. It breaks up into tortuous channels that lead everywhere and nowhere. A nearly vertical sun shines down on the voyager as he slowly toils upstream. Scarcely a breath of air stirs to blow away the malarious mists or fill a drooping sail. Mosquitoes are numerous, and insatiate for blood. 
Day thus follows day with nothing to break the monotony except now and then the appearance of a hippopotamus, rising snortingly to the surface, a crocodile with his vicious jaws, or, where the land is solid. A buffalo pushing his head through the reeds to take a drink. The true river margin is invisible except from the boat's masts over the head of the tall papyrus. Even could we reach it, we would wish ourselves back again, for of all the growth of this dismal swamp man is the most repulsive. The Dinka tribes of the White Nile are among the lowest in the scale of human beings. They are naked, both as to clothing and moral qualities. The Shiluks are a finer race physically, but inveterate pirates and murderers. In the midst of this swampy region the Nile receives another important tributary from the mountains of southern Abyssinia. It is the Sobat which, Speak says, runs for a seven days journey through a forest so dense as to completely exclude the rays of the sun. Above its mouth we must be prepared to meet the greatest of all the obstructions of the Nile. Here are many small affluents from both east and west, and here is a vast stretch of marsh through which the waters soak as through a sponge. In the center of this sponge tract is a small lake, Lake No. But to reach it or emerge from it again, by means of the labyrinthine channels, is a work of great difficulty. The sponge is a thick coating of roots, grasses and stems matted together so as to conceal the waters, yet open enough for them to percolate through. It may be ventured upon by human feet, and in many places supports quite a vegetation. But the traveller is in constant danger of falling through, to say nothing of the danger from various animals. It was through this sponge that Colonel Baker, in his second Nile expedition, managed to cut a canal, through which was dragged the first steamer that ever floated on the headwaters of the Great River. Having passed this obstacle the journey is easier to Gondokoro, where the land is firm. Twenty-three years ago Gondokoro was a collection of grass huts in the midst of an untrodden wilderness, and surrounded by barbarous and hostile tribes. It has since been made an Egyptian military station and named Ismailia. Though the spot is not inviting except as it affords you rest after your hardships, yet it is the scene of an interesting episode in the history of African exploration. Speak and Grant had started on their memorable trip from Zanzibar in 1861. Colonel Baker and his wife had started up the Nile for its sources in the same year. Now it is February, 1863. A travel-stained caravan, with two white men at its head, comes down the high ground back of the station. They quicken their pace and enter the village with shouts, waving of flags and firing of musketry. It is Speak and Grant on their return trip, with the secret of the Nile in their keeping. On their long tramp they had visited strange peoples and countries, and by courage and tact had escaped unharmed from a number of difficulties and perils. They had traced the one shore of that vast reservoir of fresh water under the equator which Speak had sighted on a previous expedition, and had named Victoria Nyanza. They had seen this beautiful equatorial reservoir discharging its surplus waters northward over the picturesque Ripon Falls, and knew that they were in possession of the secret which all the world had sought from the beginning. Lower down, at the Kuruma Falls, they were compelled to leave the stream, which they now felt sure was the Nile. Crossing to the right bank, they struck across the country, northward, and in a direct line for Gondokoro. Here they caught sight of the furthest outpost of Egyptian exploration, and again gladly looked on the river that was to bear them down to the Mediterranean. By a curious coincidence, the first Englishman who had penetrated so far to the southward, was at that moment in Gondokoro. Samuel Baker and his wife were interrupted in their preparations for their journey to the Nile sources by the noise of the approaching party, and they rode out to see what all the hubbub meant. Four people from a distant nook of Europe met in the heart of Africa, and as they clasped hands, the hoary secret of the Nile was unriddled. All of them had numberless difficulties before as well as behind them. But their hearts were undismayed, and swelled only with pride at what had been accomplished for science and for their native land. The travelers from Zanzibar bore the marks of their long journey, battered and torn, but sound and seaworthy. Speak, Baker tells us, appeared the more worn of the two, he was excessively lean, but in reality in good tough condition. He had walked the whole way from Zanzibar, never having once ridden during the weary march. Grant was in honorable rags, 
his bare knees projecting through the remnants of trousers that were an exhibition of rough industry in tailor work. He was looking tired and feverish, but both men had a fire in the eye that showed the spirit that had led them through. The first greetings over, Baker's earliest question was, was there no leaf of the laurel reserved for him? Yes, there was. Below the Kuruma Falls, Speak and Grant had been informed the stream from the Victoria Nyanza fell into and almost immediately emerged again from another lake, the Ludenzaich. This therefore might be the ultimate reservoir of the Nile waters. No European had ever seen or heard of this basin before. Baker determined it should be his prize. But now we meet a new class of obstacles as we undertake a land journey into intertropical Africa. There is no longer, as in the desert, danger from thirst and starvation, for game abounds, and we are in some degree out of the interminable swamps of river navigation. But a small army of porters must be got together. They must be drilled, and preparations must be made for feeding them. True, some explorers have gone well nigh alone. But it is not best. Stanley always traveled with one to two hundred natives, and quite successfully. And these natives are by no means easy to handle. They are ready to make bargains, but are panicky and often desert, or, what is worse, take advantage of any relaxation of discipline to rise in mutiny. Their leader must be stern of will, yet kind and good-natured, wise as a serpent and watchful as a hawk. When a start is made, difficulties accumulate. You must expect incredible rainfalls, and an amazing growth of vegetation. Then in the dry season, which is hardly more than two to three months in a year, the shrubs and grasses are burned up far and wide. Everywhere there is jungle of grass, reeds and bamboos, when the rivers are at their height. And amid the forests the great stems of the pandanus, banana and boabab are covered to their tops with a feathery growth of ferns and orchids, and festooned with wild vines and creeping plants. The native villages are almost smothered under the dark luxuriance of plant life, and lions and other beasts of prey can creep up unseen to the very doors of the huts. The whole country becomes a tangled break, with here and there an open space, or a rough track marking where an elephant, rhinoceros or buffalo has crushed away in the high grass. Then ahead of us, and between Gondokoro and the lakes we seek, the country has been so raided by slave hunters, that every native can be counted on as an enemy. Or a native war may be in progress, and if so, great care must be taken to avoid siding with either party. We must retreat here and push on there, avoiding perils of this class as we value our lives. There is no road through Africa of one's own choice, and none that may not entail an entire backward step for days, and perhaps forever. At Gondokoro we are in the midst of the Bari tribe. Pagans before, contact with the Arab wanderers and slave stealers has made them savages. They live in low thatched huts, rather neat in appearance, and surrounded by a thick hedge to keep off intruders. The men are well grown and the women not handsome, but the thick lips and flat nose of the negro are wanting. They tattoo their stomachs artistically, and smear their bodies with a greasy pigment of ochre. Their only clothing is a bunch of feathers stuck in the slight tuft of hair which they permit to grow on their heads, and a neat lappet around the loins, of about six inches in depth. To which is appended a tail piece made of shreds of leather or cotton. Every man carries his weapons, pipe and stool. The former are chiefly the bow and arrows. They use a poisoned arrow when fighting. The effect of the poison in the system is not to kill but to corrode the flesh and bone, till they drop away in pieces. The bows are of bamboo, not very elastic, and the archers are not dexterous. It was while in Gondokoro, on this his first Nile journey, that Baker had opportunity to study, and occasion to feel, the enormities of the slave traffic. The Moslem traders regarded him as a spy on their nefarious operations. They manacled their slaves more closely and stowed them away securely in remote and secret stockades. Their conduct as citizens was outrageous, for they kept the town in a continual uproar by their drinking bouts, their brawls with the natives, and promiscuous firing of guns and pistols. One of their bullets killed a boy of Baker's party. 
It was evident that these marauders were intent on compelling him to make a hasty departure, for they incited trouble among his men, and inflamed the natives against his presence. As an instance of the trouble which grew out of this, his men asked the privilege of stealing some cattle from the natives for a feast. He denied their request. A mutiny was the result. Baker ordered the ringleader to be bound and punished with twenty-five lashes. The men refused to administer the punishment and stood by their ringleader. Baker undertook to enforce the order himself, when the black leader rushed at him with a stick. Baker stood his ground and knocked his assailant down with his fist. Then he booted him severely, while his companions looked on in amazement at his boldness and strength. But they rallied, and commenced to pelt him with sticks and stones. His wife saw his danger. She ordered the drums to be beaten and in the midst of the confusion rushed to the rescue. The clangor distracted the attention of the assailants, and a parley ensued. The matter was settled by a withdrawal of the sentence on the condition that the leader should apologize and swear fealty again. Before Baker could complete his preparations for starting, the fever broke out in Gondokoro, and both he and his wife fell sick. In order to escape the effluvium of the more crowded village, he moved his tents and entire encampment to the high ground above the river. While the animals were healthy, the donkeys and camels were attacked by a greenish-brown bird, of the size of a thrush, with a red beak and strong claws. It lit on the beasts to search for vermin, but its beak penetrated the flesh, and once a hole was established, the bird continually enlarged it to the great annoyance of the animal which could neither eat nor sleep. The animals had to be watched by boys continually till their wounds were healed. An Arab guide, named Muhammad, had been engaged, and the expedition was about to move. Mrs. Baker had brought a boy along from Khartoum, by the name of Sot. He had become quite attached to her, as had another servant named Richard. The guide, Muhammad, said he had seventy porters ready and that a start could be made on Monday. But the fellow was in a conspiracy to start on Saturday without Baker. Mrs. Baker found it out through Sot and Richard. She ordered the tents to be struck and a start to be made on the moment. This nonplussed Muhammad. He wavered and hesitated. She brought his accusers face to face with him when, to Baker's astonishment, the plot came out, that the entire force of porters had conspired to desert as soon as they got the arms and ammunition in their hands. And to kill Baker in case resistance was offered. Nothing was left but to disarm and discharge the whole force. He gave them written discharges, with the word, mutineer, beneath his signature, and thus the fellows, none of whom could read, went about bearing the evidences of their own guilt. Baker now tried in vain to enlist a new party of porters. The people had been poisoned against him. He applied to Korshid, a Circassian chief, for ten elephant hunters and two interpreters, but the wily chief avoided him. It looked as if he would have to give over his contemplated journey for the season. But by dint of hard work he managed to gather seventeen men, whom he hoped to make true to him by kind treatment. At this juncture a party of Korshid's people arrived from the Latuka country with a number of porters. Their chief, Ada, a man of magnificent proportions, took a fancy to Baker and invited him to visit the Latukas. He was given presents, and his picture was taken, which pleased him greatly. His followers came and were similarly treated and delighted. They agreed to accompany Baker back to their country, but a body of Turkish traders were also going thither. They not only declared that Baker should not have the escort of these people, but actually pressed them into their own service. And then, to make things worse, they threatened to incite the tribes through which they had to pass against him should he dare to follow. Baker thought he could meet any mischief of this kind by dealing liberally in presence, and so resolved to follow the traders. He loaded his camels and donkeys heavily, and started with his seventeen untried men. Mrs. Baker was mounted on a good Abyssinian horse, carrying several leather bags at the pommel of the saddle. Colonel Baker was similarly mounted and loaded. They had neither guide nor interpreter. Not one native was procurable, owing to the baleful influence of the traders. Their journey began about an hour after sunset, and Colonel Baker, taking the distant mountains of Belignan as his landmark, 
led the way. If we are now amid the hardships of an African journey, we are also amid its excitements. Can we outstrip the Turkish traders? If so it will be well, for then they cannot stir up the tribes against us. We will try. But our camels are heavily loaded, and their baggage catches in the overhanging bramble. Every now and then one of those most heavily top-laden is swung from his path, and even rolls into a steep gulch, when he has to be unpacked and his load carried up onto the level before being replaced. It is tantalizing for those in a hurry. But the traders are also traveling slowly for they are buying and selling. Presently two of their Latukas come to us, having deserted. They are thirsty, and direct us to a spot where water can be had. While we are drinking, in comes a party of natives with the decayed head of a wild boar, which they cook and eat, even though the maggots are thick in it. The health of these people does not seem to be affected by even the most putrid flesh. These Latuka deserters now become guides. They lead the way, with Colonel and Mrs. Baker. The country is that of the Taloga natives. While we halt under a fig tree to rest and await the rearward party with the laden animals, the Talogas emerge from their villages and surround us. There are five or six hundred of them, all curious, and especially delighted at sight of our horses. They had never seen a horse before. We inquire for their chief, when a humped-backed little fellow asked in broken Arabic who we were. Colonel Baker said he was a traveler. Do you want ivory? asked the hunchback. We have no use for it. Ah, you want slaves? No we do not want slaves. At this there was a shout of laughter, as though such thing could not be. Then the hunchback continued. Have you got plenty of cows? No, but plenty of beads and copper. Where are they? With my men. They will be here directly. What countrymen are you? An Englishman. He had never heard of such a people. You are a Turk, he continued. All right, anything you like. And that is your son, pointing to Mrs. Baker. No, that is my wife. Your wife? What a lie. He is a boy. Not a bit of it. This is my wife who has come along with me to see the women of your country. What a lie, he again exclaimed. Mrs. Baker was dressed precisely like her husband, except that her sleeves were long while the colonel's arms were bare. Soon Tum, the chief of the tribe, put in an appearance. He is propitiated with plenty of beads and copper bracelets and drives his importunate people away. The hunchback is employed as interpreter, and now our party is away over a rough road, determined to beat the Turks through the Illyrian tribe beyond. But it is too late. Their advance is ahead. Their center passes us in disdain. Their leader, Ibrahim, comes up, scowls and passes on. Mrs. Baker calls to the colonel to stop him and have a friendly talk. He does so, tells him they need never clash as they are after two entirely different objects. Then he shows him how he could either punish or befriend him once they were back at Khartoum. The old villain listens, and is moved. Baker then gives him a double-barreled gun and some gold. Both parties now march into Illyria together, glad to escape the rocky defile which had to be threaded on the last stages of the journey, where many a traitor has lost his life. We here meet with Leg, the chief, who demands blackmail. Baker gives liberally of beads and bracelets, but Leg gives nothing in return, except some honey. Our men have to draw for food on the reserve stores of rice which they no sooner boil and mix with the honey than along comes leg and helps himself, eating like a cormorant till he can hold no more. We can only stay here one day, for the people are very annoying and will part with nothing except their honey. So we leave these bullet-headed natives, and start again toward Latuka, over a level country and an easier road. Old Ibrahim and Colonel and Mrs. Baker now lead the way. The wily old Arab gets confidential, and informs the colonel that his men intend to mutiny as soon as they get to Latuka. This news gives the colonel time to prepare. In two days we enter the Wakula country, rich in pasturage and abundant in water, literally filled with big game, such as elephants, rhinoceri, buffalo, giraffes, wild boars and antelope. 
A buffalo is found in a trap, and partly eaten by a lion. The men make a feast of the remainder. It is the first meat they have eaten since they left Gondokoro, and it is a great relish. A hunt by the colonel brings in several fine antelope, enough to last till Latuka is reached. And now we are among the Latuka villages. There are Turkish traders there already, for they are gathered in Latom, a border village. They fire off guns, and forbid Ibrahim and his party to pass, claiming an exclusive right to trade there. There is a row between the Moslem traders, in which poor Ibrahim is almost strangled to death. The colonel observes a strict neutrality, as the time had not come for him to take sides. After wrangling for hours all retired to sleep. The next morning he calls his men to resume the march. Four of them rise in mutiny, seize their guns and assume a threatening attitude. Bilal, the leader, approaches and says. Not a man shall go with you. Go where you will with Ibrahim, but we won't move a step. You may employ niggers to load the camels, but not us. Lay down your gun, and load the camels, thunders the colonel. I won't, was the defiant reply. Then stop right here. As quick as a flash the colonel lands a blow on his jaw, and the ringleader rolls in a heap among the luggage, the gun flying in the opposite direction. There is a momentary panic, during which the colonel seizes a rifle and rushes among the mutineers, insisting on their going to work and almost dragging them to their places. They obey mechanically. The camels are soon loaded and we are off again. But Ibrahim and his party have been gone for some time. Bilal and four others soon after desert. The colonel declares the vultures will soon pick their bones. For days after, word comes that the deserters have been killed by a party of savages. The rest of the party think it came about in accordance with the colonel's prophecy, and credit him with magical powers. Thirteen miles from Latom is Tarangol, the largest Latuka village, where Moy, the chief, resides. Here Ibrahim stopped to collect his ivory and slaves. Crowds came out of the village to meet us, but their chief attraction was Mrs. Baker and the camels. These Latukas are, doubtless, the finest made savages in all Africa. They are tall, muscular, and beautifully proportioned. They have high foreheads, large eyes, high cheekbones, small mouths, and full, but not thick lips. Their countenances are pleasing, their manners civil. They are frank but warlike, merry yet always ready for a fight. Tarangol has three thousand houses, surrounded by palisades, and each house is fortified by a stockade. The houses are very tall and bell-shaped. They are entered by a low door not over two feet high. The interior is clean but unlighted by windows. Their cattle are kept in crawls and are very carefully tended. Their dead, who are killed in war, are allowed to lie on the field as food for vultures. Those who die at home are lightly buried for a time. Then they are exhumed, the flesh stripped off, and the bones put into an earthen jar, which is deposited in the common pile or mound outside of the village. Every village has its burial pile, which is a huge collection of jars. They wear no clothes, but bestow great attention on their hair. Their weapons are the lance, an iron head mace, a long bladed knife, and an ugly iron bracelet armed with knife blades four inches long. The women are not as finely shaped as the men. They are large, heavy limbed creatures, used to drudgery. Chief Moy visits us and looks for the first time on a white person. The colonel makes presents of beads, bracelets, and a necklace of pearls for Bach, the chief's favorite wife. What a row there will be in the family when my other wives see Box present, says the wily old chief. The colonel takes the hint and gives him three pounds of beads to be divided between his wives. Next day, Bach comes to the colonel's hut, all covered with beads, tattooed on her cheeks, and with a piece of ivory hanging in her lower lip. She is not bad-looking, and her daughter is as comely a savage as you ever saw. Horrid word comes that a party of Turkish traders have been massacred in a Latuka village which they had tried to destroy and to make slaves of the inhabitants. All is now excitement. Ibrahim's party and our own are in imminent danger. 
but Moy intercedes for his white guests and appeases the angry natives. Though rich in cattle, our party cannot get a pound of beef from these Latukas. But ducks and geese are plenty in a stream close by, and we are allowed to kill all we want. Let us look in upon a Latuka funeral dance in honor of a dead warrior. What grotesque dresses the dancers appear in! Ostrich feathers adorn their helmets of hair, leopard and monkey skins hang from their shoulders, bells dangle at a waist belt, an antelope horn is hung round the neck, which is blown in the midst of the excitement. The dancers rush round and round in an infernal gallop, brandishing lances and maces, and keeping pretty fair time. The women keep outside the lines, dance awkwardly and scream like catamounts. Beyond them are the children, greasy with red ochre and ornamented with beads, keeping time with their feet to the inward movement. One woman runs into the midst of the men and sprinkles ashes promiscuously on all from a gourd. She is fat and ugly, but evidently an important part of the occasion. These people are bright, and argue in favor of their materialistic belief with great shrewdness. The colonel tried to illustrate his belief by placing a grain of corn in the ground and observing, that represents you when you die. Covering it with earth, he continued, the grain will decay, but from it will arise a plant that will reproduce it again in its original form. Precisely, said old Camoro, brother of Moy, that I understand. But the original grain does not rise again, it rots like the dead man and is ended, so I die, and am ended, but my children grow up like the fruit of the grain. Some have no children, some grains perish, then all is ended. Here we remain for two weeks, waiting till Ibrahim comes back from Gondokoro, whither he had gone with ivory, and whence he has promised to bring a supply of ammunition. Meanwhile we must enjoy a hunt, for evidences of game are plenty. We are soon out among the long grasses, when suddenly a huge rhinoceros bolts from the copse close at hand. The colonel calls on his companions to bring a gun, but instead of obeying they set up a cry, which is to call attention to a herd of bull elephants in the forest at the end of the grassy plain. Two of the herd spy him and come bearing down upon him. He dismounts to get a shot, but the beasts see the dusky Latukas and rush off again to join their companions. The colonel quickly mounts and dashes after them, but his horse falls into a buffalo hole and throws him. Mounting again, he pursues, but his game has gotten well into the forest. On he goes after the herd, to find himself in close quarters with a huge beast that comes tearing along, knocking down everything in his track. Firing unsteadily from the saddle, he lodges a bullet in the animal's shoulder. It turns and makes directly for its assailant, bellowing like a demon. The colonel puts spurs to his horse, and makes his escape. Arming himself with a heavier gun, he returns to the attack and soon sees the herd again, moving toward him. One princely fellow has a splendid pair of tusks. This he singles out for his game. The elephants at first flee on his approach, but on finding themselves pursued they turn and give battle. There is no safety there, and again he retreats. A third trial brings him upon the beast he has wounded. It is maddened with pain and dashes at him. Trusting to his horse he rushes out of the tangle. The beast does not give up pursuit but follows on. His horse is jaded, and the riding is dangerous owing to the buffalo holes. The beast gains, and the colonel's cowardly companions give no help. A moment more and the beast will be on him. He suddenly wheels his horse, and hears the swish of the elephant's trunk past his ears, as the monster beast plunges on in its direct course. It gives over the chase, and keeps on up the hill. It is found dead next morning from the effects of the bullet wound. Elephant meat is highly prized by the natives, and the fat also. With the latter they mix the pigments for their bodies. Their favorite method of capturing the animal is by pits, dug very deep in the animal's path and covered over with light brambles and grasses. They seldom attack with spears, except when they fire the grasses. Then they take advantage of the panic which ensues and attack at close quarters. Ibrahim returns with plenty of ammunition and reports that he is going to the Abo country. We are delighted, for it is directly on our way to the lakes of the Nile. So we all go together. The country between Latuka and Abo, 
a distance of 40 miles, is very beautiful. It abounds in mountains on whose impregnable peaks native villages are seen, and in green valleys filled with game. Wild fruit and nuts are also found in plenty. The journey is easy and quick. The chief of Abo is Kachaba, an old clownish man who did not beg, for a wonder. He gives a dance in our honor, which is really an artistic affair. The dusky dancers kept excellent time to their drums and sang a wild chorus with considerable effect. The Abo men wear dresses of skin slung around their shoulders, but the women are nearly naked, the unmarried girls entirely so. The secret of Chief Kachiba's power over his tribe is sorcery. When his people displease him he threatens to curse their goats or wither their flocks. Should rain fail to fall, he tells them he is sorry they have behaved so badly toward him as to merit such a punishment. Should it rain too much, he threatens to pour lightning, storm and rain on them eternally, if they don't bring him their contribution of goats, corn and beer. They always receive his blessing before starting on a journey, believing it will avert evil. In sickness he is called to charm away the disease. And the old fellow receives so many presents of daughters that he is able to keep a harem in every village of his tribe. He counts 116 living children. Each village is ruled by a son, so that the whole government is a family affair. The fine old fellow treats us like princes, and gives us much information about the country to the south. The colonel leaves his wife in the old chief's care, and we take a little trip, with eight men, to test the accuracy of the old chief's story about the high water in the river Ashua. We pass through a magnificent country and find the river a roaring torrent. The chief's story was true. We return to find Mrs. Baker in excellent health and spirits having been kindly cared for during our absence. But the old chief has fared rather badly. He wanted some chickens to present to Mrs. Baker. His people proved stingy, and Kachaba, who could not walk much on account of his infirmities, the chief of which was a head always befuddled with beer, came to ask for the loan of a horse. That he might appear on his back among his people and thus strike terror into them. His former method of travel had been to mount on the back of his subjects, and thus make his state journeys, followed by one of the strongest of his wives, bearing the inevitable beer pitcher. Though warned by Mrs. Baker of the danger attending such an experiment as he proposed, he persisted, and one of the blooded Abyssinian animals was brought out equipped for a ride. The old chief mounted and told his horse to go. The animal did not understand and stood still. Hit him with your stick, said one of the attendants. Thwack! Came the chief's staff across the animal's shoulders. Quick as lightning a pair of heels flew into the air, and the ancient specimen of African royalty shot over the horse's head and lay sprawling on the ground. He picked himself up, considerably bruised and sprained, took a wondering look at the horse, and decided that riding a beast of that kind, where one had so far to fall, was not in his line. Since we cannot go on with our journey till the rivers to the south of us fall, it is best to go back to Latuka, where supplies are more abundant. Kachiba sends us off amid a noisy drum ceremony and with his blessing, his brother going along as a guide. There is a new member of the party, one Ibrahimua, who had been to all the ends of the earth, as soldier and adventurer. He was of Bornu birth, but had been captured when a boy, and taken into the service of the Sultan of Turkey. Even now he was connected with the Turkish garrison, or squad of observation, at Latuka. He got the whole party into a pretty mess the second day after starting back for Latuka, by bringing in a basketful of fine yams, which happened to be of a poisonous variety. On eating them, all got sick, and had to submit to the penalty of a quick emetic, which brought them round all right. We now journey easily through the great Latuka, where game is so abundant. In sight is a herd of antelope. The colonel dismounts to stalk them, but a swarm of baboons spy him and at once set up such a chattering and screeching that the antelope take the alarm and make off. One of the baboons was shot. It was as large as a mastiff and had a long brown mane like a lion. This was taken by the natives for a body ornament. That same evening the colonel goes out in quest of other game. A herd of giraffes appear, with their long necks stretched up toward the leaves of the mimosa trees, on which they are feeding. 
He tries to stalk them, but the wary beasts run away in alarm. He follows them for a long way in vain chase. They were twice as fleet as his horse. We are back again at Latuka. But how changed the scene? The smallpox is raging among both natives and Turks. We cannot encamp in the town. Mrs. Baker falls sick with fever. Two horses, three camels and five donkeys die for us. King Moy had induced the Turks to join him in an attack on the Kayala tribe, and the combined forces had been beaten. Thus more enemies had been made. It was no place to stay. So we must back to Abo, and the old chief Kachaba. But here things are even worse. The smallpox is there ahead of us, carried by careless natives or dirty, unprincipled Moslem traders, and the whole town is in misery. A party of roving traders had raided it and carried off nearly the whole stock of cows and oxen. Our horses all die, and most of our other animals, under the attacks of the dreadful Tsetse fly. Both the colonel and Mrs. Baker fall sick with fever, and the old chief comes in to cure them by enchantment. It rains nearly all the time, and rats and even snakes seek the huts out of the wet. Our stay of two months here is dreary enough, and the wonder is that any of us ever get away. As soon as the colonel and Lady Baker can go out they pay a visit to Kachaba, which he appreciates, and invites them into his private quarters. It is only a brewery, where his wives are busy preparing his favorite beer. The old chief invites them to a seat, takes up something which passes for a harp, and asks if he may sing. Expecting something ludicrous, they consent, but are surprised to hear a really well-sung and neatly accompanied air. The old fellow is evidently as expert in music as in beer drinking. Waiting is awful in any African village during the rainy or any other season, and especially if the low fevers of the country are in your system. We have really lost from May to October, on account of the fullness of the stream south of us. Our stock of quinine is nearly gone, our cattle are all dead. Shall we go on? If so, it must be afoot. And afoot it shall be, for we have met an Anyoro slave woman who tells as well as she can about a lake called Ludenzaj, very nearly where we expect to find the Albert Nyanza. Now the rains have ceased. Wonderful country. Crops spring up as if by magic, especially the Tullaban, or African corn. But the elephants like it and play havoc by night in the green fields. The colonel, all ague shaken as he is, determines to have a night sport and to bring in some meat which he knows the natives will relish. Starting with a servant and a goodly supply of heavy rifles, among them is, the baby, which carries a half-pound explosive shell, he digs a watch hole near a corn field. Into this they creep, and are soon notified of the presence of a herd of elephants by the crunching of the crisp grain. It is dark, but by and by one approaches within twelve paces. Taking the range of the shoulder as well as he can, the contents of, baby, are sent on their murderous errand. It was then safe to beat a retreat. Next morning the elephant is found near the pit. He is still standing, but soon drops dead. The shot was fatal, but not for several hours. And now such a time as there is among the natives. Three hundred of them gather, and soon dispose of the carcass with their knives and lances. The huge beast was ten feet six inches in height. By January, the waters in the rivers and gulches have subsided enough to admit of travel. Kachiba gives us three oxen, two for pack animals, and one for Mrs. Baker to ride upon. With these, and a few attendants, we start for the south. But Ibrahim precedes us with an armed body of Turks. He is penetrating the country further in search of ivory and booty. It is well for us to follow in his trail, unless forsooth he should get into a fight. The colonel walks eighteen miles to Farajok where he purchases a riding ox. On January 13, Shua is reached. It is a veritable land of plenty. There are fowls, goats, butter, milk, and food of all kinds. The natives are delighted to see us, and are greedy for our beads and trumpery. They bring presents of flour and milk to Mrs. Baker, who showers upon them her trinkets in return. The people are not unlike the Abos, 
but their agriculture is very superior. Our five days here are days of real rest and refreshment. We make an eight-mile march to Fatico, where the natives are still more friendly. But they insist on such vigorous shaking of hands and such tiresome ceremonies of introduction, that we must hasten away. And now our march is still through a beautiful country for several days. We gradually approach the Kuruma Falls, close to the village of Adida, on the opposite side of the river. It is the Anuro country whose king is Kamrasi. The natives swarm on their bank of the river, and soon a fleet of canoes comes across. Their occupants are informed that Colonel Baker wishes to see the king, in order to thank him for the kindness he had extended to the two Englishmen, Speak and Grant on their visit. The boatmen are suspicious, for only a short time before a party of Arab traders had allied themselves with Kamrasi's enemies and slain three hundred of his people. It takes two whole days to overcome the king's suspicions, and many gifts of beads and trinkets. Finally we are ferried across, but oh! The tedious wait to get a royal interview. And then the surprise, when it did come. There sits the king on a copper stool placed on a carpet of leopard skins, surrounded by his ten principal chiefs. He is six feet tall, of dark brown skin, pleasing countenance, clothed in a long rich robe of bark cloth, with well-dressed hands and feet, and perfectly clean. Baker explains his object in calling and gives rich presents, among which is a double-barreled gun. The king takes to the gun and orders it to be fired off. The attendants run away in fright, at which the king laughs heartily, as though he had discovered a new test for their courage or played a capital joke. He then makes return presents, among which are seventeen cows. Thus friendship is established. The king asks for our help against the Riangas, his bitterest enemies. We decline, but in turn ask for porters and guides. The king promises heartily, but as often breaks his promises, for his object is to keep us with him as long as we have presents to give. These chiefs, or kings, of the native tribes are the greatest nuisances in Africa, not even excepting the mosquitoes. They make the traveller pay court at every stage of his journey, and they know the value of delay in granting a hearing. The wrongs of the humble negro are many. His faults are as many, and among them are his careless good humour and light-heartedness things that in northern climes or under other circumstances might be classed as redeeming traits. But the faults of the average African king, there are exceptions to the rule, are such to try our patience in the extreme. He is as ignorant as his subjects, yet is complete master of their lives. His cruelty, rapacity and sensuality are nurtured in him from birth, and there is no antic he will not play in the name of his authority. In his own eyes he is a demigod, yet he is seen by visitors only as a dirty, freakish, cruel, tantalizing savage, insisting upon a court which has no seriousness about it. Accomplished and friendly as King Kamrasi seems to be, he is full of duplicity, cruelty, and rapacity. Speak and Grant complained of his inordinate greed, and we have just seen for what motive he delayed us for three weeks. And scarcely have we gone ten miles when he overtakes us, to ask for other presents and the colonel's watch, for which he had taken a great fancy. On being refused this, he coolly informs the colonel that he would send his party to the lake according to promise, but that he must leave Mrs. Baker behind with him. The colonel draws his revolver and, placing it at the breast of the king, explains the insult conveyed in such a proposition in civilized countries, and tells him he would be warranted in riddling him on the spot, if he dared to repeat the request or rather command. Mrs. Baker makes known her horror of the proposition, and the crafty king, finding his cupidity has carried him too far, says he has no intention of offending. I will give you a wife if you want one, he continued, and I thought you might give me yours. I have given visitors many pretty wives. Don't be offended. I will never mention the matter again. To make further amends he sends along with our party several women as luggage carriers, as far as to the next village. To show how prankish and pitiable royalty is among even a tribe like the Anyoros, who dress with some care, and disdain the less intelligent tribes about them, it turned out that this Kamrasi was not the real king at all, but only a substitute. 
and that the regularly anointed Kamrasi was in a fit of the sulks off in his private quarters, all the time of our visit. The march is now a long one of eighteen days through the dense forests and swamps of the Kafur River. Mrs. Baker is sick with fever incident to a sunstroke, and has to be borne upon a litter most of the way. In crossing the Kafur upon the sponge, it yields to the weight of the footmen, and she is saved from sinking beneath the treacherous surface by the colonel, who orders the men to quickly lay their burden down and scatter. The sponge proves strong enough to bear the weight of the litter alone, and it is safely hauled on to a firmer part by her husband and an attendant. We are now near our goal and all the party are enthusiastic. Ascending a gentle slope, on a beautiful clear morning, the glory of our prize suddenly bursts upon us. There, like a sea of quicksilver, lays far beneath us the grand expanse of waters, the Luden Zeich then, but soon to be christened the Albert Nyanza. Its white waves break on a pebbly beach fifteen hundred feet below us. On the west, fifty or sixty miles distant, blue mountains rise to a height of seven thousand feet. Northward the gleaming expanse of waters seem limitless. Here is the reward of all our labor. It is a basin worthy of its great function as a gathering place of the headwaters of the Nile, which issue in a full-grown stream from its northern end. Using Colonel Baker's own language, long before I reached the spot I had arranged to give three English cheers in honor of the discovery, but now that I looked down upon the great inland sea lying nestled in the very heart of Africa, and thought how vainly mankind had sought these sources throughout so many ages, and reflected that I had been the humble instrument permitted to unravel this portion of the great mystery when so many greater than I had failed. I felt too serious to vent my feelings in vain cheers for victory, and I sincerely thanked God for having guided and supported us through all dangers to the good end. As I looked down from the steep granite cliffs upon those welcome waters, on that vast reservoir which nourished Egypt and brought fertility where all was wilderness, on that great source so long hidden from mankind. That source of bounty and of blessings to millions of human beings, and as one of the greatest objects in nature, I determined to honor it with a great name. As an imperishable memorial of one loved and mourned by our gracious Queen and deplored by every Englishman, I called the Great Lake, the Albert Nyanza. The Victoria and the Albert Lakes are the two sources of the Nile. My wife, who had followed me so devotedly, stood by my side, pale and exhausted, a wreck upon the shores of the great Albert Lake that we had so long striven to reach. No European foot had ever trod upon its sand, nor had the eyes of a white man ever scanned its vast expanse of water. We were the first, and this was the key to the great secret that even Julius Caesar yearned to unravel, but in vain. And now the lake is christened. We rush down to the shores and bathe our feet in its clear fresh waters. Then we prepare a frail canoe, large enough to carry our party of thirteen and manned with twenty oarsmen. In this we skirt the lake northward from where we first touch it at Bacovia. The journey is full of novelty. Every now and then we get a shot at a crocodile, or a hippopotamus, and herds of elephants are seen along the shores. Thunderstorms are frequent, making the navigation dangerous. The heat at midday drives us into the shade. Our work hours are in the mornings and evenings. Here we pass under beetling precipices that line this eastern shore, down which jets of water, each a Nile source, are seen plunging from the height of a thousand feet. There we float through flat wastes of reeds, and water plants and floating rafts of vegetable matter in every stage of growth and decay. On the thirteenth day we reach the point where the waters from Lake Victoria Nyanza enter the Albert Nyanza. They pour in through the Victoria River, or as some call it, the Somerset River. Now arises a momentous question. Shall we go further? If we are not back in Gondokoro in a few weeks we may leave our bones in Central Africa. We are a fatigued, even a sick party, and the season is approaching when a white man had better be away from under the equator. The colonel proposes to forego further navigation and return. Lady Baker, with a fervor the colonel seems to have lost, proposes to go to the other end of the lake in order to make sure that it is an ultimate reservoir of the Nile. A way off northward from where we are, some thirty miles, can be seen with the glasses the outlet of the lake, the Nile. 
It is settled that the inflow from Victoria Nyanza and the outlet northward are thus close together. But is that outlet the Nile after all? Lady Baker wants to settle this question too, and she proposes, after circumnavigating the lake and proving that it is an ultimate source, to descend the Nile through the northern outlet. But the colonel urges want of time. The attendants tell horrible stories of dangerous falls and hostile natives. So we decide against Mrs. Baker, and, taking the colonel's advice, begin to ascend the Victoria Nile toward Lake Victoria Nyanza, that being in the direction of our homeward march. We go but a few miles till a new marvel greets us, the Murchison Falls. On either side of the river are beautiful wooded cliffs three hundred feet high. Bold rocks jut out from an intensely green foliage. Rushing through a gap in the rock directly ahead of us, the river, contracted from a broad stream above, grows narrower and narrower, till where the gorge is scarcely fifty yards wide, it makes one stupendous leap over a precipice one hundred and twenty feet high. Into the dark abyss below. The river then widens and grows sluggish again. Anywhere can be seen numberless crocodiles. While the colonel is sketching the falls, one of these animals comes close to the boat. He cannot resist a shot at it. The canoe men are disturbed and allow the boat to get an ugly swing on them. It strikes into a bunch of reeds, when out rushes a huge hippopotamus in fright and bumps against the canoe, almost oversetting it. There are cataracts innumerable on the Nile, but this is its greatest waterfall, and a majestic picture it is. Our return journey to Gondokoro repeats many of our former experiences. We revisit the same tribes and meet with the same adventures. Khartoum is reached in May, 1865. Then we go by boat to Berber, and thence by caravan across the desert to Sonakim on the Red Sea, where a steamer is taken for England, and where the colonel receives the medal bestowed on him by the Royal Geographical Society. In concluding this long journey we must ever regret that Colonel Baker did not do more to make sure of the honours of his discovery. Since then Gordon Pasha and M. Gessie have navigated Albert Nyanza. They curtailed the proportions it showed on first maps, and proved that, as Lady Baker supposed, it had a southern inlet, which was traced for a hundred miles till it ended in a mighty ambatch swamp, or collection of stagnant waters. Which may be counted as the Lake Nzige of the natives, and of which Colonel Baker so often heard. These travellers also settled forever one of the delusions under which Livingstone ever laboured, and that was, that the sources of the Nile must be sought as far south as the great Lake Tanganyika, and even further. Since then, other travellers have traced the whole course of the Victoria Nile to Lake Victoria Nyanza, discovering on their way a new lake, Ibrahim. And this brings us to Victoria Nyanza again, which must be studied more fully, for after all we may not have seen in Albert Nyanza, so much of an ultimate Nile reservoir as we thought. It is hard too, of course, to rob our travels of their glory, but we cannot bear laurels at the expense of after-discovered truth. It was in 1858 that Speke and Grant, pushing their perilous way westward from Zanzibar on the east coast of Africa, discovered and partly navigated Lake Tanganyika, probably the greatest fresh water reservoir in Central Africa. On their return journey, and while resting at Unyanyemb, Speke heard from an Arab source of a still larger lake to the north. Grant was suspicious of the information, and remained where he was, while Speke made a trial. After a three weeks march over an undulating country, intersected by streams flowing northward, he came in view, July 30, 1858, of the head of a deep gulf expanding to the north. Pursuing his journey along its eastern cliffs, he saw that it opened into an ocean-like expanse of water, girded by forests on the right and left, but stretching eastward and northward into space. He felt that he stood on a Nile source, but could not inquire further then. When he returned to England and made his discovery known, powerful arguments sprang up about these Nile sources. Speak and one school contended the Nile reservoirs were under the equator and that Victoria Nyanza was one of them, if not the only one. Burton and others contended that Tanganyika, and perhaps a series of lakes further south, must be the true sources. So in 1860 Speke and Grant were back in Africa, determined to solve the mystery. 
They were kept back by delays till 1862, when, as we have seen, they caught sight of the lake they sought. Keeping on high ground, they followed it northward to Uganda where they fell in with Mtesa, the king. Mtesa has been painted in all sorts of colors by different explorers. Speak and Grant formed the worst possible opinion of him, but they passed through his dominion safely, till they came to the northern outlet of the lake, the Victoria Nile. Taking for granted that this was the real Nile, they cut across the country to Gondokoro, where they met Baker on his southern march, as we have already seen. This unsatisfactory journey did not set controversy at rest. Speak's opponents ridiculed the idea of a body of water, 250 miles long and 7,000 feet above the sea level, existing right under the equator. Moreover they denied that its northern outlet was the Nile, or if so, that there must be a southern inlet. All the old maps located the sources of the stream further south. Colonel Baker heard a native story, in 1869, to the effect that boats had gone from Albert Nyanza to Ujiji on Lake Tanganyika. Livingstone held firmly to the opinion that all these equatorial lakes were one with Tanganyika, till he disproved it himself. He never was convinced that Victoria Nyanza existed at all as Speke had mapped it, nor that it had any connection with the Nile River. Thus what Baker and Speke and Grant had been glorying in as great discoveries, but which they failed to establish by full research, was still a puzzle. They are not to be robbed of any honors, but it is not claiming too much to say that the real discoverer of the true Nile Reservoir is due to the American Stanley. At least he resolved to solve the problem finally and set discussion at rest. He would establish the claims of Victoria Nyanza to vastness and to its functions as a Nile source, or show it up as a humbug. Henry M. Stanley is no ordinary figure among African explorers. In tenacity of purpose, courage and endurance, he is second only to Livingstone. In originality, insight and crowning effort, he is ahead of all. He introduced a new method of African travel and brought a new power at his back. Already he had, under the auspices of the New York Herald, made a successful Central African journey and discovered Livingstone. On his present expedition he was accredited to both American and English papers, and bore the flags of the two countries. He traveled in a half-scientific and half-military fashion. He started from Zanzibar November 17, 1874. Let the reader keep in mind that this was his second exploring trip into Africa, the first having been made a few years before under the auspices of the New York Herald for the rescue of Livingstone, if alive. Here, in his own words, is the gallant young leader's order of march. Four chiefs, a few hundred yards in front, next, twelve guides, clad in red robes of jobo, bearing coils of wire. Then a long file, two hundred and seventy strong, bearing cloth, wire, beads, and sections of the Lady Alice, after them, thirty-six women and ten boys, children of the chiefs, and boat-bearers, followed by riding-asses, Europeans, and gun-bearers. The long line closed by sixteen chiefs, who act as rear-guard, in all, three hundred and fifty-six souls connected with the Anglo-American expedition. The lengthy line occupies nearly half a mile of the path. Mr. Stanley did not mean to be stopped on the route he had chosen by the objections of any native chief to the passage of the little army through his territory. If the opposition were carried to the extent of a challenge of battle, the American explorer was prepared to accept it and fight his way through. In this way he counted on avoiding the long delays, the roundabout routes, and the fragmentary results which had marked the efforts of previous travelers. It is an admirable method, if your main object is to get through the work rapidly, if you are strong enough to despise all assaults, and if you have no prospect of traveling the same road again. Its wisdom and justifiableness need not be discussed. But it may simply be remarked that this conjunction of campaigning and exploration gives an extra spice of danger and an exciting variety to the narrative. Which carries us back to the time when the conquistadors of Spain and Portugal carved their rich conquests into the heart of Mexico and South America. He carried with him the sections of a boat, forty feet long, with which to explore the Victoria Nyanza, or any other lake or stream he might discover. It was named the Lady Alice. 
he had only three English assistants, two Thames watermen by the name of Francis and Edward Pocock, and a clerk named Frederick Barker, none of whom emerged alive from the African wilds into which they plunged so light-heartedly. Unyanyembe is the halfway station between Zanzibar and the lakes of interior Africa. It is simply a headquarters for slave stealers and a regular trading den for land pirates. Stanley turned to the northwest before reaching this place, and in about the fifth degree south latitude came upon the water shed which separates the waters trending northward from those running southward. Here in a plain 5,000 feet above the sea, and 2,500 miles in a straight line from the Mediterranean, seemed clearly to be the most southerly limit of the Nile Basin. And here Stanley's real difficulties began. The party suffered from want of food and lost their way. Sickness fell upon the camp, and Edward Pocock died. The natives themselves were hostile, and Mirambo, chief of the Rugarugas, a noted freebooter, was in the neighborhood with his band of cutthroats. By and by the storm clouds burst in war, not with the bandits however, but with the Atura tribe. The battle was fought for three days against great odds. It resulted in the complete discomfiture of the foe, but with a loss to Stanley of twenty-four killed and wounded. The weakened expedition moved on bearing twenty-five men on the sick list. They were now in the valley of the Shimiu, an affluent of Victoria Nyanza from the south. It was followed through dense forests over which loomed enormous bare rocks like castles, and hillocks of splintered granite and gneiss, and then through fine rolling plains, rich in pasture lands. Hedge enclosed villages and herds of wild and tame animals. Compared with what he had passed through it was a grand and glorious country. Provisions could be had readily and cheaply, corn, potatoes, fruit, goats and chickens. The half-starved men indulged in feasting and marched with recovered strength and confidence. Murmuring and doubt died away. The native attendants who had shown unmistakable proofs of faithfulness in the midst of trial were specially rewarded. The lake was near at hand. As they dipped through the troughs of land, mounted ridge after ridge, crossed watercourses and ravines, past cultivated fields and through villages smelling of cattle. A loud hurrahing in front told that the Great Lake Victoria Nyanza had been sighted. It was February 27, 1875. The spot was Kajahai, not far from where Speak had struck it. Six hundred feet beneath them, and three miles away, lay a long broad arm of water shining like silver in the bright sunshine, bordered by lines of green waving rushes, groves of trees and native huts. No time was lost in getting the Lady Alice ready, and on March 8 she was launched and her prow turned northward. Her occupants were Stanley, a steersman, and ten oarsmen or sailors. Frank Pocock and Barker were left at Kajahai in charge of the remainder of the party. Now began a journey full of thrilling events. Almost every day brought its danger from storm, shoal, animal or hostile natives. For weeks the shores of the Nyanza stretched on, promontory behind promontory, and still the tired mariners toiled along the margin of the unknown lands on their lee, and out and in among the numerous islands. From the starting point round the eastern shore, the coast shows a succession of bold headland and deep bay, at the head of which is generally a river draining the highlands behind. Sometimes a dark mountain mass, covered with wood, overhangs the waters, rising abruptly to a height of three thousand feet or more. And then again there will intervene between the hills and the lake an open plain, grazed over by herds of zebras, antelopes, and giraffes. There is great diversity also in the islands. Many of them are bare masses of rock, supporting no green blade. Others are swathed to the summit in masses of rank intertwisted vegetation that excludes the perpendicular rays of the sun. Some of the smallest are highly cultivated, and occupied by a dense population. One or two of the largest, such as Eugingo, betray no sign of human beings inhabiting their dismal shades. Generally the region is rocky, broken, hilly, and intensely tropical in character. Behind the coast ranges absolutely nothing is known beyond a few vague reports picked up from native sources. The rivers are not large, and it is not probable that they have their sources so far off as the great snowy range that runs down midway between the lake and the east coast of Africa. 
Some geographers have chosen to call this chain by the old name of Mountains of the Moon, throwing the old landmark from the southern borders of Sahara to a point quite south of the equator and at right angles with their former direction. Between the lake and these snow-capped mountains roam them die, a fierce pastoral tribe that subsists by plundering its weaker neighbors. Stanley heard of hills that smoked in these ranges, and probably they contain active volcanoes. He also heard of the mythical Lake Baringo further north. This lake has appeared almost everywhere on African maps. If it is ever found, it may prove to be the reservoir of the Ashua, an important Nile tributary, after the stream leaves both Victoria and Albert Nyanza. Before reaching the northernmost point of the lake the Lady Alice had passed through several disastrous storms and escaped many perilous shoals. She had also met the fierce opposition of the Victoria Hippopotamus. This behemoth of an animal abounds here, as it does in all the waters of tropical Africa, but while in most other places it refrains from attacking man, unless provoked, it was found on the Victoria Lake to be of a peculiarly bellicose disposition. A few hours after starting on his voyage, Stanley was driven off the land and put to ignominious flight by a herd of savage hippopotami sallying out towards him open-mouthed. On another occasion, the rowers had to pull for bare life to escape the furious charge of a monster whose temper had been ruffled by the boat coming in contact with his back as he was rising to the surface to breathe. Probably the hippopotamus of the Victoria would be no more courageous than his neighbors if he were met with on land. There he always cuts a ridiculous figure, as he waddles along with his short legs and bulky body in search of the grass on which he feeds. He seems to know that he is at a disadvantage on terra firma, which, he seldom visits except by night. When interrupted, he makes the best of his way back to the water, where his great strength always makes him a formidable antagonist. On the Victoria Nyanza the inhabitants do not seem to have discovered the methods of killing him practiced by the natives of the Zambesi, by capturing him in pitfalls, or setting traps that bring a heavy log, armed with a long iron spike. Down on his stupid skull. But these were not the only ugly customers the crew of the Lady Alice had to contend with on the Victoria Nyanza. Frequently when the boat neared the shore, lithe figures could be seen flitting between the trees and savage eyes peering at her through the dense foliage. If an attempt were made to land a wild-looking crowd would swarm upon the shore, poising their spears threateningly or placing their arrows in their bows. Though these forms are not so terrible as the red Indian in war paint or the wild Papuan with his frizzly mop of hair, their natural hideousness is pretty well increased by tattooing and greasy paint. They are treacherous, cruel, vindictive, and one cast away on their shores would stand a poor chance of telling his own story. At a point near the northeastern extremity of the Lake Mister. Stanley was induced to come close to shore by the friendly gestures of half a dozen natives. As the boat was pulled nearer, the group on the shore rapidly increased, and it was thought prudent to halt. Instantly there started out of the jungle a forest of spears, and a crowd of yelling savages rushed down in hot haste to the margin, lest their hospitable intentions towards the strangers should be balked. The boat, however, to the astonishment of these primitive black men, hoisted a great sail to the favoring land breeze, which carried it out to an island where the crew could camp and sleep in safety for the night. A little further on, while off the island of Ugamba, a large native canoe, manned by forty rowers and adorned with a waving mane of long grasses, was pulled confidently towards the mysterious craft. After reconnoitering it for a little, they edged up alongside, half of the occupants of the canoe standing up and brandishing their tufted spears. These visitors had been drinking freely of pum to keep up their courage. They were noisy, impudent, and obstreperous. And finding that the white man and his companions remained quiet and patient, they began to reel tipsily about the boat, shout out their drunken choruses, and freely handle the property and persons of the strangers. Gradually they grew still more unpleasantly aggressive. One drunken rascal whirled his sling over Stanley's head and, cheered by his companions, seemed about to aim the stone at the white man. Suddenly Stanley, who had his revolver ready in his hand, fired a shot into the water. In an instant the boat was clear of the intruders, every one of whom had plunged into the water at sound of the pistol, and was swimming lustily for the shore. 
With some little trouble their fears were allayed and the humbled roisterers, sobered by their dip, came meekly back for their abandoned canoe. Presents were exchanged and all parted good friends. He did not fare so well with the Wavuma tribe. They attracted Stanley's attention by sending out a canoe loaded with provisions and gifts. But shoreward suddenly appeared a whole fleet of canoes, evidently bent on surrounding the Lady Alice. As her crew bent to their oars in order to escape, a storm of lances came upon them from the first canoe, whose captain held up a string of beads in a tantalizing manner which he had stolen from the white man's boat. Stanley fired upon him and doubled him up in his boat. Then using his larger rifle he punctured the foremost of the other canoes with heavy bullets below the waterline, so that they had enough to do to keep them from sinking. They ceased to give chase and the Lady Alice escaped. Directly north of Victoria Nyanza is Uganda or the country of the Waganda one over which King Tessa presides. Stanley struck the country on the next day after his adventure with the Wavuma. It was a revelation to him. He fancied he had, in a night, passed from pagan Africa to Mohammedan Europe or Asia. Instead of the stones and spear thrusts of the Wavuma he met with nothing save courtesy and hospitality. In place of naked howling savages he now saw bronze-colored people, clean, neatly clad, with good houses, advanced agriculture, well-adapted industry, and considerable knowledge of the arts. The village chief approached attired in a white shirt, and a fine cloak of bark cloth having over it a monkey skin fur. On his head was a handsome cap, on his feet sandals. His attendants were clothed in the same style, though less costly. He smilingly bade the strangers welcome, spread before them a feast of dressed kid, ripe bananas, clotted milk, sweet potatoes, and eggs, with apologies for having been caught unprepared for his guests. Stanley looked on in wonder. It was a land of sunshine and plenty, a green and flowery paradise set between the brilliant sky and the pure azure of the lake. Care and want seem never to have intruded here. There was food and to spare growing wild in the woods or in the cultivated patches around the snug homesteads. Every roomy, dome-shaped hut had its thatched portico where the inhabitants chatted and smoked. Surrounding them were courtyards, with buildings which served as barns, kitchens and washhouses, all enclosed in trimly kept hedges. Outside was the peasant's garden where crops of potatoes, yams, peas, kidney beans and other vegetables grew of a size that would make a Florida gardener envious. Bordering the gardens were patches of tobacco, coffee, sugar cane, and castor oil plant, all for family use. Still further beyond were fields of maize and other grains, and plantations of banana, plantain, and fig. Large commons afforded pasturage for flocks of goats and small, white, harmless cattle. The land is of inexhaustible fertility. The sunshine is unfailing, drought in this moist climate is unknown. And the air is cooled and purified by the breezes from the lake and from the mountains. Within his own enclosure the peasant has enough and to spare for himself and his household, both of luxuries and necessaries. His maize fields furnish him with the staff of life, and the fermented grain yields the pum, which he regards almost as much a requisite of existence as bread itself. The grinding of flour and the brewing of beer are all performed under his own eye by his family. The fig tree yields him the bark out of which his clothes are made. But the banana is, perhaps, the most indispensable of the gifts of nature in these climes. It supplies him, says Stanley, with bread, potatoes, dessert, wine, beer, medicine, house and fence, bed, cloth, cooking pot, tablecloth, parcel wrapper, thread, cord, rope, sponge, bath, shield, sun hat, and canoe. With it, he is happy, fat, and thriving, without it, a famished, discontented, woebegone wretch. The banana grows to perfection in Uganda. Groves of it embower every village, and the Waganda in addition to being fat and prosperous have plenty of leisure for the arts of war and peace. They are unfortunately inclined to war, though they make cloth, tan skins, work in metals, and build houses and canoes. Even literature is not unknown among them. Well might speak have said of Ripon Falls at the outlet of the Nile, 
with a wife and family, a yacht and a gun, a dog and a rod, one might here be supremely happy and never wish to visit the haunts of civilization again. Word is sent to the king of the arrival of the strangers. An escort comes inviting them to the court. The new comer quite eclipsed the village chiefs in the gorgeousness of his apparel. A huge plume of cock's feathers surmounted an elaborately worked headdress. A crimson robe hung about him with a grace worthy an ancient Roman, while over it was hung a snow-white goatskin. The progress to the headquarters of the court was conducted with due pomp and circumstance. Every step Stanley's wonderment and admiration increased. Each moment he received new proofs that he had fallen among a people as different from those whom his previous wanderings had made him acquainted with as are white Americans from Choctaws. Emerging from the margin of dense forests and banana and plantain groves on the lake shores, the singular beauty of the land revealed itself to him. Wherever he turned his eyes there was a brilliant play of colors, and a boldness and diversity of outline such as he had never before seen. Broad, straight, and carefully kept roads led through a rolling, thickly peopled country clad in perennial green. Now the path would dive down into a hollow, where it was shaded by the graceful fronds of plantains and other tropical trees, where a stream murmured over the stones, and the air was filled with the fragrance of fruit. And then again it would crest a ridge, from whence a magnificent prospect could be obtained of the sea-like expanse of the lake, with its wooded capes and islands, the dim blue lines of the distant hills. And the fruitful and smiling country lying between, its soft, undulating outline of forest-covered valley and grassy hill sharply broken by gigantic table-topped masses of grey rocks and profound ravines. At length crowning the summit of a smooth hill appeared King Tessa's capital, Rabaga. A number of tall huts clustered around one taller than the rest from which waved the imperial standard of the Uganda. A high cane fence surrounds the court with gates opening on four broad avenues that stretch to the bottom of the hill. These are lined with fences and connected with paths shaded with groves of banana, fig and other fruit trees, and amid these groves are the houses of the commonalty. After due delay, court etiquette is even more tedious and ceremonious in Africa than Europe, Stanley is ushered into the presence of the king, seated in his great audience hall, and surrounded by a host of chiefs, warriors, pages, standard-bearers. Executioners, drummers, fifers, clowns, dwarfs, wizards, medicine men, slaves and other retainers. And here we have a fine opportunity to compare the notes of two observers of the king's receptions. Stanley had a second interview at the Royal Palace, on which occasion the king received also M. Linant de Belfons, sent by Gordon Pasha on a mission to Uganda. The monarch prepared a surprise for him by having Stanley by his side. But let de Belfons speak. On entering the court I am greeted with a frightful uproar. A thousand instruments produce the most discordant and deafening sounds. Mtesa's bodyguard, carrying guns, present arms on my appearance. The king is standing at the entrance to the reception hall. I approach and bow like a Turk. We shake hands. I perceive a sunburned European by the king's side, whom I take to be Cameron. We all enter the reception room, a room fifteen feet wide by sixty feet long, its roof supported by two rows of light pillars, making an aisle, which is filled with chief officers and guards, the latter armed. Mtesa takes his seat on the throne, which is like a wooden office chair. His feet rest on a cushion. The whole is in the center of a leopard skin spread upon a Smyrna rug. Before him is a highly polished elephant's tusk, at his feet two boxes containing fetishes, on either side a lance of copper and steel. At his feet are two scribes. The king behaves dignifiedly and does not lack an air of distinction. His dress is faultless, a white kuftan finished with a red band, stockings, slippers, vest of black and gold, a turban with a silver plate on top, a sword with an ivory hilt and a staff. I show my presence, but royal dignity forbids him to show any curiosity. I say to the traveller on his left, have I the honour to address Mr. Cameron? He says, no sir, Mr. Stanley. I introduce myself. We bow low, and our conversation ends for the moment. 
Who is this singular Mtesa and how has his more singular fabric of empire been built up in the heart of savage Africa? All around is the night of pagan darkness, ignorance, and cruelty. Here, in the land of the Waganda, if there is, as yet, no light to speak of, there is a ruddy tinge in the midst of the blackness that seems to give promise of approaching dawn. If the people are still bloodthirsty, revengeful, and fond of war and pillage, they have learned some lessons in observing law and order, they practice some useful arts. They observe many of the decencies of life, and in the cleanliness of their houses and persons they are examples to some European countries. The Waganda themselves have a high opinion of their own importance. And their legends carry back their origin to what, for an African tribe, is a remote past. The story, as related by them to Captain Speak, is as follows. Eight generations ago a sportsman from Anyoro, by name Uganda, came with a pack of dogs, a woman, a spear, and a shield, hunting on the left bank of the Kedona Valley. Not far from the lake. He was but a poor man, though so successful in hunting that vast numbers flocked to him for flesh, and became so fond of him as to invite him to be their king. At first Uganda hesitated. Then the people, hearing his name, said, Well at any rate let the country between the Nile and the Kedona be called Uganda and let your name be Kimera, the first king of Uganda. The report of these proceedings reached the ears of the king of Anyoro, who merely said, The poor creature must be starving, allow him to feed where he likes. Kimera assumed authority, grew proud and headstrong, punished severely and became magnificent. He was content with nothing short of the grandest palace, a throne to sit on, the largest harem, the smartest officers, the best dressed people, a menagerie for pleasure and the best of everything. Armies were formed and fleets of canoes built for war. Highways were cut from one end of the country to the other and all the rivers were bridged. No house could be built without its necessary outbuildings and to disobey the laws of cleanliness was death. He formed a perfect system of paternal government according to his own ideas, and it has never declined, but rather improved. Stanley heard from Sabadu, the court historian of Uganda, a somewhat different story. According to him Kimera did not found the government but was only one of a long list of thirty-five monarchs. He however first taught his countrymen the delight of sport. He was, in fact, the Nimrod of Uganda genealogy, and a mighty giant to boot, the mark of whose enormous foot is still pointed out on a rock near the lake, where he had slipped while hurling a spear at an elephant. The first of the Waganda was Kintu, a blameless priest, who objected to the shedding of blood, a scruple which does not seem to have been shared by any of his descendants, and who came into this lake region when it was absolutely empty of human inhabitants. From Kintu, Sabadu traced the descent of his master through a line of glorious ancestry, warriors and legislators, who performed the most astounding deeds of valor and wisdom, and completely proved that, whatever may be the condition of history, fiction, at least, flourishes at the court of Mtesa. Passing over a hero who crushed hosts of his enemies by flying up into the air and dropping great rocks upon their heads, and a doughty champion who took his stand on a hill and there for three days withstood the assaults of all comers. Catching the spears thrown at him and flinging them back, until he was surrounded by a wall of two thousand slain, we come to Suna, the father of Mtesa, who died only a little before Speak and Grant's visit to the country. Suna, by all accounts, was a gloomy monarch who sat with his eyes broodingly bent on the ground, only raising them to give the signal to his executioners for the slaughter of some of his subjects. It is told of this sanguinary despot that one day he caused eight hundred of his people to be killed in his sight, and that he made a ghastly pyramid of the bodies of twenty thousand Wasoga prisoners, inhabitants of the opposite shore of the Victoria Nile. The chiefs rejected his eldest son as his successor and chose the mild-eyed Ntesa. The mild-eyed signalized his election by killing all his nearest relatives and his father's best counselors. He was drunk with power and poem. It was now that Speak and Grant saw him. They describe him as a wretch who was peculiarly liable to fits of frenzy, during which he would order the slaughter of those who were his best friends an hour before. Or arming himself with a bundle of spears would go into his harem and throw them indiscriminately among his wives and children. It is said a change came over him by being converted to Mohammedanism. 
he gave up his drinking in many pagan practices of his fathers, though still believing in wizards and charms. The Muslim Sabbath is observed and Arabic literature has been introduced. Stanley describes him as a tall slim man of thirty years, with fine intelligent features and an expression in which amiability is blended with dignity. His eyes are large lustrous and lambent. His skin is a reddish brown and wonderfully smooth. In council, he is sedate and composed, in private, free and hilarious. Of his intelligence and capacity there can be no question. Nor can it be doubted that he has a sincere liking for white men. His curiosity about civilized peoples, their customs, manufactures and inventions is insatiable, and he seems to have once entertained the idea of modeling his kingdom after a civilized pattern. He showed Stanley, Stanley, and other white visitors the greatest hospitality. Yet there was something cat-like in his caressing and insinuating ways. His smiles and attentions could not be relied on any more than the fawning of the leopard, which the kings of Uganda take for their royal badge. Stanley tried to convert him from his Muslim faith to Christianity. He got so far as to have him write the Ten Commandments for daily perusal and keep the Christian along with the Muslim Sabbath. This was on his first visit. But on his return to Rabaga he found the king had gone to war with the Wavima. He went along and had excellent opportunity to notice the king's power. His estimate of Mtesa's fighting strength on this occasion was an army of 150,000 men, and as many more camp followers in the shape of women and children. There were not less than 500 large canoes, over 70 feet in length, requiring 8,500 paddlers. The whole population of his territory he estimated at 3,500,000, and its extent at 70,000 square miles. The Wavima could not muster over 200 canoes, but they were more agile on the water than the Uganda, so that the odds were not so great after all. Day after day they kept Mtesa's fleet at bay, and readily paddled out of reach of his musketry and howitzers planted on a cape which extended into the lake. Mtesa got very mad and began to despair. He applied to all his sorcerers and medicine men, and at length came to Stanley, who suggested the erection of a causeway from the point of the cape to the enemy's shore. It proved to be too big a task, and was given over. But the American pushed his project of converting the king, now that he stood in the position of advisor. He succeeded, as he thought. But a few days later the Uganda fleet suffered a reverse, and the newly fledged Christian was found running around in a frenzy, shouting for the blood of his enemies and giving orders for the roasting alive of a prisoner who had been taken. Stanley gave his pupil a well-deserved scolding. And thinking it was time to interfere in the war, which was hindering him from continuing his journey, he put into operation a little project he had conceived. And which is worthy of being placed beside the famous device of the horse by which the Greeks captured Troy town. Joining three canoes together, side by side, by poles lashed across them, he constructed on this platform a kind of wickerwork fort, which concealed a crew and garrison of two hundred men. This strange structure, covered by streamers, and with the drums and horns giving forth a horrible din, moved slowly towards the enemy's stronghold, propelled by the paddles working between the canoes. The Wavima watched with terror the approach of this awful apparition, which bore down upon them as if moved by some supernatural force. When it had advanced to within hailing distance, a voice was heard issuing from the mysterious visitant, which called on the Wavima to submit to Mtesa or destruction would come on them. The bold islanders were awestruck. A council of war was held, when a chief stepped to the shore and cried, Return, O spirit, the war is ended. A peace was sealed with the usual tribute of ivory and female slaves for the king's harem. The next morning the king's war drums suddenly sounded the breaking up of his immense encampment on the shore, and Stanley discovered it to be on fire in a hundred places. All had to flee for their lives, and he thinks hundreds must have perished in the confusion. The king denied that he was responsible for an order which resulted in such a horror, but Stanley thought he was guilty of a piece of unwarranted cruelty, which illy became his new profession of faith. From that time on, his views began to change. Ingenious, enterprising, intelligent he found them, above any other African tribe he had met with. 
their scrupulous cleanliness, neatness, and modesty cover a multitude of faults. But for the rest, they are crafty, fraudful, deceiving, lying, thievish knaves, taken as a whole, and seem to be born with an uncontrollable love of gaining wealth by robbery, violence, and murder. Notwithstanding first impressions to the contrary, they are more allied to the Choctaw than the Anglo-Saxon, and are simply clever savages, whom prosperity and a favorable climate have helped several stages on the long, toilsome road toward civilization. There is no call upon us after all to envy their luxurious lives of ease and plenty under the shade of their bowers of vine, fig, and plantain trees. For we hold the grey barbarian lower than the Christian child. Nevertheless, Uganda, from its fertility and its situation at the outlet of the great freshwater sea of the Nyanza, must be regarded as one of the most hopeful fields of future commercial enterprise. And its people as among the most promising subjects for missionary and philanthropic efforts in Central Africa. As for the mighty Mtesa, little has been seen or heard of him since his friend, Stanley, parted from him. Colonel Chael Long, late of the Confederate Army, afterwards in the service of Egypt, who had seen him a few months before, did not think he would ever turn out to be a humane monarch. But that he has not lost his interest in his white friends and in the marvels of civilization was shown in the spring of 1880, when a deputation of four of his chiefs appeared in London on a tour of observation. The Belfons, mentioned above as meeting Stanley at King Tessa's court, was murdered, with all his party, by the Anyoro, when on his way back to Gondokoro. Colonel Long went down the Victoria Nile from Lake Victoria Nyanza, and midway between the Victoria and Albert Nyanza discovered another great lake which he called Lake Ibrahim. The last white visitors to the Nile reservoirs were an English party sent out to establish a Christian mission on Lake Victoria Nyanza. It consisted of Lieutenant Smith, and Messrs. Wilson and O'Neill. They took a small steamer along in sections from Zanzibar, and successfully floated the first steam craft on the bosom of the Great Lake. Wilson established himself at the court of King Tessa. Smith and Wilson, while exploring the lake, were driven by a storm on the island of the Ukaril, whose chief, Lokanga, had been kind to Stanley. But no faith can be put in African princes. On December 7, 1877, Lokanga attacked the missionary camp and massacred Smith and Wilson with all their black attendants. With this dismal incident the history of the exploration of Victoria Nyanza closes for the present, except as we shall have to follow Stanley after leaving the court of King Tessa on his trip down the western shore of the lake. It must be remembered that he was twice to see the king, once on his tour of circumnavigation, and then after he had completed it. After he rounded the northern end of the lake and was well on his way down its western shores, he met with the most perilous of his adventures. The voyagers were nearly out of provisions. They had passed days of weary toil under the blistering tropical sun, and dismal nights of hunger on shelterless, uninhabited islands, when the grassy slopes of Bumber hove in sight. Numerous villages were seen in the shelter of the forest, with herds of cattle, maize fields, and groves of fruit trees, and altogether the island seemed to offer a haven of rest and plenty to the weary mariners. There was no food left in the boat, and a landing had to be attempted at all risks. The look of the Bumber natives was not so prepossessing as that of their land. They rushed down from their villages, shouting war songs and brandishing their clubs and spears. No sooner had the boat reached shallow water, than they seized upon her, and dragged her, crew and all, high up on the rocky beach. The scene that ensued, says the traveller, baffles description. Pandemonium, all the devils armed, raged around us. A forest of spears was leveled, thirty or forty bows were drawn taut, as many barbed arrows seemed already on the wing. Naughty clubs waved above our heads, two hundred screaming black demons jostled each other, and struggled for room to vent their fury, or for an opportunity to deliver one crushing blow or thrust at us. In point of fact, no thrust was delivered, and possibly none was intended but the situation was certainly an unpleasant one. The troop of gesticulating, yelling savages increased every second. And the diabolical noise of a number of drums increased the hubbub. The islanders began to jostle their guests, to pilfer, and at last they seized upon the oars. 
Stanley put his companions on their guard and fired his double-barreled elephant rifle into the crowd. Two men fell. He increased the panic among them, by two rounds of duck shot, and in the midst of the confusion the Lady Alice was run down the bank and pushed far into the water. But this scarcely improved the position. The enemy swarmed on the shore and threw stones and lances at the crew. Canoes were making ready to pursue. Stanley ordered the crew to tear up the bottom boards for paddles and to pull away with all their might. All were doing the best they could, but a paralysis seized them when they discovered they were directly in the track of two huge hippopotami which had been started up by the noises of the melee, and then raged to the attacking point. The elephant rifle was again brought into requisition and the course cleared by planting an explosive bullet in each animal's head. Four of the canoes of the natives were now upon them. They meant war in earnest. The elephant rifle was used with effect. For shots killed five of the natives and sank two canoes. The other two stopped to pick up their companions. They shouted in their rage, as they saw their prize escape, go, and die in the Nyanza. Dismal days of famine and hardship followed. A storm overtook them and tossed them for hours, drenched with spray and rain. They had but four bananas on board. Happily another island was sighted and reached, which proved to be uninhabited. There they obtained food, shelter, and much needed rest. Most travelers would have given Bumber a wide berth in the future. Not so Stanley. He pursued his course to Kajahai, his starting point, having circumnavigated the lake in sixty days. There he assembled his own forces, and added recruits loaned by King Tessa. With 230 spearmen and 50 musketeers he put back to the offending island determined to punish the two or three thousand natives they found ranged along the shores. They held their own with slings and arrows against the approach of the boats for an hour. But at length they were put to flight and Stanley considered he had wiped out the insult, though they appear to have been pretty well punished before. During his two months' absence Frederick Barker died at Kajahai. This sad event was one of the items of heavy cost attending great feats of exploration. It left Stanley with but one English companion. Stanley's exploration of Victoria Nyanza confirmed in part, Speak's discovery and theories. It showed that it was a Nile reservoir, though not an ultimate source, 21,000 square miles in extent. Excellent havens, navigable streams and fertile islands were revealed for the first time. Rich and beautiful countries are romantically pictured to us. After having paid court to King Tessa a second time, as already described, the time came for Stanley to extend his journey. He chose to follow the line of the equator westward with the hope of striking a southern extension of Baker's Albert Nyanza. He departed from Tessa's old capital, Ulagala, laden with presents and food, and accompanied by a hundred Uganda warriors. Stanley, in turn, gave bountiful parting presents, and even remembered the chief Lukanga of Yukuro, who showed his appreciation of this kindness by murdering the very next white visitors, Smith and O'Neill, as above narrated. Further on, near the boundary between Uganda and Anyoro, a body of two thousand Waganda spearmen joined Stanley, making a force of nearly three thousand souls, quite too large for practical exploration as the sequel proved. The path led through scenes of surpassing beauty and fertility, and of a character that changed from soft tropical luxuriance to alpine magnificence. After getting away from the forest-covered lowlands of the lake shore, they emerge into a rolling country dotted with ant hills and thinly sprinkled with tamarisks and thorny acacias. Then come rougher ways and wilder scenes. The land swells are higher, the valleys deeper. Rocks break through the surface, and the slopes are covered with splintered granite. The streams that were warm and sluggish, are now cold and rapid. By and by mountains set in, at first detached masses and then clearly defined ranges, rising 9,000 to 10,000 feet on the right hand and the left. Cutting breezes and chilly mists take the place of intense tropical heats. At length the monarch of mountains in this part of Africa comes into view and is named Mount Gordon Bennett. It lifts its head, at a distance of 40 miles north of their route, to a height of 15,000 feet, and seems to be a detached mass which overlooks the entire country. 
Its bases are inhabited by the Gambaragara, who have regular features, light complexions, and are the finest natives Mr. Stanley saw in Africa. Sight of them brought up the old question, whether an indigenous white race exists in Africa, as both Pinto and Livingstone seemed inclined to believe. But their woolly, or curly, hair was against them. They are a pastoral people and safe in their mountain fastnesses against attack. Snow often covered the top of their high mountain, which they said was an extinct crater and now the bed of a beautiful lake from whose center rises a lofty column of rocks. The whole country is filled with hot springs, lakes of bubbling mud and other evidences of volcanic action. These mountains Stanley thought to be the dividing ridge between Victoria Nyanza, 120 miles east, and the southern projection of Albert Nyanza. But what was his astonishment to find that he had no sooner rose to the summit of his dividing ridge than he stood on a precipice, 1,500 feet high, which overlooked the placid waters of the traditional Muta, or Luda, Nzaich. What a prize was here in store for the venturesome American! Something indeed which would rob Baker of his claim to the discovery of an ultimate Nile source in Albert Nyanza. Something which would set at rest many geographic controversies. And, strange to say, something which not only supported the truth of native accounts but seemed to verify the accuracy of an old Portuguese map dating back nearly 300 years. But fortune was not in favor of the American. His large force had scared the Unyuro people, and they had mysteriously disappeared. The Waganda warriors, who formed his escort, looked ominously on this situation. Sambuzi, the leader of the escort, had gained his laurels fighting the Anyoro, and he feared a trap of some kind was being laid for him. His fears demoralized his own men and Stanley's as well. They decided to retreat. Stanley remonstrated, and asked them to remain till he could lower his boat and explore the lake. He asked for but two days' grace. But expostulation was vain. They would all have deserted in a body. There was nothing left but to return. When they arrived at Ntesa's capital, which they did without accident, the king was frightfully mad at his men. He ordered the faithless Sambuzi to be imprisoned and all his wives and flocks to be confiscated. Then he offered Stanley his great general Sekabobo with an army of a hundred thousand men to carry him back to the Mutanzaich. Stanley declined his munificent offer, and determined that in the future none should guide and govern his own force except himself. So, with very much modified impressions of Uganda faithfulness, and somewhat angrily, he started off in a southerly direction, intending to see what lay westward of Victoria Nyanza. This route of Stanley southward was that of Speak and Grant northward, fourteen years before. It is a well-watered, thickly peopled, highly cultivated country, diversified by hill and hollow, and rich in cattle. Its water courses all drain into the Victoria Nyanza. Their heads are rushing streams, but as they approach the lake they become reedy, stagnant lakelets hard to cross. The largest of these, at the southwest corner of Victoria Nyanza, is Speaks Katangul, which Stanley named the Alexandra Nile. Will we never have done with these Nile rivers? These continuations of the Great River of Egypt? It seems then that Victoria Nyanza is but a resting place for more southern Nile waters. That this is so, seems clear from the fact that the Alexandra Nile really contributes more water than flows out of the lake at its northern outlet. It has been discovered also that Albert Nyanza sends off another affluent to the north, besides that which flows past Gondokoro and which has been regarded as the true Nile. Further it seems that Lake Ibrahim, halfway between Victoria and Albert Nyanza, on the Victoria Nile, dispatches an unknown branch into the wilderness. Whether these branches find their way back to the parent stream or go off to form new lakes, no one can exactly say. But in the Alexandra Nile Stanley claims he has discovered a new ramification of this wonderful river system leading to other lakes and lake mysteries. The natives call the Alexandra the mother of the waters of Uganda, that is, the Victoria Nyanza or Victoria Nile. Be this as it may, the Alexandra Nile is interesting both for its own sake and that of the people who live upon it. Stanley struck it far up from the lake where it was a quarter of a mile wide, with a dark central current 100 yards wide and 50 feet deep, 
which below became a rush-covered stream whose banks were crowded with villages and herds of cattle. Still further on, it narrows between rocks over which it rushes in a cataract, and then it broadens to lake proportions, being from 4 to 15 miles wide. In this expanse of reedy lagoons and green islands it merges into Victoria Nyanza Lake. Crossing the Alexandra Nile to the south, we are in the Karagwe country, ruled by King Romanica. Here is a haven of peace and rest. Speak and Grant stayed many weeks with Romanica. Stanley stopped for a considerable while to rest and recruit. He is gentle and reasonable, hospitable and friendly. He is a vassal of King Tessa of Uganda, but the two are wholly different, except in their admiration of white men. Romanica has no bursts of temper, but is serene, soft of voice and placid in manner. Stanley calls him a venerable and aged pagan, a tall man, six feet six inches high, gorgeously dressed, attended by a multitude of spearmen, drummers and fifers, bearing a cane seven feet long. He has a museum in which he delights, and is an insatiable gatherer of news from those who come from civilized countries. He is not to be outdone by the stories of strangers, but has always won in response ever fuller of marvel. When Stanley told him of the results of steam power and of the telegraph by which people could talk for thousands of miles, he slyly asked, whether or not the moon made different faces to laugh at us mortals on earth. He proved full of traditions and, if there was any foundation for them, Stanley left with a rare fund of geographic knowledge on hand. The mountain sixty miles northward, rising in triple cone and called Mfumbiro, he said was in the country of the Rwanda, a powerful state governed by an empress, who allows no stranger to enter. Her dominion stretch from the Mutanzaij to Tanganyika. They contain another great lake, forty by thirty miles, out of which the Alexandra Nile flows. It is possible to ascend this channel into another sheet of water, Lake Kivu, out of which at its southern end flows another stream, the Ruzizi, which flows into the north end of Tanganyika. What wonderful information this was, and if all true, we should have the most bewildering river system, by all odds in the world. We should find the old Portuguese map of 300 years ago reproduced and verified, and the anomaly of three mighty streams draining a continent mingling their parent waters, and even permitting the passage of a boat at high water. So that in the end it might go to the Mediterranean, the Atlantic or Indian Oceans. Further, Romanica stated that Rwanda is peopled by demons, and that beyond, on a lake called Nkanyaga, are a race of cannibals, and also pygmies, not two feet high. Stanley verified the king's story by a visit to the Rwanda folks, who gnashed their teeth like dogs and otherwise expressed their objections to his visit, and Dr. Schweinfurth found, a little nearer the western coast, evidences of a tribe of dwarfs who are supposed to be the aboriginal people of the continent. But the hardest of Romanica's stories was of a tribe who had ears so long that one answered for a blanket to lie on and another as a cover for the sleeper. Stanley began to think his civilized wonders were too tame to pit against those of the African king. The larger African animals abound in the Karagwe country. Stanley was much interested in the accounts of white elephants and rhinoceri. He had the good fortune to find one of the former animals, which he shot, but found it only a dirty grey brute, just as we find the advertised white elephants of the menagerie. The elephant is the most unpleasant neighbor of the rhinoceros. If they meet in a jungle the rhinoceros has to squeeze his ponderous body into the thicket or prepare for a battle royal. In such a quarrel his tusk is an ugly weapon but no match for the tusks of the elephant. The elephant sometimes treats him like a schoolboy and, breaking off a limb, belabors the unlucky rhinoceros till he beats a retreat. At other times the elephant will force him against a tree and pin him there with his tusks, or throw him down and tramp him till the life is out of him. Perhaps these were more of Romanica's yarns, but certain it is both beasts are formidable in a forest path, especially when alone and of surly temper. On the southern borders of Karagwe is a ridge five thousand feet high. Beyond this the waters trend southward and toward Tanganyika. And beyond this ridge the people change. There are no more stately kings, but petty, lying, blackmailing chiefs, just as we found about Gondokoro. Here Stanley encountered Mirambo, 
whose name is a word of terror from the Victoria Lake to the Nyasa, and from Tanganyika to Zanzibar. To the explorer's astonishment he found this notorious personage. The mildest mannered man that ever cut a throat. In short, a thorough African gentleman. He had difficulty in believing that this, unpresuming, mild-eyed man, of inoffensive exterior, so calm of gesture, so generous and open-handed, was the terrible man of blood who wasted villages, slaughtered his foes by the thousand, and kept a district of ninety thousand square miles in continual terror. Incontinently, the impulsive explorer resolved to swear blood brotherhood with the other wandering warrior, and the ceremony was gone through with all due solemnity. The marauding chief presented his new brother with a quantity of cloth, and the explorer gave him in return a revolver and a quantity of ammunition. And then, mutually pleased with each other, they parted, Mirambo and his merry men to the gay greenwood, where, doubtless, they had a pressing engagement to meet some other party of travellers, and Stanley for Ujiji. Ujiji is on Lake Tanganyika. Here we have to leave Stanley, for he is now done with the sources of the Nile, and midway on that wonderful journey which revealed the secrets of the Congo. We will follow him thence and see what he discovered and how he lifted the fog amid which Livingstone died, but that will have to be under the head of the Congo country, whose mystery he solved more clearly even than that of the Nile reservoirs. The Zambesi The great river Zambesi runs eastward across southern Africa and empties, by many mouths, into the Indian Ocean. It is an immense water system, with its head far toward the Atlantic Ocean, yet draining on its north side that mysterious lake region which occupies Central Africa, and on its south side an almost equally mysterious region. Its lower waters have been known for a long time, but its middle waters and its sources have been shrouded in a cloud of doubts as dense as that which overhung the reservoirs of the Nile. Livingstone has contributed more than any other explorer to the lifting of these doubts. He was born in Glasgow, March 19, 1813, and was self-educated. He studied medicine and became attached to the London Missionary Society as medical missionary. In 1840, at the age of 27 years, he was sent to Cape Town at the southern terminus of Africa, whence he went 700 miles inland to the Kuruman Station, established by Moffat on the southern border of the Kalahari Desert. Here and at Kalabang, on the Kalabang River, he acquired the language of the natives, principally Bechuana. On a return trip from Kalabang to Kuruman he came near losing his life by an adventure with a lion. The country was being ravaged by a troop of these beasts. When one of their number is killed, the rest take the hint and leave. It was determined to dispatch one, and a hunt was organized in company with the natives. They found the troop on a conical hill. The hunters formed a circle around the hill and gradually closed in. Mebla, a native schoolmaster, fired at one of the animals which was sitting on a rock. The bullet struck the rock. The angered beast bit the spot where the bullet struck and then bounded away. In a few moments Livingstone himself got a shot at another beast. The ball took effect but did not kill. The enraged beast dashed at his assailant before he could reload, and sprang upon him. He was borne to the ground beneath the lion's paws and felt his hot breath on his face. Another moment must have brought death. But the infuriated beast saw Mabalwe, who had snapped both barrels of his rifle at him. He made a dash for him and lacerated his thigh in a terrible manner. The natives, who had hitherto acted in a very cowardly manner, now came to the rescue with their spears. One of their number was pounced upon and badly torn. The beast now began to weaken from the effect of Livingstone's shot, and with a quiver throughout his huge frame rolled over on his side dead. After the excitement was over Dr. Livingstone found eleven marks of the lion's teeth on his left arm, which was broken close to the shoulder and the bone crushed into splinters. Livingstone married Moffat's daughter in 1844. She had been born in the country and was a thorough missionary. He made Kalabang a beautiful station and produced an excellent impression on the natives, all except the Boer tribes to the south and east, who had become much incensed against the English, owing as they thought. To the particularly harsh treatment they had received down in their former homes south of the Vol River. At Kalabang, Livingstone first heard of Lake Ngami, 
north of the Kalahari Desert. He resolved to visit it and started in May 1849, in company with his wife and children, several English travelers and a large party of Bechuana attendants. They rather skirted than crossed the desert, yet they found it to consist of vast salt plains, which gave a constant mirage as if the whole were water. Though destitute of water, there are tufts of dry salt-encrusted grass here and there, which relieve it of an appearance of barrenness, but which crumble at the touch. In July they struck the river Cubango, or Zonga, flowing eastward and, as far as known, losing itself in a great central salt lake, or Dead Sea. They were told that the Zonga came out of Lake Ngami, further west. Ascending the river sixty miles they struck the lake, and were the first Europeans to behold this fine sheet of water. The great tribe about and beyond the lake is the Makalolo, whose chief is Sabituane, a generous-hearted and truly noble character. They could not see him on this trip. So they returned, making easy journeys down the Zonga, admiring its beautiful banks, which abounded in large game, especially elephants. The next year, 1850, Livingstone and his family started again for Lake Ngami, accompanied by the good chief Setchel, who took along a wagon, drawn by oxen. While this means of locomotion gave comfort to the family, it involved much labor in clearing roads, and the animals suffered sadly from attacks by the tsetse fly, whose sting is poisonous. But the lake was reached in safety. The season proved sickly, and a return journey became compulsory, without seeing Sabituane. But the chief had heard of Livingstone's attempts to visit his court, and he sent presents, and invitations to another visit. He set out on a third journey, and this time directly across the desert, where they suffered much for want of water. This time they found the chief. His headquarters were on an island in the river, below the lake. He received the party with the greatest courtesy, and appeared to be the best-mannered and frankest chief Livingstone ever met. He was about forty-five years old, tall and wiry, of coffee and milk complexion, slightly bald, of undoubted bravery, always leading his men in battle, and by far the most powerful warrior beyond Cape Colony. He had reduced tribe after tribe, till his dominions extended far into the desert on the south of the Zonga, embraced both sides of that stream, and ran northward to, and beyond, the great Zambesi River. Chief Sabituane died while Livingstone was visiting him, and was succeeded by his daughter Mamachisane. She extended the privileges of the country to the travelers, and Livingstone went north to Sashik to see her. Here in June, 1851, he discovered the great Zambesi in the center of the continent of Africa where it was not previously known to exist, all former maps being incorrect. Though the country was not healthy, he was so impressed with the beauty of the Zambesi regions, and the character of the Makalolo people, that he resolved to make a permanent establishment among them. But before doing so he returned to Cape Colony and sent his family to England. Then he went back, visiting his old stations on the way. He arrived at Lignanti, where he found that the new queen had abdicated in favor of her brother, on May 23, 1853. The new king Sekalutu was not unlike his father in stature and color, was kindly disposed toward white people, but could not be convinced that their religious notions were suited to him. Livingstone remained a month at Lignanti, on the Chobe, or Kwando River, above its junction with the Zambezi. He then started on a further exploration of the latter river, and was gratified to find that Sekalota determined to accompany him with 160 attendants. They made royal progress down the Chobe to its mouth. Then they began to ascend the Zambesi in 33 canoes. The river was more than a mile broad, dotted with large islands and broken with frequent rapids and falls. The banks were thickly strewn with villages. Elephants were numerous. It was the new king's first visit to his people and everywhere the receptions were grand. Throughout this Bharat's valley hunger is not known, yet there is no care exercised in planting. The spirit of exploration had such full possession of Livingstone that, on the return of the royal party to Lignanti, he organized an expedition to ascend the Zambesi and cut across to Loanda on the Atlantic coast. This he did in 1854. It was on this journey that he discovered Lake Delolo. It is not much of a lake, being only eight miles long by three broad. But it was a puzzle to Livingstone, 
and has ever since been a curiosity. It is the connecting link between two immense water systems, that of the Congo and Zambesi. When he struck it on his westward journey toward Luanda, he found it sending out a volume into the Zambesi. Headwaters of a great river. He naturally exclaimed. And there was the elevation above the sea, the watershed, to prove it, for soon after all the waters ran northward and westward instead of eastward and southward. But in a few months he was making his return journey from Luanda to the interior, to fulfill his pledge to bring back his Makololo attendants in safety. He then approached this lake from the north. What was his surprise to find another slow-moving, reed-covered stream a mile wide, flowing from this end of the mysterious lake and sending its waters toward the Congo. Though ill with fever both times, he was able to conquer disease sufficiently to satisfy himself that this little lake, Delolo, for thousand feet above the sea level, is located exactly on the watershed between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And distributes its contents impartially between the two seas. A drop of rain blown by the wind to the one or the other end of the lake may reinforce the tumbling floods that roar through the channels of the Congo and rush sixty miles out into the salt waters of the Atlantic. Or may make with the Zambesi the dizzy leap through the Great Victoria Falls and mingle with the Indian Ocean. No similar phenomenon is known anywhere. Lake Kivo may form a corresponding band of union between the Congo and the Nile, but this we do not know. Apart from the eccentric double part it plays, the physical features of Delolo are tame and ordinary enough. It has, of course, hippopotami and crocodiles as every water in Central Africa has, and its banks are fringed with marshes covered with profuse growth of rushes, cane, papyrus, and reeds. Around it stretch wide plains, limitless as the sea, on which for many months of the year the stagnant waters rest, balancing themselves, as it were, between the two sides of a continent. Unable to make up their mind whether to favor the east coast or the west with their tribute. No trees break the horizon. The lands in the fens bear only a low growth of shrub, and the landscape is dismal and monotonous in the extreme. Delolo means despair, and the dwellers near it tell a story curiously resembling the tale of the cities of the plain, and the tradition handed down regarding some of the lakes in Central Asia. Of how a venerable wanderer came to this spot near evening and begged for the charity of shelter and food, how the churlish inhabitants mocked his petition. With the exception of one poor man who gave the stranger a nook by his fire and the best his hut afforded. And how after a terrible night of tempest and lightning the hospitable villager found his guest gone and the sight of his neighbor's dwellings occupied by a lake. When the rains have ceased and the hot sun has dried up the moisture the outlook is more cheerful. A bright golden band of flowers of every shade of yellow stretches across the path, then succeeds a stripe of blue, varying from the lightest tint to purple, and so band follows band with the regularity of the stripes on a zebra. The explorer is glad, however, to escape these splendid watersheds and to pass down into the shadows of the forests of the Zambesi, where, at least, there will be a change of discomforts, and a variety of scenery. There are four methods of travel familiar in southern Africa. One is the bullock wagon, convenient and pleasant enough in the southern plains, but hardly practicable in the rude wilderness adjoining the Zambesi. Riding on bullock back is a mode of travel which Livingstone frequently adopted from sheer inability to walk from weakness. Marching on foot is, of course, the best of all plans when a thorough minute acquaintance with the district traversed is desired. But for ease and rapid progress there is nothing like paddling your own canoe, or better still, having it paddled for you by skilled boatmen down the deep gorges and through the rushing shallows of the third of the great African rivers. Before the main stream of the Zambesi is reached, the forest shadows of the Lotembwa and the Liba have to be threaded. These dark moss-covered rivers flow between dripping banks of overgrown forests and jungle with frequent clearings, where the villagers raise their crops of manihok, the plant that yields the tapioco of commerce, and which here furnishes the chief food of the natives. Fetish worship flourishes in these dark and gloomy woods. In their depths a fantastically carved demon face, staring from a tree, will often startle the intruder, or a grotesque representation of a lion or crocodile, or of the human face made of rushes. 
plastered over with clay and with shells or beads for eyes, will be found perched in a seat of honor with offerings of food and ornaments laid on the rude altar. Whether human sacrifices are offered at these shrines cannot positively be said, but the most simple and trifling acts are tabooed, and unless the traveler is exceedingly wary in all that he does or says. He is likely to be met with heavy fines or looked upon as a cursed man, who will bring misfortune on all who aid or approach him. The medicine man has a terrible power which he often exercises over the lives and property of his fellows, and a sentence of witchcraft is often followed by death. A great source of profit is weather-making but, unlike the prophets in the arid deserts on the south, the magicians of this moist, cool region devote their energies to keeping off rain and not to bringing it down from heaven. Of course if they persevere long enough the rain ceases to fall, and the credulous natives believe that this has been produced by the medicine they have purchased so dearly. Just as the Bechuana of the desert believe in the ability of their rainmakers, when handsomely paid, to bring showers down on the thirsty ground by virtue of drumming and dancing. The behavior of the inhabitants of these villages, on the appearance among them of a white man, is apt to shake the notion of the latter that the superior good looks of his own race are universally acknowledged. Their standard of beauty is quite different from ours. Sometimes a wife is measured by the number of pounds she weighs, sometimes by her color, often by the peculiarities of ornamentation, or by special style of headdress or some disfigurement of the nose, lips or ears. On which the female population mainly rely for making themselves attractive. The wearing of clothes is regarded as a practice fairly provocative of laughter, and as improper as the want of them would be in America. Nothing could be more hideous to them than the long hair, shaggy beard and whiskers, like the mane of a lion, which strangers wear. If the stranger have blue eyes and red whiskers he is regarded as a hobgoblin, before whom the village girls run away screaming with terror, and the children hide trembling behind their mothers. At the village of the Shint, the principal tribe on the Liba River, Livingstone was very kindly treated by the chief. He received him seated in state under the shade of a banyan tree, with his hundred wives seated behind him, and his band of drummers performing in front. Out of gratitude, the doctor treated the distinguished party to an entertainment with the magic lantern. The subject was the death of Isaac, and the party looked on with awe as the gigantic figures with flowing oriental robes, prominent noses, and ruddy complexions appeared upon the curtain. But when the patriarch's uplifted arm, with the dagger in hand, was seen descending, the ladies, fancying that it was about to be sheathed in their bosoms instead of Isaac's, sprang to their feet with shouts of, Mother! Mother! And rushed helter-skelter, tumbling pell-mell after each other into corners or out into the open air, and it was impossible to bring them back to witness the patriarch's subsequent fortunes. On the lower part of the Liba the scenery becomes very beautiful and richly diversified. The alternation of hill and dale, open glade and forest, past which the canoe bears us swiftly, reminds one of a carefully kept park. Animal life becomes more plentiful with every mile of southward progress, and the broad meadows bordering the stream are pastured by great herds of wild animals, buffaloes, antelopes, zebras, elephants, and rhinoceri. All of which may be slaughtered in scores before they take alarm. Below the confluence of the Liba with the Zambesi, the abundance of game on the banks of the river is more remarkable. The air is found darkened by the flight of innumerable waterfowl, fishhawks, cranes, and waders of many varieties. The earth teems with insect life and the waters swarm with fish life. As an instance of the prodigious quantity and exceeding tameness of wild animals here, Livingstone mentions that 81 buffaloes marched in slow procession before our fire one evening within gunshot. And herds of splendid deer sat by day without fear at 200 yards distance, while all through the night the lions were heard roaring close to the camp. In the heat of the day sleek elands, tall as ordinary horses, with black glossy bodies and delicately striped skins, browsed or reclined in the shade of the forest trees. Troops of graceful, agile antelopes, of similar species, scour across the pasture lands to seek the cool retreat of some deep dell in the woods. Or a solitary rhinoceros comes grunting down to the bank in search of some soft place where he can roll his horny hide in the mud. 
The trees themselves have a variety and beauty which the somber evergreen foliage of higher latitudes lacks, and which is equally wanting in the dust-colored groves of the desert further south. The voyage down the stream is by no means without incident. The river swarms with hippopotami and crocodiles. The former lead a lazy sleepy life by day in the bottom of the stream, coming now and then to the surface to breathe and exchange a snort of recognition with their acquaintances, and are only too well pleased to let the passer-by go in peace. If he will but let them alone. In districts where they are hunted, they are wary and take care to push no more than the tip of their snouts out of the water, or lie in some bed of rushes where they breathe so softly that they cannot be heard. But in a place where they have not been disturbed, they can be seen swimming about, and sometimes the female hippopotamus can be seen with the little figure of her calf floating on her neck. Certain elderly males who are expelled from the herd become soured in temper and are dangerous to encounter, and so also is a mother if robbed of her young. Such a one made an attack on Livingstone's boat, when descending the Zambesi in 1855, butting it from beneath until the fore end stood out of water, and throwing one of the natives into the stream. By diving and holding on to the grass at the bottom, while the angry beast was looking for him on the surface, he escaped its vengeance and, the boat being fortunately close to the shore, the rest of the crew got off unharmed. The alligators of this part of the Zambesi are peculiarly rapacious and aggressive, and the chances are that anybody unlucky enough to fall into the river will find his way into the mouth of a watchful crocodile. Every year these ferocious reptiles carry off hundreds of human victims, chiefly women, while filling their water jars, or men whose canoes are accidentally upset, and the inhabitants in their turn make a prey of the beast. Being extremely fond of its flesh and eggs. The crocodile attacks by surprise. He lurks behind the bank of rushes, or lies in wait at the bottom of a pool, and dashes out as soon as he sees a human limb in the water. Sometimes, however, when hungry and where favorable opportunity occurs, he will haul his body ashore and waddle up the bank on his stumpy legs. If, while disporting himself on shore, his wicked green eyes fall on some likely victim in the stream, he will dash rapidly through the rushes, plunge into the river and make a bound for his prey. The young crocodiles show their vicious temper almost as soon as they are out of the shell, and one savage little wretch about two feet long made a snap at Dr. Livingstone's legs, while walking along the side of a stream in the Zambesi region, that made the explorer jump aside with more agility than dignity. Some distance below the junction of the Liba, the Zambesi enters the valley of the Barats. This is one of the most fertile, yet the most unhealthy, districts in the interior of Africa. It is stocked with great herds of domestic cattle of two varieties. One very tall with enormous horns, nearly nine feet between the tips, and the other a beautifully formed little white breed. The country could grow grain enough to support ten times the inhabitants it has at present. Like the lower valley of the Nile, the Barats country is inundated every year, over its whole surface, by the waters of the river, which deposit a layer of fertilizing slime. The banks of the Zambesi, for some distance above and below this district, are high and cliffy, presenting ridge after ridge of fine rock and pleasing scenery, while the stream runs swiftly over its stony bed. For a hundred miles through the Barats Valley the stream has a deep and winding course and the hills withdraw to a distance of fifteen miles from either bank. To the foot of these hills the waters extend in flood time, and the valley becomes temporarily one of the lake regions of Central Africa. At the lower end of the valley the rocky spurs again approach each other, and the river forces its way through a narrow defile in which, in flood time, the water rises to a height of sixty feet above its original level. Here are situated the Goni Falls which are a serious impediment to the navigation of the upper Zambesi. But there is no such danger or difficulty here for canoes as poor Stanley met with on the Congo. Practice has made the natives, living near the falls, experts in the work of transporting these canoes over the rocky ground and, as soon as a boat approaches the rapids from above or below, it is whisked without difficulty by a pair of sturdy arms to the quiet water beyond. Below the Goni Falls, the water bounds and rolls and bounces from bank to bank and chafes over the boulders in an alarming manner, their breadth being contracted to a few hundred yards. But these swollen rapids might all be ascended, Livingstone thinks, 
when the river is full. After many leagues of this mad gambling, the Zambesi settles down again for a hundred miles to sober flow, and opens out into a magnificent navigable river a mile or two from bank to bank. Still more grand, however, are its dimensions after it receives a great deep, dark-colored, slow-flowing river, the Quando, or Chobe, before mentioned. The Chobe empties through several mouths with winding channels fringed with beds of papyrus, the stems of which are plaited and woven together into an almost solid mass of vines, and by grass with keen, sharp, serrated edges, which cut like razors. Even the hippopotamus has no little ado in forcing a way through this forest, and less weighty personages have to walk humbly in his track. So wide is the Zambesi below the entrance of the Chobe, that even the practiced native eye cannot tell from the bank whether the land, dimly seen beyond, is an island or opposite shore. And the stream flows placidly past with no sign that it is almost within sight of a tremendous downfall. The only traveler who has explored the upper waters of the Chobe is Major Serpa Pinto, on his recent journey from Benguela to Natal. But we shall learn more of his travels hereafter. It is, however, interesting now to note that he found a spot on this river also, where he could almost have placed his cap on the point of junction between streams draining toward the Atlantic, the Zambesi, the Indian Ocean, and the Kalahari Desert. Livingstone has already made us familiar with Lake Ngami and the banks of the Lower Kwando. These are the furthest outposts of equatorial moisture toward the south, just as Lake Chad and the White Nile mark its northern limits. Once, it is supposed, and indeed the fact seems beyond dispute, the Zambesi, and all its upper branches, flowed down into this southern basin and formed a goodly inland sea, until some great cataclysm happened. That diverted it and its waters toward the eastern coast, leaving the central lake to be dried up into the shallow Ngami. And the streams of this region to wander about haphazard and uncertain whether to keep in the old tracks or follow in the new direction. The discovery of the Kwando River by Livingstone in 1849 demolished the theory of a burning desert occupying the interior of Africa from the Mediterranean to the Cape, and went far to prove, what has since been completely established. That the fabulous torrid zone of Africa, and its burning sands, is a well-watered region, resembling North America in its mountains and lakes, and India in its hot humid plains, thick jungles, and cool highlands. We have already seen that the South African desert is not without vegetation, but its pride and glory are herds of big and small game, antelopes, news, zebras, ostriches, elands, gemsbocks, gazelles. Various species of deer, that roam over its spacious plains. Great deeds of slaughter have been done with the rifle, and told over and over again in many a stirring book of African sport by Gunning, Anderson, and other Nimrods who were among the first of the army of hunters who now annually go in search of hides, tusks, and horns, which every year become more difficult to obtain. The lion is practically the only animal of the cat tribe which they have to encounter, the tiger being unknown in Africa, and the leopard comparatively rare. The lion seemed to be more at home in these salt deserts than in the rank forests further north, probably because he finds food more plentiful. Livingstone had no great opinion of this beast. He describes him as, about the size of a donkey and only brave at roaring, even the talk of his majestic roar he regards as, majestic twaddle, and he says he could never tell the voice of the lion from the voice of an ostrich. Except from knowing that the quadruped made a noise by night and the bird by day. The lion would never dream of putting himself against a noble elephant, though he will tear an elephant calf if he finds one unprotected, and he would still less engage in a contest with the thick-skinned rhinoceros. Even a buffalo is more than a match for the king of beasts. Major Oswald once came across three lions who were having much trouble in pulling a mortally wounded buffalo to the ground. Both the elephant and rhinoceros are hunted here by the natives with packs of dogs. The yelping curs completely bewilder their heavy game, and while he is paying attention to them and making attempts to kill them, the native creeps up and plants his bullet or poison spear in a vital spot. English sportsmen prefer to go out against the elephant on foot or on horseback or, as Anderson, upon the back of a trained ox. In former times as many as twenty have been killed on a single excursion. The chase of the huge animal, 
which attains a maximum height of 12 feet on the Zambesi, becomes really exciting and dangerous work, for the African variety, owing to the formation of its skull. Cannot be brought down by a forehead shot like the Indian variety. The giraffe and ostrich are also hunted on horseback, and the plan adopted by hunters is to press them at a hard gallop from the first, which causes them to lose their wind and sometimes to drop dead from excitement. The ostrich, when at the top of his speed, has been known to run at the rate of 30 miles an hour, so that there is no hope of overtaking him in a direct chase. But the stupid bird often delivers itself into the hands of its pursuers by running in curves instead of speeding straight ahead. The people of the Kalahari Desert are as characteristic of the soil and climate as its vegetable life and four-footed beasts. They are of two kinds, first bushmen, who are true sons of the wilderness, wild men of the desert, who live by the chase. They are of diminutive stature and, like the dwarfs further north, are supposed to represent the real aborigines of Africa. The second are remnants of the Bechuana tribes. These have been driven into the desert by the pressure of stronger peoples behind. They are a people who cling to their original love for domestic animals, and watch their flocks of lean goats and meager cattle with great care. On the edges of the desert are the Boers, emigrant Dutch farmers, who have fled from British rule in the Transvaal, as their fathers fled from Cape Colony in Natal. The coming of these always betokens trouble with the natives, and as gold miners and diamond diggers are penetrating into the Kalahari Desert, we may expect to see British authority close on their heels. And perhaps at no distant day fully established on the banks of the Zambesi, unless forsooth, some other nations should see fit to interfere. In his trip to Luanda, Livingstone had been seeking an outlet to the Atlantic for the Makololo people. On his return, they were dissatisfied with his route and preferred an outlet eastward toward the Indian Ocean. He therefore resolved to explore a path in this direction for them. With all his wants abundantly supplied by the friendly chief Sekaludu, he set out for this great journey and after a fortnight's laborious travel reached the Zambesi at the mouth of the Chobe, in November 1855. Sailing down the Zambesi, Livingstone saw rising high into the air before him, at a distance of six miles, five pillars of vapor with dark smoky summits. The river was smooth and tranquil, and his boat glided placidly over water clear as crystal, past lovely islands, densely covered with tropical vegetation, and by high banks with red cliffs peering through their background of palm trees. The traveler was not altogether unprepared for the marvels that lay ahead. Two hundred miles away he had heard of the fame of the great gorge Mozioe Tunia, the sounding smoke, where the Zambesi mysteriously disappeared. As the falls were approached the pulse of the river seemed to quicken. It was still more than a mile wide, but it hurried over rapids, and chafed around points of rocks, and the most careful and skillful navigation was needed, lest the canoe should be dashed against a reef, or hurried helplessly down the chasm. The mystery in front became more inexplicable the nearer it was approached, for the great river seemed to disappear suddenly underground, leaving its bed of hard black rock and well-defined banks. By keeping the middle of the stream and cautiously paddling between the rocks, he reached a small island on the tip of the Victoria Falls, a spot where he planted some fruit trees. And for the only time on his travels carved his initials on a tree in remembrance of his visit. It could not be seen what became of the vast body of water, until the explorer had crept up the dizzy edge of the chasm from below, and peeped over into the dark gulf. The river, more than a mile in width, precipitated itself sheer down into a rent extending at right angles across its bed. The walls of the precipice were as cleanly cut as if done by a knife, and no projecting crag broke the sheet of falling waters. For rocks, or rather small islands, on the edge of the falls divide them into five separate cascades, and in front of each fall rises one of the tall pillars of smoke which are visible in time of flood at a distance of ten miles. Only at low water can the island on which Livingstone stood be approached, for when the river is high any attempt to reach it would result in a plunge into the abyss below. Against the black wall of the precipice opposite the falls two, three, and sometimes four rainbows, each forming three-fourths of an arc, are painted on the ascending clouds of spray, which continually rush up from the depths below. A fine rain is constantly falling from these clouds, and the cliffs are covered with dense, dripping vegetation. 
but the great sight is the cataract itself. The rent in the rocks seems to be of comparatively recent formation, for their edges are worn back only about three feet. Since Livingstone's first visit, the falls have been more minutely examined by other explorers, so that we now know more accurately their dimensions and leading features. The breadth of the river at the falls has been ascertained to be over 1860 yards, and the depth of the precipice below the island 360 feet, or twice that of Niagara. At the bottom of the rent, all the waters that have come over the falls rush together in the center of the gulf immediately beneath the island where, confined in a space of twenty or thirty yards, they form a fearful boiling whirlpool. From this a stream flows through the narrow channel at right angles to the course above and, turning a sharp corner, emerges into another chasm parallel with the first, then through another confined gap to a third chasm. And so backward and forward in wild confusion through forty miles of hills, until it breaks out into the level country of the lower Zambesi. The rush of the river through this inaccessible ravine is not so turbulent as might be imagined from its being pent in between walls less than forty yards apart. It pushes its way with a crushing, grinding motion, sweeping around the sharp corners with a swift resistless ease that indicates plainly a great depth of water. It was through this gap, caused by some unrecorded convulsion of the earth, that the great lake which must have at one time occupied south-central Africa, has been drained, and it forms undoubtedly the most wonderful natural feature in Africa. If not in the world. At the great falls of the Zambesi, named the Victoria Falls in honor of the Queen of England, we are still a thousand miles from the sea, and hundreds of miles from the first traces of civilization. Such as appear in the Portuguese possessions of eastern Africa. Nature has been exceedingly lavish of her gifts in the lower Zambesi Valley, giving it a fertile soil, a splendid system of river communication, and great stores of mineral and vegetable wealth, everything indeed. That is necessary to make a prosperous country, except a healthy climate, and industrious population. Here as upon the borders of the Nile, war and slave hunting have cursed the country with an apparently hopeless blight. Around the falls themselves are the scenes of some of the most noteworthy events in Central African warfare. The history of what are called the Tchurka Wars, has not yet and never will be written, nevertheless they extended over as great an area and shook as many thrones and dominions as those of Bonaparte himself. Tchurka was a chief of the now familiar Zulu tribe, and grandfather of that celebrated Sediweo, whose ill-starred struggle with the English cost him his country and his liberty and whom we read of the other day as a royal captive in the streets of London. It is said that he had heard of the feats of the first Napoleon, and was smitten with a desire to imitate his deeds. He formed his tribes into regiments, and these became the famous Zulu bands which immediately began to make war on all their neighbors. Conquered armies were incorporated into the Zulu army, and Cherka went on making conquests in Natal, Kafaria, and southern Africa, leaving the lands waste and empty. He spread the fame of the Zulus far into the possessions of the English and Portuguese. Turning north, he occupied the country as far as the Zambesi. Crossing this stream, he moved into the regions between the lakes Nyasa and Tanganyika, then he carried his power to the westward as far as the Victoria Falls, where he was met by the Makalolos, with whom Livingstone has just made us familiar. In this people, under their chief, Sabituain, he found an enemy worthy of his steel. This tribe could not be conquered so long as their chief lived, but at his death their kingdom began to go to pieces under Sekalutu, though he was not less brave and intelligent than his father. It was over the smoldering embers of these wars that Livingstone had to pass in his descent of the Zambesi. As he descended the Zambesi and approached the Indian Ocean, the stream gathered breadth and volume from great tributaries which flow into it on either side. The Kafui, hardly smaller than the Zambesi itself, comes into it from the north. Its course has still to be traced and its source has yet to be visited. Further down, the Longwa, also a mighty river, enters it, and its banks, like those of the Kafui, are thickly populated, and rich in mineral treasures. The great Zambesi sweeps majestically on from one reach of rich tropical scenery to another. On its shores are seen the villages of native fishermen. Their huts and clearings for cotton and tobacco are girded about by dense jungles of bamboo, back of which rise forests of palm. 
Behind the forests the grand hills slope up steeply, diversified with clumps of timber and fringed with trees to their summits. Behind, extend undulated plains of long grass to the base of a second range of hills, the outer bank of the Zambesi Valley. Now and then, on either bank, a river valley opens, whose sides are thickly overgrown with jungle, above which rise the feathery tops of the palms and the stately stems of the tamarind. On their margins, or on the slopes above, herds of buffaloes, zebras, roebucks and wild pigs may be seen peacefully grazing together, with occasionally a troop of elephants or a solitary rhinoceros. Dar. Livingstone says, nowhere in all his travels has he seen such an abundance of animal life as in this portion of the Zambesi. Yet it is possible even here to be alone. The high walls of grass on either side of the jungle path seem to the traveler to be the boundaries of the world. At times a strange stillness pervades the air, and no sound is heard from bird or beast or living thing. In the midst of this stillness, interruptions come like surprises and sometimes in not a very pleasant form. Once while Dar. Livingstone was walking in a reverie, he was startled by a female rhinoceros, followed by her calf, coming thundering down along the narrow path, and he had barely time to jump into a thicket in order to escape its charge. Occasionally a panic-stricken herd of buffaloes will make a rush through the center of the line of porters and donkeys, scattering them in wild confusion into the bush and tossing perhaps the nearest man and animal into the air. Neither the buffalo nor any other wild animal, however, will attack a human being except when driven to an extremity. The lion or leopard, when watching for their prey, will perhaps spring on the man who passes by. The buffalo, if it thinks it is being surrounded, will make a mad charge to escape, or the elephant, if wounded and brought to bay, or in defense of its young, will turn on its pursuers. A rogue elephant or buffalo, who has been turned out of the herd by his fellows for some fault or blemish, and has become cross and ill-natured by his solitary life, has been known to make an unprovoked attack on the first creature, man or beast. That presents itself to his sight. Thus, one savage, rogue, buffalo, furiously charged a native of Livingstone's party, in the ascent of the Zambesi in 1860. And the man had barely time to escape into a tree when the huge head of the beast came crashing against the trunk with a shock fit to crack both skull and tree. Backing again, he came with another rush, and thus continued to beat the tree until seven shots were fired into him. But as a rule, every untamed creature flees in terror on sighting red-handed man. The only real obstacle to a descent of the Zambesi by steamer between Victoria Falls and the sea, is what are called Kebrabiza Rapids, and even the navigation of these is believed to be possible in time of flood. When the rocky bed is smoothed over by deep water. In the ordinary state of the river these rapids cannot be passed, although the inhuman experiment has been tried of fastening slaves to a canoe and flinging them into the river above the rapids. Dar. Kirk had here an accident which nearly cost him his life. The canoe in which he was seated was caught in one of the many whirlpools formed by the cataract, and driven broadside toward the vortex. Suddenly a great upward boiling of the water, here nearly one hundred feet deep, caught the frail craft, and dashed it against a ledge of rock, which the doctor was fortunately able to grasp, and thus save himself. Though he lost all his scientific instruments. When Livingstone's boat, which was immediately behind the doctors reached the spot, the yawning cavity of the whirlpool had momentarily closed up and he passed over it in safety. All along the line of the lower Zambesi we find traces of Portuguese colonies, and also of the slave trade. Nowhere in all Africa has this traffic been more flourishing or ruinous in its effects, than in the colony of Mozambique. Here too, Livingstone was the champion who, almost single-handed, marched out and gave battle to this many-headed monster. Like Baker in the north, he inflicted upon it what we must hope is a fatal wound. As with the Egyptian authorities in the north, so the Portuguese authorities in the south, seem to have been actively concerned with the slave dealers. They not only connived at it, but profited by it. At one time, before slave trading became a business, European influence and Christian civilization under the auspices of the Jesuit missionaries extended far into the interior. 
At the confluence of the Lonwa and Zambesi is still to be seen a ruined church of one of the furthest outposts of the Jesuit fathers, its bell half buried in the rank weeds. The spot is the scene of desolation now. Livingstone bears generous testimony to the zeal, piety and self-abnegation of these Jesuit priests. Their plans and labors hindered the slave-gatherer's success, and it became necessary to get rid of them by calumny and often worse weapons. With the failure of their mission perished all true progress and discovery, and when Livingstone visited the Portuguese colonies on the Zambesi, he found complete ignorance of the existence of the Victoria Falls and only vague rumors of the existence of Lake Nyassa from which the Shire, the last of the great affluents of the Zambesi, was supposed to flow. Only ninety miles from the mouth of the Great Zambesi, empties the Shire from the north. It is a strong, deep river, and twenty years ago was unknown. It is navigable halfway up, when it is broken by cataracts which descend 1,200 feet in 35 miles. If this river is always bounded by sedgy banks, magnificent mountains are always in view on either side. No vegetation could be richer than that found in its valley, and its cotton is equal to our own sea island. The natives have both the skill and the inclination to work. It is not a healthy region along the river, for often the swamps are impenetrable to the base of the mountains. Animal life abounds in all tropical forms. The glory of the marshes is their hippopotami and elephants. Livingstone, in 1859, counted 800 of these animals in sight at once. But they have been greatly thinned out by hunters. From the cataracts of the Shire, Livingstone made several searches for lakes spoken of by the natives. He found Lake Sherwa amid magnificent mountain scenery. But the great feature of the valley is Lake Nyassa, the headwaters of the stream. It was discovered by Livingstone, September 16, 1859. It is 300 miles long and 60 wide. It resembles Albert Nyanza and Tanganyika, with which it was formerly supposed to be connected. Its shores are overhung by tall mountains, down which cascades plunge into the lake. But once on the tops of these mountains, there is no precipitous decline, only high table land stretching off in all directions. The inhabitants are the wildest kind of Zulus, who carry formidable weapons and paint their bodies in fiendish devices. They are the victims of the slave traders to an extent which would shock even the cruel Arab brigands of the White Nile. Lake Nyassa is a lake of storms. Clouds are often seen approaching on its surface, which turn out to be composed of Congo flies, which are gathered and eaten by the natives. The ladies all wear lip rings. Some of the women have fine Jewish or Assyrian features, and are quite handsome. The fine alpine country north of Nyassa has not been explored, except slightly by Elton and Thompson, who found it full of elephants, and one of the grandest regions in the world for sublime mountain heights, deep and fertile valleys. And picturesque scenery. The mountains rise to a height of 12,000 to 14,000 feet, and are snow-capped. In the valley of the Shire lie the bones of many an African explorer. Bishop Mackenzie is buried in its swamps. Thornton found a grave at the foot of its cataracts. A few miles below its mouth, beneath a giant baobab tree reposed the remains of Mrs. Livingstone, and near her is the resting place of Kirkpatrick, of the Zambesi Survey of 1826. Yet the thirst for discovery in the Zambesi country has not abetted. Nor will it till Nyassa, Tanganyika, and even Victoria and Albert Nyanza, are approachable, for there can be no doubt that the Zambesi is an easier natural inlet to the heart of Africa than either the Nile or Congo. No account of the Zambesi can be perfect without mention of Pinto's trip across the continent of Africa. He started from Benguela, on the Atlantic, in 1877, under the auspices of the Portuguese government and in two years reached the eastern coast. He was a careful observer of the people, and his journey was through the countries of the Nano, Wambo, Sambo, Moma, Biha, Cubango, Gangelas, Luchezes and others till he struck the Zambesi River. His observations of manners and customs are very valuable to the student and curious to the general reader. His work abounds in types of African character, 
and in descriptions of that art of dressing hair which Christian ladies are ever willing to copy but in which they cannot excel their dusky sisters. It takes sometimes two or three days to build up, for African ladies, their triumphs of barber's art, but they last for as many months. The Wombo people, male and female, enrich their hair with coral beads in a way that sets it off with much effect. The Sambo women, though not so pretty in the face, affect a louder style of head dress, and one which may pass as more artistic. But Pinto was prepared to wonder how human hair could ever be gotten into the various artistic shapes found on the heads of the Ganguela women. Their skill and patience in braiding seemed to be without limit. The Biha head dress was more flaunting but not a whit less becoming. Indeed there seemed in all the tribes to be a special adaptation of their art to form and features, but whether it was the result of study or accident, Pinto could not of course tell, being a man and not up in ladies' toilets. The Quimban girls wore their hair comparatively straight, but their heads were covered with cowries bespangled with coral beads. The Kabango women have a happy knack of thatching their heads with their hair in such a way as to give the impression that you are looking on an excellent job of Holland tiling, or on the overlapping scales of a fish. The Lucas women evidently take their models from the grass covers of their huts. They make a closely woven mat of their hair which has the appearance of fitting the scalp like a cap. The Ambuela head dress is as neatly 362 artistic as any modern lady could desire. Indeed there is nothing in civilized countries to approach it in its combination of beauty and adaption for the purposes intended. Pinto's journey across Africa was one of comparative leisure. He was well equipped, and was scarcely outside of a tribe that had not heard of Portuguese authority, which extends inland a great ways from both the east and west sides of the continent. He did not however escape the ordinary hardships of African travel, even if he had time to observe and make record of many things which escaped the eye of other explorers. The High Carnival, or Annual Festival, of the Sova Mavanda was a revelation to him. He had seen state feasts and war dances, but in this the dancing was conducted with a regularity seldom witnessed on the stage, and the center of attraction was the Sova chief, masked after the fashion of a harlequin. And seemingly as much a part of the performance as a clown in a circus ring. The rivers of this part of Africa are a prominent obstacle in a traveler's path. Even where they are bordered by wide, sedgy swamps, there is in the center a deep channel, and nearly always an absence of canoes. But the natives are quick to find out fording places which are generally where the waters run swiftly over sandbars. Pinto's passage of the Kuchibai was effected at a fording where the bar was very narrow, the water on either side 10 to 12 feet deep, and the current running at the rate of 65 yards a minute. It was a difficult task, but was completed in less than two hours by his whole party, and without accident. After striking the tributaries of the Zambesi, he followed them to their junction with the main stream in the very heart of Africa. Then he descended the Zambesi in canoes to the mouth of the Quango, or Chobe, in the country of the Makalolos. He passed by the Goni Falls, and down through the Luso Rapids, where safety depends entirely on the skill of the native canoemen. After passing these rapids, which occupy miles of the river's length, he came into the magnificent Baratza region where the river waters a finer plain than the Nile in any of its parts. But Livingstone has already made us familiar with the Zambesi throughout all these parts. Yet it is due to Pinto to say he made, with the instruments at his command, more careful observations of the great Victoria Falls, Mozio Etunia, than any previous explorer, especially from below. He could not get a height of over 246 feet, owing to the difficulty of seeing to the bottom of the gorge, and found the verge broken into three sections, one of a width of 1,312 feet, another of 132 feet, and the remainder a saw-like edge over which the waters poured smoothly only when the stream was full. These falls, says Pinto, can be neither properly depicted nor described. The pencil and the pen are alike at fault, and in fact, save at their western extremity, the whole are enveloped in a cloud of vapor which, perhaps fortunately, hides half the awfulness of the scene. It is not possible to survey this wonder of nature without a feeling of terror and of sadness creeping over the mind. Up at the Goni Falls everything is smiling and beautiful, here at Mozioetunia everything is frowning, and awful. 
Pinto's journey was now southward across the great Kalahari Desert, and thence to the eastern coast. We must go with him to the center of this desert, for he unravels a secret there in the shape of, the great salt pan. We remember Livingstone's discovery of Lake Ngami, into which and out of which pours the Cubango River, to be afterwards lost in the central salt pan of the desert. Pinto discovered that this salt pan received, in the rainy season, many other large tributaries, and then became an immense lake, or rather system of pans or lakes, 10 to 15 feet deep and from 50 to 150 miles long. This vast system, he says, communicates with Lake Ngami by means of the Cubango, or Zonga River, on nearly the same level. If Ngami rises by means of its inflow, the current is down the Cubango toward the salt pans. If however the pans overflow, by means of their other tributaries, the current is up the Cubango toward Lake Ngami. So that among the other natural wonders of Africa we have not only a system of great rivers pouring themselves into an inland sea with no outlet except the clouds, but also a great river actually flowing two ways for a distance of over a hundred miles, as the one or the other lake on its course happens to be fullest. The Congo Lake Tanganyika had been known to the Arab slave hunters of the east coast of Africa long before the white man gazed upon its bright blue waters. These cunning, cruel people had good reasons for guarding well the secret of its existence. Yet popular report of it gave it many an imaginary location and dimension. What is remarkable about it is that since it has been discovered and located, it has taken various lengths and shapes under the eye of different observers, and though it has been circumnavigated, throughout its 1,200 miles of coast, no one can yet be quite positive whether it has an outlet or not. It is 600 miles inland from Zanzibar, or the east coast of Africa, and almost in the center of that wonderful basin whose reservoirs contribute to the Nile, Zambesi, and Congo. The route from Zanzibar halfway to the lake is a usual one, and we need not describe it. The balance of the way, through the Ugogo and Unyamwezi countries, is surrounded by the richest African verdure and diversified by running streams and granitic slopes, with occasional crags. At length the mountain ranges which surround the lake are reached, and when crossed there appear on the eastern shore the thatched houses of Ujiji, the rendezvous of all expeditions, scientific, commercial and missionary, that have ever reached these mysterious waters. Burton and Speke were the white discoverers of Tanganyika. It seemed to them the revelation of a new world, a sight to make men hold their breath with a rush of new thoughts, as when Boba and his men stood silent on that peak in Darien and gazed upon the Pacific Ocean. Fifteen years later Cameron struck it and could not believe that the vast grey expanse was aught else than clouds on the distant mountains of Ugoma, till closer observation proved the contrary. Livingstone struck it from the west side. It was on his last journey through Africa, he had entered upon that journey at Zanzibar, in April 1866, and made for Lake Nyassa and its outlet the Shire River, both of which have been described in connection with the Zambesi. Then began that almost interminable ramble to which he fell a victim. He was full of the theory that no traveller had yet seen the true headwaters of the Nile, in other words that neither Victoria nor Albert Nyanza were its ultimate reservoirs. But that they were to be found far below the equator in that bewildering, lake region, which never failed to reveal wonderful secrets to such as sought with a patience and persistency like his own. He was supported in this by the myths of the oldest historians, by the earliest guesses which took the shape of maps, by the traditions of the natives that boats had actually passed from Albert Nyanza into Tanganyika. But above all by the delusion that the great river Lulaba, which he afterwards found flowing northward from lakes far to the south of Tanganyika, could not be other than the Nile itself. On his way westward from Lake Nyassa, he came upon the Lonwa River, a large affluent of the Zambesi from the north. Crossing this, and bearing northwest, he confronted the Lokinga Mountains, from whose crests he looked down into the valley of the Shambesi. It was clear that these mountains formed a shed which divided the waters of the central basin, or lake region, of Africa from those which ran south into the Zambesi. Had he discovered the true sources of the Nile at last? Where did those waters go to, if not to the Mediterranean? 
The journal of his last travels is full of soliloquies and refrains touching the glory of a discovery which should vindicate his theory and set discussion at rest. And what was he really looking down upon from that mountain height? The Shambizi, affluent of Lake Banguilla. Yes. But vastly more. He was looking on the head waters of the northward running Lulaba, which proved his ignis fatuous and led him a six-year dance through the wilderness and to his grave. The Lulaba has been christened Livingstone River, in honor of the great explorer. Then again it was only the Lulaba in name, which he was pursuing, with the hope that it would turn out to be the Nile. It was really the great Congo, for after the Lulaba runs northeast toward Albert Nyanza, and to a point far above the equator, it makes a magnificent sweep westward, and southwestward. And seeks the Atlantic at a point not ten degrees above the latitude of its source. Thus was Livingstone perpetually deceived. But for all that we must ever admire his enthusiasm for research and his heroism under extreme difficulties. When he plunged down the mountainside into the depths of the forests that lined the Shambizi, it was to enter a night of wandering which had no star except the meeting of Stanley at Ajiji in 1871, and no morning at all. What a story of heroic adventure lies in those years. Ere his death, his followers had deserted him, carrying back to the coast lying stories of his having been murdered. Trusted servants ran away with his medicine chest, leaving him no means of fighting the deadly diseases which from that hour began to break down his strength. The country ahead had been wasted and almost emptied of inhabitants by the slave traders. Hunger and thirst were the daily companions of his march. Constant exposure to wet brought on rheumatism and ague, painful ulcers broke out in his feet, pneumonia, dysentery, cholera, miasmatic fever, attacked him by turns. But still, so long as his strength was not utterly prostrated, the daily march had to be accomplished. Still more trying than the fatigue were the vexatious delays, extending sometimes over many months, caused by wars, epidemics, or inundation, that frequently compelled him to retrace his steps when apparently on the verge of some great discovery. Often, in order to make progress, he had no alternative but to attach his party to some Arab expedition which, under pretense of ivory trading, had come out to plunder, to kidnap, and to murder. The terrible scenes of misery and slaughter of which he was thus compelled to be the witness, had perhaps a stronger and more depressing effect on his mind than all the other trials that fell to his lot. I am heartbroken and sick of the sight of human blood, he writes, as he turns, baffled, weary, and broken in health from one line of promising exploration to another. He has left us only rough jottings of this story of wild adventure and strange discovery. For weeks at a time no entries are found in his journal. The hand that should have written them was palsied with fever, the busy brain stunned into unconsciousness, and the tortured body borne by faithful attendants through novel scenes on which the eager explorer could no longer open his eyes. His letters were stolen by Arabs, both those going to and coming from him. Yet his disjointed notes, written on scraps of old newspapers with ink manufactured by himself out of the seeds of native plants, tell a more affecting tale of valuable discovery than many a carefully written narrative. He gives us glimpses into the Shambizi jungles, whose population has been almost swept away by the slave dealers. Fires sweep over the virgin lands in the dry season. A single year restores to them their wanted verdure. Song birds relieve the stillness of the African forests, but those of gayest plumage are silent. The habits of bees, ants, beetles and spiders are noted, and of the ants, found in all parts of Africa, those in these central regions build the most palatial structures. The most ferocious enemy of the explorer is not the portentous weapon of lion's claw, rhinoceros horn, or elephant's tusk, but a small fly, the notorious tsetse, whose bite is death to baggage animals, whose swarms have brought ruin to many a promising expedition, and whose presence is a more effectual barrier to the progress of civilization than an army of a million natives. Then he is full of quaint observations on the lion, for which he had little respect, and on the more lordly elephant and rhinoceros. A glade suddenly opens where a group of shaggy buffaloes are grazing, or a herd of startled giraffes scamper away through the foliage with their long necks looking like locomotive obelisks. Then comes a description of a hippopotamus hunt, 
the bravest thing I ever saw. Again the night is often made hideous by the shrieks of the Soko, probably the gorilla of Du Chelu, and of which Cameron heard on Tanganyika and Stanley on the Lulaba. But only Livingstone has given us authentic particulars of it. Its home is among the trees, but it can run on the ground with considerable speed, using its long forearms as crutches, and hitching itself along on its knuckles. In some respects it behaves quite humanly. It makes a rough bed at night among the trees, and will draw a spear from its body and staunch the wound with grass. It is a pot-bellied, wrinkled-faced, human-featured animal with incipient whiskers and beard. It will not attack an unarmed man or woman but will spring on a man armed with a spear or stick. In attack it will seize the intruder in its powerful arms, get his hand into its mouth, and one by one bite off his fingers and spit them out. It has been known to kidnap babies, and carry them up into the trees, but this seems to be more out of sport than mischief. In his family relations the male Soko is a model of affection, assisting the mother to carry her young and attending strictly to the proprieties of Soko society. A young Soko which was in the doctor's possession had many intelligent and winning ways, showed great affection and gratitude, was careful in making its bed and tucking itself in every night and scrupulously wiped its nose with leaves. In short, it must be allowed, that the native verdict, that the Soko has good in him, is borne out by the known facts, and that in some respects he compares not unfavorably, both in character and manners. With some of the men we make acquaintance with in our wanderings through Africa. It was in April 1867, one year after his start from Zanzibar, that Livingstone crossed the Shambizi, and soon afterwards found himself on the mountains overlooking Lake Liemba. Which proved to be none other than the southern point of our old friend Lake Tanganyika. Thence he zigzagged westward over sponge-covered earth till he struck Lake Moro, with a stream flowing into its southern end, really the Lulaba. On its way from Lake Banguila, and out at its northern, again the Lulaba, into other lakes which the natives spoke of. Now, more than ever before, he was persuaded that he was on the headwaters of the Nile, and he would have followed his river up only to surprise himself by coming out into the Atlantic through the mouth of the Great Congo if it had not been for native wars ahead. Then he put back to examine a great lake of this river system, which the natives said existed south of Lake Moro. After a tramp of weeks through wet and dry, he found himself on the marshy banks of Lake Banguila. Close by where he struck it, was its outlet, the Lulaba, here known as Luapula. It is a vast reservoir, 200 miles long by 130 broad, and has no picturesque surroundings, but is interspersed with many beautiful islands. Confident now that he had the true source of the Nile, for the watershed to the south told him that everything below it ran into the Zambesi, nothing remained but for him to return to where he had left off his survey of the Lulaba. Far to the north, and to follow that stream till he proved the truth of his theory. In going thither he would take in Lake Tanganyika. It was a terrible journey. For sixteen days he was carried in a litter under a burning sun, through marshy hollows and over rough hills. Sight of Tanganyika revived his drooping spirits, but he feared he must die before reaching Ajiji. It was March 1869, before he reached the coveted resting place, but he found awaiting him no aid, no medicines, no letters. He had been dead to the world for three long years. King Mirambo was off on the warpath against the Arabs, and Livingstone had to wait, undergoing slow recovery for many months. At length, following in the trail of Arab slave dealers who had never before penetrated so far westward of the lake, and frequent witness of their barbarities, he reached a point on the Lulaba as far north as Nyangli. Where the river already began to take the features of cliff and cannon which Stanley found to belong to the lower Congo, and where the natives showed the prevalence of those caste ideas which prevail on the western coast but are unknown on the eastern. The region was also one of gigantic woods, into which the sun's rays never penetrated, and beneath which were pools of water which never dried up. The river flats were a mass of luxuriant jungle, abounding in animal life. Livingstone was greatly annoyed at one of his halting places by the depredations of leopards on his little flock of goats. A snare gun was set for the offenders. It was heard to go off one night, 
and his attendants rushed to the scene with their lances. The prize had been struck and both its hind legs were broken. It was thought safe to approach it, but when one of the party did so, the stricken beast sprang upon the man's shoulder and tore him fearfully before being killed. He was a huge male and measured six feet eight inches from nose to tail. Nyangwi, the furthest point of his journey up, or rather down, the Lulaba, or Congo, is in the country of the Manuema, the finest race Livingstone had seen in Africa. The females are beautiful in feature and form. The country is thickly peopled, and they have made considerable progress in agriculture and the arts. Villages appear at intervals of every two or three miles. The houses are neatly built, with red painted walls, thatched roofs, and high doorways. The inhabitants are clever smiths, weavers and tanners, and all around are banana groves and fields tilled in maize, potatoes and tapioca. The chiefs are important personages, who exercise arbitrary authority and dress regally. Livingstone suspected they practiced cannibalism, but could not prove it. Stanley noticed a row of 180 skulls decorating one of their village streets. He was told they were Soko skulls, but carrying two away, he presented them to Prof. Huxley, who pronounced them Negro craniums of the usual type. One of their great institutions is the market, held in certain villages on stated days. People come to these from great distances to exchange their fish, goats, ivory, oil, pottery, skins, cloth, ironware, fruit, vegetables, salt, grain, fowls, and even slaves. There is a great variety of costume, loud crying of wares, much bargaining and no inconsiderable hilarity. The market at Nyangwi is held every four days, and the assemblage numbers as many as 3,000 people. Even in war times market people are allowed to go to and fro without molestation. The Arab slave traders are fast demoralizing these people. They set the different tribes to fighting and then step in and carry off multitudes of slaves. One fine market day these miscreants suddenly appeared among the throng of unsuspecting people and began an indiscriminate firing. They fled in all directions, many jumping into the river. The sole object of the slave stealers was to strike terror into the hearts of the inhabitants by showing the power of a gun. Livingstone witnessed this unprovoked massacre and thought that 500 innocent lives were lost in it. He found the Lulaba a full mile wide at Nyangwi, and still believed it to be the Nile. In this firm belief he ceased to follow the stream further and turned his weary feet back to Ujiji on Tanganyika. It will always be a mystery how Livingstone could have nursed his delusion that he was on the Nile, for so long a time. The moment Cameron set his eyes on the Lulaba, he saw that it could not be the Nile, for its volume of water was many times larger than that of the Nile, and moreover its level was many hundred feet lower than the White Nile at Gondokoro. And though Stanley had the profoundest respect for the views of the great explorer, he hardly doubted that in descending the Lulaba he would emerge into the Atlantic through the mouth of the Great Congo. Now while Livingstone is struggling footsore, sick, dejected, almost deserted, back to Ujiji on the Lake Tanganyika, for rest, for medicine, for news from home, after he has been lost for five long years. And after repeated rumors of his death had been sent from Zanzibar to England, what is taking place in the outside world? On October 16, 1869, Henry M. Stanley, a correspondent of the New York Herald, was at Madrid in Spain. On that date he received a dispatch from James Gordon Bennett, owner of the Herald, dated Paris. It read, Come to Paris on important business. With an American correspondent's instinct and promptitude, Mr. Stanley knocked at Mr. Bennett's door on the next night. Who are you? asked Bennett. Stanley, was the reply. Yes, sit down. Where do you think Livingstone is? I do not know sir. Well, I think he is alive and can be found. I am going to send you to find him. What? Do you really think I can find Livingstone? Do you mean to send me to Central Africa? Yes, I mean you shall find him wherever he is. Get what news you can of him. And, maybe he is in want. Take enough with you to help him. Act according to your own plans. But, find Livingstone. 
By January, 1871, Stanley was at Zanzibar. He hired an escort, provided himself with a couple of boats, and in 236 days, after an adventurous journey, was at Ajiji on Tanganyika. It was November, 1871. For weary months two heroes had been struggling in opposite directions in the African wilds, Livingstone eastward from Nyangwe on the Lulaba, to find succor at Ajiji on Tanganyika Lake. Stanley westward from Zanzibar to carry that succor and greetings, should the great explorer be still alive. Providence had a hand in the meeting. Livingstone reached Ajiji just before Stanley. On November 2, Stanley, while pushing his way up the slopes which surrounded Tanganyika met a caravan. He asked the news, and was thrilled to find that a white man had just reached Ajiji, from the Manuema. A white man? Yes, a white man. How is he dressed? Like you. Young, or old? Old, white hair, and sick. Was he ever there before? Yes, a long time ago. Hurrah, shouted Stanley, it is Livingstone. March quickly my men. He may go away again. They pressed up the slopes and in a few days were in sight of Tanganyika. The looked for hour was at hand. Unfurl your flags and load your guns, he cried to his companions. We will, master, we will. One, two, three, fire. A volley from fifty guns echoed along the hills. Ujiji was awakened. A caravan was coming, and the streets were thronged to greet it. The American flag was at first a mystery, but the crowd pressed round the newcomers. Stanley pushed his way eagerly, all eyes about him. Good morning, sir. Who are you? He startlingly inquired. Susie, Dr. Livingstone's servant. Is Livingstone here? Sure, sir, sure. I have just left him. Run, Susie, and tell the doctor I am coming. Susie obeyed. Every minute the crowd was getting denser. At length Susie came breaking through to ask the stranger's name. The doctor could not understand it all, and had sent to find out, but at the same time in obedience to his curiosity, had come upon the street. Stanley saw him and hastened to where he was. Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Yes, said he with a cordial smile, lifting his hat. They grasped each other's hands. Thank God, said Stanley, I have been permitted to see you. Thankful I am that I am here to welcome you, was the doctor's reply. They turned toward the house, and remained long together, telling each other of their adventures, hearing and receiving news. At length Stanley delivered his batch of letters from home to the doctor, and he retired to read them. Then came a long and happy rest for both the explorers. Livingstone improved in health and spirits daily. His old enthusiasm was restored and he would be on his travels again. But he was entirely out of cloth and trinkets, was reduced to a retinue of five men, and had no money to hire more. One day Stanley said, Have you seen the north of Tanganyika yet? No, I tried to get there, but could not. I have no doubt that Tanganyika as we see it here is really the upper Tanganyika, that the Albert Nyanza of Baker is the lower Tanganyika, and that they are connected by a river. Poor fellow! Did ever mortal man cling so to a delusion, put such faith in native stories and old traditions? Stanley proposed to lend his assistance to the doctor, to settle the question of Tanganyika's northern outlet. The doctor consented. And now began a journey, which was wholly unlike the doctor's five-year tramp. He was in a boat and had a congenial and enthusiastic companion. Tanganyika, like the Albert Nyanza which pours a Nile flood, and Nyasa which flows through the Shire into the Zambesi, is an immense trough sunk far below the tableland which occupies the whole of Central Africa. Its surrounding mountains are high. Its length is nearly 500 miles, its waters deep, clear and brackish. Whither does it send its surplus waters? We have seen that Livingstone was sure it emptied through the Nile. This was what he and Stanley were to prove. In November 1871, 
three weeks after the two had so providentially met at Ajiji, they were on their voyage in two canoes. They coasted till they came to what Burton and Speak supposed to be the end of the lake, which turned out to be a huge promontory. Beyond this the lake widens and stretches for sixty miles further, overhung with mountains seven thousand feet high. At length they reached the northern extremity where they had been assured by the natives that the waters flowed through an outlet. No outlet there. On the contrary seven broad inlets puncturing the reeds, through which the Ruzizi River poured its volume of muddy water into the lake, from the north. Here was disappointment, yet a revelation. No Nile source in Tanganyika, at least not where it was expected to be found. Its outlet must be sought for elsewhere. Some thought it might connect eastward with Nyasa. But what of the great watershed between the two lakes? Others thought it might have its outpour this way and that. Livingstone, puzzled beyond propriety, thought it might have an underground outlet into the Lulaba, and even went so far as to repeat a native story in support of his notion. That at a point in the Ugoma Mountains the roaring of an underground river could be heard for miles. Nothing that Livingstone and Stanley did, helped to solve the mystery of an outlet, except their discovery of the Ruzizi, at the north, which was an inlet. After a three weeks cruise they returned to Ujiji, when Stanley started back for Zanzibar, accompanied part way by Livingstone. After many days' journey they came to Unyanyem where they parted forever, Stanley to hasten to Zanzibar and Livingstone to return to the wilds to settle finally the Nile secret. Stanley protested, owing to the doctor's physical condition. But the enthusiasm of travel and research was upon him to the extent that he would not hear. Stanley had left ample supplies at Anyanyem. These he divided with the doctor, so that he was well off in this respect. He further promised to hire a band of porters for him at Zanzibar and send them to him in the interior. They parted on March 13, 1872. God guide you home safe, and bless you, my friend, were the doctor's words. And may God bring you safe back to us all, my dear friend. Farewell. Farewell. This was the last word Dr. Livingstone ever spoke to a white man. They wrung each other's hands. Stanley was overcome, and turned away. He cried to his men, forward march, and the sad scene closed. Livingstone waited at Anyanyem for the escort Stanley had promised to send. They came by August, and on the 14th of the month, 1872, he started for the southern point of Tanganyika, which he rounded, to find no outlet there. Then he struck for Lake Bangwilo, intending to solve all its river mysteries. That lake was to him an ultimate reservoir for all waters flowing north, and if the Lulaba should prove to be the Nile, then he felt he had its true source. This journey was a horrible one in every respect. It rained almost incessantly. The path was miry and amid dripping grass and cane. The country was flat and the rivers all swollen. It was impossible to tell river from marsh. The country was not inhabited. Food grew scarce. The doctor became so weak that he had to be carried across the rivers on the back of his trusty servant Susie. One stream, crossed on January 24, 1873, was 2,000 feet wide and so deep that the waters reached Susie's mouth, and the doctor got as wet as his carrier. These were the dark, dismal surroundings of Lake Bangwilo. Amid such hardships they skirted the northern side of the lake, crossed the Shambizi at its eastern end, where the river is 300 yards wide and 18 feet deep, and turned their faces westward along the south side. The doctor was now able to walk no further. When he tried to climb on his donkey he fell to the ground from sheer weakness. His faithful servants took him on their shoulders, or bore him along in a rudely constructed litter. On April 27, 1873, his last entry reads, Knocked up quite, and remain, recover, sent to buy milch goats. We are on banks of the R. Malalamo. His last day's march was on a litter through interminable marsh and rain. His bearers had to halt often, so violent were his pains and so great his exhaustion. He spoke kindly to his humble attendants and asked how many days' march it was to the Lulaba. Susie replied that it was a three days' march. 
Then, said the dying man, I shall never see my river again. The malarial poison was already benumbing his faculties. Even the fountains of the Nile had faded into dimness before his mind's eye. He was placed in a hut in Chitambo's village, on April 29, after his last day's journey, where he lay in a semi-conscious state through the night, and the day of April 30th. At 11 p.m. On the night of the 30, Susie was called in and the doctor told him he wished him to boil some water, and for this purpose he went to the fire outside, and soon returned with the copper kettle full. Calling him close, he asked him to bring his medicine chest, and to hold the candle near him, for the man noticed he could hardly see. With great difficulty Dr. Livingstone selected the calomel, which he told him to place by his side. Then, directing him to pour a little water into a cup, and to put another empty one by it, he said in a low, feeble voice, All right, you can go out now. These were the last words he was ever heard to speak. It must have been about 4 a.m. When Susie heard Majwara's step once more. Come to Buana, I am afraid, I don't know if he is alive. The lad's evident alarm made Susie run to arouse Chuma, Chaupir, Matthew, and Mwanuasir, and the six men went immediately to the hut. Passing inside, they looked toward the bed. Dr. Livingstone was not lying on it, but appeared to be engaged in prayer, and they instinctively drew backward for the instant. Pointing to him, Mujwara said, When I lay down he was just as he is now, and it is because I find that he does not move that I fear he is dead. They asked the lad how long he had slept. Majwara said he could not tell, but he was sure that it was some considerable time, the men drew nearer. A candle, stuck by its own wax to the top of the box, shed a light sufficient for them to see his form. Dar. Livingstone was kneeling by the side of his bed, his body stretched forward, his head buried in his hands upon the pillow. For a minute they watched him, he did not stir, there was no sign of breathing. Then one of them, Matthew, advanced softly to him and placed his hands to his cheeks. It was sufficient, life had been extinct some time, and the body was almost cold, Livingstone was dead. His sad-hearted servants raised him tenderly up and laid him full length on the bed. They then went out to consult together, and while there they heard the cocks crow. It was therefore between midnight and morning of May 1, 1873, his spirit had taken its flight. His last African journey began in 1866. The noble Christian philanthropist, the manful champion of the weak and oppressed, the unwearied and keen-eyed lover of nature, the intrepid explorer whose name is as inseparably connected with Africa as that of Columbus is with America, had sunk down exhausted in the very heart of the continent, with his lifelong work still unfinished. His highest praise is that he spent thirty years in the darkest haunts of cruelty and savagery and yet never shed the blood of his fellow man. The noblest testimony to his character and his influence is the conduct of that faithful band of native servants who had followed his fortune so long and so far, and who, embalming his body, and secretly preserving all his papers and possessions, carried safely back over the long weary road to the coast all that remained of the hero and his work. Cameron was on his way toward Ujiji to rescue Livingstone when he heard of his death. He pursued his journey and reached Lake Tanganyika, determined to unravel the mystery of its outlet. He started on a sailing tour around the lake in March 1874. His flag boat was the Betsy. He only got halfway round, but in this distance he counted the mouths of a hundred rivers, and found the shores constantly advancing in bold headlands and receding in deep bays. Both land and water teem with animal life. Elephants abounded in the jungles, rhinoceri and hippopotami were frequently seen, and many varieties of fish were caught. In one part the cliffs of the shores were sandstone, in another they were precipices of black marble, here were evidences of a coal formation, their crags of chalk whose bases were as clearly cut by the waves as if done with a knife. In many places cascades tumbled over the crags showing that the table land above was like a sponge filled with moisture. The native boatmen were lazy and full of superstitions. Every crag and island seemed to be the resort of a demon of some kind, whose power for harm had no limit in their imaginations. Never but once, and that in the country of King Kasongo, 
had he seen the natives fuller of credulity nor more subject to the powers of witchcraft and magic. Their stories of the various forms of devils which dwelt in out-of-the-way places were wilder than any childish fiction, and their magicians had unbridled control of their imaginations. Cameron's course was southward from Ujiji. He turned the southern end of the lake and found no outlet there. But he saw some of the most extraordinary examples of rock and tree scenery in the world. There were magnificent terraces of rock which looked as if they had been built by the hands of man, and scattered and piled in fantastic confusion were overhanging blocks, rocking stones, obelisks, and pyramids. All were overhung with trees whose limbs were matted together by creepers. It was like a transformation scene in a pantomime rather than a part of Mother Earth, and one seemed to await the opening of the rocks and the appearance of the spirits. Not long to wait. The creepers sway and are pulled apart. An army of monkeys swing themselves into the foreground and, hanging by their paws, stop and chatter and gibber at the strange sight of a boat. A shout from the boatmen, and they are gone with a concerted scream which echoes far and wide along the shores. The inhabitants are not impressive or numerous on the shores, yet they show art in dress, and in manufactures. They have been terribly demoralized by the slave traders, and many sections depopulated entirely. While sailing up the western shore of the lake, Cameron thought he found what was the long sought for outlet of Tanganyika, the traditional connecting link between it and Lakes Ngami and Albert Nyanza. Of a sudden the mountains broke away and a huge gap appeared in the shores. There was evidently a river there, and his boat appeared to be in a current setting toward it. The natives said it was the Lukuga, and that it flowed out of the lake westward toward the Lulaba. But alas for human credulity. Cameron ran into the Lukuga for seven or eight miles, found it a reedy lagoon, without current, stood up in his boat and looked seven or eight miles further toward a break in the hills. Beyond which he was told the river ran away in a swift current from the lake, and then he returned home to tell the wondrous story. Tanganyika had an outlet after all. The wise men all said, I told you so, the lake is no more mysterious than any other. Why Cameron should have stopped short on the eve of so great a discovery, or why he should have palmed off a native story as a scientific fact can only be accounted for by the fact that he was sick during most of his cruise and at times delirious with fever. While it was thought that he had clarified the Tanganyika situation, it was really more of a mystery than when Burton and Speak, or Livingstone and Stanley, left it. We here strike again the track of our own explorer Stanley. We have already followed him on his first African journey to Ujiji to find Livingstone, in 1871-72. We have seen also in our article on, The Sources of the Nile, how he started on his second journey in 1874, determined to complete the work of Livingstone, by clearing up all doubts about the Nile sources. This involved a twofold duty, first to fully investigate the lakes Victoria Nyanza and Albert Nyanza, second the outlets of Tanganyika and the secret of the Great Lulaba, which had so mystified Livingstone. In pursuit of this mission we followed him to Victoria Nyanza, on his second journey, and saw how he was entertained by King Tessa, and what adventures he had on the Victoria Nyanza. He settled it beyond doubt that the Victoria was a single large lake, with many rivers running into it, the chief of which was the Alexandra Nile. This done, he had hoped to visit Albert Nyanza, but the hostility of the natives prevented. He therefore turned southwestward toward Tanganyika, and on his way fell in with the old King Marambo with whom he ratified a friendship by the solemn ceremony of blood brotherhood. The American and African sat opposite each other on a rug. A native chief then made an incision in the right leg of Marambo and Stanley, drew a little blood from each, and exchanged it with these words, If either of you break this brotherhood now established between you, may the lion devour him. The serpent poison him, bitterness be his food, his friends desert him, his gun burst in his hands and everything that is bad do wrong to him until his death. On May 27, 1876, Stanley reached Ajiji, where he had met Livingstone in 1871. Sadly did he recall the fact that the grand old hero, who had once been the center of absorbing interest in that fair scene of water, mountain, sunshine and palm, was gone forever. He came equipped to circumnavigate the lake. 
He had along his boat, the Lady Alice, built lightly and in sections for just this kind of work. Leaving the bulk of his extensive traveling party at Ajiji, well provided for, he took along only a sufficient crew for his boat, under two guides, Para, who had been Cameron's attendant in 1874. And Ruango who had piloted Livingstone and Stanley in 1871. Once again the goodly, Lady Alice, was afloat, as she had been on Victoria Nyanza. He cruised along the shores for fifty-one days, travelled a distance of eight hundred miles, or within one hundred and twenty-five miles of the entire circumference of the lake, and got back without serious sickness or the loss of a man. He found it a sealed lake everywhere, that is, with waters flowing only into it, none out of it. What then became of Cameron's wonderful story about the outlet of the Lukuga? Stanley looked carefully into this. He found a decided current running down the river into the lake. He pushed up the river to the narrow gorge in the mountains, beyond which the natives said the Lukuga ran westward toward the Lulaba. There he found a true and false story. In this ancient mountain gap was a clear divide of the Lukuga waters. Part ran by a short course into Tanganyika, part westward into the Lulaba. Stanley was of the opinion that the waters of the lake were rising year by year, and that in the course of time there would be a constant overflow through the Lukuga and into the Lulaba, as perhaps there had been long ages ago. Even now there is not much difference between the level of the lake and the marshes found in the mountain gap beyond, and Mr. Hoare, who has since visited the Lukuga Gap, says he found a strong current setting out of the lake westward, so that the time may have already come which Stanley predicted. This Lukuga Gap probably represents the fracture of an earthquake through which the waters of the lake escaped in former ages and which has been its safety valve at certain times since. When it is full it may, therefore, be said to have an outlet. When not full its waters pass off by evaporation. It is only a semi-occasional contribution, if one at all, to the floods of the Great Congo, and in this respect has no counterpart in the world. All of which settles the point of its connection with the Nile, and leaves the sources of that river to the north. Had Livingstone known this he could have saved himself the last two years of his journey and the perils and sickness which led to his death in the wilderness. And now Stanley had clarified the situation behind him, which stretched over 800 miles of African continent. But looking toward the Atlantic, there lay stretched a 1,000 miles of absolutely unknown country. Into this he plunged, and pursued his course till he struck the great northward running river, the Lulaba. The path was broken and difficult. Rivers ran frequent and deep, and crossing was a source of delay, except where, occasionally, ingeniously constructed bridges were found, which answered the double purpose of crossing and fish weir. These are built of poles, forty feet long, driven into the bed of the stream and crossing each other near the top. Other poles are laid lengthwise at the point of junction, and all are securely tied together with bamboo ropes. Below them the nets of the fishermen are spread, and over them a person may pass in safety. Stanley's party had been greatly thinned out, but it still consisted of 140 men. Cameron had found it impossible to follow the Lulaba. Livingstone had tried it again and again, to meet a more formidable obstacle in the hostility of the natives than in the forests, fens and animals. Could Stanley master its secret? He was better equipped than any of his predecessors, just as earnest, and not averse to using force where milder means could not avail. He had settled so many naughty African problems, that this the greatest of all had peculiar fascination for him. He would, freeze to this river, and see whether it went toward the Nile, or come out, as he suspected it would, through the Congo into the Atlantic. It was a mighty stream where he struck it, at the mouth of the Luama, full 1,400 yards wide and moving with a placid current, and close to Nyangwe which was the highest point Livingstone had reached. Here he marshaled his forces for the unknown depths beyond. He had only one of his European attendants left, Frank Pocock. Not a native attendant faltered. It would have been death to desert, in that hostile region. Such woods, so tall, dense and somber, the traveller had never before seen. Those of Uganda and Tanganyika were mere jungle in comparison. Even the Manuema had penetrated but a little their depths. 
They line the course of the Lulaba for 1,500 miles from Nyangli. At first Stanley's party was well protected, for ahead of it went a large group of Arab traders. It was the opinion of these men that the Lulaba flowed northward forever. Soon the Arabs tired of their tramp through the dark dripping woods, and Stanley found it impracticable to carry the heavy sections of the Lady Alice. It was resolved to take to the river and face its rapids and savage cannibal tribes, rather than continue the struggle through these thorny and gloomy shades. The river was soon reached and the Lady Alice launched. From this on, Stanley resolved to call the river the Livingstone. He divided his party, so that part took to the boat, and part kept even pace on the land. The stream and the natives were not long in giving the adventurers a taste of their peculiarities. A dangerous rapid had to be shot. The natives swarmed out in their canoes. The passage of the river was like a running fight. On November 23, 1877, while the expedition was encamped on the banks of the river at the mouth of the Ruiki, thirty native canoes made a determined attack, which was only repulsed by force. On December 8, the expedition was again attacked by fourteen canoes, which had to be driven back with a volley. But the fiercest attack was toward the end of December, when a fleet of canoes containing six hundred men bore down upon them with a fearful din of war drums and horns, and the battle cry, Bobo, Bobo, Bobo. -o -o. Simultaneously with the canoe attack a terrible uproar broke out in the forest behind and a shower of arrows rained on Stanley and his followers. There were but two courses for the leader, either to fight the best he knew how in defense of his followers, or meet a surer death by surrender. The battle was a fierce one for half an hour, for Stanley's men fought with desperation. At length the canoes were beaten back, and thirty-six of them captured by an adroit ruse. This gave Stanley the advantage and brought the natives to terms. Peace was declared. Here the Arab traders declared they could go no further amid such a country. So they returned, leaving Stanley only his original followers, numbering 140. The year 1877 closed in disaster. No sooner had he embarked all his force in canoes, for the purpose of continuing his journey, than a storm upset some of them, drowning two men and occasioning the loss of guns and supplies. But the new year opened more auspiciously. It was a bright day and all were happily afloat on the broad bosom of the Lulaba, where safety lay in keeping in midstream, or darting to opposite shores when attacked. What a wealth of affluence the great river had and how its volume had been swelled. The low main had emptied through a mouth six hundred yards wide. On the right the Luama had sent in its volume through four hundred yards of width, the Lira with three hundred yards, the Urindi with five hundred yards, the Loa with one thousand two hundred yards, the Mbura with two branches of two hundred yards each, and two hundred miles further on, the Aruimi. Two thousand yards from shore to shore. The Lulaba, Livingstone, had now become four thousand yards wide and was flowing persistently northward. The equator has been reached and passed. Can it be that all these waters are the floods of the Nile and that Livingstone was right? There was little time for reflection. The natives were ever present and hostile, and the waters themselves were full of dangers. But we have ran ahead of our party. Just after the mouth of the Lomain was passed the expedition reached that series of cataracts, which have been named Stanley Falls. Their roar was heard long before the canoes reached them, and high above the din of waters were heard the war shouts of the Moana savages on both sides of the stream. Either a way must be fought through these dusky foes, or the cataract with its terrors must be faced. To dare the cataract was certain death. The canoes were brought to anchor, and a battle with the natives began. They were too strong, and Stanley retraced his course a little way, where he landed and encamped. Another trial, a fierce surge through the ranks armed with lances and poisoned arrows, gave them headway. The first cataract was rounded, and now they were in the midst of that wonderful series of waterfalls, where the Lulaba cuts its way for seventy miles through a range of high hills, with seven distinct cataracts. In a channel contracted to a third of its ordinary breadth, where the stream tumbles and boils, flinging itself over ledges of rock, or dashing frantically against the walls that hem it in as if it were struggling with all its giant power to escape from its prison. 
Within the gorge the ear is stunned with the continual din of the rushing waters, and the attention kept constantly on the strain to avoid the perils of rock, rapid, whirlpool, and cataract with which the course is strewn. With extreme caution and good luck the rapids may be run in safety. But how are frail canoes to survive the experiment of a plunge over a perpendicular ledge, in company with millions of tons of falling water, into an abyss of seething and gyrating foam? Ashore, the cannibal natives lie in wait to oppose a landing, or better still, to slay or capture victims for their sport or larder. A toilsome ascent has to be made to the summit of the bluffs forming the river banks over rough boulders and through tangled forest. In places where the fall of the stream is slight it may be possible to lower down the boats, by means of strong hawsers of creepers, to the pool below. But in other cases the canoes have to be dragged painfully up the cliffs, and launched again with almost equal toil where the current seems a little calmer. All this while the poisoned arrows are hissing through the air, spears are launched out of every thicket, and stones are slung or thrown at the unlucky pioneers from each spot of vantage. Only by van and rear guards and flanking parties, and maintaining a brisk fire can the assailants be kept at bay. The vindictive foe are as incessant in their attacks by night as by day. And the whiz of the flying arrow, the hurtling of lances through the temporary stockade and the sharp crack of the rifle, mingle with the dreams of the sleeper. The descent of Stanley Falls was not made without loss of life and property. In spite of every precaution, canoes would be dragged from their moorings and be sucked down by the whirlpools or swept over the falls. Or the occupants would lose nerve in the presence of danger, and allow their craft to drift into the powerful center current, whence escape was hopeless. During their passage occurred one of the most thrilling scenes in all this long journey through the dark continent. The canoes were being floated down a long rapid. Six had passed in safety. The seventh, manned by Muscadi, Yolody Muscadi, and Zaidi, a chief, was overturned in a difficult piece of the water. Muscadi and Yolody were rescued by the eighth canoe. But Zaidi, clinging to the upturned canoe, was swept past, and seemed on the point of being hurled over the brink of the fall. The canoe was instantly split in two, one part being caught fast below the water, while the other protruded above the surface. To the upper part Zaidi clung, seated on the rock, his feet in the water. Below him leapt and roared the fall, about fifty yards in depth, above him stretched fifty feet of gradually sloping water. Mr. Stanley and a part of the expedition were at this time on the banks. No more strange and perilous position than that of Zaidi can be imagined. A small canoe was lowered by means of a cable of ruttons, but the rope snapped and the canoe went over the falls. Poles tied to creepers were thrown toward him but they failed to reach. The rock was full fifty yards from the shore. Stanley ordered another canoe, fastened by cables, to be lowered. Only two men could be found to man it, Yulady, the coxswain of the Lady Alice, and Marzouk, a boat boy. Mamba Kwa Mungu, exclaimed Yulady, my fate is in the hands of God. The two men took their places in the canoe and paddled across the stream. The cables which held the boat against the current were slackened, and it dropped to within twenty yards of the falls. A third cable was thrown from the boat towards Zaidi, but he failed to catch it till the sixth throw. Just as he grasped it the water caught him and carried him over the precipice. All thought him lost, but presently his head appeared, and he seemed still to have hold of the cable. Stanley ordered the canoe men to pull. They did so but the upper cables of the canoe broke and it was carried toward the falls. Fortunately it caught on a rock, and Yulady and Marzouk were saved. They still had hold of the cable which Zaidi clung to. By dint of hard pulling they were enabled to save, for they dragged him back up the falls to their own perilous position. There were three now on the rock instead of one. Twenty times a cable loaded with a stone was thrown to them before they caught it. They drew it taut and thus had frail communication with the shore. But it was now dark and nothing more could be done till light came. In the morning it was decided that the cable was strong enough to hold the men if they would but try to wade and swim to shore. Yulady dared it, and reached land in safety. The others followed, and terminated an anxious scene. Stanley was in the midst of these falls for twenty-two days and nights. 
On January 28, 1878, his peril and hardship ended by passing the last fall. By February 8, Rubanga, a village of Nganza was reached, where he found friendly natives. And not a moment too soon, for his men were fainting for want of food. This was encouraging, but his heart was further rejoiced that the Lulaba had not only assumed its wide, placid flow, but had suddenly changed its northern direction to one almost westward toward the Atlantic. He was then not going toward the Nile. No, it was not a Nile water, but must be the Congo. What a rare discovery was then in store for him. And the natives verified the thought. For the Rubanga chief, on being questioned, first mentioned the Congo. Ikutuya Congo, said he, that is the river's name. The words thrilled Stanley. The Lulaba had ceased to flow, the Congo had taken up its song and would witness the further adventures of the brave explorer. It was a mile and a half wide, with a magnificent bosom. Green, fertile islands sprinkled its glassy surface. The party enjoyed needed rest, in this paradise, and then February 10, the boats pulled downstream again, the rowers bending gleefully and hopefully to their arduous task. On the 14 the mouth of the Aruwimi was passed and they were in the Bangala country. Here they suffered from the most formidable attack yet made. It was the 31st struggle through which the party had passed on the Lolaba, or Congo, or Livingstone, though the latter name now seems out of place since we know that all is Congo, clear to Banguilo, on whose shores Livingstone perished. The shores of both the Congo and Aruwimi resounded with the din of the everlasting war drums, and from every cove and island swarmed a crowd of canoes that began forming into line to intercept and attack the travelers. These crafts were larger than any that had yet been encountered. The leading canoe of the savages was a portentous length, with forty paddlers on each side, while on a platform at the bow were stationed ten redoubtable young warriors, with crimson plumes of the parrot stuck in their hair. And poising long spears. Eight steersmen were placed on the stern, with large paddles ornamented with balls of ivory, while a dozen others, apparently chiefs, rushed from end to end of the boat directing the attack. Fifty-two other vessels of scarcely smaller dimensions followed in its wake. From the bow of each waved a long mane of palm fiber, every warrior was decorated with feathers and ornaments of ivory. And the sound of a hundred horns carved out of elephants' tusks, and a song of challenge and defiance chanted from two thousand savage throats, added to the wild excitement of the scene. Their wild war cry was, Yahahaha, Ya Bengala. The assailants were put to flight after a series of charges more determined and prolonged than usual. This time, however, the blood of the strangers was fully up. They were tired of standing everlastingly on the defensive, of finding all their advances repelled with scorn and hatred. They carried the war into the enemy's camp, and drove them out of their principal village into the forest. In the center of the village was found a singular structure, a temple of ivory, the circular roof supported by thirty-three large tusks, and surmounting a hideous idol, for feet high, dyed a bright vermilion color, with black eyes, beard, and hair. Ivory here was, abundant as fuel, and was found carved into armlets, balls, mallets, wedges, grain pestles, and other articles of ornament and use. While numerous other weapons and implements of iron, wood, hide, and earthenware attested the ingenuity of the people. Their cannibal propensities were as plainly shown in the rows of skulls that grinned from poles, and the bones and other grisly remains of human feasts scattered about the village streets. They had now a peaceful river for a time, or rather they were enabled to float in its middle, or dodge from shore to shore, without direct attack. But food became scarce. On February 20th, they got a supply from natives whom they propitiated. On the 23, Amima, wife of the faithful Kashesh died. Her last words to Stanley were, Ah, master, I shall never see the sea again. Your child Amima, is dying. I have wished to see the coconuts and the mangoes, but, no, Amima is dying, dying in a pagan land. She will never see Zanzibar again. The master has been very good to his children, and Amima remembers it. It is a bad world master, and you have lost your way in it. Goodbye, master, and do not forget poor little Amima. 
The simple pathos of this African girl sweetened the deathbed scene as much as a Christian's prayer could have done. For a distance of one thousand miles from Stanley Falls the river is without cataracts, flowing placidly here, and they're widening to ten miles, with numerous channels through reedy islands. Everything was densely tropical, trees, flowers, plants, birds, animals. Crocodiles were especially plenty in the water, and all the large land animals of the equatorial regions could be seen at intervals. There were few adventures with these, for the party clung rigidly to their boats. But once in a while, a coterie, organized for a hunting bout, would come back with such stirring tales of attack and escape as we are accustomed to read of in connection with the eastern coasts of the continent where hunting the elephant. Rhinoceros, lion, hippopotamus, is more of a regular business, and where spicy stories of adventure are accepted without question. After a treacherous attack by the people of King Chumbury, Stanley's 32nd battle, the natives showed a more peaceable disposition. They had heard of western coast white men and knew something of their ways. So there was a pleasant flow of water and a safe shore, for many days. But now the river was about to change. It received the Ikalemba, a powerful stream of tea-colored water, one thousand yards wide. Its waters flowed along in the same bed, unmixed with those of the Congo, for one hundred and fifty miles. This immense tributary and that of the Abari, were reported to come from Great Lakes, eight hundred miles to the south, and probably the same that Livingstone and Cameron both mention in their travels. For nine hundred miles the Congo has had a fall of only three hundred and sixty-four feet, or a third of a foot to the mile. We are now within four hundred miles of the Atlantic, yet one thousand one hundred and fifty feet above it, and on the edge of the great tablelands of Central Africa. The days of smooth sailing are at an end. The mountains come close to the stream, and the channel narrows. The white chalky cliffs remind Frank Pocock of the coasts of Dover in his own England. A roar is heard in advance. The cataracts have begun again, and they sound as ominously as the war cry of the natives hundreds of miles back in the woods and jungles. We have now been over four months on this river, and the next two hundred miles are to be the most tedious, laborious and disastrous of all. The terrors of Stanley Falls are here duplicated a thousand times. Bluffs rise one thousand five hundred feet high. Between them the river rushes over piles of boulders, or shoots with frightful velocity past the bases of impending crags, up which one must quickly scramble or else be carried into the boiling whirlpools below. These falls we shall call the Livingstone Falls. In their general features they are not like Niagara, or Victoria on the Zambesi, but a succession of headlong rushes, as if the river were tearing down a gigantic rock stairway. Of the Great Ntamo Fall, Stanley says, take a strip of sea, blown over by a hurricane, for miles in length by half a mile in breadth, and a pretty accurate conception of its rushing waves may be obtained. Some of the troughs were one hundred yards in length, and from one to another the mad river plunged. There was first a rush down into the middle of an immense trough, and then, by sheer force, the enormous volume would lift itself upward steeply until, gathering itself into a ridge. It suddenly hurled itself twenty or thirty feet straight upwards before rolling down into another trough. The roar was deafening and tremendous. I can only compare it to the thunder of an express train through a rock tunnel. In this vast current, rushing along at the rate of thirty miles an hour, the strongest steamer would be as helpless as a cockle shell, and as for frail canoes, they had to be dragged from rock to rock. Or taken clear from the water and borne by land around the obstructions. Frequently canoes were wrecked and then a halt had to be ordered till new ones were hewn from trees. Yet amid trial, sickness and sore distress they had to pause at times in wonder before the imposing sights that opened on them. One was that of the Edwin Arnold River which flings itself with a single bound of three hundred feet into the Congo, clearing the base of its cliff by ten yards. Still more wonderful is the Cascade of Vinkank, which is a plunge of a one thousand feet and nearby another with a fall of four hundred feet. Many gaps were made in the ranks of Stanley's companions through this valley of shadow. In one day, March 28, he saw eleven of his men swept over a cataract and disappear in the boiling waters below. 
First a boat, in which was Kalyalu, an attendant of Stanley in all his journeys, was sucked within the power of a fall and plunged into the abyss. Hardly had the eye turned from this horror when another canoe was seen shooting down the stream toward what appeared to be certain death. By almost a miracle it made an easy part of the cataract and the occupants succeeded in reaching the shore in safety. Close behind came a third with a single occupant. As the boat made its plunge the occupant rose and shouted a farewell to his companions on the shore. Then boat and man disappeared. A few days afterwards he reappeared like an apparition in camp. He had been tossed ashore far below and held a prisoner by the natives, who had picked him up more dead than alive. On April 12th, the Lady Alice, herself, with her crew, came to the very verge of destruction. The boat was approaching a bay in which the camp for the night was to be made, when a noise like distant thunder fell on the ears of the crew. The river rose before them into a hill of water. It was a whirlpool, at its full. All hands bent to their paddles and the boat was plunged into the hill of water before it broke. They thus escaped being sucked into a vortex which would have sunk the boat and drowned all. As it was, the boat was whirled round and round through a succession of rapids, before the crew could bring her under control again. Fortunately the natives were still friendly and of superior type. They had many European manufactures, which passed from tribe to tribe in regular traffic, and enjoyed a higher civilization than those of the Central African regions. Stanley rested with these people for several days while his carpenter made two new canoes. On June 3, he lost his servant, comrade and friend, last of the Europeans, the brave and faithful Frank Pocock. All the boats had been taken from the water and carried past the Massace Falls, except the canoe, Jason, in which were Pocock, Yulity and eleven others. This had gotten behind on account of Frank's ulcerated feet. Chafing at the delay he urged Yulity to shoot the falls, against the latter's judgment, and even taunted the crew with cowardice. Boys, cried Yulity, addressing the crew, our little master is saying that we are afraid of death. I know there is death in the cataract, but come, let us show him that black men fear death as little as white men. A man can die but once. Who can contend with his fate? Our fate is in the hands of God, were the various replies of the men. You are men, exclaimed Frank. The boat was headed for the falls. They were reached, and in another moment the canoe had plunged into the foaming rapid. Spun round like a top in the furious waters, the boat was whirled down to the foaming pit below. Then she was sucked below the surface and anon hurled up again with several men clinging to her, among them Yulity. Presently the form of the little master was seen floating on the surface. Yulity swam to him, seized him, and both sunk. When the brave Yulity appeared again he was alone. Poor Pocock's tragic death was a blow to the whole expedition. Most of the party gave way to superstitious dread of the river and many deserted, but quickly returned, after a trial of the dreary woods. On June 23, the carpenter of the expedition was swept over the Zinga Falls, in the canoe, Livingstone, and drowned. Stanley's food supply was frequently very short amid the difficulties of Livingstone Falls. Not that there was not plenty on the shores, but his means of buying were exhausted, and such a thing as charity is not common to the African tribes. Even where most friendly, they are always on the lookout for a trade, and a bargain at that. It is a great hardship for them to give, without a consideration. The appearance of his attendants cut Mr. Stanley to the heart every day, so emaciated, gaunt, and sunken-eyed were they. Bent and crippled with weakness who had once been erect and full of manly vigor. And the leader's condition was no better. Gone now was all the keen ardor for discovery, the burning desire to penetrate where no white man had yet penetrated which animated his heart at the outset of his journey. Sickness that had drained his strength, anxiety that had strained to its utmost pitched the mind, sorrow for loss and bereavement that had wearied the spirit, these had left Mr. Stanley a very different man from that which he was when he set out full of hope and ardor from Zanzibar. All his endeavor now was to push on as fast as possible, to reach the ocean with as little more of pain and death to his followers as possible. 
At last Stanley struck a number of intelligent tribes who gave much information about the rest of the river and the coast. There were three great falls still below them, and any number of dangerous rapids. It would be folly to risk them with their frail barks. Moreover, he learned that the town of Boma, on the Atlantic coast, could be reached by easy journeys across the country. His main problem, as to whether the Lulaba and the Congo were the same, had long since been solved. He had been following the Congo all the time, had seen its splendid forests and mighty affluence, its dashing rapids and bewildering whirlpools and falls, had even, through the spectacles of Livingstone, seen its headwaters in Lake Banguillo. Amid whose marshes the veteran explorer laid down his life. What need then to risk life further at this time, and in his very poor condition? He resolved to leave the river and make direct for the coast at Boma. When he assembled his followers to make this welcome announcement to them, they were overcome with joy. Poor Safini, coxswain of the Lady Alice, went mad with rapture and fled into the forest. Three days were spent in searching for him, but he was never seen more. Relinquishing his boat and all unnecessary equipage at the cataract of Isangela, the party struck for Boma, but only to give out entirely when still three days distant. A messenger was sent in advance for aid. He came back in two days with a strong band of carriers and abundance of food. The perishing party was thus saved, and was soon receiving the care of the good people of Boma. Here all forgot their toils and perils amid civilized comforts and the pardonable pride aroused by their achievements. Stanley's exploit is unparalleled in the history of African adventure. Though not the first to cross the continent, he hewed an unknown way and every step was a startling revelation. He did more to unravel African mysteries and settle geographic problems than any other explorer. And, August 12, 1877, three years after his start from Zanzibar on the Indian Ocean, and eight months after setting out from Nyangwe to follow the Lulaba, he stood on the Atlantic shores at Boma and gazed on the mouth of the Congo, whose waters shot an unmixed current fifty miles out to sea. Though he had proved it to be so, he could still hardly believe that this vast flood pouring two million cubic feet of water a second into the ocean, through a channel ten miles wide and one thousand three hundred feet deep, was the same that he had followed through wood and morass, rapid and cataract, rock-bound channel and wide expanse, for so long a time, and that it was the same which Diego Kemp discovered by its color and reedy track four hundred years before. While sailing the ocean out of sight of land, in the journey of 7,200 miles, 114 of Stanley's original party had perished. Many had fallen in battle or by treachery, more were the victims of disease, and some had succumbed to toil or been washed down by the gulfs. But a goodly remnant survived. These were returned, according to contract, to their Zanzibar home. Stanley went with them by steamer around the Cape of Good Hope. It needs not to tell the joy with which the people again beheld their home. How they leaped ashore from the boat, how their friends rushed down to the beach to welcome back the wanderers. How wives and husbands, children and parents, literally leaped into each other's arms, while, with weeping and with laughter, the wonderful story of the long and terrible journey is told to the eager listeners. Stanley, having paid his followers in full, according to the terms of his contract, and rewarded some over and above their lawful claims, so that not a few of the men were able to purchase neat little houses and gardens with their savings. Prepared to quit Zanzibar forever. The scene on the beach on the day of Stanley's departure was a strange and an affecting one. The people of the expedition pressed eagerly around him, wrung his hand again and again, and finally, lifting him upon their shoulders, carried him through the surf to his boat. Then the men, headed by Yulady the coxswain, manned a lighter and followed Mr. Stanley's boat to the steamer, and there bade their leader a last farewell. Stanley's own feelings at this moment were no less keen. As the steamer which bore him home left the shore of Zanzibar behind, his thoughts were busy with the past. He was living once again in retrospect the three strange, eventful years, during which these simple black people had followed him with a fidelity at once simple and noble, childlike and heroic. For him, his comrades in travel through the dark continent must ever remain heroes. 
for it was their obedient and loyal aid that had enabled him to bring his expedition to a successful and noble issue, to accomplish each of the three tasks he had set himself to do, the exploration of the great Victoria Nyanza Lake. The circumnavigation of Tanganyika, and the identification of Livingstone's Lualaba River with the Congo. Ever since this memorable journey, Mr. Stanley has been enthusiastically working to found a great Congo free government and commercial empire, which all the nations shall recognize and to which all shall contribute. He has projected a steamer system, of heavy draft vessels, from the mouth of the river to the first cataracts. Here a commercial emporium is to be founded. A railway is to start thence and lead to the smooth waters above. This would open 7,000 miles of navigable waters on the upper Congo and a trade of $50 million a year. It would redeem one of the largest fertile tracts of land on the globe and bring peace, prosperity and civilization to millions of human beings. Only climate seems to be against his plans, for it is undoubtedly hostile to Europeans. But if native energies can be enlisted sufficiently to make a permanent ground work for his ideal state, he may yet rank not only as the greatest of discoverers but as the foremost of statesmen and humanitarians. The possibilities of the Congo region are boundless. A missionary just returned from the Congo country thus writes of it. The bounds of this Congo free state are not yet defined, but they will ultimately embrace the mainstream and its immense system of navigable tributaries some of which are 800 miles long. The Congo itself waters a country more than 900 miles square, or an area of 1 million square miles. These rivers make access to equatorial Africa and to the Sudan country quite easy. The resources of this fine region are exhaustless. The forests are dense and valuable. Their rubber wealth is untouched, and equal to the world supply. Everywhere there is a vast amount of ivory, which lies in used or is turned into the commonest utensils by the natives. There are palms which yield oil, plantains, bananas, maize, tobacco, peanuts, yams, wild coffee, and soil equal to any in the world for fertility. Europeans must guard against the climate, but it is possible to get inured to it, with care. In the daytime the temperature averages 90 degrees the year round, but the average of the night temperature is 70 degrees to 75 degrees. Rain falls frequently, and mostly in the night. The natives are hostile, only where they have suffered from invasion by Arab slave dealers. Already there are some 3,000 white settlers in the heart of the Congo country, Portuguese, English, Belgians, Dutch, Scandinavians and Americans, and their influence is being felt for good. The completion of Stanley's railroad around the Congo rapids will give fresh impetus to civilization and lay the basis of permanent institutions in this great country. The Cape of Storms The little Portuguese ship of Bartholomew Diaz was the first to round the Cape of Storms, in 1486. When King John II of Portugal, heard of his success he said it should thereafter be called Cape of Good Hope. The passage of this southernmost point of Africa meant a route to India, on which all hearts were set at the time. Nearly two hundred years later, in 1652, the Dutch settled at the Cape. They called the Quake, or natives, Hottentots, from the repetition of one of the words used in their dances. The colony became a favorite place for banished Huguenots, from France and Piedmont. It grew, got to be strong, and at length tyrannical. The more liberal members left it and pushed into the interior, where they drove back the Kaffirs, and redeemed much valuable territory. The parent colony tried to force its government on these pioneers, who were called Boers, the Dutch word for farmers. A rebellion ensued. The Prince of Orange asked England to help suppress it, 1795. She did so, and with characteristic greed, kept it till 1803. It then passed to the Dutch, but was retaken by England in 1806. Settlement marched rapidly up the eastern coast of Africa, and a great agricultural section was opened. The Kaffir tribes protested and five fierce wars were fought, with the loss of all Kafraria to the natives. The Boers were never reconciled to British authority. They murmured, rebelled, and kept migrating northward, till north of the Orange River they founded the Natal, the Orange Free State, and the Transvaal Republic. 
The high promontory of Cape of Good Hope, Table Mountain, is visible a long distance from the sea, owing to the dry, light atmosphere. On its spurs are many ruins of blockhouses, used by the early settlers. Over it, at times, hangs a veil of cloud, called the table cloth, which, when dispersed by the sun, the inhabitants say is put away for future use. The town of Cape Colony, or Cape Town, is now perfectly modern, and very pretty. It was here that the great missionary Robert Moffat began his African career in 1816, here that Pringle started to found his ideal town Glen Linden. In 1867 all Cape Colony was thrown into excitement by the discovery that diamond fields existed inland near the Kalahari Desert. There was a rush like that in our own country in 1849 when gold was discovered in California. Exaggerated stories of finds of diamonds by natives, valued at $50,000 apiece, were eagerly listened to, and in a few weeks there was a population of 10,000 in a hitherto unknown region, with the road thither, for hundreds of miles. Literally alive with wagons, oxen, pack mules and footmen. The diamond territory is Griqualand, on the headwaters of the Orange and Val rivers and close to the desert, partly in it. The region is 16,000 square miles in extent and 3,000 feet above the ocean. In the diamond fields the diamonds are found in the sand by washing. This is the native method of getting them, and also that adopted by thousands of people who have no capital. But it was soon found that they could be had in larger numbers and of greater size and purity by digging. This brought capital, machinery, and regular mining tracts, called claims. At first the mining towns were made up of tents, filled with a mixed people, toiling willingly all day, and dancing, gambling, drinking and rioting at night. At one time there were 60,000 persons in these diamond fields, but now not more than 40,000. The Kimberley Mine is the favorite. It has been excavated to a depth of 250 feet and has proved very rich. It is now surrounded by quite a town, and the people, mostly native diggers, are orderly and industrious. The diggers delve with spade and pick in the deep recesses of the mine, and the sand, rock and earth are pulled to the surface in buckets, where they are sorted, sieved, and closely examined for diamonds. Formerly the claims sold for fabulous prices. Many, only 30 by 16 feet, brought $100,000. And some rare finds have been made. The great diamond, found a few years ago, and called the Star of South Africa, was sold, before cutting, for $55,000. And while we are writing, one is undergoing the process of cutting in Paris which is a true wonder. It arrived from South Africa in August, 1884, and was purchased by a syndicate of London and Paris diamond merchants. It weighs in the rough 457 carats and will dress to 200 carats. The great Koinur, weighs only 106 carats, the region of France 1363-4 carats, the star of South Africa 125 carats, the Pigot 821-4 carats, and the Great Mogul 279 carats. But the latter is a lumpy stone, and if dressed to proper proportions, would not weigh over 140 carats. The Kafaria country, lying between Cape Colony and Natal, is rich in beautiful scenery and abounds in animal life. While the larger animals, as the elephant and lion, have retreated inland, there are still many beasts of prey, and the forests have not given over their troops of chattering baboons. Its greatest scourge is periodical visits of immense flights of locusts, which destroy all vegetation wherever they light. The natives make them into cakes and consider them a great delicacy. These natives are a brave, fine people, and have been conquered and held with difficulty. As they yield to civilization they make an industrious and attractive society. Natal was so named, in honor of our Savior, more than 300 years ago by Vasco da Gama. It was the center of the Zulu tribes, whom King Cherka formed into an all-conquering army, until the invasion of the country by the Boers. It became a British colony in 1843, and has been held with the greatest difficulty, for the Zulu warriors showed a bravery and method in their warfare which made them formidable enemies even against forces with superior arms and discipline. 
It was in the English wars with the Zulus that the Prince Imperial, of France, lost his life. A writer describes the Zulus as a race of the most handsome and manly people found among savages. Tall, muscular, and of remarkable symmetry, beauty and strength. Their carriage is upright, and among the chiefs, majestic. The Drakenberg Mountains, many of whose peaks are 10,000 feet high, shut off Natal from the Transvaal Republic. This Transvaal region was, as already seen, redeemed from the natives by the Boers, who are mostly devoted to farming, but many to a pastoral life like that of the old patriarchs, living in wagons or tents and leading, or rather following. About immense herds of cattle and sheep. They are a hardy, strong, brave people, and in subduing them and annexing their beautiful and fertile country, it is very doubtful whether Great Britain has done herself credit or humanity benefit. Boers may not be all that modern civilization could desire. In their contact with the natives they may have retrograde to a certain extent. But it is very probable they have made larger and more beneficial conquests over nature than any other more highly endowed and uncompromising people could have done in the same length of time. There is hardly a product of the soil that does not grow in the Transvaal, corn, tobacco, apricots, figs, oranges, peaches, two and sometimes three crops a year. It is finely watered with noble mountain streams, and is rich in iron, tin, copper, lead, coal and gold. The capital, Pretoria, is the center of a rich trade in ostrich feathers. Ostrich farming is a large industry in these South African states. Farmers buy and sell these animals like cattle. They fence them in, stable them, tend them, grow crops for them, study their habits, and cut their precious feathers, all as a matter of strict business. The animals begin to yield feathers at eight months old, and each year they grow more valuable. They are nipped or cut off, not plucked. The ostrich feather trade of South Africa is of the value of one million dollars a year. The birds are innocent and stupid looking, but can attack with great ferocity, and strike very powerfully with their feet. The only safe posture under attack by them is to lie down. They then can only trample on you. The Transvaal region is a paradise for hunters. The elephant, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, buffalo, giraffe, zebra, springbok, new, lion, and indeed every African animal, finds a home amid its deep woody recesses and sparkling waters. As he entered its borders from the desert, Pinto's camp was attacked by two lions, who scented his desert pony and herd of cattle. The natives became demoralized, and Pinto himself could do little toward saving his property on account of the darkness. Fortunately he got his hand on a dark lantern, in which was a splendid calcium light. Placing this in the hand of a native, he ordered him to go as near to the growling intruders as was safe, Pinto following with a double-barreled rifle. The glare of the light was then turned full in the faces of the beasts. They were dazed by it, and cowered for a moment. That moment was fatal. Pinto gave both a mortal wound and saved his cattle. And it was here that Cummings lost one of his guides, who was pounced upon by a lion as he lay asleep before a camp fire. Here also Lieutenant Moody and his party got the ill will of a herd of elephants, which charged upon them and gave furious chase, knocking the lieutenant down and tramping him nearly to death. One of his companions was killed outright by the charging beasts and his body tossed angrily into the jungle with their tusks. But the finest sport is hunting the buffalo. He is stealthy, cunning and swift. It requires a long shot or a quick ingenious chase to bag him. He never knows when he is beaten and will continue to charge and fight though riddled with bullets or pierced with many lances. Gilmore was once intent on an elephant track when suddenly his party was charged by five buffaloes. His horse saved him by a tremendous leap to one side, but one of his attendants was tossed ten feet in the air, and another landed amid the branches of a tree, one of which he fortunately caught. 